Yin Li's butler and El's assistant, looking inside the capsule, silently waited for the cabin to open and for the young master to awaken. The assistant rested her palms on the glass and asked the master with curiosity that was clearly readable in her large eyes if he was awake. The butler, immediately after seeing the open eyes of the master, pressed the button to unlock the capsule and it opened with the usual beep sound. A loud splash of capsule fluid being pumped out was heard and all that remained was to wait for it to unlock. Diziz was heard by those standing next to the capsule and watched it fully open. The capsule was unlocked and Yin Li was on the monitor tracking the master's vital signs with sensors glued to his body. The master was trying to figure out what was happening now and what kind of day it was in general. Looking directly into the butler's eyes, he asks how long he's been in the capsule. L rolls up the medicine card and the butler informs the master that his supply of the sixth effect drug is completely depleted, but he doesn't seem to be listening. L injects the master with the serum needed after awakening from the virtual world and asks him to relax. The butler, unable to stand the weight, asks the young master if he has really seen the future. Immediately assuming a serious look, the master replies that he has only seen an episode of the future. The wizard tells him that the virtual game Era, which his parents helped invent, will become popular and completely change the world. He also talks about some kind of market crash that will be a real disaster for the country, and money will lose its former importance. The master brings up more that the only currency for the entire world will be gold coins from the era. The master is just furious that he never got to see who got rid of his parents in this episode. On the other hand, mom and dad gave the young master a sign which gave him a lot of hope. The master stands up from the capsule on the cold floor and begins to realize what kind of sign he saw. With determined fists clenched, he informs Ella and the butler that he will have to infiltrate the era game and find out the whole truth there. The master finds information about the official release of the era game and thinks about how to convert his money into game coins before it starts. The young master, looking out the window, turned to Yin Li and asked to know how much money they have in their account. Hearing back about a fortune of over one billion, the master smiles wryly and realizes that it should definitely be enough. The butler standing with a tray nearby informed Chu Tianju that another 30 billion from the Zhao Association would be arriving soon. And then the young master was struck, the Zhao Association. How could he have forgotten about it? He began to recall the relationship between the Zhao Association and Sichu Association and speculated whether the former had something to do with his parents' departure. While the butler poured hot tea for the master, the latter speculated that his parents were very important to the association Sichu worked for. The master taking the mug of hot drink realized one thing. Without his parents, the Sichu Association was completely useless. While he drank his tea, a plan was maturing in his mind, and he even managed to stash a couple trump cards up his sleeve for further action. The master finished his tea and asked the butler if his gaming booth was ready for immersion. L was putting the remaining vials of serum into a safe, securely secured vault and seemed to be up to something. The butler led the master to the bedroom where the elite cabin was located, equipped with the feeding and deep sleep modes necessary for a full game. Yin Li held out something in the master's hand that allows players to stay online for weeks at a time, maybe more than that. The young master settles himself comfortably into the cockpit and starts the identity setup to confirm his identity. First in the identity setup is the confirmation of his fingerprints. The next stage is the confirmation of the master's retina. And finalizing the admission to the game is the full confirmation of his DNA. The young master begins to immerse himself in the virtual world through the nanoglasses in the capsule. There is a powerful transition to another dimension that he has never experienced before. His body feels as if it is in weightlessness and flies in an unknown direction towards a bright light. The dive is over and the young master tries to see through the pall of smoke where he has gone. The smoke clears and the wizard notices that he is standing on the roof of a tall building. His eyes fill with tears and his throat dries up because everything looks so realistic. It turns out that he has entered the world of the game that his parents once worked on. Suddenly, the voice of the system comes over the master, asking him to choose a name for his character. Without hesitation, the master replies that his character's name will be Chu Tianj. While in the capsule, the wizard completes the naming in the game in time for its official release and chooses a class to enter. A two-part tutorial is presented on the monitor, Learning and Sharing. 
The young master, without a second's hesitation, clicks on the exchange icon and the download begins. For a while, the downloading takes place on the monitor, and the young master waits for the exchange to start. The screen displays a possible exchange of money for gold coins in era, equal to one to one. The master immediately notices that the game is very conveniently arranged and up to a billion dollars can be exchanged at once. He immediately focuses on exchanging a billion, but is visibly worried about it. The thought flashes through his mind that this is tantamount to buying a thousand sports cars and more. The master thinks about the fact that for some, a billion dollars is just pocket money. But when another 30 billion shows up, he swallows nervously because each billion equals a million, and that means he will have to make the exchange at least 3,000 times. A lot of tension built up in the room, and it was as if the cabin was trying to crush him from the number of exchange counts. After much deliberation, the young master still presses the screen and makes the long-awaited exchange. Congratulations on his successful exchange and his initiation as a bronze player appear on the monitor. Some information is displayed on the screen, and the master reads it thoughtfully. He's not happy with what he sees and dismisses everything, going into exchange mode again. The master quickly, without thinking, presses the exchange button that appears again. His account information of $3 million appears on the screen. Chu Tiange makes several more exchanges in a row, quickly pressing consecutive buttons on the screen. After being in the game booth all this time, the master earns the title of silver, gold, and platinum player, accomplishing an exchange of $1 billion. The young master finally decided to take a break and take a break because the exchange has exhausted and tortured him. He himself is not happy about it and does not see any pleasure in it, rather only torment. But nothing can break the spirit of the master, and he continues the exchange with even greater passion. Two hours later, the mansion is plunged into darkness and gloom, sanctified only by the full moon. The unbelievable had happened. The young master had exchanged over a billion dollars and became the first tycoon of the era. Chu Tiange was completely exhausted and exhausted, but he still had no intention of stopping there. The master thought of Yin Li with a cup of hot tea and decided to leave the cabin for a while. The butler and Ella's assistant entered the bedroom, carrying a hot drink on her tray. The butler informed the already tense master that $30 billion had arrived from the Zhao Association. The master collapsed to the floor as he had just finished a billion-dollar exchange, and now he had $30 billion on top of that. The butler gathered his wits and informed the young master that there was something else. Yin Li's news was that a certain Liu family from Gangyam City wanted to take the $10 billion for investment. The master is puzzled and asks if the Liu family is the one he is talking about now. He has long known that they have become one of the most powerful families in the city, plus there was some sort of pact between their families. The butler decided to interfere with the master's thoughts and advised him not to give them the money. Chu Tiange immediately remembered the pile of work and ran back to the game booth. A new era of mankind was about to begin, because the official release of the game was just days away. Master, before reaching the cabin, listens to the latest news and freezes on the spot, that certain pact between his family and the Liu family has been publicly dissolved. Chu Tiange began to reflect on the fact that they had already had some minor disagreements after his parents left. The master knew of Zhao's insidious association, but there was no way he would have expected such a thing from the Liu family that he knew. Chu Tiange closed his eyes and began to think about what kind of threat this treacherous family was actually carrying. Still according to plan, for the next two days, there was a continuous exchange of currency in the game. Unexpectedly, the young master receives a new exclusive title, Kryptonist. The monitor lights up with detailed instructions for the Krypton player. Even without reading it all the way through, the master continues to make exchanges at his own frenzied pace. The master gains one title after another, and at the same time increases his friendliness skill with the in-game NPCs, who are just regular bots. Chu Tiange is not going to stop there and so spends the next six days. On the screen of the tired young master appears already a pile of gold coins. The game informs the master that he has maximized the friendliness skill of the game's NPCs. The young master throws himself on his back without strength and realizes that the deed is done. The monitor displays a countdown to the game's official release and a forum chat discussing it. Sitting at the computer, L's assistant tried to understand why the master hadn't returned yet and decided to read a little about the game. On the monitor appeared the Game Guardian with information about the history of the names of the Seven Kingdoms. 
plus displays information about four profession subcategories, which can later be changed. The girl notices the open booth and immediately rushes to the young gentleman. On his face reads fatigue and traces of sleepless nights, which are the consequences of the exchange. L literally carries the master to rest and urges him to wait for the official release. Finally, on November 11, 2020, the long-awaited official release of the famous game took place. The master hops into the game's entry booth with renewed vigor. Chu Tiange, now as a player, enters Era along with many other characters. Era welcomed the player into its universe and automatically selected his view, which could be changed at will. The young wizard is not interested in the character's species. He only cares about the exchange. Suddenly, an error sign appears in front of him with information about the exchange mode being closed. The master looks in bewilderment in front of him and does not understand what is happening. At the main control station of Era, there is a powerful explosion. The scientists run around the game's main control station in panic and try to find out how they lost control so quickly. An argument breaks out between them about destroying the control center. The master recalls the episodes he saw earlier under the influence of the Sixth Sense drug. Pulling himself together, Chu Tiange promises himself to get to the truth at any cost. On the screen that appears, the young lord selects an awakening skill. Through a pillar of blue radiation, he appears in the very epicenter of the game, attracting quite a bit of attention. In the moment, there is a fiery upgrade of the skill to the usual low-grade stamina. Such a skill does not suit the wizard, and on the control panel he makes another choice. A response comes back from the system with the usual mid-grade skill insanity. Such a choice doesn't please the wizard either, and he makes another update reset. Standing at the panel, the wizard gets another skill— the unusual low-grade skill, critical, and again, not that. Successful resets keep changing to cooler skills. The young master thinks about the 400,000 spent and the maximum skill obtained with this unusual mid-grade skill. Chutiange can't believe it and rushes towards the screen with rage. There is a tremendous surge of green radiation, and the master rumblingly receives a new transformation. The master's body is maximally tensed, and a successful awakening reset of the rare high-end skill Divine Light appears. The master, looking at his hands, is perplexed as to what effect is behind this transformation. Gathering all his power and strength, he counterstrikes the screen and resets the skill. The characters standing on the platform below notice a bright pearlescent glow. A large number of players shifted all their attention towards the endlessly repeating resets. Suddenly, a pillar of golden radiance rose up beneath the clouds, visible even beyond the city limits. Chu Tiange felt a wild power in his body after upgrading to the legendary high-grade heaven reflecting skill. The young master was finally satisfied with a truly successful reset. He was presented with a choice of one of four subcategory professions on the screen, but he could also rely on random selection. The master, without thinking long, selects a random profession for his character. A strong stream of light was directed at the young master, selecting a subcategory. Chu Tiange changes his existing armor and gains the ancient power of a warlock. The master is not happy with this random choice and resets his profession. The next reset reincarnates Chu Tiange as a powerful mage and once again he passes. Arrows appear behind the young wizard's shoulders and a crossbow in his hands, his choice of archer. Further transformation gives the master the armor of a warrior with a shining sword. The master exhales loudly and folding his arms across his chest realizes that none of this is what he needs. Sharp glowing wings and super armor are the choice of the ancient clan and the hidden profession of ancient dragon emperor is revealed. The master feels a surge of power and energy in this super armor and confirms his new choice. He is the only one with the chosen skill and profession and must now choose a country to appear. With a little thought, the young master voices the country for his character Tang. Chu Tiange gets on the teleport platform and presses load. The master finds himself in another country where some players have already been. He inspects the buildings and machinery in Yumi Village, the place he was transported to. One of the players joked to master that he stood in line for a long time to connect and missed everything. Chu Tiange, without saying a word, remembered that he had a top-level game booth after all. The player who had contacted the master was going to the outskirts of the village to level up. The young master hears the system's voice, notifying him of an exclusive crypto gift. On the screen that appears, Chu Tiange checks his inventory. He clicks on the selected icon with the notification hanging there. In front of the master appears an exclusive suit of immortal stature. 
the armor of the ancient dragon emperor. The game system offers to immediately improve the young master's equipment, and he quite agrees. A bright flash of light caught up with the virtual villagers at the most unexpected moment. Players looked at what was happening in bewilderment and even thought that there was an explosion somewhere. They did not even believe that this person and began to run away faster in the hope that an NPC would appear. The young lord descended down the tunnel of light, donning his armor along the way. The young lord's epic landing on the lands of Yumi Village was accomplished, and he guessed that he would draw quite a bit of attention to his person. Chu Tiangi finally appeared in full armor in front of the other players. The characters here began to argue with each other about the newly arrived recruit in expensive armor. They began to accuse the newcomer of cheating, and the master decided to keep a low profile to avoid further problems. Before he could do anything, Chu Tiange felt someone grab his leg with all his might. A moment later, the entire company standing nearby hangs on to the master and swears that they are blood related to him. The young master immediately realizes the venal nature of the insolent players. He is enraged by the situation and explodes right at that very second. With the speed of lightning leaving a trail of fire behind him, he breaks out of the embrace of the insolent crowd. At that moment, the virtual inhabitants guess the exchange. They immediately contact the system to make the exchange. Realizing that the exchange mode has been blocked, the players go into a frenzy. Running away from the indignant crowd, the master enjoys his superiority while the game forum is actively discussing his person. Two players on the outskirts of the village were going through the first level, the wolf zone. One of the players engaged the wolves in combat, dealing them decisive blows. The second player was a pink-haired girl, surprised to see her partner so strong. Determined to help him, she steeply gains momentum and throws her crystals at the wolves, who dash backwards. With this action, the girl player further enraged the pack, and the wolves rebelled against them. Before they could get far, the players were thrown aside by a sharp blow. They looked amongst themselves in confusion as to what had happened after all. The young lord resolutely attacked the wolf pack with his sharp spear. Not only lightning bolts flew from Chu Tiange's weapon, but also the wolves. The partners, upon seeing what was happening, were slightly dumbfounded. The young master on the screen that appeared added these players to his friends. At this moment, the system notified Chu Tiange of a new achievement. The master couldn't believe his eyes as he read what he saw on the screen. Looking at his new friends in the monitor, he tried to find out which of them was so rich. He tried to contact them through the monitor and saw a clue. Without taking his eyes away, he tried to learn as much as he could about the player's achievements and effects. The screen displayed information about the friendliness of the bots in Yu Mi's newcomer village. The master thought that it would be a good idea to check everything he had read. Taking the spear tighter in his hands, Chu Tiange makes a powerful dash towards the village. The master enters the wolf zone to pass the first level and passes through with ease. He legendarily fights in the Black Bear area with the next opponents. In the third level, giant bloodthirsty crocodiles await him. With godlike strength, he passes this test with ease as well. A player with an earring in his ear who is a reporter calls out to investigate with him. As he speeds up, he quickly runs away with his cameraman who is filming everything. The reporter says something to the camera bowl in the lion's area. He gets as close as possible to the enraged lions, but they behave suspiciously calm. The player has been broadcasting through the camera ball to the other characters all this time. The reporter and his camera bully moved with all their feet towards some strange sounds. He stood motionless and looked at the fallen demonic tigers. The reporter realized that someone had reached the fifth level before him. But how was that possible? The other players watching the broadcast could no longer contain their astonishment. Reporter decided to climb higher to the main action. He saw someone with a sharp spear flying straight at the Tiger King. The young master, holding the point of the spear firmly in front of him, looked like one of the gods. He fought bravely against the Tiger King, despite the latter's immense strength. Chu Tiange thought that he could use his secret technique. The master decisively attacked the ferocious top-ranked demonic lion. One of the characters watching the broadcast rushed over to worship Chu Tiange. The player who was conducting the broadcast made a plan to get closer to the scene. The master was releasing fire tips from his spear towards the tiger. Chu Tiange flew through the monster, making a huge hole in it. There was an explosion above the battle scene, and equipment and coins flew into the air as rewards for winning the battle. The players who were watching the broadcast were discussing the battle vigorously. The young master stopped to rest and recover from the battle. 
A reporter from behind a cliff was peeking at Chu Tiange standing there. The master noticed the camera ball and looked directly into his video recorder. The characters, seeing Chu Tiange's face so close on the screen, were ecstatic. The reporter panicked that the master might notice him in the camera ball. The young master brought out a mini screen on the palm of his hand with the inventory gathering. All the rewards lying on the ground quickly fell into the master's possession. Chu Tiange pushed himself off the ground, and with a fiery bullet, he traveled further onward. On the ground, the gold coins that the master hadn't collected remained lying on the ground. The reporter rushed to pick up all the remaining gold coins from the ground at the same instant. An unknown player with arrows over his shoulders was walking towards the lands of Yumi Village with a certain mission. Squinting slightly, the character thought about the place he had entered. He considered the village and its local inhabitants, the characters. In the streets of Yumi Village, the rumor of the exploits of the great player Chu Tiange had already spread. The new recruit with a mission stopped at the main gate and thought about something. The master continued to attack the formidable opponents that came his way. Looking at yet another victory, Chu Tiange immediately pondered the next plan of action. The master, leaving a trail of fire behind him, quickly rushed towards the village. The newcomer noticed the master who had just arrived in the village. Chu Tiange opened the monitor with the game privileges and instructions. The young master clicked on his favorite case with equipment and privileges. Chu Tiange's armor changed to his usual long kimono suit. The master was met by a waiting recruit with a greeting. The new recruit introduced himself to the master as Hang Wu and offered some sort of deal. The master continued walking without interest, which infuriated his interlocutor. The new recruit caught up with Chu Tiange and continued his story. Suddenly, the two players silently stopped next to each other. The master looked at the player and realized that he was aware of his exchange. The new recruit continued his story, smiling achitically as he did so. The new recruit became infuriated at the master's refusal of any cooperation. The master kept going, making his opponent very angry by doing so. Hen Wu decided to go with trumps and gave even more details, switching to shouting. Very close to them, someone's loud footsteps and stomping could be heard. A bunch of bots were moving straight towards the master in quick strides. They literally pounced on the young master with admiration and questioning. One elderly geisha suggested that the master stop by for her tasks. Another bot shouted to him that she would do anything for him. It wasn't without an elder who was also trying to say something. All the NPCs were trying to get the wizard on their side somehow. The newcomer was outraged at the insolence of the intemperate bots. Near the mountains, the modest mansion of the village head Yumi stood in the semi-darkness. Everyone walked on, and a certain NPC offered the master a task about poultry. Another one tried to give the task of practicing the wooden pole. The master rejected all the assignments from the cheeky bots present. A while later, the young master thought that it would be a good idea to take a couple assignments after all. On the screen that appeared, Chu Tiange selected a hidden task. The bots surrounded the master, selecting one hidden task after another. The wizard was carefully reading the sentence of one of the bots next to him. This NPC decided to ask the wizard how he managed to take several hidden quests at once. The other bots were outraged by the insolent behavior of the inquiring NPC. The wizard realized with annoyance that he would have to consider a couple more quests. The other players were outraged at this attitude of all the bots towards the wizard. The crowd of players still couldn't calm down and tried to riot. The enraged recruit was moving towards the village head's mansion. The master went inside, surrounded by overprotective bots. The players didn't understand why tasks were being offered to the master specifically. Everyone was curious about one question. Why were the bots acting so polite towards Chu Tianzhu? The new recruit began to loudly shout ridiculous threats at the master. Behind the newcomer's back, more and more characters appeared. They ran straight down the recruit's back to meet the master. The players shouted nonsense at Chu Tianzhu with suggestions. Trampled by the crowd, the recruit motionlessly remained lying on the ground. The master looked at everyone who had come with surprise and confusion. He didn't want to tolerate this buffoonery and mess for another second. Chu Tiange broke free from the maddened crowd in one swift dash. On the second level, where the Black Bear's territory was, a battle was going on. There were wounded players lying on the ground, asking for help from the newbie healer player. One of them decided to make a lewd and rude suggestion to her. Newbie got very angry and didn't even think about saving them. The only question in her eyes was, how could she save herself from her attackers? When Newbie saw the bears approaching, she quickly started running. 
Not far from the Black Bear's territory, a small bright flash appeared. The small flash abruptly turned into a bright pillar of fire. The healer heard a sharp rumble and saw the smoke dissipating and was about to see what was there. Nubi looked straight ahead of her with wonder and fear. As the smoke cleared, she was beginning to realize what or who was behind it. The young master turned around, sensing that someone was watching him. The long-haired newbie with her modest equipment was standing right in front of the master. Chu Tiange had immediately added her to his friends after scanning her. Nubi was a bit confused and was about to say something. The healer tried to politely decline the master's offer. The young master had his own plans for her, which he wasn't going to voice yet. The healer accepted the offer of friendship from the master on the screen. Chu Tiange and Nubi ran off together to meet another adventure. There were still a few opponents left in the Black Bear's territory. Chu Tiange, surrounded by his fire lightning, prepared his spear for battle. With one powerful strike, he rose up against all the opponents at once. Nubi was a bit shocked and confused by such a master's strength. The master ran forward and asked Nubi to keep up with him. The healer with all her might still tried to catch up with Master Chu. Nubi noticeably speeds up and runs as fast as she can to her partner. She realizes that she is unable to catch up to the master and calls out to him to wait for her. Chu Tiange tells her to stay put until she has dealt with all the enemies ahead. The master attacks the enemies again with a paralyzing lightning strike. The last enemies here have been defeated by the strong Chu Tiange and Nubi immediately rushes towards her partner. A bit confused, she still tries to find out what he needs her for. Chu Tiange again did not go into details and only mentioned some sort of assignment. Suddenly a giant ancient rattlesnake appears in front of Master and Nubi. The healer looks it straight in the eyes and gathers her wits for the upcoming attack. Nubi is determined to take part in the battle this time by all means. Before she could do anything, all she saw was Chu Tiange, who was aiming straight at the poisonous snake's mouth with fury. With all his might, the master delivers a powerful decisive strike with his spear. Chu Tiange hits several parts of the rattlesnake at once, Nubi warns the master of the fearsome opponent's retaliatory attack. The ancient snake releases venomous crystals from its mouth towards Chu's player. The young master creates a force field to protect himself before retaliating, but the defense fails and the poison crystals are stabbed into his hand. Nubi notices the rapidly spreading poison around the wizard's body. The healer realized that now was the time to use her power. Before she can get close to the master, she notices that something is happening to him. The unconscious master starts auto-regeneration mode on his own. Nubi realizes that even with all her power, she is useless to him. The reporter enthusiastically continues his broadcast. The virtual residents listened attentively to the reporter speaking live. The reporter gets closer to the closed area where the level six boss is. Hiding behind a tree with the camera ball, the player tries to get a glimpse of anything. He opens the navigational map of the levels and tries to figure out what's wrong. The players are just furious at such a boring broadcast and think they've been tricked. The somewhat confused reporter tries to somehow remedy the situation. The broadcaster, along with his camera ball, has run to the next level of the game. He deftly climbs up the high cliff to the lair of the cave boss and freezes right on the cliff. The reporter is even more excited and tries to distract the watching characters with other bosses. The young master looked at Nubi's outfit with embarrassment and suggested she change her outfit. He called up the system screen so the healer could make a new choice herself. Nubi, after looking at the available arsenal, makes a choice in favor of a nice outfit she likes. The transformation of the healer's outfit began gradually from the bottom up. The new costume began to cover all of her partner's prominent circles that attracted unnecessary attention. The master watched Nubi's final transformation in languid anticipation. The healer appeared before the master in her new outfit and noticed the approval in his eyes. The young master suggests that his partner continue with further tests. Nubi tries to tell the master that it is time for her to quit. The master, full of determination and excitement, does not understand this choice of the healer. The girl asks the master if he uses the game capsules to enter. The partner explains that she uses a regular game helmet and has been in the game for a very long time. The master realizes that she needs a rest and agrees with her decision. Chu Tiange gets the healer a teleport scroll for quick travel. Nubi thanks the young master and triggers the scroll to teleport back to the real world. The teleportation begins to move her partner, creating a force field of instant disappearance around her. Nubi is completely transported home, and the young lord is left completely alone with his thoughts. 
Chu Tiange, without moving, began to make some assumptions about his newfound partner. The young master quickly realized that he was distracting himself from his main goal and tried to get rid of the unnecessary thoughts. Chu Tiange, gripping his spear tighter, set off in the direction of the active volcano. The master was approaching the volcano with rivers of raging lava and angry monsters looking on. In a small town in Japan was the number five women's dormitory. Her roommate walked into the room of the master's partner who had just gotten out of the game. Nubi cheerfully removed her helmet and greeted her incoming mate. The healer clearly wanted to share with her roommate something interesting that had happened to her recently in the game. The neighbor, noticing the game helmet in Nubi's hands and another one nearby, became very indignant. The buddy no longer wanted the game helmet she had asked Nubi to buy for herself earlier. The new game helmet was lying still sealed in a box on the table. Nubi was very upset as she had already spent a fortune on it. The healer thought with annoyance that she would not be able to exchange or return the helmet back. Her friend, smiling wryly, informed Nubi that she had found a way out with a guy named Lee. Nubi, with undisguised anger, remembered that arrogant rich man Lee and did not understand what her friend found in him. She immediately put her helmet back on, ignoring her chatty neighbor. Her friend tried, as it seemed to her, to reason with Nubi, shouting at her. The neighbor clearly didn't like this proper behavior of the girl, but she didn't have time to say another word. The healer in her new gear found herself on one of the busy streets of Yumi Village. Some characters who saw the healer saw her as a player from their team from yesterday. The players examined Nubi's new and obviously expensive outfit with bewilderment and curiosity. The young lord victoriously finished exploring the area with the volcanoes and started looking for the demon king. Chu Tiange leisurely walked forward while carefully looking around. The ground beneath the master cracked with a rumbling sound and was at the mercy of the fire element. The powerful explosion of the earth abruptly threw Master Chu high into the sky. The young master watched as a huge, fiery arm burst out from the ground, amidst a pile of flying rocks. Chu Tiange inflicted a swift rift with his spear on the earth dragon. The master was standing on a volcanic slab in the middle of the lava and fending off the fireballs flying directly at him. Suddenly, the slab on which Chu Tiange was standing began to rise with him from the powerful flow of rising lava. A powerful demon with burning eyes rose up from the lava, resembling a stone man but characterized by gigantic size and incredible strength. Chu Tiange, being very agile, had an advantage over the enemy and decided to attack first. Not only did the young master lack any sense of fear, on the contrary, he was completely focused on the battle. The master flew towards his opponent with unprecedented confidence. After getting as close to his opponent as possible, Chu Tiange clenched his spear tighter and thrust it into the earth dragon with lightning speed. The master even liked the fact that the fight didn't take so long to end and that he actually had a worthy opponent. The stone earth king opened its mouth and roared loudly from the blows it had received. The main demon of Yumi village was defeated by the master, who received a reward for it. Chu Tiange notices some strange bluish glow behind him. Turning around, the young master notices a teleport platform and heads straight towards it. He steps onto the platform and studies the information on possible relocation. The master ponders what kind of place this teleporter could take him to. Chu Tiange slowly steps off the platform with thoughts of what to do next. He calls up the game system to review his friends list and notices his partner online. The young gentleman quickly clicks on the summon icon to video chat with Nubi. On the virtual monitor, Chu Tiange sees a worried partner and the embittered characters running after her. The wizard pulls out his teleport scroll from his available inventory and is about to move. A force field of instant disappearance is created around the wizard for the next move. The infuriated characters surround the shocked healer at the very edge of the steep cliff. One of the players had already prepared a sharp dagger for a bloody massacre of the girl. The other characters were shouting out alternative ways to get her equipment. Scared out of her wits, Nubi tried to negotiate with the player somehow, but she wasn't very good at it. A distraught player with a sharp dagger lunged straight at the healer. The characters standing on the cliff suddenly heard a loud whistle. All of the characters stopped and shifted their gaze to the wizard who had appeared from the Pillar of Lightning. Chu Tianga teleported to his frightened partner just in time. Before the characters even had a chance to realize it, Chu Tianga had blocked Nubi from seeing him. The players turned around in horror to see who this brave savior was. In front of them stood none other than the richest player, Chu Tiange. 
The master anxiously asked his partner if she was all right. The healer, determined to get revenge on her abusers, tells the master what they were going to do to her. The characters are puzzled and begin to realize that the master and newbie are somehow connected and begin to worry for their lives. The frightened players run off with all their legs, away from the master and the girl. Chutiange was not about to leave the characters unpunished and abruptly appeared right in front of them. One player quickly reminds the young master of the punishments for massacring them. Another player dares to suggest that the master will not touch them. The character with the blade, pointing at the healer, talks about being able to attack her whenever he wants. The player brazenly demonstrates his boldness to the wizard by getting very close to him. The player's face changes in the same second and something happens that he was in no way expecting. The shocked players stare at the master's smitten buddy with no signs of life. They watch their friend's virtual soul depart and plan to avenge him. The master, having struck two more players in one fell swoop, was heading for the last one. The remaining player frantically scans the master coming at him and doesn't understand why he is without the red punishment mark. Chu Tiange jumps on the offending player as if to hint to the one that he is allowed to do everything. The master and healer set off on their journey, and Chu Tianj remembers the NPC's words on the way that he has special rules for him. The new recruit with the mission blocked the path of his partners by loudly calling out the young master by name. The newcomer approached the halted newbie and the master. The young master was trying to find out why he would not leave him alone and was always following him. The newcomer, with a smile on his face, began to talk about his famous guild and the master's need to join them. Towards the end of his speech, he once again switched to shouting, which was an attempt to attract the attention of his interlocutor. Chu Tiange was not afraid of the newcomer's threats and stood firm in his decision. The newcomer, threatening, began to approach closer and closer to the master. Angrily shifting his eyebrows, the new recruit began to tell the young master what would happen if he refused. Chu Tiange was confident in his strength and firm in his decision not to accept any offers from the annoying player. The situation made the newcomer very angry, thus making his partners laugh a lot. The newcomer became enraged at such self-righteous behavior from the master, but he did not give up just yet. Chu Tiange, along with the healer, continued to banter with their interlocutor. The new recruit decided to change the tactics of the conversation and got to the point, while throwing around various threats. The interlocutor of the partners continued to threaten Master Chu and bring, as he himself thought, quite weighty arguments. The words of the newcomer echoed between the trees somewhere far into the sky. The newcomer asked the master if he would dare to leave the village of newcomers after all that he had heard. Chu Tiange asked him what would happen to him in such a case. The newcomer only laughed in the master's face, saying that he knew nothing about this game and its rules. He continued his story, gesticulating vigorously while saying that his powerful guild could attract a lot of people from outside. The young lord listened to the whole story without much interest and asked how they were going to do it. The newcomer, taking a determined stance, thought that he had already told enough. The newcomer added to the master about what would happen to him if he refused. The interlocutor continued his story about the master's further restrictions outside the settlement in case of refusal. The newcomer spoke to the master about how it would also be beneficial for him to join their guild. The young master, after some thought, moved closer to his interlocutor and informed him of his agreement only if the era system closed. The newcomer, smiling contentedly, says that it would be easy for them to pull something like that off. He looks intently at the master, waiting for a response to his proposal. Chu Tiange breaks out into a smile and asks the new recruit something. The recruit becomes enraged at what he hears and turns to shouting. The young master takes his spear in his hand with fire lightning flying around. Chu Tiange points the tip of his spear directly at the recruit, who was clearly not expecting this. The master takes a step forward with the spear in his hand, not noticing his partner's worried expression. In an instant, the recruit's virtual soul quickly flew through a blue tunnel of displacement for further rebirth. The recruit traveled through the tunnel to the revival field, where there were other resurrected players. Once revived, the recruit was very angry and promised himself to take revenge on the master for what had been done to him. The other revived characters heard the shouts of promises with the newcomer's vengeance. The characters approached the newcomer, asking him to join them in carrying out their revenge together. Chu's mansion reflected the territory of the great build with its large windows, but not without the help of sunlight. 
Chu Tiange took a shower and slipped a towel over his head and walked down the stairs to the study, vigorously wiping his wet hair. He walked over to his laptop and decided to read the latest news, seeing first an invitation to Songland for some sort of event. Next comes news of military recruitment for a faction unknown to him. Next comes news of an invitation to yet another guild, and then a video of the battle of that most powerful guild recruit against the King of Tigers appears on the monitor. The young lord leans closer to the laptop with interest to select the desired video. With a smooth motion of his hand, he presses the download button for further viewing. On the cliff, all the players of the guild were gathered, led by their leader apparently standing behind the army. The faction leader with a rifle on his shoulder was congratulating his guild on another victory. In front of the faction stood a formidable green-eyed demonic tiger, clearly preparing to attack. Slowly stepping, the embittered opponent moved straight towards the guild players. The faction leader readied his rifle for battle and gave a command to his large army. The guild commander loudly announced the start of the attack and with a pointing gesture, sent the army into battle. The demonic tiger, which had a huge scar instead of a second eye, bellowed menacingly at them. The enraged Tiger King rushed into the battle, quickly knocking down all the standing players in its path. The battle participants used bow arrows and their strongest magic skills to attack their opponent. The Tiger King stood up on its hind legs and fiercely took all the numerous blows of the opponents that hit it. Suddenly, the entire guild heard a loud roar from the beast like a plea for mercy and froze in anticipation. Coins, armor, and other equipment sprinkled from the era's notification system as rewards for the heroic victory. The guild leader broadcast in front of everyone about the strength and power of their invincible team. He shouted loudly about how player Chu Tiange had unfairly emerged as the winner of this difficult level. The leader was telling the listening guild about his intentions towards the boastful player Chu Tiange. He menacingly raised his index finger upwards and gave Master Chu one day to ponder their proposal. The leader looked directly at the young master through the laptop screen and invited him to join them before it was too late. Chu Tiange was extremely resentful that the guild was using his already famous name for their nefarious purposes. With his hands folded, the master stepped away from his laptop and scrolled through the next plan of action in his head. Chu Tiange firmly resolved to teach the foolish faction a lesson for such a brazen act. The young lord quickly walked over to his game booth and began to change his clothes. Some characters of Yumi Village were watching the broadcast of the Master's battle with the Black Bears. One of the characters began to say that Master Chu himself didn't provide much of anything. Another player said that he had heard about him being rejected by one of the powerful factions. Players one after another speculated about Chu Tiange and even said that it was all about his immense wealth. There were some characters who admired the Master, looking at him with enamored eyes on the broadcast screen. The master was walking with Nubi in the middle of the forest and telling her in detail about his former victories and the rewards for them. Chu Tiange decided to explain to his partner why he had taken all those numerous assignments. The young master informs the girl of his intentions to leave the village of Yumi newcomers as soon as possible. He reminds the healer that it will not be safe for her to be here after he leaves. They stop and the master proceeds to tell Nubi about his future plans. Nubi listened with confusion to the powerful player Chu about his unfinished quest. The healer was very surprised to learn that this quest was egg collecting and imagined herself chasing chickens. The master realized that Nubi had taken him too literally and clarified exactly what would need to be done in this quest. The partner listens admiringly to the master and realizes that she enjoys this far more than the chicken coop chase. The partners open the system screens and the young master offers to hand Nubi a couple of quests to complete in order to level up faster and thus increase her power. The girl is desperate to understand why Chu Tiange is being so generous with her and asks him directly about it. The master seems to be caught off guard by such a question and he thinks about it himself. After a bit of thought, Chu Tiange informs Nubi that she will definitely know the answers to all her questions someday. The girl understands nothing when the master holds out a scroll to her, and he explains that only one can move, and she must do it first. A certain character stood near the cliffs and searched the game's navigation map for something for a long time. Sweeping the player off his feet, an electrical flash swept past him in a powerful whirlwind. The character sat on the ground and came to a stop, looking at the distant flash. The player squinted to get a better look at anything amidst the bright light. The character finally realized who had rushed past him and loudly called out his name. 
the young master planted his feet on the ground with all his might to stop abruptly. The character out of breath informs Master Chu that he has some very important news. Old Omar, that was the character's name after panting a bit, warns the young master of the enemies waiting for him in the valley. Chu Tiange, frowning, asks the one in question what exactly the matter is about. The master clarifies with the player if he has understood everything correctly, and it is he who is waiting in an organized ambush. Old Omar confirms his words and urges the master to take a different route. In the seemingly peaceful valley of Hulu, between the cliffs, there is some rustling. Armed players are on the cliff, and hidden stand rather quietly for the successful execution of the plan. The newcomer checks the readiness of his new team by directing everyone to maintain complete silence. The new recruit approached a reporter and threateningly asked the reporter to say something on live TV specifically for him. He also asked the reporter to find him some information about player Chu Tiange. The reporter quickly found all the available material on the master in the search engine and turned to the reporter. The reporter interjected what exactly the newcomer wanted to know about Chu Tiange. The recruit asked the interlocutor to display the master's accomplishments on the screen. The monitor in front of the new recruit began downloading information from verified informants. A chat room appeared on the screen with characters who wrote there about what was happening to the master in real time. The new recruit, among what he read, noticed that one of the players had given a clue to Chu Tianju and was infuriated by it. He, after thinking for a bit, selected the button on the screen to summon their faction leader. The new recruit promptly reported to the leader that everything was going according to plan. They were awaiting the master's arrival in the valley. The leader praises the subordinate with a well-organized capture plan and encourages everyone to execute it flawlessly. The recruit informs the reporter of the end of his conversation with the guild leader. Pointing to the camera ball, the capture chief commands the reporter to begin broadcasting. The reporter, frantically adjusting the camera ball, turns it on and starts the beginning of the live broadcast. The virtual residents gather for the broadcast that has begun with the reporter. One of the characters notices a large number of unidentified but heavily armed players behind the reporter. Some of the players assume that they are about to be shown a fight with one of the main bosses. The reporter reveals the cards on camera, talking about the plan to capture the rich man. The characters are at a loss to discuss which rich man they are about to capture now in the valley. The reporter, with a standing army in the background, begins to talk about the momentous battle to come. The viewers see the silhouette of a player on the screen and recognize him as Master Chu Tiange. Those watching the broadcast see the young master enter the valley and think that he is unsuspecting. The van that pulled up was standing on the grounds of Lee's luxurious residence in Gangiam City. From the outside, the unremarkable van actually held something of secrets and mysteries. A certain gray-haired man was sitting with a device on his head that looked like a gaming helmet. Apparently, the man had learned all the necessary information and was about to get out of the van. The doors of the van creaked open and a man in a strict suit stepped out. The man and the woman accompanying him were on their way to the meeting and knew that the Liu family was obtaining information about the era faster than the prices in the stores were rising. The gray-haired man in the suit turned out to be none other than the very leader of that very faction, Zhang Ze. The Liu family, consisting of their head and daughter surrounded by guards, came out to negotiate with Zhang Ze. The faction leader greeted the richest family and apologized for the inconvenience caused to them. Zhang Ze brought along a laptop to show the Liu family something really worthwhile. The head of the family questioned the words the leader had said to him and inquired about it. The faction leader spreading a smile, informs the family about the upcoming grand show called Grabbing the Rich Man. The young lord stood between the rocks in full alert at the entrance of the valley, holding his spear tightly. Chu Tiange was suddenly disturbed by an incoming video call, and on the screen that appeared, one of the characters informed him of the upcoming ambush. The master entered into a dialogue with the player, saying that he was aware of the cunning plan of the players waiting for him. Chu Tiange continued his conversation, talking about the ambush as an opportunity to prove himself without noticing that he was already being followed. The characters in the ambush were preparing their battle weapons and secret techniques for the upcoming battle. Chu Tiange walked past the players standing on the slopes of the cliffs, causing the opponents to react violently. The players raised their weapons upwards with loud remarks directed towards the master. The newcomer immediately called all armed invaders to silence and order. The newcomer standing high on the cliff called out loudly to the master by name. 
With his arms folded across his chest, the newcomer asked Chu Tiange if he had expected to see him like this. The master calmly listened to the newcomer's speech and, with an undisguised laugh, told him that he had known about everything a long time ago. The newcomer, standing among his charges, did not expect such an answer and immediately boiled up. He shouted loudly to the master that if he did not join their guild, the fight would turn against him. After calming down a bit, the recruit cheerfully told Chu Tianju that he could still change his mind and join them. The characters watching the broadcast listened to the recruit's threats against Rich Chu. One player especially admired the confident speech of the head of the invaders. The characters were discussing the guild amongst themselves and even considered joining them after the battle. Zhang Ze kept his laptop open with the broadcast in the era going on. The head of the Liu family was listening intently to the conversation between the rivals in Hulu Valley. The gray-haired man told the Liu family with full confidence that the plan to capture the rich man would be successfully realized. The head of the Liu family's eyes flashed with interest and as if there was something else. The newcomer, full of determination, asked the young master if he dreamed of getting away with it. The newcomer was delighted with his plan of capture, even though he thought it wasn't really necessary. One of the characters watching the live broadcast noticed that there was not a single player with the warrior profession among the players who were about to attack. Almost all the players watching the broadcast were cheering for the guild and raising their hands in the air to admire them. A new recruit joked to the master that even if he had wings, he still wouldn't be able to get away from them. The master found the idea very interesting and quite doable. Chu Tiange made a powerful leap and flew upwards, shouting to his opponents that he did not need wings to fly. The partner who was the leader of the army shouted loudly to his subordinates to immediately catch Chu Tiange even in the sky. The archers inserted arrows into their crossbows and began shooting at the master on command, while the mages and warlocks charged their magic staffs at Chu Tiange. Everything flying into the sky, the equipment and privileges of the attackers exploded with a powerful, bright flash. Chu Tiange, with his usual agility, zigzagged to dodge everything and even managed to fight them back. Finished with the massacre in the sky, the master flew straight at the recruit, aiming the tip of his spear at his insolently cocky face. The master moved as close to the recruit as possible, preparing to attack and shouted the earth dragon's splitting fury. The powerful explosion with a fiery flash blinded the entire guild on the cliff. The young lord, leaving behind a huge hole in the cliff, was moving away. The reporter was still trying to recover from the powerful attack and didn't notice the richest Chu player approaching him. Coughing, the reporter saw the master standing menacingly in front of him with a spear in his hand. The reporter, unable to believe his eyes, cowardly looked at Chu Tiange. The master commanded the reporter not to get distracted and continued to continue to broadcast live. The young master lightning quickly leapt to reach the next guild players. Chu Tiange single-handedly rose up against the enemies and sent them to the other world, one by one, with powerful spear strikes. The players who watched the live broadcast noted Master Chu's agility and strength. The players defeated in the battle continuously appear on the revival field one after another. The new recruit quickly summons the system screen with a live feed and orders the guild's next actions. On the battlefield, illuminated by the master's explosions, the characters that have survived so far are flitting about. A new recruit, watching the scene, shouts to them that he will increase the revival compensation by half. Several players, hearing about the rebirth fee, decide that it's a great and more importantly, easy money-making opportunity. Losing their minds, the characters, thinking only of money, run to attack the master. Chu Tiange immediately uses his signature strike the Earth Dragon Rage split. The newcomer sees a massive explosion live, spilling far across the valley. The newcomer begins to think that the master is taking over his men and becomes visibly worried. Suddenly, hundreds of fireballs and arrows fly at the master from all sides. The characters who continue to attack suddenly see a giant blinding burst. The new recruit finally feels relief and victorious pride in his guild as he looks at the sight of the powerful explosion. Chu Tiange has no intention of giving up and is ready to fight the enemies some more with renewed vigor. One of the players in the village doesn't understand the master's decision to fight alone against an entire army of armed men. Another notes that Chu Tiange's strength is definitely something to envy. The master, keeping his trump cards up his sleeves all this time, opens the system screen to select additional skills. 
While the master is reviewing the information on the screen, the guild players channel all their rage and power towards him. Another explosion occurs, and in the dissipating smoke, the master's face begins to be clearly visible. The guild members, unable to believe their eyes, try to see through the smoke. The master still manages to click on his chosen skills before the attack and begins to refresh. The young master with fiery eyes undergoes a change on the first skill, 100% damage reflection in 10 seconds. All incoming blows to the master are mirrored to the remaining players in the faction. Chu Tiange begins to transform on the second chosen skill. The master, standing in a green glow, gains accelerated auto-regeneration for 10 seconds. The young master's eyes burning with fire show all his fury and strength, dragon power. The master who acquired the super high ability summons the power of a golden fire-breathing dragon. The guild watches as fireballs are shot far into the sky. The fireballs turn around towards the guild and fly straight towards them. Guild leader Zhang Ze, along with the Liu family, moved to the mansion to watch the decisive battle more comfortably. The TV hanging on the wall was showing the live broadcast of the battle in Hulu Valley. Everyone gathered in the room of the mansion was watching the guild's obviously failed plan. The head of the Liu family asked the gray-haired man what it all meant. Zhang Ze calmly drank his coffee without looking at the screen and replied to the mansion master that everything was going according to plan. On the TV screen, the moment of the master's first victorious attack over the guild was just going on. The head of the Liu family informed a dramatically changed Zhang Ze of their failure. The gray-haired man informed his interlocutor that the departure of the guild commander did not equal the end of everything. The head of the Liu family was staring at the screen with concentration while listening to Zhang Ze's speech. Zhang Ze was completely confident in his magnificent plan and said that he was about to accomplish what he had planned. He explained to the head of the Liu family some details of his plan, not only concerning the valley area, but also the village as a whole. Zhang Ze also explained that the master could still join their faction, for there was a huge amount of money at stake. The TV screen broadcast the master's next victorious attack over the guild. The head of the Liu family, remaining completely calm, was already confident of player Chu Tiange's victory over the guild. Zhang Ze was thrown into a cold sweat, but he continued to say that not all was lost yet and one must be patient. The television broadcast the master's final attack, Dragon Power. The gray-haired man began to realize the failed battle for his guild. Liu Liu Fei, the daughter of the head of the Liu Liu family, smirked at the thought that it was more like capturing Zhang Ze rather than the rich man Chu Tiange. After finishing watching the broadcast, the mansion master calmly turned to the uninvited guest. The head of the Liu family offered to let Zhang Ze leave voluntarily and informed him that his faction was being considered. Finally despairing, Zhang Ze accepted defeat and realized that this was the end, and there would certainly be no further consideration. The young master stood on the cliff surrounded by the bodies of his opponents and held his spear tightly. The master walked with the reporter following behind him and looked at the entire lying reward for winning the battle. Chu Tiange asked the reporter to turn off the camera ball, thus ending the live broadcast. The reporter did not immediately realize what the master wanted, but after remembering his victory, he quickly responded to the request. Chu Tiange quickly turned on the mode to collect the bounty lying on the ground. Looking at all the loot he had earned, he thought that he had ripped off a good chunk of loot. As the master collected all of his loot, he noted that even without completing any other missions, he could easily get rich like this. Chu Tiange grinned and thought that if such a battle were to be repeated again, he wouldn't have to fight any bosses. Master was stopped by the abrupt sound of the system alerting him that his vault was already full. Turning to the reporter, Chu Tiange motioned for him to pick up the remaining reward. The reporter was ecstatic upon hearing the master's offer. He realized that none of the defeated people were here, and he could safely take whatever he carried away. The reporter quickly rushed to collect the bounty, replenishing his supplies. With a jerk, the master disappeared from the valley, and the reporter only had time to shout his thanks after him. The reporter thought that if he had the chance, he would definitely follow the master in the future. As the reporter gathered armor, coins, and other loot, it occurred to him that if he returned alive, the guild would realize who had taken their items. Reporter opened a system window and quickly looked up some information. He realized what he had to do, but there was no way he could muster up the courage to carry out what he had planned. 
Gathering all his will in a fist, the reporter jumped from the high cliff straight down. Lying on the cold stone slab, he waited for the tunnel to move to the rebirth field. The reporter's virtual soul began to ascend upwards towards the tunnel, and he even had time to consider the paltry reward he was leaving behind. Master Chu Tiange arrived at the gates of Yumi Village, forming a trail of fire around him. Standing at the gate to the village were some hefty players, apparently guarding the entrance from intruders. The characters recognized the rich man Chu Tiange as the visitor, walking resolutely towards the village gate. Surprisingly, no one dared to engage Chu Tiange, letting him pass forward. The young master was only thinking about how good it was that no one knew how long it would take for his skills to recharge for subsequent attacks. Before he could enter the village, the wizard was surrounded by the very NPCs he had accepted hidden quests from. An elderly geisha informed the master that he could leave the task if he found it too difficult. The elder, on the other hand, explained that Chu Tiange would be able to leave any task without receiving a penalty for doing so. The overly intrusive NPCs still did not leave the master's side and suggested that he go to the village head Yumi's house for tea. The distant bots and the master were followed by an embittered recruit who promised to avenge everything on Chu Tianju. At the village head's house, the bots took turns congratulating the master on successfully completed quests. In addition to the congratulations, the monitor also displayed information about the perks available to him. The master, surrounded by NPCs, was reviewing all the quests he had completed and the subclasses he had opened for it. Chu Tiange continued to study the boxes popping up one after another on the monitor. The master's current level had been raised as high as 10th, something even the master himself had not expected. The young master searched the monitor for information about this level increase and the rewards. From what he read, Chu Tiange learned that some bots, in addition to grades, gave him additional rewards, thus greatly increasing his experience. The master, while looking through his rewards and achievements, came across something quite interesting. Chu Tiange had learned that he could use teleportation to leave the village and travel to any city of Era afterward. The master, mentally reconsidering himself, wondered which city he would like to go to. The young master clicks on the Tang Country icon for information about the country. The monitor displayed a map of the country, consisting of seven kingdoms and further expansion. The master began to think how best to proceed since he knows nothing about these kingdoms. Chu Tianj decided to leave the game for a while and, cheerfully getting up from the cabin, headed towards the couch. On the way, the master recalled the events of immersing himself in the virtual world even before the official release of the game. He remembered that he had seen a fragment from the future which spoke about the great popularity of Era. Not knowing the answers to all his questions, the young master plumped down on the couch and waited for the butler and assistant to return. He knew that the butler and the assistant could not leave the game early and decided to check the news on the internet. On the laptop screen, popular news appeared and all of them were, of course, about Era. The young gentleman read the comments under the news posts and noticed that some people were trying to boycott the game. He thought about the fact that if a bunch of people are playing Era and a bunch more are condemning it, eventually the game will really take over the world. The young master's musings were interrupted by the butler and assistant entering the room. They were all standing at a display with a map of the country of Tang, and the butler advised the master to choose any kingdom. The master thought that it really didn't matter which county he chose. After all, he could create his own clan. Chu Tiange was the first to study the information on the map for the Chang kingdom. The next place was Luoyan County, which was home to high-level monsters. The master recalled another county that was the best place to depart. Suddenly, Zhou County came to Chu Tiange's mind, making the master think of all the counties at once. Chu Tiange was puzzled as he tried to figure out which county to go to in the end and what to choose. Assistant, L asked the master if he knew the capital of Tang Country. The master explains to the girl that the capitals of the countries are hidden in the game, and you have to find them on your own. The butler asks the young master what the young master ends up choosing. After a little thought, the master replies to the butler to choose the county with the biggest advantage at the beginning of the game. The young master also indicated that he would try to utilize as much of the early game as possible. The butler interrupts the master's speech with a report of some important news. Yin Li tells Chu Tianju about an invitation for him to attend a party from Zhao Shu that will be held tomorrow. 
The master immediately recalls the dark dealings between Zhao and Shichu's associations. The butler suddenly suggests that the young master accept the invitation and go to the party. Yin Li explains to the master that perhaps it has something to do with his parents' passing and he will be able to learn something interesting. The master, on his way to the cabin, tells the butler that he accepts Zhao Shu's invitation to the banquet and will be on time. Chu Tiange plunged through the game pod into Yumi Village straight to the bots. As he left, the master looked back and shouted to the NPC that he was leaving the village. Young master called up the system screen to change the current location. A blue glow suddenly appears and rises in a column upwards, taking the master with it. Chu Tiange abruptly grabs the teleporter and tosses it several times as it moves. The virtual citizens roam the streets of the city, some on foot and some on horseback, looking for quests. The wizard moved to the very center of the street, eliciting suspicious glances from passers-by. The game board displayed a congratulation to the wizard for being the first player to leave the village of the new settlement, plus a reward of 10,000 points. The information about the master was heard by the characters fighting on the third level. While fighting the crocodiles, they didn't understand how player Chu Tiange was able to reach level 10 so quickly and leave the newcomer village. A character from the fifth level was also pondering about the speed of a master completing levels. Some characters speculated that it was people from Korea who had infiltrated their game servers. The young master regarded the place he found himself in, particularly its virtual settlers, with interest. The master striding forward down the street was greeted by the game's system. Chu Tiange looked at the bots standing nearby and didn't understand why they weren't going to approach him. The master thought that he wouldn't like it here if he was treated the same way he was treated in Yumi Village. The young master heard someone running behind him trying to catch up with him. One of the NPCs caught up to the master and greeted him and expressed his joy at his arrival. The wizard decided that the bots weren't that unfriendly, it was just their way of standing out. A young geisha standing on the balcony of the entertainment quarter invited the master to visit their establishment. The young master was slightly embarrassed by the geisha's invitation and immediately politely declined, quickly stepping forward. Chu Tiange climbed onto the roof of the abandoned building and looked around the city, half of which he hadn't even explored yet. The master was approaching a tall, motley building, quickly realizing that it was the location of the mage clan. Chu Tiange stopped to survey the majesty of the entire task, deciding that he could now open up the mage subcategory profession. The master walked up the huge staircase leading to the statues denoting the mage clan. The mage elders sitting around the table were discussing the master not belonging to their clan. The black elder said that he too had expected to see a mage and a player from the new village who had arrived. The white elder replied that there was nothing to complain about since they had ended up losing the battle to Chu Tianju. The master approached closer and closer to the conversing people and heard that the conversation was about him. Chu Tianj noted with a smile on his face that he had in no way expected his story to spread this far. The elders noticed the master approaching them and recognized him as the same player Chu Tiange was. The young master bowed and politely greeted the mage elders. Chu Tiange informed them of his intention to register their subcategory. The elders in utter bewilderment only silently looked amongst themselves. The black elder stood up and as he approached the master said that he definitely had good taste. The elder noticed the master's pensive face and explained that mages do the most damage in battles and that was why he had good taste. The master only listened silently to the elders wordlessly talking about his excellent choice. Chu Tiange chose to remain silent about his cunning decision to make all classes their own categories. The elder displayed the basic mage knowledge book for the master to study. The young lord added his wish that he wanted to change his qualifications. The elder replied to him that he should complete the quest to change qualifications and provide them with a letter of recommendation. He also explained to the master that he couldn't give him the quest on his own, as he wasn't a natural mage and only a letter of recommendation would help him. The white elder behind him jumped up like a madman and started shouting something. It turned out that he had seen an endless number of letters of recommendation from the master and didn't understand where he got them all from. The young master, without saying anything, only remembered that he had received all these letters just by replenishing his balance. The master took out a bunch of letters of recommendation and began to list them to the elders. Chu Tiange read one of the letters about a battle mage and an invisible mage and decided that they were useless to him. The master began to further quickly go through his letters of recommendation. 
Chu Tianga came across a letter of a lightning mage and thought about the fact that their attacks were the most devastating at long range. Introducing a lightning mage, he thought that it would help fill the lack of attacks at these ranges. The master handed the last letter of recommendation to one of the mage elders. A congratulatory message appeared on the master's monitor congratulating him for joining the mage guild as a lightning mage. The master didn't fully understand. Was this really the choice of subcategory? The young master hurriedly visited the next healer's guild. The healer elder greeted Chu Tiange by placing a hand on his shoulder. The elder recognized the purpose of the master's visit and said that he definitely had good taste. The young master lightly chuckled and thought that he had heard this somewhere before. The elder continued to tell the master about the healers as the best of the best among the four subcategories. He also told the master about abilities such as the use of poison and the ability to heal. The elder asked the master that since he had chosen their subcategory, he knew how things worked around here. The young master pretended that he didn't know anything about the order of initiation and needed an explanation. Chu Tiange informed the healer elder that he also wanted to register a subcategory. The elder grinningly interrogated Master Chu about his decision. The elder was just beginning to tell the master how powerful the healers were when the master interrupted him. The master quickly handed the surprised elder a letter of recommendation. The master's letter spoke of the power of a healer equal to carrying a first aid kit. The following congratulations on registering the healer class appeared on the master's monitor. The master looked directly at the huge stone statue marking the territory of the warrior clan. The warrior elder was telling Chu Tianju about the indestructible power of warriors, and then all the actions were repeated similar to the previous guilds. On the green part of the grounds, there were effigies with arrows hitting them. The master arrived at the archer clan and listened to another fable about the fourth guild. The black elder of the mages was telling about how among the many subcategories, the master had decided to choose them. The mages, talking amongst themselves about the master's choice, concluded that he thought they were the best. The white elder of the mages offered to tell all the guilds about his new position. The black elder was about to leave, saying that he needed to send out invitations to the other guilds. The white mage only shouted at the black one about not revealing the reason for the invitation, so that it would be a surprise to everyone. The healer elder had received an invitation from the mage clan to their abode. The invitation reached the warrior elder, and he decided that it was the perfect occasion to tell about his new apprentice. The archery elder smirked as he read the invitation, imagining the look on the other clansmen's faces when he told them their big news. The master with a satisfied face, having received all four subcategories, was about to make a full upgrade. With a bright flame at the very center of the building stood a tall forge. The young master walked up to the building, stood on the elevator platform, and began to climb upwards. After reaching the entrance of the forge, the master went straight inside. Chu Tiange walked inside the forge and saw the blacksmiths there working in sweat. The master decided that being at level 10, he should immediately replace the existing armor with new armor. One of the blacksmiths asked the master what had brought him here. Without waiting for the master to answer, the blacksmith said that he needed new armor because of his arrival in the city, taking Chu Tiange by surprise. The blacksmith also commented on his current armor as a complete failure for his current location. For some reason, the young master thought that the blacksmith didn't quite understand what he needed. The blacksmith called the young lord after him to show him the armor available. Together, they entered a large room with many different armors. The master quickly looked around and realized that there was armor for all four subclasses here. The blacksmith told the young master that they did not have a suitable suit for his strength and power, but he could offer him warrior armor. The blacksmith stopped at one of the suits and began to describe its characteristics. With burning eyes, the blacksmith hoped that the master would agree to this armor right now. The master only smirked slightly, saying that the armor was weak for him, to say the least. The blacksmith decided to pull his trump cards out of his sleeve and show off the armor that hadn't even been tested yet. With a quick step, the blacksmith walked forward and called Chu Tiange after him. The blacksmith opened the protective chamber of the suit and invited the master to examine this magnificent armor. The equipment was a 10th level purple armor, a warrior king set. The master scrolled through the blacksmith's words about the 10th level purple armor in his mind. Chu Tiange annoyingly informed the blacksmith that the stats of this armor were low for him as well. The blacksmith didn't know what to offer the master anymore. After all, it was the best suit on the second floor of the forge.
He thought that they didn't have any higher ranked armor and that the master was just mocking him. Then the blacksmith asked the young master to show him the armor he thought was worthy. The master easily gave an example of his armor, the characteristics of which were far superior to their purple armor. Chu Tiange emphasized that his level one equipment had the same characteristics as theirs at level 10. The blacksmith looked at the divine armor made specifically for the ancient emperor class with astonishment. The master asked the blacksmith if they had anything cooler than his armor, to which he heard the answer, no. Suddenly, several blacksmiths piled around the master, telling him about the other armor. The young lord only calmly informed them that he didn't need any new equipment, which angered the blacksmith. The blacksmith, turning to shouting, began to ask Chu Tiange why he had visited their forge in the first place. The master, after waiting for a short pause, initiated the blacksmith into his plan for a complete upgrade. Puzzled, the blacksmith asked the master several times if he understood the meaning of his words correctly. After some thought, he quickly calculated in his mind how much it would cost. The blacksmith asked the craftsman if he was willing to pay a fortune, because it would be insanely expensive. He saw the master's carefree face and thought he was joking with him. The master did not give up and asked the blacksmith what he needed for a full upgrade. The blacksmith replied to Chu Tianju that he needed a blue rank armor to do so. The master, with a smile on his face, only laughed out loud at the blacksmith's words. The blacksmith gestured to all the available armor in the hall and noted how much materials it took. He informed the master that for a complete upgrade, one would need to have 90 sets of blue ranked armor. The blacksmith began to calculate in his mind how many blue rank materials would be needed to upgrade the young master's suit. After quickly calculating all the missing materials, he informed Chu Tianju. The blacksmith saw no urgent need to transform the existing outfit. He told the master that with this armor, he would be able to reach the 30th level and then improve it on his own. The master was not going to back down and said that he had the blue armor he needed for the transformation. The blacksmith, still not believing in the validity of the master, asked about the amount of available armor. The master, with a quick glance at the screen, happily announced that over a thousand materials were available. The blacksmith asked several times how he got so much blue armor. The young master told him about destroying several bosses and players and requested a full upgrade. The blacksmith wondered if he could accomplish such a cool upgrade. He tried to explain to Chu Tianju that it wasn't even about the material itself, but the cost for such a transformation. The master, taking his gaze away from his monitor, immediately clarified the cost of this work. Without waiting for an answer, Chu Tiange dropped a considerable pile of gold coins in front of the blacksmith. Watching the blacksmith's reaction, the master inquired if it would be enough. Without waiting for a reply, Chu Tiange quickly clicked on the coin icon a few more times. The blacksmith stared at the mountains of gold coins in front of him, at a loss for words. The young master kept dropping more and more gold coins. The companion stood around the huge pile of gold and Chu Tiange was certain that it should definitely be enough. Meanwhile, in the forge, work on various equipment and armor was in full swing. From the substitute workshop of the forge, blue liquid poured down the recesses in the floor. The liquid completely filled the main workshop on the second floor of the forge. The foreman and blacksmith watched the noisy launch of the building's main shop for the coming transformation. The main shop's cabin slowly opened and some sort of armor began to be seen inside. In the illumination of blue lightning, a super-powerful upgraded armor appeared. The master looked on in delight at the upgrade that had occurred, only adding that it was worth its money. The blacksmith didn't fully realize the situation yet and didn't know whether to be happy or not. The upgraded armor began to slowly disappear from the cabin of the main workshop. The armor gradually moved on its own onto the young master who was frozen in surprise. Chu Tianga stood menacingly in the completely upgraded and improved super powerful armor. The master was very pleased with how he looked in his new equipment. As he left, Chu Tiange thanked the mouth-opening blacksmith for a job well done. The master was firm in his decision to attend Zhao's event today to meet him face to face. Zhao Xu was holding a conference with reporters in the city, talking about associations and many other things there. The young master promised himself to avenge his parents and put the arrogant Zhao in his place. The butler informed the master of the arrival of the car for the trip to the banquet, and the assistant carried the suit prepared in advance for him. Elle happily announced that she had prepared a special suit for Master for such an occasion. Chu Tiange gave up on the flashy outfit and called the butler to follow him. 
The master and the butler followed to the car, while the assistant remained in charge in Chu's mansion. Almost reaching the car doors, the butler stops the master to report something else. Yin Li asks Chu Tiange if he is going to reveal his gaming name, thus giving himself away. The butler wants to know if he needs to prepare some definite answer in such a case. The young master, getting into the car, replies to Yin Li that he will handle everything himself. The new car independently turns on autopilot mode for a comfortable ride. Chu Tiange sits in the car seat and presses the start button. The chair turns into a mini capsule with a game helmet and control panel. The assistant, after waiting for the car to drive away from the mansion, pulls a cell phone out of her pocket. L quickly taps the keypad, typing in a message that reads gone and presses send. Being already in the game, the master pondered the butler's words about the game name. He paced with thoughts of not wanting to draw undue attention to himself. Chu Tiange knew that unlike other players, he had some sort of privileges in the era. The young master opened the monitor and read that he could use the disguise mode to hide his true identity. Chu Tiange knows that the mode has limitations and calls his first identity simply Yi. The process of transforming the young master's appearance to create a new personality is initiated. The master appears in a new hidden guise upon completion of the transformation. A vagrant sitting in the alley is surprised to see the scene. Chu Tiange, throwing him a couple of gold pieces, asks him to keep this little secret strictly between them. The tramp abruptly jumps up from his seat towards the master, scooping up his bowl of gold coins. The young master turns around at the noise and sees the tramp running at him. Chu Tiange shoutingly asks him what is even going on here. The vagrant, sticking his stick forward, utters the words, Heaven, King, Earth, Tiger. The young gentleman assumes he has stumbled upon some sort of hidden quest. Grinning, he remembers someone telling him that handsome men are always lucky for hidden quests. As a disgruntled hobo stands behind the wizard's back, he ponders the words he spoke. Turning to the vagrant, Chu Tiange replies as if with a question, Weather, tower, river, demon. The tramp immediately changes in face and shouts to the master that he has finally found him, and they will all be saved. He lists all of the master's actions from the beginning of his appearance in the alley to the secret words spoken and tells him that he fits the right description. The drifter calmly steps closer to the master and calls him a hero of this country. He puts his hands on the shoulders of the surprised Chu Tiange and informs him that the revival of the Song country is now in his hands. The master, slightly embarrassed, clarifies to the wanderer what reward awaits him for this hidden quest. The wanderer replies that he will be fully rewarded, but that no one will come to his aid. He continues his story, going into some details about the revival of the country. The young master, unable to understand the tramp's role in all this, asks him about it. The vagabond gives the master a talisman with a flower and tells him in detail what needs to be done. Chu Tiange still didn't understand anything, after all. Low-level characters can't fulfill the given requirements. The master doubted the right choice, but still reached for the talisman with the flower. Taking the talisman firmly in his hands, Chu Tiange once again muttered to himself what he must do. The young lord was left alone in the alleyway with his thoughts that the system was too much of a mess with the mysteriousness of the quest. Chu Tiange went forward thinking that this was another unimportant quest. The master transformed back into his usual appearance and was going to continue with the quests pertaining to his new subclasses. Half an hour later, aiming for the very same alley, some player flies across the sky. Arriving at his destination, the player doesn't understand why no one has greeted him with instructions. The player with an iron mask on his face decides to speak the secret code first. The character, still standing in the alley, says, Weather, tower, river, demon in a loud voice. After waiting a bit, the player is furious that even that didn't work and no one still never showed up. The virtual citizens walking around the town heard a screaming voice from an alley, weather, tower, river, demon. After a couple minutes of waiting, the player's repeated words from the alley echo through the city over and over again. Lightning mage training and healer training appear on the young wizard's screen. Sword master training and beast king training appear next, while the master is already preparing to strike the first blow at the monsters. Chu Tiange remembers that he must definitely finish all of these quest training to obtain his new skills. The master smashes an entire army of monsters with a single strike of his spear. He even resents that there are such weak opponents outside of this city. The young master thought about the fact that the game developers could have made them stronger. Chu Tiange was about to move on when he heard the butler's voice. 
The master was still wearing the game helmet and asked if they had already arrived or not yet. The young master and the butler walked through the parking lot and looked at the Zhao Manor, indulging in former memories. Chu Tiange noted that the event was going to be quite solemn and flashy. The butler suggested that this banquet was definitely something to do with the game. The master, looking at all this, as he himself said circus, guessed that Zhao Shu knew much more about the game than the others. Chu Tiange, fixing the collar on his sweater, was really hoping for a good evening. Approaching the gate at the main entrance, the master also recalled Zhao's dealings with the Sichu Association. Bringing the monologue in his head to its logical conclusion, Chu Tiange drew a conclusion for himself about Zhao Corporation. Some low-looking guy met the young master at the entrance of the event and asked if he was the young head of Sichu. The guy gestured towards the luxurious manor and said that Zhao Shu was already inside. Breaking out into a wide smile, he was clearly going to say something else. In a haughty voice, he informed the master that commoners like him were strictly forbidden to enter. With a cold-blooded tone, the master asked the short guy who he was. The guy with a feigned importance in his voice began to say that his father was an employee of Zhao's company. The master only replied that he was just another hound dog and that he belonged outside. Before he could let the guy reply, the young master gave him a resounding slap. The guy yelled at Chu Tiange, causing those around him to become interested in what was happening. Walking towards the unfolding mini-drama, Zhao Shu himself walked over to greet them. Holding a cigar in his hands, the manor master asked what had just happened here between the two of them. The young master struck up a conversation about the butler he knew well, the old times, and their associations. After the conversation ended, Chu Tiange walked inside the gate and turned around and asked him to teach his subordinate some manners. Zhao Shu, without letting the fellow explain himself, slapped him with another resounding slap. The manor master was angry at his subordinate for not being able to keep his mouth shut and embarrassing him. The people inside, noticing the master, were discussing amongst themselves about their Sichu Corporation. They continued to discuss the company's affairs and Chu Teague's family as if they were not paying attention to him. One of the people talking said that he had heard that Liu Fei herself from the Liu family would be attending the banquet. The banquet guests were curious to see Master's reaction to Liu Fei breaking off the previously planned wedding with him. One of the guests was still worried about the topic of their conversation. After all, Chu Tiange was also from a very powerful family. The butler wanted to intervene in the conversation, but the Master only asked him to ignore the gossip. The butler looked at the Master and decided to clarify whether he was going to ignore such talk about himself. Chu Tiange, smiling, knew for sure that he wasn't going to ignore anything, but more on that later. The young master menacingly announced that when the era reached the next level, they would all repay them in full. Chu Tiange commanded the butler to find out the gaming names of all the banquet guests discussing him. Among those present, the arrival of the last but not least banquet guest, Liu Fei, was announced. The master, upon hearing this name, cautiously turned around towards the mansion gate. Liu Fei pathosily entered the mansion grounds along with its master Zhao Shu. For a second, it seemed that the master became uneasy as the guests tried to consider his reaction to the girl's arrival. Without giving any sign or even turning around, Chu Tiange remembered that this was just another vile woman. Liu Fei immediately recognized Chu's longtime acquaintance in the crowd standing with his back to her. Zhao Shu, leaving the other guests, was heading straight towards the young master. The master of the manor scattered hypocritical apologies about the less-than-perfect hospitality, as he was very busy with other important matters. While the master quietly drank his hot tea, Zhao inquired if he had already heard of the era. Chu Tiange reminded Zhao, who already knew this without knowing it, that his parents had once been directly involved in the development of the game. The estate master took a drag on his cigar and proceeded to the main question of the evening. Zhao Shu asked the departing master if he played Era and heard the reply. Sometimes. The arrogant Zhao Shu was interested in the master's answer about the ambiguous sometimes. The manor master decided to clarify the young master's game name, and the young master replied with a short yi. Zhao Shu only thought that according to his data, there was no strong player with such a name in the game. The master of the manor smugly tells the young master in passing that the game has unlimited possibilities and he should definitely try them out. An announcement is heard over the manor about the beginning of the banquet and some important news, which will be announced by the master of the banquet.
Liu Fei begins to guess that the invitation to the party was not for a good time at all. Chu Tiange thought that the banquet guests at the manor are quite knowledgeable, and something special is being prepared. The manor master took a seat in front of the seated guests and began with the main topic of the event. Zhao Shu said into the microphone that the reason for this banquet was the release of the famous era. The estate master also spoke of it as a game that was rapidly gaining popularity in players. He, of course, did not miss the opportunity to mention the huge financial possibilities of era. The guests listened to Zhao's speech very attentively and gave him full support while applauding him. Some of the guests shouted endless praise for the master of the manor. Other guests were already ready to join Zhao Shu's ranks and learn from him. Zhao Shu announced with an intriguing look that he had an initial plan of action, and that was why he had gathered them all here today. Liu Fei admired the banquet master and mentally compared young master Chu and Zhao Shu. Chu Tiange listened attentively to the old buddy's speech without taking his eyes away. Zhao also talked about how the game had an incredible impact on the entire financial market of their country. He also added to the listening guests that they should unite to realize some amazing plan. Zhao Shu, taking a proud stand, said that they should invest in the game together to conquer the whole country. He explained that by conquering one country, they would control millions of players. At the end of telling his devious plan, the banquet host added that in the end, each of them would have countless amounts of money. The guests, enraptured by such a delightful idea, one by one began to shout their agreement. After a moment, almost all of the invited people loudly began to approve of such an elegant plan. Zhao listened to the numerous approvals from the guests of his plan from the stage and was very happy about it. The banquet host kept his eyes on the main guest of his party. He was sure that everything was going according to the plan, and the young master would also agree to participate. Zhao Shu was about to continue his rant, but he was suddenly interrupted by the master. The young master abruptly stood up from his seat, attracting the attention of the surrounding people. He was about to leave and said goodbye that he had a lot of things to do and regretted that he would not be able to participate in this event. Chu Tiange, along with his butler Yin Li, silently walked away. Zhao, of course, did not like this behavior of the master and tried to stop him somehow, but it was all in vain. The master of the banquet was not on a joke angry and said that it was all for commercial purposes. Zhao Shu added that the master should not recall the past grudges between their associations and think about the main purpose of the evening. Master was only running the thought in his head that in the end, the whole point of the plan was to lure out money. Chu Tiange was somehow confident that Zhao would easily, after accepting money from him, rally with others to oust him. The guests one by one went over to Zhao's side and told the master afterward about his foolish decision. Chu Tianju, looking at them all, was amused to remember how they had once relied very heavily on his Sichu Corporation. The master also remembered worrying about the former employees of the Sichu Association, but he quickly realized that it was for nothing. Under the taunts of the guests, Chu Tiange and his butler were moving away from the event in question. The young master suddenly stopped upon hearing a familiar voice. Liu Fei's own Liu Fei was moving directly towards the master, reprimanding him about his inability to appreciate the good fortune that he had just had. She was determined to change the master's mind and shouted at him that if he refused, he would dishonor his parents. Chu Tiange at the same second quickly stopped and froze in place. Master asked Liu Fei in a calm yet intimidating voice what she had just said. Chu Tiange quickly turned around to all the guests there, and they saw the rising anger on the young master's face. The master was looking straight into the eyes of the insolent girl, who was already visibly frightened and regretted everything she had said. Chu Tiange quickly gathered his thoughts and decided to tell everyone who else among them was actually a blind fool. He addressed the entire audience at once, asking them to look at themselves if they wanted to see a hopeless fool. The young master decided to make a mini-performance so that no one else would dare to harass him with these kinds of statements. Chu Tiange tells the listening guests about this ingenious investment plan. Turning to Zhao standing behind him, the master asked him how much he planned to invest himself. Before Zhao could answer anything, the master intercepted the conversation and continued to ask if he had three billion dollars. Zhao Shu quickly ruminated in his mind that even having a huge amount of money, he would not be able to discreetly invest even $3 billion into the game. 
The young master looked at Zhao's face full of doubt with a smile. Chu Tiange asked all the guests who among them would be able to put one billion dollars into the game. The banquet guests only silently looked amongst themselves in incomprehension after hearing such an amount. The master decided to take a lower bar and asked who could invest more than one hundred million dollars. The guests continued to silently glance at each other and only a few raised their hands up. At this moment, Chu Tiange told them that they would only be able to raise a few billion in the end. The young master told the guests that he now had three billion dollars plus fund accounts and asked them why he would get involved in this obscure matter. The guests, including Liu Fei, were visibly surprised by such a statement from the master. Master thought about the fact that none of them would be able to know how much money he had already invested in the game anyway. Chu Tiange, taking a fighting stance, decided to pull out a trump card from his sleeve. The young master showed the three billion dollar check he had brought here with him. In front of everyone, he tore up the check, explaining that none of them were truly ready to plan anything. The master, after finishing his victory speech, announced that he would not waste any more of his time on them and was now moving away. Zhao Shu, who certainly did not expect such a turn of events, was simply furious at the arrogant behavior of the master. The banquet master quickly took his place on the stage and told everyone that the master was not even taking the game seriously. He told the guests that the game will still show its true face and then Master Chu will crawl at his feet. Zhao Shu decides to tell about his, as he himself believes, brilliant investment plan. He talks about acquiring several large guilds and further developing skilled players. Finally, the banquet host adds that the main goal of the plan is to have the famous player Chu Tiange join them. Zhao reveals that by accepting such a strong player to join them, they will be at an advantage. Zhao also assures that with Chu Tiange, they will attract a huge number of players, further drawing the approval of the public. Liu Fei coquettishly recalls that player Chu Tiange had invested more than a hundred million dollars before the game was even released. Miss Fei would really like to know who this player Chu Tian's really is, but she is sure of one thing. He is definitely cooler than the arrogant young master Chu. On the campus of Ganjim University, there is a broadcast with a certain player. From the screen, the character is broadcasting about the possibilities of unlimited desires of all involved in the game. A guy sitting at a table, not taking his eyes off the screen of his phone, said that his only wish was for cute girls. A long-legged girl passed by the table, which immediately attracted the attention of the guy playing on his phone. The guy did not even notice how two people approached him and asked him something. From a familiar voice, the guy turned around and saw in front of him old buddies, whom he called Big and Third Brother. The guys, seeing the confused face of his buddy, continued to joke. The company of guys cheerfully greeted each other, getting ready to order. The guys ordered a relaxing drink each from the waiter. The guys sat down at a table together and began to reminisce about the last time they had seen each other. The Third Brother said that they hadn't seen each other since the Big Brother's family got into trouble. Frowning, the Third Brother asked the young master what had happened back then. The second brother also joined the conversation, agreeing with the third brother's question. The third brother told the master in all seriousness that he was willing to give his life for him if necessary. The young master was amused by this friendly atmosphere and offered to drink to their long-awaited meeting. Clinking their bottles, the boys drank their drinks while sitting at a table. The master decided to shift his attention and inquired how his named brothers were doing. Chu Tiange continued to make friendly banter with his second brother. Master shifted his gaze to the third brother and inquired about his affairs. The third brother took out a lighter from his pocket and told him about his small business. He also told the master that he was going to sell all his assets and make a good bet on Era. Suddenly, the second brother jumped up and began to rebuke the third brother for his obvious stupidity. The second brother continued his speech until the master interrupted him, asking if the third brother had any specific plan. The third brother talked about how hard it had become to maintain a real business now that people were buying virtual goods all around. He went on to talk about how people are willing to spend more and more of their money on virtual purchases. The third brother also suggested that virtual reality would soon be able to fully satisfy people's needs. He told it all quite convincingly, backing it up with real facts. Master thought about the fact that even though he wasn't a player, the third brother was good at it. The third brother talked about his long childhood dream and specified that with the help of Era, he would be able to realize it. 
Finally, he added that he wants to spend a few years on the game and start the business from scratch if he fails. The young gentleman liked the third brother's idea. Supporting him, he said that he would wait for the one in the land of dance in the city of Chang. The second brother stood up abruptly and said that he also supported him, though he didn't fully understand what was being said. He also said that he would wait for him in the land of song and help walk him through the game, as he definitely plays better than Big Brother. The third brother, grinning, replied that he would rather go to the land of dance to see Big Brother. The second brother, clearly puzzled, looked at his buddies. The third brother explained to him that Big Brother would be more reliable in all matters. The buddies laughed loudly and continued drinking their drinks. Two girls passed by the noisy company sitting at the table. The young gentleman, quietly sipping his drink, noticed one of the girls. The girl who passed by the company turned out to be his partner from the game Newbie. The master, after thinking a bit about where he might have seen her, remembered that he had once studied together with her in high school. Chu Tiange was surprised that after so many years they had met right here and now. The young master immediately remembered his partner from the game and compared her to his high school buddy. Lindsay Yu, newbie's real name, didn't notice a single free table and suggested that her neighbor leave. At the same time, a tall guy in a business suit entered the establishment. Lindsay Yu's neighbor, making a surprised face, recognized this guy as young Master Lee and quickly said something about coincidence. Master Lee, keeping his eyes on Lindsay Yu, played along with the coincidence and added that coincidences were not coincidental. As if nothing had happened, Master Lee asked the girls if they had the same goal in this establishment. After looking around, he happily invited the girls to join him at a vacant table. Lindsay Yu did not like the offer, and justifying her departure with business, she headed towards the exit. The neighbor was not going to give up so easily and tried to stop her fiery friend. Coming very close to Lindsay Yu, she reminded her of her money problems and Master Lee's unlimited power. Lindsay Yu was clearly upset by her neighbor's venality. The neighbor didn't miss the opportunity to remind her pal about possibly closing her credit account in an instant. She also hinted that young Master Lee was clearly interested in Lindsay Yu. Not lagging behind, the neighbor started talking about the various loan funds and the consequences of her borrowing. Finally getting angry, Lindsay Yu quickened her step, informing her that she didn't need anyone's help. Chu Tiange observed the picture of Lindsay Yu, who clearly wanted to leave, trying to stop Master Lee. The young master did not like what was happening between these guys right now at all. The second brother also recognized the girl as a school friend and noticed Master Lee's obvious molestation. Getting up from the table, the second and third brother decided to take a closer look at the unfolding drama. Young master quickly commanded them to go back to their seats and pretend that they hadn't noticed anything. Chu Tiange asked his buddies to ignore the scuffle and look at him. Master Lee continued to pester Lin with his excessive persistence. Turning to shouting, young Master Lee informed Lin of his serious intentions. Lin only turned away from him and quickly said that she already had a boyfriend. Master Lee was clearly unprepared for such a response and was even confused for a couple of minutes. He silently, but with a clear reproach, stared at neighbor Lin as if demanding an explanation. The neighbor picked up the conversation and began to ask Lin what she was talking about, because she would know if she actually had a boyfriend. Master Lee strongly approached the poor girl with a rebuke for her obvious deception. Young Master Chu stepped in, quickly approaching the talking trio. Placing his hand on Lin's shoulder, he inquired why she had never told him about her classmates. Lin Ziyu also recognized the young master as a school friend and didn't understand what he was doing here. She quickly got into character and started telling Master Chu that he should have contacted her a long time ago, to which he replied something about a dead phone. Lin gestured to her roommate, Xu Rong, introducing her to her newfound boyfriend. She also introduced young Master Li and Chu Tiange greeted everyone politely. Master Li realized how awkward the situation was and decided to leave before any problems started to appear. Chu Tiange was not going to let Master Li go so easily and grabbed him by his jacket and suggested that he stay for a drink with them. Master Li, at a loss, began to talk about an urgent set of plans and that he should leave immediately. Chu Tiange, still clutching Master Li's hand tightly, suggested that they meet privately sometime next time. Young Master finally let go of Master Li, and Lin told her neighbor to take care of her dear master. Young Master Li was furious at being treated so carelessly and insultingly, but he didn't dare to say anything. 
As he moved away from the standing Lin and Chu Tiange, Shui Rong's neighbor quickly moved after him. One of young Master Chu's buddies remarked on his brilliant work. Looking at Chu and Lin standing together, the other brother asked them when they had managed to become so close so quickly. Chu Tiange and Lin Ziyu only silently glanced at each other, not knowing what to say to that. The young master suggested that Lin sit together with them, reasoning that it was a long time apart. In the dark alleyway around the corner of the bar, Master Li was threatening his neighbor Xue Rong. Xue Rong tried to justify herself to young Master Li by saying that she had never heard of Lin's boyfriend. Master Li immediately flared up, after all, he had spent a lot of money on her to help set him up with Lin. The neighbor couldn't think of anything better to suggest that her boyfriend wasn't her boyfriend at all. Young Master Li seemed to be cheered up by this thought and thought about something. At the table, the three friends and their new companion were sitting at the table and were discussing something heatedly as they devoured their dinner. Lin Zeyu started a conversation about a classmate who used to be a gaming expert. The other brother confirmed Lin's words, but didn't hope that Big Brother could be a good player as well. During the conversation, Lin also mentioned luck, which was undoubtedly something one couldn't do without. She immediately recalled player Chu Tiange and his incomparable help to her for nothing. Second brother said that he had nothing against luck, but far more important was the player's abilities and skills. He loudly boasted that he already had as many as five blue gear in the game. The guys sitting at the neighboring table who heard the second brother's speech were surprised to have so many blue equipment. The second brother, with his arms folded across his chest, was undoubtedly proud and pleased with himself. Lin immediately recalled when Chu Tiange had suggested that she transform her costume and she had changed more than ten blue gear in a row. The girl laughed at the situation she found herself in, and she tried her best to hold back. The young master, for his part, was thinking about how even having a set of divine equipment was quietly keeping it quiet. The second brother, having finished bragging, turned his attention to the strangely behaving master and Lin. Lin remembered with interest that she hadn't recognized the master's game name and wanted to fix it quickly. The young master did not want to reveal the cards, and said that it was a secret, thus upsetting the curious girl a little. In the most unexpected moment, Lin somehow thought of the player Chu Tiange. The master looked perplexedly at Lin, who was desperately trying to put something out of her mind. The girl stood up from the table, thanking him for his help and company, saying that she should be heading home already. Lin waved goodbye to her savior. The second brother was about to speak obscenities towards the departing girl, but the young master immediately stopped him. Chu Tiange once again focused on the main topic of the evening and continued their conversation. The master asked the third brother to choose the Tang country and meet in Chang City. The young master also suggested that the second brother continue his game in the Land of Songs. Chu Tiange offered to give second brother, after leaving the novice village, some money. Second brother hesitated and replied to big brother that he wouldn't be able to do that. The young master didn't let the second brother finish speaking, saying that it wasn't over yet. Chu Tiange explained to him that he would not just give him money for nothing, but thus investing in him. Second brother hesitated a bit, but still agreed to his old buddy's proposal. He optimistically told the big brother that he would not waste his money. A group of strangers approached the table of the seated trio with quick steps. The guys sitting next to them recognized the strangers as unpleasant types from the neighborhood. Young Master Lee watched the named brothers from around the corner, waiting for something interesting to happen. The second brother noticed one of the strangers grabbing a bottle and was already aiming at them. The young lord turned around silently to see what the second brother was talking about. The gang of strangers, seeing who was in front of them, turned slightly pale and stopped. The master stood up from the table and slowly began to approach the gang with a menacing look. The strangers quickly recalled their former scuffle from which they had emerged victorious. The group of strangers were visibly frightened and were about to go on the run the master decided to ask them if they had come for revenge. The chief of the gang immediately began to assure Chu Tiange that they were not even thinking about it. The master, spreading a smile, asked why they had grabbed the bottles in the first place. The strangers quickly began to devour the contents of the bottles, and their leader replied that they had simply come to apologize for the past. Hiding around the corner, young master Lee didn't understand why his plan was falling apart before his eyes, and instead of a fight, he saw them all together, drinking merrily. The company of strangers, having gotten quite drunk, asked the young master if they could leave already. 
Chu Tiangge did not even intend to stop them, and the gang immediately started running away. Second brother didn't understand why Master didn't even recognize who had sent them to do such a despicable thing. The third brother commented on the situation that it was in Big Brother's good style. The young master told his friends that he had already taken care of the gift to the one who had arranged all this and was not going to let it go, because everyone must answer for their despicable deeds. Young Master Lee angrily slammed his fist on the brick wall of the alley. He was sitting in the alley, kneeling on one knee, having already received young master's gift. The young master was furious at being punished by those he himself had sent, even though he had a big name. Leaning against the wall, he called a certain brother wolf with trembling fingers. On the other end of the wire, someone was clarifying the details of such a late call. The young master reported what had happened and asked for his help at some cost to him and his men. Young Master Chu, unsuspecting of anything, was calmly crossing the road. Master Li, who had called, was told that reinforcements would be arriving soon and would take care of everything. The master stopped in the middle of the road, noticing the formidable guys with weapons standing there. Opposite Chu Tiange stood the scarred bouncer, and hiding behind his shoulder, the cowardly Li, pointing at the master as his assailant. The bouncer, assuming a menacing appearance, began the conversation with threats and insults. The young master said that he was not afraid of any small hooligans and knew only a tiger from the street. The bouncer smiled and asked which tiger he was talking about. After a couple of seconds, he got the full meaning of what was said and got angry that he was called some small hooligan, as if he was a small teenager. Young Master Lee intervened in the conversation with a detailed explanation of who was in front of him now. The master wasn't afraid of any threats and continued to taunt the wolf brother. Master Lee, not knowing the whole truth, hoped for a swift reprisal against Master Chu. Brother Wolf, taking his bat, began shouting at Chu Tianzhu that he would regret everything he had just said. The bouncer, unable to take a single step, froze in place, blinded by the headlights of the approaching van. The van, accompanied by several other cars, stopped at the curb. At that moment, the bouncer recognized Lord Tiger's car, which he already knew well. The bouncer's gang, along with Master Lee, was surrounded by formidable guards. From the car, none other than Lord Tiger himself stepped out of the car, leisurely, with a serious look. Lord Tiger approached the standing master, noticing the frightened faces of the hooligans. The bouncer immediately changed his face and asked in a squeaky voice what brought the majestic lord here. The Tiger Lord bowed politely to the young lord and asked him something quietly. Everyone standing nearby and observing this picture was very much surprised. The master, with a cheerful smile, presented to his detractors the very tiger he had mentioned earlier. The bouncer finally realized which tiger was in question, and what a high position young Master Chu had, since he was worshipped and obeyed by the lord himself. Lord Tiger asked the young master what these people wanted from him. Master Lee quickly realized the situation he was in and shouted about his immunity, and that he would definitely be sought after. Unable to bear it, the bouncer himself slapped the talkative Lee with a ringing slap. As he walked away, the young master said that they could do whatever they wanted to them, as long as they did not appear in the city again. Brother Wolf fell to his knees and begged for forgiveness and mercy. Realizing that no one would help him here, he began to cry out for rescue to the young master. Chu Tiange, without turning around, quickly disappeared behind the door of his van. The butler addressed the tiger that he would accompany the master and leave everything here to him. Lord Tiger, calling the butler a magnanimous man, only thanked him for all the past. The whole company of ill-wishers wept and begged for mercy from everyone they could. The car started and moved off, leaving their men to deal with the scoundrels. Brother Wolf and the rest of the offenders were still looking hopefully at the departing cars. The gang of miscreants, looking at Master Chu's formidable friends, clearly understood what awaited them now. On the master's game screen, the quests they had completed, one by one, were being displayed. Chu Tiange was walking through the city and wanted to find something else to do. The master went to the forum where they were discussing old Omar, the player who had warned him about the ambush in Hulu Valley. The further action of the game unfolds in the village of Yumi, which is where the young master headed. The new recruit Hen Wu, who was in the village, menacingly called out a player named old Omar. Together with his thugs, he approached him and began shouting at him for daring to reveal their guild's plans. Old Omar, visibly frightened, began to talk about how in the end, Chu Tiange didn't listen to him and entered the valley anyway. 
Hen Wu, with growing anger, replied to the one that this was exactly what the matter was about. He pointed out to the player that he had made a big mistake, because because the master had entered the valley, they were ridiculed by the entire era. Heng Wu was still in no way relenting, and shouted to old Omar of swift reprisal and cruel vengeance. He warned Omar that he would be followed and harassed until he finally left the game for good. Hen Wu laughed loudly and said that even if he warned Chu Tiange, it wouldn't help him in any way, and no one would come to save him. He warned player Omar that he would set him as an example to the others to avoid this kind of thing in the future. The old Omar decided that he was doomed, because it was unlikely that the master himself would remember him, and even if he did, he would not be able to enter the village and help him in any way. Suddenly, an active teleport platform appeared not far from Omar. The NPCs quickly rushed towards the teleporter, for they already knew who had arrived. Old Omar, watching what was happening, thought that such a scene seemed familiar to him. At the main gate of Yumi Village, none other than Master Chu himself appeared. The obsessive bots hung onto the master out of habit, shouting out how much they missed him. The master paid no attention to the NPCs, after all. He had come here for an entirely different purpose. Chu Tiange, noticing old Omar, gestured for him to come over. Old Omar did not expect such a turn of events and was overjoyed. Master Chu Tianj walked towards his old friend for the upcoming conversation. He asked Omar if it was true what was written on the forum and the Blasphemer's Guild had come to get even with him. Old Omar only cried and said that it was not necessary to come back here for him. The young master put his hand on his shoulder and assured him that he had nothing more to worry about. Chu Tiange explained to his old friend that it was no trouble for him and that it was his duty of honor. Old Omar said that he was not worth such sacrifices and was not suffering here at all. Clenching his fists tightly, he promised the master that he would be loyal only to him in the future. The young master asked old Omar to list all the guild members who had offended him. Master Chu's old buddy didn't understand why he needed this information, and more importantly, what he was going to do with it. The master, without saying a word, went to the village and called everyone to follow him. The virtual villagers, having noticed the master, began to argue about how he managed to return to the village of newcomers. Rookie Hen heard about this news and was a little surprised. Hen Wu was sure that Chu's return would not last long and he would not linger here for some old lobster. At the house of the village head, Yu Mi, many people were gathered around the table, including the young master and his buddy. He was explaining to the head the current situation with his buddy and his inability to leave the newcomer village quietly. Village head Yu Mi was clearly angered by what he had just heard. Chu Tiange asked the head if he could issue any quest to the guild members. The head replied to him that issuing quests was not a problem, but he had no reward for them. The young master, after thinking for a bit, offered to reward them with gold coins. Chu Tiange offered 100,000 gold coins for each name on his list as a reward. Village head Yu Mi began to quickly click on the screen and do something. While Old Lobster was admiring what was happening, the master shouted and drew his attention to himself. Chu Tiange asked him to make a roll call list of the bullies and go directly to the head for help in the future. The head of the village addressed the master that there was a need to give at least some name to the quest. Chu Tiange briefly thought about what would be a suitable name for such a quest. With childish joy, he informed everyone of the name for the quest, Dog Extermination. Some players had already heard about the master's return to the village and were speculating about what might happen to them. They decided that even if Chu Tiange decided to get even with them, they would be in a safe zone to continue watching Old Lobster. One of the players talking heard someone's footsteps right behind them. The other players were talking amongst themselves about how they had found the ones it was time to say goodbye to. They rushed towards the conversing players with shouts and weapons with fury. Right at the main gate of the village, sparks and lightning flew from the heavy blows. The players who had defeated some of the members of the Blasphemer Guild were moving away. The new recruit learned of what had happened and became furious, not believing that someone dared to go against their powerful guild. While Hen was talking to himself about revenge, he heard the sound of arrows flying straight at him. Another player had completed the quest, Destroying Dogs, and was rewarded with 300 gold as promised. Once on the revival field, one of his guild members headed towards Hen Wu. There was definitely no way they could allow anyone who wished to do this to them so easily. In Chung City, while at the 12th level, the master attacked the Beast District. 
he easily massacred the lowly swamp puppets one by one. The master knew that he didn't need quests to level up and could train on his own. Chu Tiange noted the high attack and defense of the swamp puppets and would not wish an ordinary player to be here. A whole horde of embittered enemies flew at once at Master Chu in a single leap. Chu Tiange, with his usual agility, zigzagged lightning fast to attack all the monsters. A notification from the system about a hanging friend request came to the master's screen. Chu Tiange looked at the monitor in bewilderment and tried to understand how this was possible, since he had restricted the ability to add himself as a friend. Back at the beginning of the game, Chu Tiange had completely blocked all incoming friend requests. The master saw a notification that his second player, Yi, was being added as a friend by a certain Ching Ching. Chu Tiange accepted the incoming request and saw a message on the screen that it was Liu Fei himself. The young master opened a correspondence with a very unpleasant person with a jubilant face. There was a correspondence between longtime acquaintances about the master's level. The master found it funny considering the fact that Liu Fei didn't know who she was actually corresponding with. She wasn't going to get behind him and was trying to find out what equipment was available to him. Master saw another incoming request from a player with the silly name, Money Makes You Stylish. The player with the tacky name turned out to be Zhao Shu, who was still trying to sway him to his side. The master didn't understand why he didn't want to get away from him. After all, he had made his stance on his foolish plan clear. After messaging with the annoying Zhao for a bit longer, Master decided to call it a day. Chu Tiange displayed the list of available functions on the screen and quickly clicked on the block icon. The young master walked through the forest, pondering about the game, its meaning, and the intrusive enemies. Chu Tiange stopped abruptly when he saw not a player or a bot nearby. The master opened the system to search for information about the stranger, who turned out to be a bot. Chu Tiange was going to ask the NPC called Secret Merchant if he had any good items for sale. Leaving a trail of fire around him, he rushed closer to the unfamiliar bot. Getting as close as possible, the master stopped to greet it. The secret merchant, with a huge bag over his shoulders, told the young master that he was lucky because he had met him now. The NPC invited Chu Tianju to take a look at his goods, pointing out the obvious benefit in buying from him. The secret merchant also said that one could only look at the goods after paying a certain fee. Master Chu inquired about the cost of looking at all the available goods at once. The secret merchant named the price for reviewing different goods, and the master quickly handed him a sack of gold. The NPC, seeing the sack with a hundred gold coins, contentedly allowed him to look at all the available goods. The secret merchant was sure that the player in front of him wouldn't be able to afford to buy from him and rejoiced at the loot. The NPC opened a list of all his goods on the screen and told the master that it was unfortunate that not everyone had the ability to purchase them. Various items from swords to gems with varying values appeared on the screen. After looking at these items, the master flicked onward to the appraisal scroll and disc. The secret merchant, while leafing through his goods, was simultaneously praising them to the examining master. Suddenly, the young master stopped at one of the goods, unable to believe his eyes. A mythical egg worth two million gold coins appeared on the screen. The master excitedly shouted out the low price of such an important item, much to the merchant's surprise. Chu Tiange, after looking at all the available goods, informed the merchant that he wanted to buy from him. The secret merchant was worried because he had underpriced many goods without even expecting that the master would be able to buy anything. The master began to select items one by one on the screen, quickly paying for them. Chu Tiange did not miss the opportunity to remind the bot of the underpriced goods. The young master continued to buy up all the remaining goods at his fast pace. After a while, the mysterious merchant looked sadly at his emptied shelves. Chu Tiange, without thinking for long, sent the secret merchant to the revival field. In a dimly lit hall, some very serious people were gathered around a large table. One of the people sitting at the table was Zhang Ze, who was hoping for the help of sponsors. Zhang Zi stood up from the table and headed towards the gaming chair to demonstrate his capabilities to the sponsors. As he sat down in the chair, he told the guests that he hoped for their understanding and interaction. Zhang Zi put on the gaming nano goggles and began to immerse himself in virtual reality. The leader of the Blasphemers Guild, sitting on a cliff, was having a conversation with his subordinates. He informed the team that they now had a topaz gemstone. 
The leader appraised the gem and was able to insert his weapon to increase damage by 1%. The screen broadcast the guild leader's speech where he spoke about the power and value of the gems. The new recruit noticed that the number of their viewers had increased to huge numbers and reported it to the leader. One of the players watching the broadcast got the idea of finding the gems. The new recruit, surprised at what he saw, tells the main that the viewers had grown to over a million. The guild leader was clearly pleased with himself and the attention he attracted. The guild leader also said that there would be no stone above level 3 anywhere in the near future. The characters watching the broadcast were surprised by this statement. The leader tried to explain his vision to the listening players. He told them that the ratio of gems was 5 to 1, which would require a lot of components. The leader, based on past experience in games, also talked about how it was simply not profitable for Era to have a gem above level 4. On the live stream, the guild leader stated that if this happened, he would slap his own face in front of everyone. At the same time, the system alerted that the richest player, Chu Tiange, had just obtained a level 5 stone. The three gems that young Master Chu possessed appeared on the monitor. The guild leader was still recovering from the shocking news. And at this time, on the other side of the screen, he was being loudly reminded of his promise. The sponsors invited by Zhang Ze, seeing what was happening in the game, left the room and denied the possibility of cooperating with them. There was only one secretary left in the meeting room, watching the boss immersed in the game. She was trying to shout to Zhang Ze that the sponsors had already left with a refusal. The guild leader was at a complete loss and didn't fully understand what had just happened. He quickly displayed the system alert once more on the screen and scrutinized it carefully. Three level five gems appeared on the monitor again. The guild leader had to admit his mistake regarding the gems. He was about to leave the live broadcast when he heard the shouts of those watching his broadcast. The guild leader had no choice but to fulfill his promise and slapped himself soundly on the cheek, leaving a red mark. A white van carrying the master was rushing down the road at high speed. The butler quickly turned to the young master and told him the important news. Yin Li told Chu Tianju that they had someone hanging on their tail for a very long time. The young master had expected such a turn of events and was not surprised at all. Looking out the window, he silently pondered over who could be supporting the Zhao family and how they were related to his parents. Master also assumed that all of this was somehow related to those 30 billion from Zhao's association. Late at night, after the banquet ended, Something was happening in the Zhao Manor. Zhao Shu silently listened to something and only thought about what move to make next. On the screen, one could see someone's dark figure informing the people listening to him that they were no longer cooperating with them. One of the people there loudly announced that they would take all the necessary steps to carry out the plan. Thus, he added that he would go to any lengths even if he had to sacrifice someone. After finishing his formidable speech, the man looked directly at the frightened Zhao Shu. The unknown man from the screen also added that player Chu Tiange was extremely important to them. The rest of the people present in the hall didn't understand why they needed this guy for, considering their powerful position and huge fortune. The frightened Zhao Shu also didn't understand why they were willing to risk everything and everyone for some guy Chu. Everyone sitting at the table looked at Zhao with disdain and blamed him for their shameful failure. Zhao Shu was terribly angry at Master Chu. After all, he had caused him to embarrass himself in front of the entire family. One of Zhao Shu's family members asked the man on the screen if this Chu was so important to them. The on-screen man was angered by such a brazen question because he had already told them everything. He also added that everything was closely related to each other, including the young master and ERU. Zhao Shu was still trying to figure out what secrets this young master was hiding in bewilderment. The stranger from the screen added that they didn't need to go into details and just follow the orders they received. He also mentioned what role they play in building their corporation and what they owe them. Finally, the stranger ordered that the player Chu Tiange be found and caught. The entire Zhao Shu family obediently agreed and bowed to the secret man. All of the people in the hall were expecting to completely cut off communication with the stranger. The head of the Xu family, after finishing his conversation with the superior boss, caught everyone's attention. He shouted and pounced at the others with the order they had all just received. Zhang Shu, after coming to his senses, finally rejoiced at the opportunity to get even with Chu Tiange. With a menacing look, the head of the family commanded everyone to immediately spring into action. 
The white master vans continued to drive down the road between the other vehicles. Chu Tiange asked the butler if all the necessary preparations had been completed. Hearing an affirmative answer, the master commanded for the show to begin. He was determined and wanted to see what his opponents could do. The butler started the system inside the van to execute the plan he had in mind. Through the intercom, Yin Li ordered someone to begin the operation. The two vans that were traveling behind each other suddenly merged into one vehicle. Those who were following the young master clearly did not expect this and were extremely surprised. The vans that had merged into one quickly rushed forward on the highway. The master leaned back contentedly in his seat, enjoying his plan. The vans, rushing at breakneck speed, in a moment disconnected and drove off in different directions. One of the guys following the master from the other car commanded into his earpiece to proceed. At the same time, somewhere nearby, a sports race was starting. A long-haired girl with a black and yellow flag in her hand was preparing to announce the start of the race. The Zhao family was once again gathered at the conference table after a short break. Bowing their heads, they languidly waited for a response from their subordinate people. Finally, one of the family members' cell phone rang. The head of the family immediately rushed towards the phone, announcing the call of their men. He lightly clicks the answer button with his hand and immediately asks about their plan. The guy desperately informs his boss of their capture by the city's police patrol. The head of the family demands to hear only one thing from his subordinate, a successful operation. To their misfortune, the guy tells them why they were detained and about the failure of the plan. The head of the family realized with annoyance that they had lost their secrecy and there would be certain consequences for such a failure. He remembered the existence of the formerly great Hazen clan, famous for its power and influence over the entire city. After the Hazen clan failed to fulfill the plan given to them by the same secret boss, no one had ever heard of them again. The young lord's two vans were rushing along the highway towards the mansion. The butler informed Chu Tianju that he had received information about the assassination attempted assassins. He also clarified that there was nothing interesting found on them, and they had introduced themselves to the police as just ordinary racers, and since there was a race going on nearby, they believed him. The master thought for a while and realized that they could not take them so easily and they needed more information about these people. He pondered that this was too brazen an act and that in the future he should be more careful of his rival's sixes. The butler tried his best to keep the young master out of trouble, advising him to stay away from any trouble. Chu Tiange only cheerfully replied that everything was fine, and this did not please Yin Lai at all, as he was worried for his life. The butler still insisted that they shouldn't get involved in something like this, as they might not be able to get away so easily next time. Master, knowing Yin Li's attitude, still asked him if he would protect him if necessary. The butler, without saying a word, only nodded approvingly in response. The master knew that the butler only seemed so harmless and kind, and recalled a moment from his childhood. About twelve years ago, he and his father had watched Yin Li take down a dozen gangsters on his own. Little Master Chu was carefully watching the scene taking place. His father was telling Little Master to memorize the unrivaled strength of his uncle, who was a martial arts master. Chu Tiange remembered the promise he had made to his father about his uncle that night, to keep it all a secret. Without wanting to, the young lord revived images of his parents leaving him in his mind. He realized that the Shu clan had something to do with his parents' departure, but he didn't have enough evidence against them. Clenching his fists tightly, he promised himself to get to the truth, no matter what it was. Chu Tiange knew that Era was involved in all of this, and his main mission in the game was to find the truth. The master sincerely believed that he was close to the clue and would definitely find out everything. The actions of the game are transferred to the city of Chang to the Tessellation Guild, which is engaged in the processing of expensive materials. Three elders of the guild, gathered together, are arguing loudly about something. One of them declares that his unit is the best in their guild. The second, however, replies to him that their work is not that great and unique. The third, supporting the first, speaks of the complexity and importance of their work. All three continue to argue with each other, trying to figure out who is the best. The master went straight for the voices and got to the most interesting part of the conversation. Not wanting to be a party to the squabble, he informs them that he will return when they are done. The elders immediately recognize Chu Tiange and shout for him to stop. They immediately head in his direction, saying that he has appeared more timely than ever. A bright fire lights up in the eyes of the elders, which slightly frightens the young master. 
He tries to get out of the situation and wonders if there is anything he can do to help them. One of the elders asks the wizard if he has really gotten three level five gems at once. He proudly states that they will personally help set all the gems for free. The master doesn't understand why the elders personally want to do this for him for free. The elder explains that this is a good opportunity for them to further declare themselves the best of the guild. One of them wonders what will happen in case they do the job equally well. The master understands the intentions of one of the older ones regarding the purpose of the stone, which is dwindling on his jewel. The young master merrily thinks about how all his luck is in his beauty. The elders take the stones from the master and discuss their purpose for each item. One of the elders remarks the fact that all the stones are divine. All three, bent over the stones, think of one thing. They cannot do without each other's knowledge. The first elder gets to work and swings his sledgehammer over a stone. Something like a flash of fire occurs, which has a blinding effect. The master, gritting his teeth, wishes the work would be done a little more gently, but says nothing. The first elder continues to hit the gemstone with the sledgehammer. Another flash of fire occurs, rising in a tall column to the top. The young master displays on the screen that the critical damage has been increased by as much as 7%. The master, looking at the screen, already knows that this value usually reaches a maximum of five. The second elder, taking his sledgehammer, is already ready to get to work. He embeds the gem in the right place and swings it. With burning eyes, the elder delivers a powerful blow to the table with the gem. Bright purple electric lightning with rings appear above the table. The master checks the information again already on the second stone, where the luck increases by 7% as well. Chu Tiange is again surprised that instead of 5%, his luck has increased by 7%. The second elder proposes to declare his work the best among all. The third elder definitely doesn't agree with the second elder's decision. He says that it is too early to judge the final winner among them as he hasn't even started yet. The third elder sort of hints that he will do a much better job. The second elder assures him of defeat as the stone delivered to him is of the lowest value. The master begins to worry that he may refuse to work the third and final stone. The third elder is not going to give up so easily and and takes the stone away from Chu Tiange. The first elder mockingly expects him to fail and is willing to watch it. The third elder slowly unclenches his palm and looks at the stone. In his hand is a gemstone that shimmered brightly in the light. The second elder recognizes the jewel as a rainbow stone in complete surprise. The first elder is obviously against the treatment of the gem and loudly tells everyone so. The elders get into an argument among themselves, as this stone can only be used at the sixth level. The master notices that the third elder is not going to give up, which is to his advantage. The third elder swings his sledgehammer and delivers several powerful blows at once. Electric streaks of lightning rise high up with a trail of fire. The master quickly checks to see how much the critical damage has increased this time. The third elder raises the damage by as much as 8% with his work. The master, noticing the frowning faces of the other elders, asked them what was wrong. Those, unwilling to give any coherent explanations, only called them crazy and strode away. Chu Tiange, looking at his magnificently renewed spear, decides that the winner is himself. Next up, Master Chu is about to visit the appraisal guild. One of the elders of the appraisal guild is telling the other appraisers something about luck. He talks about the appraisers who have lived in the Dragon Vein territory since ancient times and their superiority. Another appraiser disagrees with the elder's reasoning and says that their guild is just as good. The young master goes inside the guild and finds himself in the middle of the appraiser's conversation. From the conversation, he realizes that the elders from this guild are trying to exalt their advantage over each other. Having been in a similar situation in the past, he realizes that this is only to his advantage. An elder of the appraisal guild declares that he would show what he is capable of if they had a worthy treasure by their side. The young lord decides to intervene in their conversation and says that he has some rather good equipment for them. The appraisers involved in the conversation immediately turn on the master. The elder, not yet knowing what the master is talking about, replies to him that he doesn't have any equipment worthy of his appraisal. Master Chu, remaining completely calm, silently opens the screen. The elder curiously froze in anticipation of player Chu's equipment. The young master selects the right section on the monitor and slowly pulls something out from there. In the white electric discharge light, a powerful handle appears. Next, Chu Tiange takes out his fully equipped spear with a single tug. He announces to the elder that he has a heaven-quality artifact and an enhanced scroll. 
The appraisers watching everything say that this is a great opportunity for the elder to show off all his skills. The elder still doesn't understand what's going on and takes the scroll held out to him. He thinks about the fact that the evaluation of an attribute really depends a lot on chance. Turning around, the elder leads everyone in a demonstration of his skill. He pulls out a few other scrolls from his sleeve to begin the evaluation. Thinking of something, the elder hopes to prove his superiority to everyone present as he still claims to be the capital's appraiser. With the power of the magnetic field, he opens the scrolls, drawing them into a single circle. Stepping onto the platform with the spear in the center, the elder gets to work. He directed all his power coming out of his hands to the attribute standing next to it. The power of the electric arrow assessment was mirrored onto all the scrolls. All the appraisers and masters standing behind the elder's back watched with interest. Since the elder possessed supreme power by right of descent, he decided to be a little devious. Raising his hands again, he used the high-level rule. Around the spear standing in the center, lightning and flashes flew in different directions. The young lord was happily watching the work of the elder and his attribute. Suddenly there was a tremendous explosion of the magnetic field. In the center of the platform stood, appraised by the elder, a spear surrounded by fire. The system displayed a congratulations to player Chu Tiange for successfully appraising the weapon identified as a golden attribute. The young master was a bit shocked by the information provided about the attribute. The name Raging Dragon Spear was displayed on the screen with information about its mighty power. The other players, while completing quests to level up, also heard the system's announcement. They didn't understand how Chu Tianju managed to surpass all the players so quickly. The master, as if thanking the elder, remarked that he was worthy of being a capital appraiser. The elder only made a haughty look, showing that it couldn't have been any other way. What he was actually thinking about was how many advanced runes he now had to use for his own success. The master asked the elder if he could ask him for help in the future. The elder had a fear in his mind of losing even more of his advanced runes, Without giving any sign, he said to look for him in the central capital and promised to help. In fact, the elder knew that the entrance to the central capital was not accessible to everyone. The master, as he left, said that he needed to visit the next familiar's guild. Chu Tiange was in contemplation about what kind of creature was inside his egg. He approached a building with tall white pillars called the Familiar's Guild. The young lord approached the first person he met on his way to ask about the elders. The man replied to Master Chu that the elders were resting, and there was no need to bother them unnecessarily. The master, smiling enigmatically, told the first person he met that he actually had something for them. He took out a gleaming pet beast egg from his inventory. The first person he met couldn't believe his eyes and couldn't take his eyes off the egg. He got angry for some reason and started shouting that newcomers like him couldn't have such things. A guild elder came out to the commotion and asked what was going on here. Chu Tiange immediately approached the elder and asked him to hatch his egg. The familiar's guild elder looked at the mythical egg that was held out to him with astonishment. Looking at the egg, he came to the conclusion that it could be a pet egg. The master asked with interest if he could tell what kind of beast was inside. The elder replied to Chu Tianju that he should know for himself from which nest the egg came from. Later, he also learned that the master had bought the egg from a secret merchant without asking about the nest. The elder warned Chu Tianju that he had a huge responsibility for the beast after it hatched. The master, after listening to all the warnings, still insisted on doing his own thing. He clearly didn't like the fact that the elder offered to just give him his beast egg. The elder took the egg from the master's hands, making sure he agreed to hatch the beast. He followed Master Chu into the great beast hall to the main altar. The elder immediately began the hatching ritual, carefully inserting the beast egg into the altar. The young master kept his eyes on the egg, wondering with interest what mythical beast was inside. The egg was securely placed into the main altar and glowing with a bluish light began to hatch. Chu Tiange watched the process begin with hope and excitement. The pet beast egg finished the hatching process, raising a pillar of bright blue glow into the sky. The system once again announced Chu Tiange's achievement and congratulated the player. The disgruntled characters heard another alert about the richest player. An elder was carrying a mythic beast that had just hatched from an egg in his arms. He blesses the pet beast holding it in divine light. The master looks at the hatched white puppy in utter bewilderment. A record of the beast registering as a snow-white heavenly dog is displayed on the monitor. 
Chu Tiange is still a bit shocked and curiously asks the elder if the beast is supposed to be some mythical animal. The elder spoke about not underestimating this heavenly beast. The young master still couldn't believe in the might and power of this small beast. The guild elder asked the master to be sure to name his pet. Chu Tiange bewilderedly took the snow white puppy and began to think of what to name it. After a couple minutes, with the pet in his arms, he opened the monitor to enter the new name. The screen displayed the master's confirmation of the name for the celestial beast as Ursha. The system also displayed the pet ranking of Huxia City's sole owner, Chu Tiange. The young master was leaving the familiar guild together with his newly formed pet. The snow white puppy with its tongue sticking out cheerfully ran beside him, looking around with interest. Looking at him, Chu Tiange did not understand how he could be a mythical beast, despite his cute appearance. The master was approaching the twelfth level with a swamp of huge evil golems. The screen popped up with the young master's experience and added a line with his dog. The master liked what he saw and put the experience distribution towards Ursh. Splitting the experience in half between himself and the pet, he confirmed his choice. Master Chu was about to do something else, but suddenly noticed something missing. He was left standing alone at the beginning of the level, and his beast had suddenly disappeared somewhere. Ursha, while his master was busy doing something, ran straight to the golem and started barking loudly. This made the swamp golem very angry and he growled menacingly at the dog. The young master noticed that Ursha had angered the golem and engaged in a fight with it. Chu Tiange looked at the dog facing the swamp monster and thought that it wasn't that bad. The master was about to rejoice at the beast's boldness, but he saw an ambiguous picture. A whole army of angry swamp golems was closing in on his pet. The master visibly became worried about his dog's disadvantage. The pet desperately tried to get away from the vicious monsters, quickly running away. The young master did not wait for Ursh to be attacked and rose up against the golems himself. He, in his usual style, launched fiery lightning strikes at the enemy army. As the master fought, he thought about how the pup was worth his rank after all. Chu Tianga also surmised that the dog summoning an army of golems to one place would help raise his level faster. Striking a powerful bursting blow at the golem, he considered the dog to be quite a worthy pet. A bright fiery explosion erupted at the scene of the fight, spreading far across the outskirts of the valley. Master and Ursha were left standing alone in the huge hole formed after the explosion. Chu Tianga noticed a sort of blue glow directed towards his dog. In an instant, Ursha had noticeably increased in size and gained tremendous strength. The monitor displayed updated information about the master's pet. Chu Tiange was pleased with Ursha's upgrade and his reduction in damage received by 90%. After praising the dog some more, the master informed him that it was already time for them to head out. The master traveled lightly through the next 13th and 14th levels. As he fought, Chu Tiange noted the merits of his upgraded weapon. He quickly continued fighting monsters and passing levels, reaching the 15th level already. The system informed the master that his experience gain rate was being reduced to 10% due to his insufficient average level in the game. Chu Tiange was indignant since he couldn't affect the level increase rate of other players. He realized that there was nothing more for him to do here and retreated away along with his new shaggy friend. On the way, the young master pondered about what else to do if there was no point in leveling up further. Chu Tiange looked for answers on the map and saw that it was possible to fight golden bosses to obtain golden weapons. He quickly realized that their first order of business would be to fight a couple dozen gold bosses. The master ran forward with excitement along with his dog towards the adventure. The next actions of the game took place in the Tang country, the village of Xiao He. One of the players upgrading in the firelight finally leveled up to the tenth level. A message from a certain friend Sun Ji appeared on his monitor. The message spoke of an internship offer and the corresponding payment for it. The player scrutinized everything and informed his friend that he was not interested in any of this. The player's friend didn't understand why the player refused such a simple opportunity to earn money. Taking a serious look, the player replied to his friend that his main goal was Chu Tiange. He said that he had to prepare to leave the village first, and then he would deal with Master Chu afterward. The formidable lion, with its mouth wide open, rushed forward and roared loudly. The young master used his renewed strength and used the golden dragon's earth-splitting strike against his opponent. A tremendous fiery explosion erupted at the battle site, cracking the ground. 
Master Chu looked at the still menacingly standing opponent in astonishment. Chu Tiange was surprised that there wasn't a scratch on the lion after such a powerful blow. The master quickly checked the strength information of the Golden Lion King on the monitor. He saw all of its qualities on the screen, including its high defense. The enraged Lion King was running straight at the master, who in turn was preparing to retaliate. The master was already thinking that if this continued, he wouldn't be able to withstand it for long. Chu Tiange commanded his beast to use the provocation skill and lead the monster away. Ursha immediately rushed to fulfill his master's order and ran forward, attracting the lion's attention. One tug and the dog was already standing behind the Lion King and trying to replace him in his trap. The master wasn't worried about Ursh as he had a skill to reduce the damage he received to 10%. Chu Tiange heard the sound of a cell phone notification through the game capsule. The young master put the capsule on standby for a while and stepped out into the real world. Taking off the game helmet, he quickly took out his cell phone from his pocket and read the message. He was texted by Lin Chi Yu asking why he hadn't added her as a friend. She assumed that he was just shy because of her level and equipment. Master only replied that he had added her as a friend a long time ago and told her to check the list. Meanwhile, Ursha was already barely coping with his role as provocateur. The formidable lion pushed himself harder off the ground and roared towards the exhausted dog. The master returned to the game just in time and directed a stream of divine healing at the beast. The Lion King was so close to victory, but right below him, he noticed the healed dog. Chu Tiange pointed his spear towards the vicious monster and unleashed fiery arrows. The young lord's accurate strikes flew straight into the furious lion's back. At this moment, the healed Ursha joins the battle, flying with open mouth towards the lion. He delivers another heavenly blow to his opponent and, dodging its attack, quickly flees. The master watched as the pet once again led the formidable king away from him. Chu Tiange opened the system screen and saw that his partner was now online. He texted her that he had asked her earlier to check her friends list. Nubi confusedly read the message and remembered that young Master Chu had recently asked her the same thing. The thought flashed through her mind about the possibility of communicating in life and here with the same person. They had a friendly correspondence that set things straight and revealed the identity of the mysterious god Chu Tiange. Nubi promised the master at his request to keep his identity a secret and told him about her recent successes. In parting, Chu Tiang asked her to go to Chan'an City after reaching the 10th level. The monitor displayed the Lion King's health scale information. The young master launched another powerful attack against the monster. In the moment between strikes, he remembered that he had forgotten to add his named brothers as friends. Making the next attack on the fearsome lion, he decided that he would do it right now. The actions of the game are again transferred to the country of Tang, already familiar village of Xiao He. There was a certain player sitting on a rock, typing something quickly on the system screen. A private chat channel had been created in the system, consisting of only two players. These players turned out to be the second and third brother who were corresponding about their current affairs in the game. Unexpectedly, the third brother received a friend invitation from the richest player, Chu Tiange. The third brother was very surprised, and after thinking for a while, he accepted the incoming request. A chat screen opened on the system screen, and the richest player introduced himself as Big Brother. The third brother was even more surprised and stared at the screen in confusion. The young master asked him not to tell anyone about who he really was, and to leave after the tenth level to Chain and City. The song game country was one of the newest and most advanced. A player with an open screen was walking along the streets of the city among other characters. Suddenly he received a message from the richest player revealing his secret identity. The player turned out to be the second brother, who still couldn't believe his eyes. He had no way of realizing that his big brother Chu and the richest player Tiange were the same person. Chu Tiange created a chat group in the system, to which he added his two brothers, and started a voice conversation. The second brother immediately apologized to the master since he didn't know what his place in the game really was. Chu Tiange with Ursh continuing to attack the lion replied to him that he was now up to speed on everything. The second brother offered to delete his account and start a new one at the same place where his big brother was now. Chu Tiange immediately told him to drop the idea as he needed him exactly where he was. As he continued to do battle with the opponent, the master said that he would transfer a certain amount of money to the second brother's account. 
The second brother was dumbfounded by the amount, for it was simply huge. The third brother, interfering in the conversation, asked how much gold the master had in the game. Chu Tiange, while continuing to strike the enemy with his spear, suggested that the brothers guess. The brothers made guesses to no avail, and the young master replied that he accounted for eight out of ten parts of the game's total gold. Chu Tiange, gathering all his fury and power, flew with his spear straight at the Lion King. The master flew through the monster, leaving only a trail of fire behind him. There was a violent explosion and Chu Tiange flew down, shrouded in smoke. The defeated formidable Lion King let out his desperate farewell roar. The master flew down to the ground, surrounded by sprinkled gold coins. The game rewarded victory with expensive equipment, armor, various items, and piles of gold. The young lord stood around the crumbling bounty and listened to the congratulations on receiving all this payment. The game system once again announced the master's victory over the level 11 gold boss. The brothers approached the master to see if he had fought the gold boss right as they were talking. Hearing the elder brother's affirmative answer, the two buddies were at a loss for words. They simultaneously thought to themselves that Chu Tiange was not only the richest, but also the strongest person in the game. The players resented why the world system announcement was dedicated to Chu Tiange again. They were also discussing what the reward was and whether it would be cooler than the one he already had. It was as if the master himself was unhappy that the system had once again notified everyone about his next victory. Going through the available inventory, Chu Tiange found a golden equipment for his dog. The equipment that reduced the opponent's defense was displayed on the monitor. The master chose an exclusive equipment to enhance the pet. In the same second, a cloak of underworld appeared on Ursh, thus increasing his strength. Chu Tiange watched the merrily frolicking pet with a stone face. The young master moved to fight at the twelfth level with the Golden Tiger King. A couple of powerful punches and flashes of fire, and Chu Tiange once again came out with another victory. The players couldn't seem to hear the world announcements in honor of player Chu anymore. Chu Tiange, without stopping, easily destroyed another golden boss. Iron-masked player Zhao ended up getting pissed off by all these world announcements and didn't even want to hear the master's name. On the system screen, the master's congratulations for passing the level came one after another. The third brother suggested that Chu Tianju go to the forum and see what was going on in his honor. In the game's forum, the players were actively discussing the master's exploits, which were not to their liking at all. Chu Tianju, reading the forum news, thought of doing something interesting. He quickly went through the system menu and clicked on the world mouthpiece button. The other players, unsuspecting, heard a voice telling them to try much harder. Some even stopped fighting and didn't realize what the conversation was even about now. The master went on to say that they were unsuccessfully trying to raise their levels. He also explained to them why he was fighting golden bosses and urged them to put in as much effort as possible to raise their levels. Players couldn't understand how Chu Tiange had already reached level 15 so quickly. One of the players pointed out that their low average level among the country's players was much more important. They realized that Chu Tiange couldn't raise his level because of them, so they were taking the golden bosses to battle. The master finally added that he hoped that they would be more diligent, and then they would leave the village without any problems. Some of the players asked Chu Tiange why he was so arrogant since he just got lucky at the beginning of the game. The leader of the Blasphemer's Guild stated that he would outplay the master in no time at all. The new recruit from the guild explained to the guild leader that only Chu Tiange could hear him through the world mouthpiece, not the other players. Hearing the blasphemer leader's words, the master also said that they wouldn't see them leaving the village after the tenth level. Somewhere outside of Bayun village, a player upgraded right on the battlefield. He proudly raised his hand up, saying that he had risen to the tenth level. The player hoped that being second with that level, he would be able to go to the main city of the game. A certain NPC appeared in the player's path, seemingly blocking his way further. The bot explained to him that their space-time channel had been damaged by a demon and he could now give him a hidden task. The player who wanted to move from this place gladly accepted the task. He launches an attack in the 10th level magic zone with the one-eyed demon. The player, creating a magic ball, is about to deliver the final blow to the enemy. Before he can do anything, the player's soul soars upwards, leaving the defeated monster on the field. Flying upwards towards the relocation tunnel, the player tried to figure out how this happened. In the game's world chat, there was a heated discussion about the possibility of leaving the newcomer village. The young lord, stretching, 
had finished the gold bosses through level 20 and was going to another city. Standing on the outskirts of the city with the master, Ursha suddenly starts barking viciously. Suddenly, thunder rumbled in the sky and purple lightning flew. The master, looking at the terrifying picture, felt the spirit of extermination. A world announcement alerted everyone that all the wild monsters had gone into a state of frenzy. Somewhere in other levels, monsters were turning into madmen in front of the battling players. The players didn't understand why the monsters had become dozens of times stronger in an instant. Chu Tiange looked up at the sky and saw nine monsters there, but he didn't understand where they came from since he had already destroyed all of them. Nine dragon heads came out of the sky directly at the master one by one. After a moment, a huge nine-headed monster descended to the ground. The young master quickly realized that it wasn't the nine golden bosses at all, but a single evil monster. Chu Tiange quickly tried to search the system for information about the ancient nine-headed dragon, but found nothing. The master realized that encountering such a huge boss was a surprise and took out his teleport scroll. The system alerted him that the space was blocked and he couldn't use the scroll right now. The huge red dragon saw this and squealed that just seeing it was already a great honor for the master. The nine-headed dragon roared, thus creating a far-reaching force field. The young master and his pet were thrown further and further back. Chu Tiange, along with his dog, was finally able to stop standing in a pall of smoke. The master didn't understand why just from its roar alone, almost half of his life was taken away. Chu Tiange, gathering all of his strength, rushed forward to attack the dragon with fury. He performs his usual powerful fire strike on the monster. From the blow dealt to the dragon, the master himself flies backwards, tearing a long hole in the ground. Stopping, Chu Tiange stares straight into the eyes of the nine-headed dragon with anger. The mighty dragon expressed admiration for the master and invited him to join their ancient clan. The master recalled the fact that their ancient clan was opposed to humanity. Chu Tiange replied to the dragon that there was no way he would join monsters like them. The dragon said with a menacing look that if he refused, he would be forced to take his life. The young master tried to explain to the dragon that he could heal himself, which only made him laugh. The monster's eyes narrowed and took the shape of a cross, emitting lightning bolts. In the same second, a nine-ranked demonic lotus appeared in front of the master. The dragon told the master that once the lotus entered his body, he would be completely zeroed in level and experience. The beast also specified that there would be exactly nine such hits on him. The master couldn't believe that he would lose level to zero a full nine times. The ancient dragon kept reminding Chu Tianju to make an early choice. The master, not knowing what to say, procrastinated, and the dragon started counting down. Suddenly, from nowhere, a bright blinding glow appeared in the sky. It caught the attention not only of the master, but also of the dragon waiting for an answer. A shield-shaped pillar of bright sunlight descended from the sky to the ground. An unknown person's spaceship appeared in front of the master and the dragon. Chu Tiange looked in its direction with admiration and called it a UFO. The ancient nine-headed dragon realizes that the situation is getting much worse. A light appears from the open hatch of the spaceship and someone comes out. The stranger in divine armor is the caretaker of the celestial tower. Master Chu, with hope in his eyes, thinks that his savior has finally arrived. The caretaker of the celestial tower asks the dragon what he has forgotten in his state. The dragon is not afraid of him, and only says that if he had appeared in his real form, he would not have been so brave. The celestial tower keeper refrains from answering and launches his attribute at him. The attribute is a miniature of the celestial tower, which takes on a full-sized appearance in flight. The ancient dragon, noticing the caretaker's action, roars loudly, attacking its opponent. The enraged beast emits a ferocious roar with a wave-like motion. Such a fight causes all the trees standing nearby to fly apart. The dragon sees that the tower is not collapsing, but on the contrary, it is only getting bigger. The nine-headed dragon decides to leave the fight, saying that it is enough for today. The caretaker of the celestial tower does not intend to let his rival go so easily. He and his celestial tower follow the flying dragon. The young master, after a languid wait, finally exhales and decides that the dragon has left. Only after relaxing a bit, Chu Tiange sees some sort of flash nearby. The nine-ranked demonic lotus appears in front of him once again. Chu Tiange at this moment hears the treacherous dragon's words about his unfulfilled promise. The nine-headed ancient monster reappears in front of the master and repeats its words. 
In the face of danger, regardless of the consequences, the brave Ursha flew out in defense of the master. Chutiange, unable to stop him in time, desperately calls the dog back to him. Ursha covers his master with himself, taking the full force of the impact. In the dissipating smoke, a bowed master sits on the ground with his dog in his arms. He looks with frustration and despair at the wounded Ursh who had so bravely defended him. The young master looked into the dog's eyes with pain and regret and thanked him for saving him. Meanwhile, there was complete silence in young master Chu's mansion. Assistant L was telling someone on the phone that young master and the butler were right now in the game. With a deft movement of her hand, she quickly dialed some five-digit code. A notification came to the phone that a certain secret channel had been opened. L was checking with someone on the other end of the wire about the status of the vial she had handed over earlier. She learned from her interlocutor that the matter was progressing too slowly and gave her consent to use any resources. Satisfied with herself, L ended the conversation and pressed the call end button. Standing by the stairs, she pondered over what soup to prepare for the young master's return. The master was still in the capsule in the game helmet inside the game. Chu Tiange with Ursh in his arms was still sitting in the hole left behind after the powerful explosion. Suddenly, it was as if a celestial portal inside the system had opened in the sky. The master, before he could say goodbye and looked sadly at the teleporting body of the pet. Ursha was placed in the pet space with zero health points. Master looked at the monitor, which said that the pet's recovery process had started. Chu Tiange took his gaze away from the screen and looked at the ominous dragon with fury. The dragon was asking the master how his foolish dog dared to take the powerful lotus strike addressed to it upon itself. At the same time, the caretaker of the heavenly tower flew at the nine-headed dragon with an attack. The caretaker attribute powerfully attacked the dragon several times from different directions. After several explosions, the attribute shrank back to its initial size and returned to the caretaker. Through the dissipating smoke, the dragon appeared after numerous blows. The celestial tower caretaker looked at his opponent in bewilderment. The dragon creates a huge force defense ball around itself and says that it is invincible. The Celestial Tower caretaker clearly did not expect this turn of events. He was about to say something when he noticed a master standing nearby. The Celestial Tower's caretaker along with the ancient dragon turned towards Chu Tiange. The young master was about to do something incredible and mentioned a single top quality sacred talent. Lighting a fire around him and raising the ground, he launched a reflection of the heavens. Far into the sky, a tall pillar of powerful fire glow rose up, Around the flaming firemaster, water erupted from the earth and stone. Chu Tiange was in complete control of the situation and was already ready to launch another attack. The master had created a large-scale zone in which the opponent's stats were lowered by as much as 10%. The caretaker was surprised that the young master possessed a single top-quality sacred talent. He also knew that under the effects of this skill, his characteristics would increase by 10%. The caretaker pointed his attribute towards the dragon and shouted at it about the inevitability of its horrible fate. He once again threw the miniature of the heavenly tower with all his might, which increased in a moment. The nine-headed dragon looked straight at the flying huge tower, which made rapid circular movements with energy release. It quickly realized that it was a good time to secure itself and summoned a protective barrier around itself. Right at the junction between the tower and the dragon, a protective force ball formed. The sky tower began to drill into the dragon's defense, trying to break through it in any way. The ancient nine-headed dragon didn't give up and directed all of its strength at the force ball. The caretaker was not going to retreat either and attack the enemy with all his might. The master, standing on the ground, watched the mighty battle in the sky. The celestial tower caretaker had used up almost all of his strength and was practically running out of power. He was almost in despair when he noticed that the strength of his defenses had also increased. The dragon, thinking that victory was on his side, said that his barrier was absolutely invincible to anyone. Suddenly the following happened. The tower's tip was able to drill through the defense and it cracked like glass. The caretaker was delighted with his power and shouted to the dragon to go to hell. The sky tower completely destroyed the dragon's protective force ball and flew straight at him. The ancient nine-headed dragon immediately realized what fate now awaited him. In a moment, a tremendous explosive wave occurred from which the reward for the victory flew in all directions. Chutians, with satisfaction, observes the demise of the enemy and the fallen armor, equipment, and gold. 
A congratulations on receiving the passive skill, Ancient Breath, is displayed on the wizard's monitor. Chu Tiange is glad that he received a pretty good skill for nothing, if you don't count his reflection of the heavens technique. The young master notices a new inventory appearing on the monitor and looks through it. The caretaker of the celestial tower himself descends to him on the ground with his attribute. He asks him to do his best to improve it and tells him that he expects a glorious battle with it in the future. The caretaker flies back to the spaceship, and the master realizes that he forgot to ask where he can purchase the same UFO. Chu Tianga decides to check on Ursha in pet space. He sees on the screen the beast's recovery process with health points. The master doesn't understand why the pet hasn't had any change in characteristic. He ponders whether it is possible that when it resets its level, its characteristics do not decrease. Chu Tiange discovers details about the pet and learns that in the battle, the dog mutated and underwent a transformation in his favor. He realizes that even after reaching a high level and losing it, the dog's characteristics will not change. In Xiao, he's village of Tang State, other characters had the following events happen. A girl stood next to the third brother and desperately thanked him for saving her. He clarifies with her why she was fighting the wild monsters of the fifth level alone. The third brother learns that her teammates have left on business and advises her not to fight alone any further. The girl remembers that he told her about a certain abnormal level up point and she wants to find out where it is. The third brother agrees to tell her, but warns her not to tell anyone about it. He takes the girl deep into the forest closer to the rocks to a clearing and tells her that this is where the zone is located. The third brother suggests that the girl should start raising their levels right away. It's like the girl is trying to put it off for a while and asks him to wait a bit. The third brother and the girl were approached by an armed company of strangers. He heard them loudly admiring the place in question and asked who was in front of them. The strangers were looking at the area and one of them addressed the girl, thanking her for a job well done. The third brother realizes that the girl has deceived him and is in league with them. The player from the company said that he understood everything correctly and the girl was not going to raise the level at all. She just needs a strong hand, which she found and followed him. He also told the third brother that he had spotted him a long time ago and had been following him closely. The player explained that he made up the scene with the girl to get attention and it worked great. The third brother, upon hearing how the player was going to make his own rules in the valley, said angrily that it would never happen. The player started threatening and said that if he told anyone about the place, he would do anything to remove him from the game forever. The third brother, seeing the company raising their weapons and starting to surround him, said that in that case he would just leave. He didn't even notice someone approaching him from behind and only felt a heavy blow. The young lord walked forward along the road, discarding unnecessary low-level equipment. A system alert announcement popped up on his screen and he clicked on it. On the monitor was a picture of the third brother with a note of his recent demise. Chu Tiange stopped and froze in place from the surprise that had caught up with him so suddenly. He quickly gathered himself and promised to find out who dared to raise a hand against his third brother. In the chat room of the group of brothers, there was correspondence between the big brother and the second brother about the third brother's departure and some sort of master plan. Somewhere outside of Chen'en City, the sentries were obediently doing their duty. One of the sentries heard someone's approaching footsteps and turned around to look. Seeing a huge bag of gold coins in the hands of a master, he didn't even pay attention to who was in front of him. The wizard said that he had a small request, and seeing the sentry's attention, told them about it. Without telling the real reason, he simply asked to enter Xiao He's village in a friendly manner. The sentinel informed him that his teleportation had been inactivated, and that he was going straight to a ten-level huge demon that he would have to exterminate anyway. The young master only cheerfully replied that it was no problem for him and stepped forward into the teleportation portal. Through the relocation tunnel, the third brother found himself at the Xiao He village's revival point. Fully realizing the failure that had happened to him, the third brother became very angry. The players who were calmly chatting in the village noticed the NPCs quickly rushing past them. None of the players understood what had happened or where all those bots had rushed off to. The third brother approaching the village gate also noticed the bots running fast. At the same moment, he received a private chat message from one of the brothers. Chu Tiange told the third brother about his whereabouts and asked about what had happened to him. The third brother started typing something quickly on the on-screen keyboard. 
He asked why the master had come here and told him, at his request, what had happened to him recently. The annoying bots surrounded the master and began to enthusiastically greet him and invite him to visit. Chu Tiange was amused that they were all so welcoming and friendly to him. He asked the bots who in the village was responsible for punishing other players. One NPC was extremely surprised at this purpose of the wizard's visit to their village. He addressed one of the bots, calling it blind, asking it to deal with such a small thing. The bot cheerfully replied to the wizard that he could do whatever he wanted, since he was blind and couldn't see anything anyway. He also clarified that he wasn't changing the law because he really couldn't see anything. Players passing by noticed the bots surrounded by someone. They tried to figure out what was going on there and consider who the bots were having a conversation with. On the official era forum, there was another discussion about the player Chu Tianj. The players who had sent the third brother to the revival point had seen him on his approach to the village. Apparently, the chief of their company asked how he dared to come here. The third brother recalled his same words to that one about a strong arm, while looking at the frightened girl. The main one of the company, smirking eagerly, asked if the one was going to challenge him to a duel. Pointing his hands in the direction of the third brother, he threw a strong punch. There was a bright pink flash, followed by a powerful explosion. The main company rejoiced at such a quick victory, and said that he deserved such a happy ending. In the thick, dissipating smoke, someone's dark figure began to be seen. The chief was puzzled as he tried to consider what had happened and who was in front of him. He desperately did not want to believe that his rival had somehow survived. In front of the company, the richest player, Chu Tiange, stood at full strength. The girl immediately recognized him and opened her mouth and slowly said, God, Chu Tiange. Chu Tiange was covering his third brother with himself and asked if this company was involved in the attack on him last time. The gang of strangers were surprised at the conversation between the richest player and their enemy, having learned in addition that they were close friends and possibly brothers. The head of the company quickly realized what was going on and began to apologize and repeated several times that it was just a big misunderstanding. The young master only disdainfully asked if he had authorized him to say anything. Chu Tiange called up the system screen and began to check the available inventory. He found a gold-level equipment in his possession and handed it over to the third brother's possession. The master saw the third brother's surprised face, telling him that he would be safely protected in it and asked him to put on the new equipment. The third brother, still not believing his eyes, clicked on the golden equipment icon on the screen. In the same second, the transformation of the third brother's armor to the new armor started. All the players standing nearby saw a blinding flash with a bright light. The third brother completely changed the old armor and appeared in front of everyone in a magnificent golden armor. The company's master realized the disadvantage they were at and began to press the fact that it was harder for ordinary players like them to improve. The master offered him a life-for-life -life exchange, but on the condition that the third brother would do it himself. The head of the company hoped for a favorable outcome and thus did not expect such a request saying that it was too much even for him. Opening his teleport scroll, he told the master with a smile that he was leaving for a village where he would not be able to destroy him in front of the bots. Disappearing in the blue light of the teleport, the leader said his goodbyes, leaving his team behind. The company didn't understand how he could leave and what they should do now, as they were left all alone with God Chu and his third brother. The girl quickly realized that it was useless to fight with them and needed to run away immediately. The other players also ran after her, not noticing the third brother behind them. Suddenly, a strong lightning strike struck between the fleeing players. The third brother, having sent everyone but the girl to the revival field, stood in front of them. The girl didn't dare to move and only looked at the bodies of her destroyed buddies. The third brother told her to leave. After all, he had a game rule of honor. Don't kill girls. She stared at the justice for a while and then immediately rushed away. The third brother decided to check if he had a red mark for destroying players. He didn't understand why there was no mark and heard from the young master that he was the one who had arranged everything with the NPCs. Chu Tiange also said that they would find his offender and execute him at level zero. The third brother didn't quite understand the master's plan, as it was forbidden to do such a thing in the village. Xiao He Village's revival field was located at the edge of the valley, not far from the valley entrance. The gang leader was greatly angered when he saw his teammates there as well. He became furious as he gave a long speech about Chu Tiange, 
not forgetting to insult his buddies as well. Suddenly, the players noticed a discharge of electric lightning right above them. The spark discharge flew straight at the head of the gang, delivering a crushing blow. The buddies standing nearby didn't immediately realize what had happened and wrote it off as a natural phenomenon. Chu Tiangi and the third brother stood on the high cliff above the revival field and watched everything. The master was telling his brother what subcategories he had and what was in his power. Once revived, the mastermind looked at the system's notification of who he had been destroyed by. He couldn't believe that the master had dared to do such a thing, and before he even knew it, another lightning strike was approaching him. The named brothers watched with pleasure the picture that was taking place. The head of the gang reappears on the field of rebirth thanks to the young master. The buddies want to find out from him what is happening to him and who is responsible for it. They don't have time to hear anything because a spark lightning bolt descends on their leader again. Once again, the leader is revived after passing out through the travel tunnel. Standing powerless in front of his buddies, the leader only manages to utter a short Chu Tiange. Once again, an electric charge with a paralyzing effect flies towards him. In the gang leader's alert system, one by one, messages about his destruction and level reduction appeared. Seeing all this, he became even more angry and realized that he couldn't even exit the game in battle mode now. The young master, smiling evilly, wasn't going to stop and immediately charged another lightning bolt. The head, stunned by the next strike, thought only about what a cruel punishment the master would receive for everything that had happened to him and that he would never be able to get rid of the red mark. He was sure that after such a thing, Chu Tiange's account would be tagged and blocked by the game forever. The campaign head stood on the ground, bent on one knee, waiting for the next attack. After looking around, he decided that Chu Tiange was done with the massacre and contentedly raised his hands up, awaiting the one's rightful punishment. At the same moment, another bright, powerful flash once again flew at the arrogant player. Everything was in a thick pall of smoke, and the player standing nearby tried to see through it. They saw a scorched hole in the ground with only the armor of the gang leader lying in it. The players quickly noticed that the armor lying there was not simple armor, but of expensive blue quality. The master and the third brother watched from on high as the players greedily rushed to grab the armor. No doubt the named brothers were very pleased with their ruthless but just act. The defeated player saw a notification on the screen with his level downgraded to level one. Barefoot and without armor, he walked forward on the road cursing Chu Tiange for everything. A new character ran past him asking where to get a baton for beginners. The player walked further down the street in the same underwear while listening to the taunts of the other characters. The second brother, reading a news forum, for some reason decided that his big brother had been hacked. There was a discussion on the forum about the master's action, which divided the players into two camps. Some were delighted and some were the opposite. Chu Tiange talked to third brother some more and said that he could always come to him for any help. The third brother only reminded him that he was wearing a golden equipment right now, and it was unlikely that anyone would dare to harm him in any way. The young master agreed with his brother's words, and once again reminded him to go to Chainan City after the tenth level. In parting, Chu Tiange added that he still needed to kill a huge demon to leave this village. In the general chat, the players discussed that Master had opened a teleport portal to Xiao He and invited him to visit others in the villages. The Master, having finished all the gold bosses up to the 20th level of Yangzhou City, intended to leave the game for a while. Suddenly, he noticed some player teleporting into the city street. He looked at the character and didn't understand where he came from, as there wasn't a single player in the city. Master Chu quickly scanned the player in the system and recognized that it was someone named Mao Yun. He immediately remembered that he had seen this character's game name in a future episode. After completing the move, the player Mao Yun looked at the master and addressed him by name. They looked at each other without saying a word, but Mao Yun's face changed dramatically. Suddenly, he began to run brokenly straight towards the surprised master. Chu Tiange took up a fighting stance, thinking that Mao Yun was going to fight him. After reaching the young master, Mao rushed to hug his legs and told him how he had long dreamed of this encounter. Chu Tiange thought again in confusion how hard it was to be in his position and also handsome. The butler and his assistant entered the room with the young master's play pod. They were happily watching their young master return home from the era. Chu Tiange looked out the window and concluded that playing the game turned out to be a huge physical labor. At this time, El brought the master a tureen of broth for a speedy recovery.
The butler held out a tablet to the master, informing him that he had found information on all the era players within their country. The young master saw one announcement on the screen and remembered that he had already seen it in a fragment from the future. Chu Tiange suggested leaving it for later and was opening the game's navigation map in his tablet. He was still choosing the most suitable place to establish his own guild in Shannon City. El was surprised to ask about the difference in the location of the guild headquarters, as she thought it was particularly important. Master began to explain that the difference was quite large, and he even highlighted three main categories to choose from. The first category included places with a lot of monsters, but since there would be players there all the time, there was a high chance of the headquarters being attacked. The second category includes places far away from settlements, but they are very difficult to build and play in general. The third category, and perhaps the most interesting, involves some sort of measuring device. The butler and assistant did not understand how this would be possible to accomplish. The master began to explain that he wanted to introduce a toll function, whereby players passing by or into the headquarters would pay him a certain price. He also clarified that in order to do so, a single road would need to be established in that area so that everyone would accurately get to his guild with the toll measured and then paid. Chu Tiange, after thinking well about his cunning plan, was himself very pleased with it. The young master had chosen a narrow passage to Chainan City leading through his headquarters and wanted to set the toll at one or two gold coins. El certainly liked the master's plan, but she was worried that he might be in danger because of it. Butler decided to start discussing the plan by asking how many players he had already gathered for his headquarters. The young master clarified that that was exactly what he wanted to talk to him about now. Butler caught the gist of the conversation and said that soldiers charge quite a bit to take them on. He also suggested that at this moment, a master's main goal should be to improve himself, as he was far ahead of the other players. Chu Tiange replied to him that he saw all the power in guilds in the future, which was why he urgently needed to create one and develop there. After thinking for a bit, he also agreed with his uncle's words about self-improvement. After all, he couldn't be the most successful era player without constant progress. El also suggested that players who joined his guild could be a potential target for other players. The young lord pondered over her words, after all, a small number he would be able to protect, but many players. He looked for a loophole in his plan and informed her that in that case, they would have to cheat a bit. The master began to say that his guild wouldn't have a large number of employees until a certain point. Butler understood what he was talking about and supported the master's idea, as it would cause a large number of players to demand to join their ranks. The master also narrated a plan to buy a few other guilds where no one would be able to take out his people since they wouldn't know who the guilds belonged to. Finally, Chu Tiange said that they would have to create several offline companies to give out the best players the best game modules. Butler listened carefully to the master's plan and was about to tell him something. After waiting for a bit, Yin Li tells the young master that there wasn't much money left in their account. Chu Tiange was surprised by this news and tried to understand how this happened. The butler reminded him of the $30 billion investment in the game. El's assistant offered to start working for her biological company. Master refused such an offer because everything she would earn would belong only to her and it would not help him in any way in the end. El, smiling sweetly, only said that her money was young Master's money. Chu Tiange, of course, did not want to lose his own dignity and politely refused the girl's offer. The butler was also still wondering the same thing. What should they do now? The young master offered to cash in some money from the game by exchanging gold coins for dollars. He learned that the exchange rate of dollars to in-game gold was one to three and a half, far below his expectations on that score. Butler attributed this to the fact that players do not have gold coins to buy anything, and therefore the domestic market is inactive. He also added that even those who have something to sell aren't taking it up. El excitedly interrogated the master if he was going to sell his gold coins. Chu Tiange, on the other hand, replied that he was simply going to revitalize the market. Somewhere on the outskirts of the city, there was a tall, abandoned building. Inside the building, everything inside was equipped for work and housing at the same time. The guys, who had apparently decided to grab a bite to eat, noticed something or someone and froze. 
Zhang Zhe walked inside the building with an admonishing speech about how they had to try their best if they wanted to attract sponsors to their blasphemer guild. The guys didn't seem to be particularly interested in the boss's speech and just continued to eat further. One of the guys called the boss over to show the game's news for him. Zhang Zhe quickly ran over to the monitor and saw the most interesting news. The forum said that the richest player Chu was selling his gold coins due to lack of money to live. Under the master's post, there were already a bunch of different comments written about it. One of Zhang Zi's guys suggested that the gold coin rate might drop because of this sale. The boss decided to withdraw all the gold coins since he had recently gotten over a thousand of them in the game. Someone tried to dissuade Zhang from this idea, but the boss decided that he would raise the level of their guild this way. One of the guys got worried and asked if they even had the money for this. Zhang Zhe only remained silent as he had nothing to answer the guy. Zhao Shu once again asked his father for money, only now to buy coins from Chu Tiange. He was trying to convince his father to take advantage of this offer, as he considered it to be a profitable investment in the era. Walking closer to his father, Zhao said with a serious face that this time, he was definitely sure of what he was doing. His father, after thinking for a bit, allowed his son to carry out his plan, but of course not without benefit to themselves. Zhao Shu was already happy with his father's approval, so he simply agreed. El informed the master that the entire news forum was just talking about him. The young master had already started receiving offers of gold purchases from various guilds. Chu Tiange glimpsed through all the messages and learned that the maximum offer came in at a ratio of one to three. The butler, while bringing a hot drink to the master, reminded him of the present exchange rate of coins to the dollar. He invited the young master to accept the given offers, to which he received a refusal. Yin Li didn't understand why Chu Tiange wanted to wait a little longer. Master Chu declared that no one had the right to announce his market price to him. After all, he himself was the market. He clarified to L how many total gold coins were for sale. Hearing a few million in response, the young master smirked contentedly. Yin Li's butler was scrutinizing something while looking at the tablet screen. He informed the master that all the gold coin transactions had just been redeemed. The assistant didn't understand how several thousand transactions could be redeemed in such a short time. Frowning his eyebrows, Chu Tiange was already making some conjectures about it. He wasn't interested in what kind of rich man had bought up all of these. The most important thing was that the purchases were accomplished. He had set the ratio of gold coins to the dollar to be one to ten. The young gentleman opened the successful trades and began clicking on their sale icon. The butler questioned the master once more if he was willing to sell the coins for so much. Zhang Zhe's team, crowded around the monitor, announced the start of the sale. At the same time, Zhao Shu was telling his subordinates that he had easily talked his father into the deal. He was confident that by buying out all of Chu Tiange's coins, he would be able to build a powerful guild in the game. Zhao Shu was also informed that Chu Tiange had launched the sale of his coins. He snatched the tablet from one of his subordinates, saying that he would handle the matter himself. Zhao saw the approved transactions on the monitor in a very different ratio than he had expected. His team informed him that they were completely done with the deals as requested by the boss. Zhao Shu was simply furious at what he heard because it meant one thing. The forum was discussing the sale deal proposed by the master with his ratio. Zhang Zhe's guys, after seeing such a ratio, hesitated to make the right choice. After Zhao Shu's subordinates successfully bought the deal, the amount of Zolat decreased. One of Zhang Zhe's fellows noticed that the number of coins being sold had changed. The other one speculated about the possibility of them being bought by a fake buyer. At the boss's command, the guys quickly hacked into the server to get the buyer's information. On the computer monitor, among a bunch of IP addresses, they found one familiar name. Zhang Zhe was a little surprised that the buyer was Zhao Shu. He began to ponder that although the offer was like robbery, they should follow young Zhao's example. Zhang quickly ordered the team to buy two million dollars worth of gold coins. Zhao Shu was still trying to figure out from his subordinates why they bought the coins at such a frantic rate. One of his team said that the boss himself had instructed them to buy back the trades as soon as they were publicly available, and added that besides them, someone was also buying the coins. Zhang pondered whether it was worth the risk to buy another batch of gold. Assuming that, should anything happen, the blame would not be on him, but on his men, he ordered the purchase. 
Zhang decided for himself that he should accept this buying rate, even though it was unreasonably huge. He wanted to make another purchase, but the system gave out that there were no coins left. Zhang looked hysterically at the sold-out coins and couldn't understand why he didn't have time. On the master's monitor, the total amount of sales revenue received, including commission, appeared. The butler and assistant informed the young master about the quick completion of the transactions and their current status. Yin Li asked the young master if he had seen this moment in a fragment of the future. El supported the butler's assumption, for how else could one explain such a bold act? Master Chu clarified that he had only seen small snippets of the future, and this was definitely not there. El marveled at the master's idea to obtain a huge amount of money this way. The young master simply waved his hand and said that this was just the beginning of their profits. His tablet received a notification of the messages he had received. Several guilds immediately wanted to buy gold coins from the master. Chu Tiange realized that everyone had bought into his cunning plan and were afraid of further increasing the stakes. The butler didn't quite understand what master was talking about and asked for an explanation. After the master told him about the guilds buying gold and guilds without it, he realized the essence of the bids. The forum was actively discussing Chu Tiange's post about his gratitude for buying deals. The young master asked Uncle Yin Li if they now had enough funds to carry out the plan with the establishment of the guild. The butler replied that it was more than enough, and after squandering these finances, more could be earned. Master Chu was very happy with this answer and began to immerse himself in the cabin in the game world. Just before loading, he told the butler that he was leaving everything here to him. The cabin closed, and the butler and his assistant obediently awaited the young master's immersion. An unknown man walked into the abandoned building Zhang and his team entered. The stranger asked one of his subordinates to call their boss over to him. Zhang Ze had already gone out to meet the unknown man himself, inquiring who was in front of him. The stranger introduced himself as Lin and said that he had come as a sponsor with one good investment proposal. Chu Tiange was looking at the navigation map of Chanan City with all the narrow passages available. He was walking along the outskirts of the city and choosing the best route through his future guild. The master, after studying the map, came to the conclusion that all the roads in the city led to the south of the capital. On the map, he found the perfect place to build a headquarters with a future passage toll. Chu Tiange found the guild founding order in the game's system menu. He noticed that it was as if this place had been created for his guild headquarters. After choosing the exact location to set up, he clicked on the confirmation icon. The system asked the wizard for a name for the new guild before installing it. After a bit of thought, the wizard named the guild Dragon Emperor's Palace. The construction process of the master's guild started at the selected location. The picture of the future headquarters of the roof and steps began to emerge. After a small amount of time, the master had his new guild standing in front of him. The World Alert announced to everyone about the erection of the guild in Chanan City by player Chu Tiange. Some players wished they could join the headquarters of the great and mighty Chu Tiange sooner rather than later. On the master's screen, all available information about his domain was displayed. Player Mao Yun wished to join the Dragon Emperor's palace. The master confirmed his request and told him to settle down in Chanan City for now. Suddenly he heard some noise and turned around to see what it was. From behind the trees, two huge iron birds flew out at the master. They immediately launched an attack and headed straight for Chu Tiange. The young master prepared for a retaliatory attack and darted away from the ground. He flew between them, striking at both iron birds at once. Landing with a trail of fire, he looked at the departing enemies. Master Chu didn't understand where those strange creatures had come from. It turned out that the birds weren't going to fly away at all and were simply turning around for another attack. Chu Tiange immediately summoned his spear for the next crushing blows. After accelerating, he swung his weapon for the next attack. A powerful stream of blast fire swept in front of the iron foe. The unknown creature was thrown back a little from the impact, leaving smoke behind it. The birds were not going to give up so easily and flew at the master with renewed vigor. In one motion, they pushed the young master off his feet and threw him to the ground. The enemy titans turned into a vicious attack and released their iron feathers at Chu Tiange. They circled over the master like vultures as he tried to dodge the blows. The iron opponents decided to clamp the master and flew at him from opposite sides. Chu Tiange, seeing this, thought that he now had a chance to win. After waiting for them to get as close as possible, he abruptly flew above them with his spear. The master launched his trademark trick, 
cleaving the ground of the fierce dragon. A tremendous nuclear explosion column descended on the iron birds. Master Chu stood in a pall of smoke and iron feathers flying around him. He had already laid down his weapons and was rejoicing in his quick victory over the obnoxious enemies. As the smoke began to clear, the master was shocked to notice the birds looking directly at him. He didn't understand why his attack had no effect on them and assumed they were divine phoenixes. The birds only became even more angry and dashing towards the sky with fury. Chu Tiange realized that he was once again facing a heavy opponent. The iron bird stopped attacking and began chirping loudly and nastily. The chirping was so unbearable that the master could no longer hear this annoying sound and tried his best to cover his ears. At this moment, the Dragon Emperor Palace Guild completely collapsed in an instant. Chu Tiange looked at the collapse in bewilderment and wondered how this had happened. The Iron Birds finally left the master alone and flew away. A request to repair the guild building at a cost of 10,000 gold appeared on the wizard's screen. Without thinking for long, he immediately accepts the system's condition to repair the building. The guild building appears in front of the wizard again with the successful repair. He doesn't even have time to savor this moment before he hears chirping behind him. The iron birds have returned back and chirped with even more vigor for a speedy victory. The young lord was already quickly thinking of a further plan of action against his enemies. The feathered opponents with their chirping were getting closer and closer. Chu Tiange thought. Since normal attacks didn't work on them, why not try something else? He pointed a magic wand at the birds with lightning bolts issuing from it. Several electrical discharges flew at each opponent at once. Two devastating powerful fire explosions occurred at once in the place of the birds. The master heard the sounds of collapse and destruction of the guild building behind him. He couldn't understand why the palace was collapsing again. After all, he had defeated all the birds. The screen once again displayed the current state of the guild building. Chu Tiange realized that as soon as he rebuilt the palace, he would be attacked by the phoenixes again. The master summoned the loyal pet Ursha with his provocation skill to help. Ursha appeared before his master as a fully grown dog, fully recovered from the previous battle. Chu Tiange petted the beast and commanded it to use its provocation skill against the phoenix. Meanwhile, the young master once again moved to purchase the restoration of his palace. The master's guild was once again completely successfully rebuilt. The master had already seen the flying enemies and was ready to start executing the plan. He gestured for the enraged Ursha to run forward as bait. Ursha rushed to carry out the order and within moments was already beckoning the birds, who were somehow not attracted. Chu Tiange thought that the phoenixes were somehow differently disposed since they did not succumb to his pet's skill. He looked at the birds flying towards him and was already preparing his magic rod. The master again directed several electrical discharges with thunderbolts at them. There were two more devastatingly powerful fiery explosions in the sky. Chu Tiange heard a familiar rumble behind him and immediately realized what had just happened. He thought that perhaps attacking wasn't really appropriate here and needed to defend. Master chooses a guild-level upgrade for 100,000 gold coins. The system congratulated player Chu for upgrading the palace to level 2. The master's next choice was to spend another 300 gold coins to upgrade the palace. The system congratulated him again for upgrading his level to level 3 already. The divine phoenixes circled over the guild again with their annoying chirping. The master was ready to confront the iron birds and defend the palace. Chu Tiange pointed his magic rod with lightning towards the phoenixes. The birds in the queue exploded noisily with electric discharges once. Ursha also seemed to be surprised by his master's astonishing power. This time, the dragon emperor's palace stood its ground without a scratch. The master thought about the fact that, after all, building guilds near roads wasn't really allowed yet, and that was why this happened. He was going to strengthen the palace's defenses even more by raising his level to do so. On the screen, Chu Tiange confirmed the guild's improvement to level 10. The Dragon Emperor Palace reflected an incredible dazzling flash. Mao Yun walked along the forest road towards the city and didn't even realize how lost he was. Before entering the capital, he saw a beautiful high-rise building in his path. The system congratulated the master for upgrading the guild to level 10 and gave him a bunch of add-ons to go along with it. Chu Tiange found the function to activate the defense in the system information. Mao Yun decided to walk closer to the building in front of the city and look around. On the pavilion, there was a large signboard with the name Dragon Emperor Palace on it. 
Mao Yun, noticing the master with the dog, quickly realized that this was his new own new guild. He approached Master Chu, and the latter welcomed him to the guild headquarters. Mao Yun was delighted with the palace, even though the master said it was just the beginning. After petting the dog, he was ready to assist the guild head in everything and informed him. The young master was unable to activate the defense ticket, as there wasn't the proper level and the appropriate number of staff members. He was a bit confused, as waiting until level 20 was too long. Chu Tiange decided not to give up and clicked the button to activate the ticket several times without looking away. A large force dome was formed around the entire guild area. It didn't take long for Mao Yun to marvel at the master's achievement as he noticed something amiss. Black clouds and lightning appeared above the dome palace. The dome seemed to be filled with black magic, and the master ordered everyone to quickly move away. There was an explosion in the sky, and the dome seemed to be sucked into a heavenly vortex. In the middle of the fiery sky, a golden boss appeared, a divine phoenix lord. Before the master could do anything, the phoenix began to chirp and demolish everything in its path. He flew far back and realized that this bird had a very powerful energy. Together with the master, Ursha and Mao flew back, followed by the rocks and earth. Mao clutched onto Chu Tiange's cloak concurrently asking what kind of boss was in front of them. The Golden Phoenix Lord introduced himself as the former Lord of Chinan City. He told the Master that a very long time ago, the city belonged to him, and the entire territory behind it was now his. Chu Tiange was not happy with this course of events, after all. This was where his guild stood. The Phoenix Lord did not even think of retreating, and began to threaten the Master. The young master received a system alert with the choice of accepting the battle with the former city lord or destroying the guild. Chu Tiange was willing to do anything for the sake of his palace and of course accepted the fight. He ordered Mao to stay away now, wanting the latter to flee already. Running away from the battlefield, Mao only wished for the master to win this fight. The phoenix lord flew higher, causing the ground and rocks to collapse. Taking a comfortable position, the golden boss began to attack the master with its fiery roar. The golden divine phoenix lord was rushing straight at the master at breakneck speed. Chu Tiange zigzagged in his usual manner to dodge the attack. The master unleashed his strongest side. The ferocious dragon split the ground. The phoenix lord's fiery explosion explodes in the sky. It was as if the golden boss didn't even notice the master's attack and hissed at him that all his attempts to destroy it were futile. Chu Tiange was surprised that the bird wasn't even affected by this, so powerful was it. The golden phoenix, rapidly flapping its iron wings, asked the master to show him something else interesting. Chu Tiange stared at the fierce opponent's eyes in confusion. The phoenix lord unleashed his powerful fire feathers at the master, and Chu Tiange tried to quickly dodge them. The young master did not expect that the feathers flying at him would also explode additionally. Several feathers powerfully exploded right in front of the master, who barely had time to dodge. The exploded projectiles flew past the master into one of the guild buildings. Chu Tiange was still on his feet, not intending to surrender to the iron opponent. The divine phoenix lord opened its mouth wide to shoot out a fiery roar. The master was a bit tired of defending and attacking and quickly thought about what to do next. Before he could think of a plan of action, Chu Tiange flew at full speed away from the violent flash. The Golden Phoenix was not going to give the master a single chance to escape and unleashed another fiery arrows at him. The young lord deftly escapes from the shots following one after another. The lord attacked the master with even more fury, hoping for an early victory. Chu Tiange defended himself as best he could and courageously repelled all the blows flying at him. He ran with all his legs, seeking refuge in one of his guild's buildings. Before he could turn around, he felt another strong push behind him. Doing a steep somersault, he found himself on one of the roofs of the buildings and with his eyes quickly searched for shelter. The master saw the phoenix approaching and realized that there was nowhere else to hide. The golden boss was already preparing a huge fireball in its mouth for a shot. Suddenly, Ursha ran out in defense of the master with a loud bark, attracting attention. The pet managed to lure the attacking divine phoenix lord over to him. After smashing another building, the bird makes a U-turn and is going towards the barking dog. Mao Yun observes the ongoing battle from outside the guild, hiding behind a tree. Seeing all the strength and fury of the golden boss, he doesn't understand how he can even be defeated. 
The master looked at the incoming projectile that made a hole in the roof beside him. Chu Tianju liked what he saw, for it meant that Ursh's provocation was working. He immediately praised his pet for successfully using the skill in battle. During this time, the young master had time to think about his next actions towards the enemy. Chu Tiange summoned his magic rod with lightning from his inventory. He decided to climb to a higher rooftop and ordered Ursh to distract the enemy. Mao Yun, upon seeing the magic rod, realized why he wasn't the one to become the first apprentice to the mages. Chu Tiange pointed the rod towards the Phoenix Lord for the next attack. The explosive charge of strong electric lightning struck right on target. The lightning bolt to the golden boss made a hole and cracked one of the wing's mechanisms. The young lord rejoiced when he saw that it worked and there was no way the bird could defend itself physically without magic. The monitor displayed the health status of the phoenix lord. Chu Tiange did not expect to deal such a low damage of only some 5% with such a powerful strike. Ursha noticed the phoenix fluttering above the phoenix master and began to call out to it. The golden boss was very angry and flew at Ursha to destroy him. The master immediately decided to use the mage's next ability and summoned a thunder attack. Explosive charges rained down on the golden phoenix from all sides. It hoped to escape from the thunder net and began to chirp loudly. Above the dragon emperor's palace, the divine phoenix lord powerfully exploded and ignited. Mao Yun cheered with shouts of joy at the young lord's victory, deciding that this was the end of the battle with the obnoxious birds. After the explosion, a cloud of smoke dissipated, through which something was heard. The master was already prepared for the next attack and watched the cloud of smoke carefully. When there was no smoke left at all, there was still a wounded phoenix with minimal health in the same place in the sky. Mao Yun didn't understand why the phoenix was still fluttering there, even though it was barely there. Suddenly a pearlescent sheen and green glow appeared around the phoenix, and all the wounds began to heal. A moment later, the recovered golden boss appeared before the young master with full health. Chu Tiange realizes at the same time as Mao Yun that the phoenix has had automatic life restoration. The opponent's attack continues, with the phoenix releasing fire arrows and the master using magic lightning. Ersha decides to help the master again and uses her provocation skill. The master, of course, is once again distracted by the pet's provocation. The master seizes the opportunity and quickly gives the iron bird several explosive strikes at once. Mao Yun realized the purpose of Ursha's provocation skill against opponents, which was to distract the enemy. The phoenix lunges in rage following the annoying dog, reducing its attention to the main opponent. The master tries to keep the pet from attacking and calls the phoenix back to him. The phoenix lord, ignoring Chu Tiange's call, throws a fire charge towards the snow white dog. The master from behind the rooftops can only see the exploding wave of the enemy's next attack. He is determined to defeat the phoenix and is about to join forces. The magical forces unite their elements in the sky and unleash a powerful charge of lightning. The light of reflected magical engraving falls to the ground for the necessary victory. The master fuses the magical engraving with the heavenly elements and aims straight at the phoenix. The golden boss seems to ignore the wizard's power and continues to fly towards certain doom. It hits the very center of the fusion of all of the wizard's magical powers and lets out a nasty squeal. Mao Yun begins to realize that there has been a fusion of magical powers, and as a result, a double strike to inflict even more damage. Chu Tiange wasn't finished yet and let the next action take place by commanding Ursha. Ursha dashes towards the feathered opponent with the scroll in his teeth. He practices reaching the place where the divine phoenix lord is squirming under the influence of magical powers. The young lord orders his pet to reveal the elemental scroll now. Ursha quickly unfolds the scroll, which has the five elements engraved on it. From the scroll, the powers of the powerful elements fly out in all directions in glowing rays. The golden phoenix is no longer able to resist the master's attacks and shrilly screams. Mao Yun is still in awe of the master's many skills and is sure that this is not all he is capable of. He dares to express this to the master, who in turn is sure that it's over. Chu Tiange only exhales slightly as he hears behind his back from someone that he underestimated his opponent. The master turned around, but other than the puffs of smoke, he didn't notice anything. He realized where the sound was coming from and looked towards one of the guild towers. Above the tower, divine phoenixes were furiously circling above, descending from the sky one after another. Chu Tianzhu had already grown tired of these creatures, and here was an army of new ones, Mao Yun was also looking at the whirlwind of frenzied iron birds with astonishment. 
The young lord accelerated towards the birds that were not paying attention to him. He raised his magic rod upwards and charged several annihilating lightning bolts towards them at once. Mao Yun came out of hiding closer to the guild to see what was going on. As he got closer, he heard the tearing chirping of the divine phoenixes. The master heard the phoenixes circling behind him and decided to find out what was going on there, having already only seen Mao's soul flying away on the revival field. Chu Tiange pointed his annihilating rod at the remaining iron birds. A bright, dazzling surge occurred above the guild, and numerous rewards sprinkled down. Master received a system alert congratulating him for destroying the golden boss and activating the Dragon Emperor Palace's defense system. Chu Tiange smirked and thought to himself that this was indeed not an easy task at all. He was about to leave and suddenly heard someone tell him that he was not bad at all. The young master started to turn around in different directions in confusion, but all he heard was a voice in a new place. He finally caught the speaker's gaze and froze in place in surprise. Opposite Chu Tiange, the same golden phoenix that had transformed into an ordinary divine phoenix was sitting on the rooftop. It announced to him that it would be dwelling in the guild from today, as it was henceforth its guardian beast. The master asked the phoenix with interest when he would be able to regain his former mighty powers. The phoenix explained to him that in order to increase his level and strength, he needed the rewards left over from killing other powerful golden bosses. Chu Tiange began to quickly check his existing inventory, replenished after his previous victorious battles. On the monitor, the game system was giving out various rewards in large quantities. Master Chu quickly began to quickly empty his backpack and throw away all of his inventory to the Phoenix. He left a bunch of different equipment on the ground and wondered if it would be enough for a good upgrade. The Divine Phoenix didn't expect the wizard to have so many rewards. Nevertheless, it greedily asked for more gold coins and the more the better. Without even thinking, the master began to choose gold on the screen because he had plenty of it. The gold coins began to fall one after another, turning into large mountains. The divine phoenix greedily ran to gather all the gold, jingling the coins loudly. The young master knew that until he raised the guild level, the phoenix's level could not be increased either. Chu Tiange raised the guild level several times in a row, and the guild began to upgrade with a bright flash. The greedy bird that was collecting gold began to shake as if there was an earthquake. The process of increasing the level of the guild took place in every building of the guild, thus transforming it drastically. The Dragon Emperor's palace was completely upgraded and raised to level 20. Along with the palace, the bird was also upgraded, becoming the golden divine phoenix lord and the guardian beast of the Chu Tiange guild once again. The divine bird proudly flew above the guild, flapping its golden wings. The bird's iron mechanism had definitely become even better than before. The golden phoenix landed on the roof of the guild building as its current guardian. The master displayed the bird's information on the screen, stating all of its superpowers. The golden phoenix thanked the master for everything, calling him its master now. Chutiange himself was happy to upgrade the bird as it was now on his side. The master studied the phoenix's annihilating roar, which increased the probability of the lowest level players dying. The resurrected Mao Yun ran merrily towards the current head of the new guild. Chu Tiange greeted Mao once again, confirming the suggestions of him dying and leaving for the revival field. The new guild keeper intervened in the conversation, citing Mao's low level in the game as the reason for his quick demise. Mao didn't like the bird's behavior and shouted at it to stay out of his conversation with the master. Phoenix guessed that the latter did not recognize him and gave a small clue about the past fight not in his favor. Mao, having time to get angry, scrutinized the bird, but then it came to him. The Golden Phoenix introduced itself as the new guild guardian beast of the Dragon Emperor Palace Guild. The Phoenix explained why it had been defeated. It had in no way expected to find a player with the lowest level in the territory. The Master added that in this way, the guild had avoided destruction and the phoenix had not been reborn in its usual form. Mao realized that thanks to his weakness he had saved the guild and was very happy about it. He felt needed. The golden phoenix listened to the conversation between the two and told them that he was tired and went to rest. In front of the player's eyes, the bird began to disappear behind the clouds, that is, to teleport to sleep. The young master invited Mao and Ursh to go see the new guild. They went inside the Dragon Emperor's palace, where there were tall buildings with beautiful towers. Mao was simply delighted with the renovated guild and was not going to hide it, 
speaking loudly about all the grandeur and power of the new building. The master led his friends to the highest floor of the palace, from where they could see any point for several kilometers. They watched several teleportation pillars nearby at once. Chu Tiangai knew that those were the players from the rookie village coming out, which meant that their levels would increase and he would be able to shift at last. The system alerted the master to the possibility of a level increase as the game average increased. The young master had finally removed the level increase restriction and could move on. The huge one-eyed monster was facing the attack of the player army. The girl player was telling the other characters which side was best to attack from. She also engaged the monster by using her magic skills. The girl fired a giant, crushing, bursting projectile at the demon. The huge, one-eyed monster shattered into tiny particles in the light of the fire flash. The system notified the players that the challenge was over and they could leave the newcomer village right now. The characters were collecting their victory rewards and rejoicing at the opening of the portal. One of the players decided to ask the girl what city she was traveling to, to which he heard the answer, Chanan. Other characters teleported into the city street where the players were busy doing something of their own. One of the players noticed three beautiful girls arriving in the city at once. All three girls came out of the teleport portal at the same time. The first girl who destroyed the one-eyed monster turned out to be Master L's assistant. The second girl was a player Chu Tianju already knew well, newbie. The third girl did not reveal her cards and only wanted to meet the richest player as soon as possible. Before the girls could even take a couple steps, other characters ran around them with offers to play together. All three of them simultaneously replied that they had come to find the greatest player Chu Tiange. Young Master Chu sneezed loudly without stopping for about ten minutes. He knew from his childhood that when you sneeze often, someone is thinking about you or remembering you. Mao came running to tell him that the players had arrived, but the master asked him to recruit people to the headquarters himself. Mao decided to intrigue Master Chu, and quickly rambled that there were three beauties waiting for him at the gate at once. Even Chu Tiange did not expect such a thing and was visibly interested in such news. He immediately went towards the girls to satisfy his personal interest. Upon seeing the girls, the young master did not recognize all of them, but he guessed who the third stranger was. The stranger, looking at the other girls, arrogantly thought that they were no match for her. As soon as the master approached the girls, she coquettishly extended her hand to introduce herself to him. The master, ignoring the stranger, greeted the other girls in a friendly manner. The stranger remained standing alone on the sidelines, greatly surprised by this arrangement. The girls took turns greeting the master and marveling at the new guild. The stranger realized that the other two girls were already familiar with Chu Tiange and needed to act differently. The young master took turns adding the girls he already knew to his guild headquarters. Chu Tiange was about to leave, but a stranger blocked his path. She began to admire the master and asked to be added to the new guild headquarters. Chu Tiange asked the two girls to go look around the palace. The stranger thought that the richest player Chu couldn't resist her and decided to be alone, but it wasn't surprising since she was Liu Fei herself. As if embarrassed, she reminded the master of her request to join his staff. Chu Tiange replied without a fraction of a doubt that he was not recruiting people right now and she could be free to go. At a loss, she tried to remind him of her recent invitation. Chu Tiange clarified that the invitation was only for two girls and had nothing to do with her. Suddenly, a few more players came running in asking to join the staff, clarifying that they were Mao's acquaintances, and the master immediately approved them. Liu Fei was visibly angry and spoke unflatteringly about it. After all, they had come later than her. The master didn't make her wait for a response and threateningly said that only he would decide who would perform in his dragon emperor palace. Liu Fei was enraged, and as she left, she shouted in farewell that he would regret it big time. El quickly realized from her appearance and the master's attitude towards her that Liu Fei was in front of them. She didn't pity this arrogant rich girl for a second, saying that it was her way. The Blasphemer's Guild, led by their leader, arrived in Chanan City. The leader led his guild forward and, of course, did not forget to mention Chu Tiange. Meanwhile, in the Dragon Emperor's palace, the master divided the people into two groups to work on guild matters. The players obediently followed the guild master's order and ran in groups to whoever was going where. A new recruit from the blasphemers noticed a teleport glow ahead. They stopped and tried to figure out where they were, for the city was behind them. Not knowing what lay ahead of them, they decided to go see what was there. 
At the entrance to the guild, they were greeted by a system alerting them to pay a fee for further entry. After reading the name of the guild, some players were already starting to guess who the owner of the guild was. The leader of the blasphemers heard the enthusiastic responses about the new guild and abruptly said that they would have a much better one. He refused to go inside and decided to go around the guild another way. The new recruit said it would take a bunch of time, which made the leader stop. They thought about how best to proceed and came to the conclusion that they could pay some attention to Chu Tianju. The Blasphemer's Guild safely paid the fee before entering. The players resented why there was a fee to enter at all and wondered if they would need to pay next time. Chu Tiange, along with his staff, fought at level 19. The first to enter the battle was L, using her magic skill cane. The monsters were firmly chained together in spherical force fields. Chu Tiange joined the attack next, utilizing the Tsang Lun's burst. The opponents were torn apart and destroyed along with the chains in one powerful blow. Having partially recovered, the monsters were about to launch a counterattack. Before they could do anything, they were blown apart by the magnetic force field. Nubi was the next to enter the battle, using her healing skills on the young master. Protected by his partner's strength, Chu Tiange was ready to attack the enemies again. All the players collectively defeated the monsters and received a level increase. Young Master had reached level 20 and received an enhancement gift set. L, who was playing as Yao Li, noticed that her level was increasing with the Master much faster than before. The girls chatted amongst themselves that they wouldn't have been able to do so quickly without each other's help. The system alerted the Master about the activation of the dungeon mode, which caught the girls' attention. He explained to them that this mode was activated at a certain level, and a minimum of four players could enter it. L asked Chu Tiange if he could invite them since their level was lower. The young master opened the dungeon map on the screen and clicked on the squad creation icon. He dragged the icons of his friends to the still empty human headquarters. After making sure all the data was entered correctly, the master confirmed his choice. Some sort of glow appeared around the young master and the players he had chosen. All four players disappeared without a trace in the light of the beam that appeared in the same second. The players along with Ursh found themselves in a dungeon where the trees were marked with fire. Mao Yun didn't hear the conversation between the master and the girls and didn't realize where they had just gotten to. The master explained to his buddy what had happened, thus causing Mao to be childishly excited. A task was displayed on the screen with a time limit of half an hour and a specification of who exactly they were to attack to win. L asked the young master if quests are always limited in time and learned that this is not always the case. The healer suggested that they start by familiarizing themselves with the area. Going forward, the master remembered that he hadn't seen a secret merchant anywhere for a long time, and the players were expecting mythical beasts to appear. He asked Mao to return to the guild and immediately inform him when the secret merchant was encountered. The buddies told the master that they knew a very popular supplier to the imperial court from Europe in the city and advised him to pay him a visit. Suddenly, Ursha took a fighting stance as he heard something suspicious up ahead. He stopped and stepped out as if to protect the players, covering them with himself. The young master also heard something and warned everyone to be extremely careful. An army of monsters with red eyes were advancing towards the buddies from the darkness. Chu Tiange and Mao looked at the enraged monsters in confusion. Master tried to defuse the situation and jokingly suggested that they were Ursha's relatives. Ursha froze in place in bewilderment as if looking questioningly at the master. Nubi and Mao gingerly looked around them and saw red eyes everywhere. The red-eyed monster surrounded the foursome and came closer and closer to attack. The monsters rushed towards the master abruptly as he tried to joke around. The partners were surprised at Chu Tiange's calmness, and L.A. clarified that the young master didn't know what excitement was. The monsters began to attack all the players, and each of them used their strength and skill. Chu Tiange, among the pile of defeated monsters, tried to find his pet. Suddenly, the red-eyed monsters started howling loudly, picking each other up. Around everything going on, the boys heard some strange noise. Master heard the sound coming from where and quickly turned around to look. Chu Tiange was confused for a while as he saw the main monster on top of the cliff. In front of the players stood the quest boss, Werewolf Wolf King, whose ability scanning system was unable to scan. The Werewolf Wolf King looked at his fallen subordinates and let bright rays of light shoot out of his red eyes in different directions. The previously destroyed wolves lying on the ground began to disappear one by one. 
The players watched as the werewolf wolf king sucked in the bodies of the disappearing wolves. Mao realized that the boss was getting stronger at the expense of the smaller wolves, and the more they destroyed, the stronger the king would become. Nubi suggested that they should deal with the boss first and then the small wolves. Master liked Nubi's idea and asked him to cover him while he fought the boss. Chu Tiang'e quickly rushed towards the boss and immediately the battle began for everyone. He flew through the smaller wolves, deftly striking them with his spear strikes. The werewolf wolf king, with a stern grin, saw the master approaching him. He abruptly leapt to attack and flew straight at Chu Tiang'e. The master, defending himself, put out the tip of his spear in front of him, fending off the main boss's strike. The werewolf wolf king pushed the master far back with a powerful kick. Chu Tiang'e flies backwards but stops in a moment, breaking with his feet. He pushes himself off the ground hard and flies towards the boss for a counter-crushing attack. In flight, the master meets the boss, firing fiery arrows at him while defending himself from the enemy's powerful blows. Chu Tiang'e steps back to use the extra power from the engraving. Pointing it at the Wolf King, he summons a thunder that splits the sky. The boss caught in the engraving power is subjected to multiple attacks at once. The smaller wolves and players watched in amazement at the suffering of the main boss. As soon as the engraving power stopped, the boss jumped aside and the small wolves rushed towards him. They surrounded the king and began running in a circle until they gave their lives to restore the boss. The buddies didn't know the best course of action, because if they fought the small wolves at once, their boss would increase his energy at the expense of the fallen, and if they started with the king, his mutts would still come to his aid. The thought occurred to Mao to wipe out half of the small werewolves first. The master interrupted Mao's musings by saying that they would handle all of them at once. Mao didn't quite realize how it was possible to do that with such monsters. Chu Tiange only said with a chuckle that not all divine beings would like such a trick. The young master's formidable pet ran out to help the players with a bark. Chu Tiange, about to carry out his plan, told Ursh to run back. The pet didn't immediately understand why master wanted him to leave, but he didn't object. He quickly turned around and ran away, leaving the master and the other players on the battlefield. The werewolf Wolf King was already preparing to attack, glaring menacingly at the players. At his command, he and his army moved forward to attack the dungeon guests. Chu Tiange loudly commanded everyone to quickly run forward from the bloodthirsty pack. The pack of wolves rushed after the players from the forest along the cliffs at breakneck speed. The master shouted to Mao and Nubi to split up and lure the boss and the wolves into the gorge. For Ella, he left the task of setting a trap in the gorge and waiting for him there. All four of the fleeing men split off in different directions, leading the wolves behind them. The master, catching up with Ursh, asked him to run to Nubi to help lure the wolves faster. El quickly ran between the rocks looking for the right gorge to set the trap. She stopped to look around at the high cliffs and decided that this would be the perfect place for the trap. Chu Tiange led some of the pack away, opening the system screen as he went. He quickly dialed El and asked her how much longer he had to run away from the monsters. At the same time, Mao, Nubi, and Ursha were running away from the evil boss and the second part of the pack. After running around the rocks from different directions, they all met at the entrance of the right gorge. The master with an open screen informed them that they were all here just in time. Together they all quickly ran away from the angry pack with the boss right into the gorge. Ella just activated the traps and they went off as shields as soon as the wolves touched them. The entire army of monsters along with their boss got trapped and blew up on the shields they had set. The master wasted no time and attacked with a new attack, sky-shattering Hu. Chu Tiange, as usual, zigzags between the entire army of wolves with powerful blows. Mao marveled at the young master's combination of skills and strength like it was the first time. The players heard a world announcement congratulating the master and his team who had accomplished the first destruction in the Twilight Forest. The vendor of the Imperial Palace was Oracle Ju Fu, who wanted to level up as soon as possible to get on the quest. All four of them, led by the master, were returning to the Dragon Emperor's Palace with victory. The players at Chu Tiange's headquarters informed him of the arrival of the new people at the headquarters. They couldn't take their eyes off the richest Chu player and called him head at the request of the third brother. Lined up in several rows, they solemnly shouted loud greetings. The master suggested that the players familiarize themselves with the surroundings and borrow the blue clothes from Mao. 
Mao saw the surprised faces of the characters and added that after completing the quests, they would also be given purple gear in the future. The players were pleasantly shocked by the news, as they couldn't even dream of such a thing. Mao called everyone behind him to show them where they were and what was waiting for them. One of the players was walking behind them and was clearly unhappy with something or someone. Looking at the master with a slanting glance, he slyly thought that he would definitely figure out Chu Tiange's true identity. The game's world announcement congratulated everyone on their one month of playing the game and reaching over one billion players, and added that Era had organized a gift quest to celebrate. The wizard also heard from the announcement that the game would be unavailable for a while and realized that this time was necessary for investor shares. On the forum appeared one of the quests, UFO, in the starry sky, with raffles and cool gear, for which will be given a lot of incredible rewards to the first hundred winning players. L had also read that it would be possible to activate a UFO, and the master was already hoping to acquire one there. The girls read a heated discussion on the forum about a vendor from Europe and their chapter, which could not pass without a trace. The forum even posted a vote on the real winner in the person of Chu Tiange and the supplier with comments. Master had also logged onto the forum and tried to remember how he was so familiar with the name Oracle Ju Fu. The next day, Chu Tiange went to the arena with the teleportation hall. Once inside, the master was greeted by the system with the entrance to the Starry Sky UFO event and asked to throw coins into the machine to begin with. Without hesitation, Chu Tiange took out the coins he had prepared beforehand and threw them into the machine. The teleportation platform in the arena opened and the master began to move. Through the blue glow of teleportation, Chu Tiange began to discern some strange things. Having entered another dimension to complete a quest, the master still couldn't believe his eyes. A meteorite in outer space greeted the master in a friendly manner and offered him the choice of either single mode or race mode. Chu Tiange was under the impression that even the star here was talking and chose the race mode. Meteorite displayed the available UFO vehicles for the race. The master looked at the spaceship and its characteristics with great surprise. Chu Tiange immediately lit up at the idea of purchasing it and asked about it, to which he received a negative answer. The master polished a couple more ships and stopped his gaze on one of them. He scrutinized the spacecraft's stats, skills, and appearance. After coming to the conclusion that this UFO wasn't that bad, Chu Tianga made his final choice. Somewhere not far away from the master, first a blue tower appeared, and then the UFO itself. Deftly flying around planets and other meteorites, the ship finally came to a stop. Up close, it was quite huge and even more magnificent than in the picture in the system. Meteorite asked Chu Tiange to go inside and familiarize himself with the operation of the machine. The master sat in the cockpit of the UFO, and the system prompted him to select the appropriate skills for the apparatus. Going over all the capabilities of the spaceship, Chu Tiange was pleased to see that they were even cooler than the description. Following the instructions, he easily adjusted the course and viewing angle of the apparatus for successful races. Next in the ship's settings was the technical skill, coming as one of the main functions of the UFO. And last was the acceleration setting needed for race mode. The wizard checked once again all the settings he had chosen and was completely ready. The system alerted the wizard to the end of familiarization and the generation of the quest map with the enemy being randomized. The name of the randomly generated opponent was displayed on the screen, Oracle Ju Fu. The master had seen this name before and thought that they would meet faster than he expected. The spaceship was fully ready in the departure to the launch point. The master quickly figured out the controls, and even here he couldn't resist his famous zigzag. The space stands of the UFO quest were crowded with players, wanting to see everything with their own eyes. In one of the apparatuses, the leader of the Blasphemer's Guild sat and ordered a live broadcast to the regular players to increase their popularity. There was an announcement on behalf of the Blasphemer's Guild to start the live broadcast in five seconds. The leader was confident that this time it would work out and they wouldn't embarrass themselves like last time. One of the players in the grandstand was watching the poster of the races and called the others to watch, rather. No one wanted to get up, and the player excitedly announced that the final competition would be between God Chu and Oracle Vendor. The guild leader was about to start talking about UFOs when a new recruit informed him that their audience was dispersing somewhere. The Blasphemer's guild leader ran around the ship in bewilderment and asked what was wrong. 
On the 63rd track, two spaceships were preparing to launch. Oracle Jufu, sitting in his UFO, greeted God Chu and wished him good luck. Master Chu, looking at the vendor in response, similarly wished for a successful race. Announcing the imminent start of the race, the spaceships turned on the ignition. Both players were determined and wanted to see each other's strength. The LED indicator lit up with a color-coded countdown to the start. As soon as the indicator zeroed out, the start was announced and the race began. The master immediately gets a little ahead and notices some awards on the track. The rewards on the track include items such as gold and various expensive stones. On the monitor inside the UFO, information about the rewards picked up on the track appeared. Chu Tiange quickly noticed that collecting coins was slowing down the speed of the machine considerably. Oracle Ju Fu also noticed on the screen that the wizard ship had slowed down after collecting the coins. He smilingly remarked that there was only free cheese in a mouse trap. The vendor moved a little closer to the master still and pressed the firing button. The master, though, noticed that he had slowed down a bit, but there was no way he was expecting this. Several explosive shots flew into Chu Tiange's spaceship. One of the shots hit right into the wing of the master's apparatus, immediately exploding. The young master tried to dodge the blasts, but he was still unable to counter all of them at once. Because of the broken fan on the wing of Chu Tiange's ship, his apparatus severely lost speed. Oracle Ju Fu's oracle supplier surged forward at breakneck speed. Chu Tiang observed that the ship's energy was not lost after the impact, which was not the case with his speed. Ahead of the track, something resembling a playing cube could be seen in the embrace of fire. The master, racing on his opponent's tail, saw that there was a lottery ahead that could be both a trap and good luck. As he got closer and closer to the object, Chu Tiange noticed that it was the embodiment of a real dice. The master, without dropping his speed, dashed straight at the dice, thus activating it. The dice was thrown far off the track and began to spin on a trap or luck. Finally, it stopped spinning and showed the final value. The system congratulated the master for receiving the lucky reward of a first-class booster rocket. Chu Tiange, without hesitation, immediately put the lucky reward into action. The master did not even expect the spacecraft to gain such a powerful acceleration. In a split second, Chu Tiange's spacecraft turned a large gap from his opponent into a minimal gap. The players flew down the track towards the next incarnation of the dice, trap or luck. The first to hit the dice with his ship was the Oracle supplier. Trap or Luck flew spinning forward along the track, making its choice. As soon as she stopped, her value became six, and that implied one thing. The system congratulated the Oracle on receiving the lucky reward of invincible status for a full ten seconds. Small lights flashed around the vendor's spaceship. A moment later, his UFO was completely protected by a forceful fireball. The Master was once again surprised to see a protective hood around his opponent's machine. Players watching the live stream of the quest were impressed by the Oracle's agility. The vendor deftly drove around the next gold coins and stones, mindful of the slowdown on the track. The master was still trying to figure out what to do with the coins without collecting them directly. Chu Tiange found a gas projectile ability on the ship's panel and put it into action. The gas projectile ability threw the gold coins and stones forward towards the opponent. Even though Oracle carefully flew around all the rewards, it was as if they were magnetically drawn to him. The master was pleased that so far everything was going smoothly according to his well-thought-out plan. The Oracle did not immediately understand Chu Tiange's thought and only thanked him for the gifts. Chu Tiange, mindful of slowing down after the rewards, abruptly moved to overtake him. The young master did not yet know what his treacherous opponent was actually up to. With a single movement of his hand, Oracle Jufu pressed a button in the ship that was already familiar to him. Several explosive charges flew from the Oracle's apparatus into the Master's UFO at once. Chu Tiange decided to use the engraved shield as a defense. The defensive shield took the form of a triple ring around the wizard's ship. The young Master flew through the exploding projectiles, turning everything into a powerful explosion. Thanks to his engraved shield, he emerges from the fire and overtakes his opponent. Oracle did not expect at all that the wizard has an engraved shield with inscriptions. The vendor makes a full forward thrust, yanking the speed lever to maximum. His ship makes a powerful dash at breakneck speed, catching up with the master. The two rivals reach the finish line almost on equal footing. Crossing the gates of the finish line, the master is just centimeters ahead. Chu Tiange wins the race, beating Oracle Ju Fu by only a mere one second.
The spectators are shocked that even the supplier couldn't beat the master in the race. The rivals exchange handshakes in a friendly manner without losing their dignity. Round shields with screens appear in front of both players. A lotto drum with windows of several prizes is displayed. The system prompts you to click to start the lottery and both players click on it. The Oracle dreams of only one prize, to swap the winning and defeated player's time with each other. Chu Tiange, for his part, wants to become the owner of one of the spaceships. The master falls out some secret box with unknown contents. He realizes that he has been dropped out a gift box of materials and turns his attention elsewhere. At this time on the screen, the time of the rival race changes in favor of Oracle Ju Fu. The audience doesn't quite understand what's going on either, but one thing is clear. Oracle is now the winner of the race. A conversation ensues between the rivals and the master admits that he very much underestimated his abilities. The supplier excitedly offers the master another game and he agrees. Chu Tiange and Oracle Ju Fu compete in a great battle in the card game Dungeon Poker. The young master makes a move with pairs of aces and the vendor has nothing to beat him with. He remembers that the cards left in his hand will be against him in a future boss battle and the cards played will be in his favor. The master decides to discard a pair of threes, hoping to fulfill his plan. In response, the oracle moves a pair of kings, to which the wizard has nothing to put in response. On the next move, the vendor takes turns laying down a ten, a jack, a queen, and a king. The master sees a combination attack to effectively humiliate the boss further. A little flustered but not giving any sign of it, Chu Tiange calmly replies that he has nothing to beat. The oracle similarly lays out cards three through seven in order, which is a combo arrow. Chu Tianj thinks about the fact that everyone's abilities are the same, and he still has a chance to win. The oracle stands up and announces that he has no more cards and the game is over. The master realizes that the oracle has all the power in his hands and wonders if he always waits for the combination to fall out. Receiving an affirmative answer, Chu Tiange says that the oracle relies too much on luck. Suddenly, there is an incomprehensible sound and a strong wind rises. Master Chu quickly minimizes the game, teleporting it to his inventory. As expected, after the game ends, the main boss emerges from the forest for a battle. A giant bipedal upright monster with sharp claws stands in front of the players. At this moment, players activate their enhancement and weakening according to their completed card game. The evil giant steps its giant foot right on the players, wanting to crush them. The opponents manage to move back a little and are crushed by the giant monster's foot hitting the ground. Oracle loads lightning arrows into his crossbow and aims directly at the main enemy. Chu Tiange, after waiting out all the weakening, rushes straight at the giant to attack. Immediately, many different blows fly into the giant monster from both sides. The master approaches the very face of the monster and tries to pierce it with his spear, but immediately flies backwards. The giant boss spews a destructive roar of fire from its mouth. The oracle recharges his lightning arrows and fires at the angry monster without stopping. The giant is hit by all the fire arrows fired at once and explodes right on top of him. He begins to fall apart and lets out a piercing parting roar as he realizes his sad end. A moment later, there is a massive explosion at the spot where the giant giant was standing. Chu Tiange notices the vendor standing next to the boss and shouts to him to quickly move away so as not to get hurt. All that remains at the site of the explosion is a shroud of thick smoke and a completely unharmed oracle without a scratch. Oracle Ju Fu turns around and notices the surprised face of the young master and only giggles in response. At this moment, Chu Tiange realizes that he is still affected by the invincibility bonus caught in the race earlier. The guys don't have time to exchange a few words before the giant monster lunges at them again. The oracle quickly loads arrows into his crossbow and shoots at the monster with the same accuracy. Lastly, the supplier has prepared many arrows for the giant, piercing and penetrating straight through the heart. The giant runs straight at the players and at that moment gets all the arrows fired at him at once. There is a bright flash, followed by a powerful explosion that finally destroys the huge monster. A pile of good rewards and something else for defeating the boss appears in the air. The oracle isn't interested in gold, armor, or anything else. He snatches up an item that is new to him. The item, in the form of a family of crystals, is an artifact of the city of Shanann. The vendor, after examining the artifact he has received, tells the young master that he has won again. The master, unaccustomed to defeat, replies to him that this is not the end, and he will surely win back. Chu Tiange waits a couple of minutes and solemnly pulls out a card from his armor. 
He deftly tosses the previously stashed card to Oracle, and he looks at it with interest. The card is discarded with a forced exchange function between the players. In that same second, all the artifacts Oracle received move into Chu Tianju's hands, much to the supplier's surprise. The supplier did not understand how and when the young master had thought of and pulled off this trick. He also did not understand why the card did not turn into an enhancement when the boss appeared, but remained with him. The master smilingly pulled out a few more cards from his stockpile, explaining that there were a lot of them in the donations. The oracle only said that apparently the phrase Krypton doesn't change lives was a lie, to which the wizard replied that it does if you have a lot of it. The vendor, after a bit of frustration, decided to show the master one last thing. Chu Tiange was not in the least frightened, deciding that the one still somehow had a card against him. The oracle told him not to worry about anything and handed him his card. The young master took the business card with an exhale, which said that the oracle was the head of a trading company and could also organize unlikely quests. The master received a system alert with a friend request from Oracle, which he immediately confirmed. Chu Tiange realized what Oracle's main goal was, as it wasn't easy to get friends with God Chu. The system congratulated the players for successfully completing the dungeon poker quest. The characters, upon hearing the world announcement, didn't realize which dungeon was even in question. A conversation ensued between the unknown players on the subject of Oracle vendor Ju Fu. The blonde man was very angry about the fact that his players couldn't kidnap the Oracle as a last resort. The characters mumbled something and tried to justify themselves to the boss somehow. Liu Fei entered the building, insulting the worthless subordinates she thought she was. The blonde man quickly reminded her of her recent failure in joining the Dragon Emperor's palace. Liu Fei was more than pissed off by this. She was furious. The blonde man calmly told her that after she left the palace, his men were able to settle there without any problems. Liu Fei snootily walked away and the blonde man looked after her. The next monster with sharp claws was hit by several exploding shots at once. It turned into a mountain of ash, leaving behind only smoke and piles of broken rocks. The players collected the reward for their victory and told Oracle that he had become very popular after competing with God Chu. The Oracle only reminded them that they were merchants after all, and should be neutral towards the powerful players and not cling to all the powerful people in a row. Suddenly, he received alerts from the system about the sudden demise of his men, one after another. The supplier stared at the monitor in confusion and called his subordinates for clarification. The players began to take turns shouting out about Zhao's guild attacking them, and Oracle asked them to hide somewhere safe for the time being. After a bit of thought, he informed the other two players that he needed to leave the game. One of the characters became worried that someone was trying to expose the Oracle's real identity in this way. They looked silently at the still uncollected reward and wondered what to do with it. One of them said it would be a pity to lose it all if there were others waiting for them outside the quest as well. The vendor suggested that they just exchange all the rewards for gold coins. The players didn't realize who would buy so many rewards from them now and the oracle assures them that such a person exists. He also hands them teleport scrolls to travel to the Dragon Emperor's Palace, St. Itabashi Hospital at the Medical Faculty of the University of Japan. In the ward, with an unconscious patient lying behind a curtain, a guy wakes up in a gaming chair. The first thing the guy does is check the condition of the unconscious patient lying behind the curtain. He exhales, making sure the patient is fine and there is no change for the worse. A nurse came into the room and the guy immediately informed her that he was ready to pay for the necessary surgery. She looked at the guy in bewilderment and told him that all the expenses had been covered long ago. The guy was very surprised at what he heard, but his thoughts were interrupted by two bouncers who entered the room. One of them approached and called the boy by the name Oracle Ju Fu and asked him to talk to them about something. The young lord and his close friends chatted about the vendor and the recent attack on his guild. Chu Tiange was interested in such news and decided to find out for himself who he had already contacted. He quickly found the oracle icon with the call in the system and clicked on it. The master supplier didn't answer, and suddenly out of nowhere he appeared himself in front of them apologizing for his disappearance. He explained that he had some business to attend to, which was why he had disappeared so abruptly, but he had already sorted it out. Chu Tiange finished listening to the Oracle's story and informed everyone that since everyone was in place, he was starting the tiered quest. All four of them started moving around the area to the quest chosen by the master. 
The teleportation took some time and transported them to a sandy area. The young master immediately asked the oracle what had happened to his guild after all. The vendor spoke of the competitors about the items taken from them and remarked that they were on a quest of quite a high level of difficulty. Chutiange replied that on such an occasion, he was just going through it with him. The oracle decided to honestly admit that he really only needed one item out of everything. The master was a bit wary of such a statement from the vendor and listened to him carefully. The oracle informed Chu Tianju of a certain benefit card that hid a left account. The young master recalled that there was already such a gift in past donations. Chu Tianju is pulled out of his musings by the sound of sand shifting nearby. Suddenly, creepy poisonous scorpions rose out of the sand from nowhere. The master quickly commands all the players to attack the enemies to kill. The third brother shouts to Chu Tianju to leave the small enemies to them and go to fight the boss himself. The young master finds the powerful scorpion king and goes on the offensive straight at him. The oracle deftly loads his fiery arrows into his bow, aiming at the scorpions. The arrows, upon reaching the monsters, explode with them in a bright flash. Meanwhile, Master Chu stormed the scorpion king, using magic and physical skills together. He lightning fast flew around the king several times, delivering staggering blows. The scorpion boss was destroyed by a violent explosion, leaving behind only smoke. The other small scorpions began to vaporize in front of the players in the same second. The system displayed the rewards for winning this level of the quest. El started a conversation about the good rewards for the first level, much to Newbie's surprise. The players realized that Newbie was out of the loop and began to explain to her that this quest consisted of five levels, and the rewards for winning would be different everywhere. While everyone was examining the rewards they had received, the wizard suggested they move on. The system displayed a suggestion for Chu Tianju to accept the next level. The players bravely fight the wild octopuses in the second level and win. In the next level, they fight evil mummies in armor and come out of there victorious as well. Moving on to the fourth level, the players victoriously attack a huge ogre. The system prompts the master to advance to the final level, with the condition that if any of the players are destroyed, the entire team will automatically be counted as defeated in the entire quest. The young master chooses to confirm the conditions and teleports to the final level with the others. They find themselves in a snowy forest which leads Nubi to childlike admiration. At this time, Chu Tianju receives a video call from Mao informing him that the Dragon Emperor's palace is surrounded. The master looks at Mao in confusion, not knowing what to reply. Many armed players have gathered around Chu Tiange's guild. Mao Yun was worried that the guild leader had entrusted him to guard the palace and right now they were surrounded by enemies and wanted to capture them. The leader of the Blasphemer's Guild and a blonde man, who turned out to be Zhao Shu, approached the palace and challenged Mao to fight them. A system alert appeared in front of the leaders to pay the toll for further passage. The head of the Blasphemer's and Zhao's guild leader read the alert with expressed displeasure. Zhao objected because he had come to take over the palace not to pay him, but the blasphemer's leader assured him that he would be paid back in full after the plan was successful. In the Chu Tiange Guild news chat room, there was a heated discussion about the player's future plan of action until the master returned. Third brother suggested that they return to the guild right now to avoid the seizure of the palace warehouse. The master didn't know the exact plan of action yet, but one thing was certain. If the palace was captured, he would consider himself defeated. The players were discussing amongst themselves why the palace was being attacked now that they had reached the final level. Everyone paid fleeting attention to Oracle Ju Fu, who had never once supported the conversation about attacking the palace in the entire time. The master quickly brought them out of their thoughts and shouted to run to attack. All five of them charged and ran towards the horned monsters. The third brother even managed to encourage everyone, saying that the sooner they finished the battle, the sooner they would get out of there. The players worked together and each used their own skill and familiar techniques. Between the snow-covered Christmas trees, something huge and powerful floated towards the players. A giant snow woman, Yukiana, appeared before them in a snowy whirlwind. The master, as usual, was not intimidated by the impressive size of the monster and called everyone to a showdown with the ice block. The snow Yukiona, seeing the impending attack, prepared to retaliate. The players simultaneously began to fight against the ice woman who had put up protective shields in front of her. 
Chu Tiange felt a sudden frosty feeling from somewhere and searched for the reason with his eyes. Yuki Ana's protective shields turned into weapons that shot blocks of ice and snow. The snow woman directed the powerful force of all the shields at once against her opponents. While they were being swept off their feet and covered in snow, the young master remembered that her attacks would reduce their strength and cause them to lose their lives. Chu Tiange remembered the condition of the final quest level and summoned a loyal pet to help. In the middle of the snowy battle, the formidable Ursha appeared, ready to use the skill. The master commanded El to use the magic circle of Hu's seal to seal the Snow Queen and left the healing task for Nubi. Nubi quickly reacted to the master's order and said not to worry about it. El also obediently called out to Ursh to run after her and keep up. The master and third brother were at this time fighting the boss with the compound of a fierce dragon slashing the ground and fiercely glittering swords. With their rebellion, they had only angered Yukiona even more and she was preparing to retaliate. The Snow Queen created a huge spiraling vortex, throwing her opponents far back. At this time, Ursha with his provocation skills had just arrived. The Snow Queen was immediately attracted by the loud barking of the beast and stopped her attack for a while. The players looked at the distracted Yuki Ona with the realization that the dog's provocation was working. The young master watched as Oracle Ju Fu loaded an arrow into the crossbow, pulling the string hard for the shot. The provider was still holding the arrow firmly in his hand, as if concentrating on the shot. Chu Tiange menacingly asked him how much longer he would stall for them. The oracle clearly did not expect such a question, and out of surprise, he released the arrow without looking. The fiery arrow quickly flew past, right at the snow woman's head. The vendor seemed as if he didn't understand what was wrong and asked the master what he meant. Chu Tiange replied that El Seal was still in effect for another three minutes and he had one chance to explain himself. After a moment, he added that he wanted to hear what was so important that prompted him to help the Blasphemer's Guild and the Zhao Guild. Oracle Ju Fu visibly quieted down and became nervous, clutching his crossbow tightly in his hand. He tried not to show it, and said that he didn't understand what was going on, and he was just participating in the quest like everyone else. Suddenly, the master launched his spear at the vendor standing with his back to him. The oracle did not immediately notice the flying weapon and could not dodge the blow completely. The other players noticed what was happening and watched everything with noticeable surprise. Chu Tianga's spear grazed the oracle's shoulder, and he shouted to ask what the oracle was doing. The young master, without changing his expression, still continued to stare menacingly at the oracle. The players were so engrossed in what was happening that they seemed to have forgotten about the battle until they heard Ursh barking. He was quickly running in their direction, leading the evil Snow Queen behind him. The third brother, upon seeing the Queen, was discussing with Nubi their future plan of action. He quickly dialed L on the screen, who said that Yuki Ona should never leave the Hu Seal area. The third brother accepted L's order and called for the other players to run forward. At this time, the master and the vendor were waging their own war, attacking each other. The oracle shouted to the master that if he destroyed him, he would be breaking a condition of the quest and all their efforts would be in vain. The master merely replied that he wasn't interested in the quest, the rewards, or any of that, and would quietly destroy it and head back to the first level. He deftly dodged the oracle's flying lightning arrows with a cool somersault. After finishing the firefight for the time being, the young master landed and looked straight into oracle's eyes. Chu Tiange clarified that he was only staying here to hear the truth, but if that didn't happen, he would end it and return to the beginning of the quest. The vendor drew his arrow tightly and seemed ready to shoot, but he didn't dare. Chu Tiange didn't back down and kept asking why he had agreed to help some scoundrels and wasn't afraid of the wrath and vengeance of God Chu himself. The oracle still wasn't going to shoot anymore, and lowering his crossbow with a loaded arrow, he decided to tell everything. Standing with his head down in front of the master, he began to talk about his sick sister who had been threatened by these scoundrels. The master put the whole puzzle together. The oracle wanted to use Zhao to attack the palace and save his younger sister in the meantime, and the benefit card was needed to further hide the identity from the left account. Oracle didn't know what to say for himself. After all, master was absolutely right. Suddenly, Chu Tiange heard the voices of his men calling out to him for help. He turned around to see what was happening on the battlefield and saw that the Snow Queen had the advantage. The master quickly opened the player's health screen and saw that everyone already had less than half. 
He remembered the terms of the quest again and quickly moved to help his friends. Powerfully pushing off from the ground, Chu Tiange flew into the snow woman's attack. With a single jump, he reached her and used a new Sang Lun tearing technique. Chu Tiange launched an explosive spear strike with a trail of fire and sparks. Without delay, his next attack was thunder that shook the sky. The young lord seemed to absorb the energy of the lightning and thunderstorm and attacked Yuki Ona with burning eyes. He sent several dozen paralyzing lightning and fire blasts at her. Looking at the intimidating master, the third brother said that he was very scary in anger. Elle came over to the guys, and after noticing the attacking master, she wondered why all the bosses of their chapter were given so easily. She immediately realized that Hugh's battle order that she had drawn up earlier was completely useless. The players were snapped out of their musings by a powerful nuclear explosion spilling over the entire clearing. The system displayed the information that the level 5 boss had been destroyed, and the multi-level quest was over. The third brother, looking at the monitor, rejoiced at their victory in the final level of the quest. L, for her part, was looking forward to receiving the coolest rewards for all levels. The oracle quickly opened the monitor and began to look through all the rewards he had received. He realized in a panic that he wasn't seeing what he needed and became visibly upset. The young master mockingly noted that his luck seemed to have turned away from him, as the benefit card did not fall out. The world announcement congratulated all five players for completing the tiered quest. Zhao and the leader of the blasphemers heard the announcement, but decided that they would manage before they returned. Looking at the large protective dome of the Dragon Emperor's palace, they thought about how to get through it. Mao Yun, who was inside the dome, looked at the army outside and shouted invitations for them to enter. A new recruit informed the leader that a group of poison kings had weakened the magic barrier around the palace, and they could attack at any moment. The leader loudly commanded the far group of warriors to cover and the near group to storm in. Both groups accepted the leader's order and took their defensive and attacking positions as ordered. They smashed and shelled the protective dome from all sides with all available weapons. A while later, they managed to break through the magical barrier and break through inside. Mao Yun noticed that the defense was shattered and panicked as he began to think about what they should do next. He quickly thought about the fact that the head didn't allow him to hire many people, which would have come in handy right now. A loud sound of damage to the guild's main gate was heard. The attacking players shouted that the main gate had been destroyed and it was safe to move forward to attack. Mao Yun ran away from the warden's post and shouted for everyone to hold on to the last and not retreat. Zhao Shu announced to his men to attack everyone and go up to the third floor for the main target. Mao heard this and wondered how they knew the warehouse was on the third floor, because that meant they had a rat. He ran with his subordinates and shouted to everyone to protect the warehouse at the cost of their lives. Suddenly the clouds thickened and a noise was heard through the purple lightning. From the clouds, a menacing voice asked who it was that had come to the guild and was disturbing the guild's sweet sleep. Zhao Shu and the leader of the blasphemers were puzzled as they tried to look at who was speaking. In an embrace of lightning, a golden phoenix descended menacingly from the heavens, informing them that the palace was his sanctuary and promised to destroy anyone who disturbed his sleep. Mao saw the guild's guardian beast and shouted that they were now saved. The attackers discussed amongst themselves what kind of beast was in front of them and how to fight it. The leader of the blasphemers quickly opened the screen, reading the information about the bird. Zhao smugly stated that some bird wouldn't be able to undo their attack. The golden phoenix flew straight towards the guild headquarters, scattering everyone in its path. It spewed annihilating flames with fury, fulfilling its formidable promise of revenge. In one swift movement, he explosively tore down towards the attackers. The players only had time to see the bird's huge iron paws flying straight at them. The golden phoenix rammed into everyone who didn't manage to escape, making a long depression in the ground. The guardian beast, from where it would stop, began to sizzle the army of enemies with wild fire. The guild leader looked regretfully at his entire fallen army of the melee line. Zhao Shu commanded the dumbfounded players to shoot arrows at the golden phoenix. As soon as the phoenix soared above them, the players loaded their arrows into their crossbows and began firing. The enraged guardian proceeded to use its favorite destructive roar. As soon as it opened its jaws, the attackers flew to different corners along with their weapons. Mao Yun and his staff men also fell under the general attack and defended themselves from the powerful phoenix attack. 
As soon as he heard the first chirp of the Guardian creating an entire vortex, he ran as far away as he could at breakneck speed, knowing what was coming next. He hid in one of the guild buildings, looking at the players flying in different directions from the sounds of the bird. Mao noticed that the lower-level players couldn't do anything against the Guardian Beast, just like he had done when he was still a Phoenix boss. Zhao, the leader of the Blasphemers and the new recruit, were waiting with dread for the bird's chirp to end. They talked amongst themselves that the power and energy of this beast was too strong and perhaps they should retreat before it was too late. The guild leader didn't want to give up in any way, but he still pondered over the words about retreating. Mao knew that they would not be able to defeat the palace keeper and was going to find that rat in the guild headquarters. The guys, having finished the quest, all gathered together, and the oracle began to say that there was no more point in bickering. He continued the story of how the villains found his sick sister and threatened to kill her if he didn't keep the wizard on the quest while they looted the warehouse on the third floor of the palace. The players were infuriated by this behavior of the insolent men, and Nubi asked why they had chosen Oracle Ju Fu in the first place. The master explained that since Oracle didn't side with them, they were afraid that he would join the ranks of our guild, and in the case of a setup, I would break any relationship with him, and so they would kill two birds at once. The Oracle made no more excuses and simply admitted that he was very guilty in front of him. The young master took out some kind of card, and third brother didn't understand what he was going to do. After a moment, Chu Tiange deftly launched the card straight at the vendor. The oracle turned the card over and saw that it was the very same benefit card hiding the left account. While he was looking at the card in utter confusion, Chu Tiange informed the players to return to the palace as soon as possible. Waking up from his incomprehension of what was happening, oracle called out to the young master. Chu Tiange continued walking forward, but he heard the oracle well when he thanked him. He only reminded him of their arrangement whereby the benefit card would go to him and the master would take everything else. The players had already stood on the teleportation platform and Chu Tiange told Oracle to step out to check the card. Moving over, the third brother told Chu that he was a good man, to which the third brother replied that he just wanted to bypass the cunning Zhao. All four moved on to the palace, leaving Oracle Ju Fu to watch their remaining trail. He seriously pondered over the young master's last words about quitting. Scattered all over the Dragon Emperor Palace were the fallen players from the Golden Phoenix attack. They were even on the rooftops and half-destroyed buildings of the Master Guild. The survivors of Zhao, the leader, and the new recruit were cautiously peeking out from around the corner. They were checking to see if the Phoenix had flown away and if there was any other danger on their way back. The players were about to leave when they heard someone behind them menacingly order them to stop. Just then... The master and his friends returned to the palace and found the attackers trying to escape punishment for what they had done. Mao Yun and the surviving players ran to meet the young master. Chu Tiange began to talk about how they had forced a good man to frame him, for which he had already paid in full, and now the same fate awaited them. Zhao and the leader of the blasphemers tried to ridiculously threaten the master. They quickly took out their teleportation scrolls and opened them to quickly move to a safer place. The teleportation for some reason didn't work and they tried again, but still nothing happened and the leader stared at the scroll. Zhao asked what was wrong and only heard from the leader that they weren't working for some reason. The young master decided to intervene and explained to them that as long as the phoenix was flying over the palace, they wouldn't be able to use their scrolls. Zhao was already loading an arrow into his crossbow and said that in that case, they would fight to the last man. The leader fired the shotgun and Zhao released an arrow from the crossbow. The master deflected their blows with ease and asked how much longer they would resist the inevitable. With a sharp jump, he reached his enemies in the same second without letting them reload. Chu Tiange landed a pair of cross blows, followed by a bright explosive flash. Zhao and the leader of the blasphemers were destroyed and their souls were leaving their bodies. The young master angrily turned around to the still surviving recruit. The recruit was already preparing to take out an arrow and said that he would definitely avenge everything on him someday. Before they could realize anything, the players looked on in amazement at what was happening. While the new recruit's soul was flying towards the tunnel, he managed to shout to the master that they would meet again. Mao whispered to the master that there was a rat in their guild, to which the master replied not to worry. Mao Yun, completely trusting Chu Tianzhu, obediently nodded and said, That's right. 
Master plunged into thinking about how best to deal with Oracle Ju Fu's situation. A white van was rushing down the road of the night city at breakneck speed. The tired guy carefully took off his gaming nano goggles to exit the game. He exhaled slowly and the nurse asked him if he was all right. The worried guy immediately asked the girl about the condition of the sick nurse. One of the people sitting in the front asked the boss, addressing the guy if he had figured out the game. The guy, aka Oracle Ju Fu, noticed the guy had bruises and abrasions all over his face and started to recognize how he got them. The guy in the front began to explain that he had gotten the injuries during a small conflict with the Zhao family. The Oracle startled and began to ask for details of what had happened to him. The injured boy began to tell what had happened to them about an hour ago. In the beginning, Oracle called him and told him that two thugs had threatened him and asked him to do something for them, and so he and his sister needed to be taken out of the hospital as soon as possible. The guy, of course, agreed, saying he would take care of everything and make arrangements with the hospital. He drove the van at full speed to the hospital's emergency exit in the underground parking garage. Pulling up there, the guy and his partner quickly ran after the boss and his sick sister. Next, the guy told Oracle that they did everything exactly according to plan until they met some of Zhao's men in the garage. He explained that there were too many of Zhao's men and they had to fight. When they were on the verge of defeat, an unknown person appeared. This person who appeared was young Master Yin Li's butler. When Zhao's men saw the stranger, the entire crowd rushed at him with fists. The guy went on to tell how the butler quickly dispersed everyone and helped take away their boss along with his sister. Oracle Ju Fu, after hearing the story to the end, looked in the rearview mirror and asked Yin Li if he was their savior. The butler nodded his head affirmatively and said that it was Chu Tiange who sent him to help them. The oracle was at a complete loss after hearing this and couldn't help but ask who Chu Tiange really was. The butler calmly replied that Chu Tiange was just an ordinary player and there was no need to worry about it. In the Zhao mansion, the entire family gathered in the meeting room around a long table. They were watching the game's news portal about the failed attack on the Dragon Emperor Palace and Chu Tiange's might. The broadcast was interrupted by a dark figure that suddenly appeared on the screen that was already familiar to them. The Zhao family knew exactly why the stranger had contacted them and what was about to happen. The stranger from the screen asked the family father if taking over the warehouse in Chu Tiange Palace was his genius plan. The head of the family bowed and replied that it was just an accident and they would fix it soon. The stranger interjected that this was the first time they had an accident and said that their family would no longer be able to be used in the future. After these words, the dark figure disconnected the connection and the father was still trying to change his mind somehow. Lastly, they heard words of imminent reprisal against the entire Zhao family. Zhao Shu couldn't listen to this and see his father depressed anymore and jumped up shouting that all of this was stupid and had no meaning. He shouted furiously that he would deal with Chu Tiange himself, and then the Singularity Organization would regret his words. Meanwhile, in the Singularity Organization, six men were having a conversation about their next actions. One of them was saying that the biggest obstacle for them in the era was Chu Tiange. They decided to go to another game country where Chu Tiange would not be able to enter due to his insufficient level. The man from the six walked up to one of the halls and opened the door to it. He stood in front of a bunch of identical people and said that he would create such a team in just ten days. In the Martial Arts Guild, the workers were laboring almost nonstop. The young lord came to the guild with a request to upgrade his spear and learned that certain materials were required. The worker also clarified that it was impossible to do anything right now, as the materials were in other countries that could not be reached due to insufficient levels. The master asked if the spear could be transferred in another way and the worker told him about the secret merchants. Chu Tianga remembered that he had just recently seen that very merchant somewhere. At this time, the secret merchant was offering his large selection of rare goods to the players. Meanwhile, he thought about how stupid these players were and decided not to procrastinate any longer. The master, who was still in the martial arts guild, called up the game system screen. He got into a dialogue with the second brother, from which he learned that there was some kind of organization that controlled many people and deprived them of territories with all the materials. The second brother spoke briefly about the activities of this organization and specified that he had never seen them go offline yet. 
Two guards stood at the post of the teleport portal with the transition to Song Country. The players watching them from hiding were a bit surprised at such a small number of guards. They were about to start the operation, but Second Brother commanded them to wait. The Second Brother quickly wrote to the Master that he would recruit people for the stealth attack and hand over all the materials to him after the capture. Suddenly, very close by, he heard the crunching of branches and a suspicious noise. The second brother had not yet finished talking to the master and shouted for everyone to stand down as they were surrounded. The players were surrounded on all sides by armed mercenaries flying at them. The mercenaries turned out to be mighty ninjas with throwing blades and swords. The ninjas launched their weapons, leaving a trail of fire behind them. The second brother managed to put up a protective shield and deflect many blows. He turned around to look at his men and saw them being struck by blades and swords. The ninjas, having finished with all but the second brother, flew straight at him. He took a fighting stance and began to defend himself, not intending to run. The second brother used the power of his shield and powerfully pushed everyone aside. Unfortunately, he didn't see all the ninjas, especially the one flying at him from behind with a sharp blade. He was still in contact with the young master and quickly told him that he couldn't deflect the blow. The master at this time was texting the second brother to be careful and let him know how it went. The system alerted him that the message had not been delivered, which meant only one thing. An alert appeared on the master screen with second brother's icon crossed out. Chu Tiange already knew for sure that second brother had been sent to the other world by someone. After successfully reviving, second brother's subordinates would walk beside him and discuss the next course of action. The second brother was against it as the opponents were professionals at their job and then the player suggested gathering more people for the next attack. The second brother expressed his doubts about the group of people who had attacked them, as they were quite good at martial arts themselves, but they had fallen so quickly. The other player suggested calling the strongest fighter to their aid, but his interlocutor saw no point in it, as they should avenge themselves. The second brother received a message on his screen that someone from his headquarters named Pineapple Rice is gathering fighters against the guild that attacked their boss. The first player looks at the message with excitement and says he's going to go fight too. The second character remembers former battles with Pineapple Rice and is apprehensive to give up the idea. The second brother says that there is no need to be afraid of her, as she has always been looking for a dueling opponent like God Chu, so she overreacts. The first player knows the power of Pineapple Rice and interjects to ask if she can still win. The second brother suggests the subordinates not to speculate and go see for themselves with their own eyes. Chu Tiange wrote a message to the second brother asking what happened to them at the teleport crossing and asking for their coordinates. The second brother said that they had been attacked by the strangers, but they would deal with it themselves, as even a young master couldn't move to another country. Chu Tiange still insisted that he send the exact coordinates of his guild, and the second brother obediently sent them to him. The master was walking through the streets of Chainan City in the Tang country with the intention of finding someone. A young geisha at the counter was telling him that fresh maple berries had just arrived this morning to enhance the healing medicines. The master asked the geisha if she had any medicines for the long journey and took out a talisman from his pocket. Seeing the talisman, the geisha immediately realized that it was a pass to all lands, which could only be given to him by a vagabond from an alley with a hidden task. She said with a smile that this rare flower on the talisman belonged to their house of Baiwalu, and it would definitely not disappoint the noble son. The geisha gestured for the young master to come inside their mysterious guild. Showing the surroundings of their home, she said that they had finally waited for such an important person for their country. Unexpectedly at this moment, a system screen with a task appeared in front of the master. He was invited to take part in the hidden mission, Song Country Renaissance. After studying all the given information on the hidden mission, the master immediately confirmed the invitation. Chu Tiange clarified to the geisha that he wanted to visit the Song Country, and she asked him to follow her. On one of the walls inside the building hung a poster that the geisha was about to take down. Finished, she asked the master to give her a talisman with a flower from their house. There appeared to be a certain shaped notch in the wall into which the talisman fit perfectly, which now served as a key. The key activated the opening and the walls slowly moved apart in a certain order. The master watched with bated breath and began to realize what was in front of him. In front of him was a teleportation point to all the various countries of the game. The geisha informed the young master that he could go, 
but warned him that he would be on the outskirts of the chosen country, which could be very dangerous. The master thanked the geisha and entered the portal, indicating the Song country. There was a lightning explosion in one of the glades on the outskirts of Kaifeng. The powerful explosion turned into a blinding pillar, which was noticed by a merchant who was just nearby. Turning around, he wondered where there could be players from in such a remote location. The secret merchant didn't think long and decided that he would make a fortune now. The navigation map that appeared identified the new location of the master. Although Chu Tiange knew where he was, he was still excited and a little surprised. The young master saw a familiar figure rushing towards him from afar. Taking a closer look at the approaching figure, he recognized it as a secret merchant. Upon reaching the master, the merchant froze in surprise and thought of only one thing. Why him? Player Pineapple Rice stood at the gates of the Strangers Guild, bounding a couple of old-timers by the stone. Putting her spear forward, she demanded to summon their ringleader immediately. One of her subordinates came out of the gate and reported that the ringleader was not present, and afterward inquired what she was going to do next. Pineapple Rice was at the subordinate's face with a powerful shove, saying she would fight them until he came. The subordinate flew to the ground after receiving several strong punches and replied that there was no point in even talking about it since no one was coming. She dragged him by the leg to a rock to tie him up like the others and added that none of them knew how to fight. Before she could carry out what she had planned, she saw four soldiers with spears come out of the gate. Pineapple Rice cheerfully counted them and asked them where they were hiding earlier. She continued to speak to them, switching to threats as they readied their thunder cannons. Finished speaking, the girl watched as they charged their spears with lightning. The soldiers brought their weapons forward and moved to attack the girl, who also ran out to counterattack. Their spears with sparks met in midair, striking each other hard. Pineapple Rice deftly defended herself from the sharp weapon of one of her opponents. She accelerated to the limit and ran in a circle, thus knocking back three of the warriors advancing on her at once. While Pineapple Rice was delivering her crushing blows, she noticed the gaze of a fourth soldier, still not engaged in the battle. It occurred to her that the soldier was tracking and memorizing her movements and moves. Turning sharply, she reprimanded the fourth soldier for not being able to analyze her shortcomings in combat. She continued to single-handedly attack the three soldiers, beating them badly. The girl decided to take the battle to the next level and use the Thunder Roar skill. With one dissecting fiery strike, she threw all three of them far back. The alien guild soldiers were thrown high into the sky and then swept into a powerful blast wave, causing irreparable damage. The girl grinned as she looked at the cooling bodies of the soldiers in the pit, formed after the explosion. Pineapple Rice was engrossed in her own victory and forgot about the quadruped soldier she had noticed too late. He decided to attack her from behind and was already flying fast with his spear. The girl didn't have time to dodge the blow of the fourth soldier, who landed in front of her after a successful attack. After landing, the soldier was sure to send her straight to the revival field. The soldier walked towards the place where he thought the reward would lie for him, but he saw something completely different. He couldn't believe that instead of the reward, there was a still half-dead girl lying on the ground. One of the second brother's men crawled up to her unnoticed to make sure she was alive. He asked her if she was alive and added that she was lucky as they had gotten there in time. Pineapple Rice, hearing about the luck, gathered all her strength and pushed the player away from her. She jumped up and started yelling about how it wasn't luck at all, and she wasn't as easy to finish her off as he thought. The second brother and another player finally reached the scene and asked the girl about her condition. Seeing the army of soldiers, he immediately warned everyone that there was clearly something wrong with these guys. Pineapple Rice said that she had to deal with them and then wasn't sure what damage had already been done to her. She also added that the soldiers were very ambiguous, as one half of them were professionals and the other half were misfits, and together it was as if they were making a trade-off in battle. There was nothing left but to engage the soldiers in battle, and the girl suggested that everyone rally together. One soldier stepped forward, saying that many were eager to get their spears, but it would never happen. The second brother led his men into battle and shouted for everyone to be ready to attack. The two armies furiously flew at each other, putting their weapons forward. The second brother's subordinate decided to use the double-blade gravity technique. Flying lightning fast through several soldiers, the subordinate struck them with fiery blows. 
The soldier who had offended the girl last time announced the end of the warm-up and his entry into the game. His spear began to be covered in magical power from tip to hilt. The other players continued to attack each other to defeat. The soldier with the spear imbued with magical power moved to attack the second brother's subordinate. The subordinate dodged the blows as best he could using all his strength. After waiting for time, he launched a powerful strike at the enemy from his side. The soldier stopped for some reason and as if he was thinking of something, looking at the second brother's men. Suddenly, the second brother and the other players felt a strange change throughout their bodies. The subordinate didn't immediately notice what was happening and continued to attack the strong opponent. The second brother and his men were poisoned by the soldier's magic spear and were literally falling over. Finally, the subordinate sensed something and turned around to see what had happened. The soldier was standing in front of everyone with a poison core enchantment skill with a hidden poison king class. The second brother realized that it was a poison skill and the subordinate was poisoned along with them, who would now take a lot of damage during his own attack. The soldier confirmed the second brother's words and said that they would finish each other off themselves. With a sharp movement, he once again struck the subordinate, first on the shoulder and then on the leg. The soldier looked at his wounded opponent and asked him to get up and finish the fight with dignity. He walked over to his subordinate and put his spear to his cheek, ordering him to fight. Pineapple Rice, watching them, was visibly worried about her subordinate and shouted to him not to give up. The soldier swiped the tip of the spear across his subordinate's cheek with a single movement of his hand, leaving a deep mark. The second brother's team was still trying to defend and fight, shouting insults towards the soldier. The soldier didn't care about their unflattering remarks, only adding that no one could ever defeat them. One of the players yelled to his subordinate to leave the fight and go offline immediately. He tried to defend his buddy and quickly ran to attack the soldier. The soldier wasn't about to give up either and quickly took a fighting stance, gripping his spear tighter. With one powerful strike, he threw the player far back with his spear. The subordinate was terrified and the soldier took advantage of this and taunted him. He also decided to check with his opponents to see if they were wondering why their reinforcements weren't coming up. The girl took the hint at his direct involvement and started yelling what he had done to them. The soldier, looking into his second brother's eyes, told him that his men were standing at the teleportation point and would destroy anyone who tried to pass through. The subordinate was about to use the teleportation platform, but something didn't go according to plan. He managed to start moving, but the soldier disrupted the teleportation while asking him how far he was going. The soldier knocks the subordinate out of the teleporter with his spear with a sharp jolt. The rest of the other members of the second brother's team look on in amazement. Virtually unmoving, the subordinate lies wounded on the cold ground. He rises up and tells the soldier to finish him off, for he is still alive and breathing. The soldier replied that he had already made all the inquiries about him and was aware of his self-detonation skill, which would work on everyone standing nearby if he was killed. The subordinate had nothing to say to this and just got angry at his own helplessness. The soldier asked if this skill could destroy his own allies on the field and offered to test it. He swung his magic spear over the wounded subordinate and was about to take the last and final step. The subordinate still didn't believe what was happening and didn't want to leave the battlefield. The soldier was already close to the reprisal as suddenly fiery arrows slammed into his spear. He looked at the flaming arrows and could not understand where they came from. At this moment, everyone present on the battlefield heard a violent rumble. A shroud of thick smoke appeared and a figure became visible. A soldier looked at the appeared person in bewilderment and asked him who he was and what he was doing here. In front of him stood a tall, long-haired man in a hat, clenching his fists menacingly. The hatter turned to his subordinate to get out and added that he would handle it himself. The soldier again didn't like the fact that the subordinate wanted to teleport and was going to stop him. He rushes at breakneck speed towards the hatter and the slipping subordinate. The hatter strikes first, firing several fiery arrows at the enemy at once. The soldier defends himself and deftly throws the arrows away with his spear. The hatter prepares for his next attack using his usual skills. He creates a powerful vortex around him and fires more fire arrows at the soldier. The soldier can't handle so many hits and finds himself wounded in different places at the same time. He definitely has no idea who is in front of him or how this is even possible. The girl reveals the mysterious identity of the Hatter to everyone, calling him the Great Warrior Yin Li. Meanwhile, the Hatter, a.k.a. the Butler, fires automatic arrows.
The arrows fly with lightning force towards the already losing soldier. They fly through him, creating several bright flashes at once. Butler delivers his final blow and the soldier explodes on the spot. The nearby alien guild soldiers fly off from the powerful blow. The Hatter loads the next automatic arrows for another attack. The butler fiercely fires them at the surviving opponents. The soldiers literally stare their approaching demise in the eye, not knowing what else to do. Players watch as automatic arrows pierce the soldiers. The souls of the alien army began to ascend to the relocation tunnel for further rebirth. The admiring girl looked at the battlefield and the mighty hatter with interest. Pineapple Rice hopefully decided that Yin Li would take her to train with him. The second brother gestured for the girl to shut up and ask the hatter why he had helped them after all. The butler replied that it wasn't his idea at all. The young master had asked him to do it. The second brother and the Pineapple Rice were surprised and a little tense for some reason. While the three of them were talking, the new army of the Stranger Guild was already on the offensive. Soldiers with spears surrounded the trio from all sides and were preparing to destroy them. The Hatter soldier, who had been defeated in the previous battle, announced his new reinforcements. Pineapple Rice didn't understand how he managed to survive after everything that had happened to him. The second brother told the butler that if they went into battle mode, they wouldn't be able to get out, and there were quite a few opponents. The wounded soldier still wouldn't calm down and shouted that he wouldn't let them leave this place alive. The second brother was already preparing a protective shield while everyone else was loading their weapons. At the same time, a powerful pillar of bright light appeared behind everyone in the battle. Everyone froze in anticipation of someone or something from the blinding stream of light. The glow began to fade and out of it came some warrior with a weapon. The warrior turned out to be none other than Master Chu Tiange, who had come to the aid of his friends. The terrified army looked up to see God Chu already preparing to attack. The young master soars above everyone and uses his earth-splitting dragon technique. A tremendous explosion occurs, sending small sparks flying everywhere. The wounded soldier, being in the epicenter of events, looks at everything happening in confusion. The master, having finished the job, calmly returns to his friends, leaving dozens of departing souls behind him. The second brother cheerfully greets the boss with genuine joy. The butler also greets the young master, who thanks him for a job well done. Pineapple Rice looks admiringly at the richest player, Chu Tiange. The army, upon hearing the name of God Chu, panicked and began to discuss where he came from. A wounded soldier, without giving up hope, told the soldiers that it was a fake Chu player and they should defeat him immediately. The soldiers once again surrounded the company of friends in order to destroy them as soon as possible. They rushed at the players and a huge nuclear flash happened. The wounded soldier grinningly repeated his words about the fake and rejoiced in victory. Through the dissipating shroud of smoke, part of the defense dome could be seen. The wounded soldier clearly did not expect this turn of events and opened his mouth in amazement. When the smoke finally cleared, the soldiers saw that the protective dome was created by Chu Tiange himself. Second brother was also surprised by Big Brother's new power and learned from him that it was his new shield. Chu Tiange was about to leave the shield and commanded everyone to stay inside the protective dome. The young master stepped out of the dome and announced to all the soldiers that he was the very real Chu Tiange, and they could easily verify it right now. Chu Tiange, holding his spear in fiery lightning, used a powerful thunder lotus technique. Flaming lightning bolts spread across the entire battle area, demolishing everything in their path. The alien soldiers were still recovering from the paralyzing effects of the lightning. A wounded soldier tried to cheer up his guys by telling them that it was just some unfortunate lightning strikes. After a moment, the true effect of those blazing bolts of lightning came to his attention. But the soldier still refused to believe what was happening looking at his feet. Although he was very angry, but he could do nothing but scream because he was completely paralyzed. At this time, the young master strikes the next blow, dragon lightning fury. The rival army is scattered by such a strong attack on them by Chu Tiange. The wounded soldier, not moving, is no longer able to watch his army being mercilessly annihilated. Chu Tiange, after handling the entire army of soldiers, headed towards his main target. Moving closer to the wounded soldier, he tells him that if he wants to ask for forgiveness, he will only be able to do so after his death. One sharp swing of the spear, a blinding flash of sparks, and it's all over. The young master deftly jumps over the soldier, leaving him flying down to the ground. Chu Tiange's friends watch his victory through the protective dome.
The wounded soldier, this time by defeat, lay on the cold ground and whispered the master's name. While waiting for the transition, he still recognized that it was the real god Chu Tiange after all. The soldier, after saying his last words, exhaled deeply and his soul left his body. The game's news forum was discussing the main news of the day. Chu Tiange had defeated the alien guild's army. The young lord removed the effects of the protective dome, and his friends were able to come out to him. He thinks about what an all-around good shield he had acquired on his way here. About an hour ago, on his way to his friends, the young master bought up everything he had from the secret merchant again, and he was left to mourn his bankruptcy. The master began to ask what happened and learned from his second brother that there might be numerous NPCs in the alien army. Chu Tiange, after listening to second brother's theory, approached the butler with the same question. Yin Li revealed that he had been following them earlier, and many players hadn't been offline for over a month. He also suggested that it might not be bots, but an artificial intelligence account. The master clarified about the evidence about this and heard that it was already being processed and the results would be coming soon. The second brother intervened and reminded him that the game does have a technical identification that prevents fake numbers from registering in the game. The young master pondered his buddy's words after all his parents had helped develop the game and there shouldn't be such a major glitch in it. Two more of their people approached the company, asking where everyone went. The second brother informs them that the boss is here and everything is fine now, to which one of the players grinningly notes the excessive smugness of that one. The second brother realized that the arriving players hadn't noticed Chu Tiange yet and gestured to the other boss. One of the players exclaimed the master's name several times, unable to believe his eyes. The players were getting closer and closer to Chu Tiange, realizing that he was their boss as well. A player turns around looking for the girl and looks at her questioningly. After a moment, he asks why she's so calm since she's been looking for Chu Tianju for so long to challenge her to a fight. Pineapple Rice throws the player away with a sharp punch and yells at him to shut his mouth immediately. After gathering her thoughts, she modestly tells the young master that he simply talks too much. Chu Tiange learns from his other brother that most of the soldiers were bots after all. He stops to think for a bit, and after a couple minutes, he informs everyone of his decision. The young lord offers to let the guys clean up some bots without even giving them a break. The buddies make it to the outskirts with a teleport portal guarded by soldiers hiding behind rocks. The second brother asks the young master what their next plan of action is. Chu Tiange smiled wryly and opened the tool selection panel, quickly finding the world mouthpiece there. The master addressed the players of Song Country to come together and teach the villains standing at the teleport portal a lesson. Some characters, upon hearing the announcement, were surprised to find the master in their country, but at the same time, they also rejoiced at the release of the portal. The second brother hesitated a bit, and the wizard and tried to reassure him, saying that he had fought more. The Hatter quickly alerted everyone that someone was coming out of the portal. Several people came out of the portal towards the soldiers and the players tried to understand the nature of their encounter and what they were holding. One of the people who came out was handing the soldier some sort of casket and asking for caution in bringing it to the guild. A master from afar noticed in the box one of the materials he was missing to upgrade his spear, Song Liquid. Chutiange approached the girl to ask if this was the person they were thinking of. Hearing an affirmative answer, the master gave the order, everyone prepare for the robbery. While the soldiers were talking about something, Chu Tiange's team quickly flew straight at them. The soldiers immediately drew their weapons to retaliate because no one dared to attack them. At the head of the company, an enraged master approached the soldiers. The soldiers immediately recognized God Chu Tiange and abandoned the thought of fighting, deciding to run away immediately. They didn't manage to get far as the master ran with his fiery spear at all the soldiers. Chu Tiange, having finished his attack, watched the souls of the soldiers leave and said that his power was enough for all of them and their boasts. Mountains of armor, gold, and other things were left lying on the ground as rewards for the victory. The players rushed to collect everything, asking if the young master, who hadn't even thought about it, would take anything for himself. The second brother was collecting armor and suddenly noticed the very same box on one of them and shouted to the master that he had found the liquid song. The girl checked with him to see if it was the liquid needed to improve weapons. The other brother handed the box to the craftsman, who took out a vial with its contents. Suddenly, through his side vision, he saw an arrow flying towards the big brother with the vial. 
The other brother rushed to the boss's defense, covering him with himself and shouting for him to step aside. The girl collecting the reward and the butler who was waiting for them turned around at the noise and froze. The master threw himself toward the other brother, who was disappearing from the field with a shout, saying that they must protect the liquid song. Lastly, he turned towards the boss, adding that he was leaving everything to him now. Chu Tiange still didn't understand anything and called out loudly to his second brother. The firing soldiers nearby accepted their head's command to go in search of the liquid song. They ran into the attacking players in order to destroy them and retrieve the vial of liquid. The master asked the butler in bewilderment what the skill was and why the second brother had disappeared without the ability to revive. The head of the soldiers angrily shouted to the players to return the Songlin liquid to them. Chu Tiange wasn't going to listen to this rant anymore and rushed forward to attack. Single-handedly, he smashed the bulk of the enemy army with one powerful strike. The head of the soldiers, seeing Chu Tiange's fury and power, did not dare to engage him. He immediately rushes into a run, not noticing the master with a spear behind him. Chu Tiange decides to catch him in a different way and summons Ursh to help him. An embittered pet of the master teleports onto the battlefield and immediately rushes towards the enemy. The soldier tries to run away, but realizes that the distance between him and the dog is shrinking to a minimum. Ursha rushes in to attack, forming huge streaks of flashes of fire. He grabs the soldier by the collar of his armor and forcefully drags him to his master's feet. The young master pointed the tip of his spear at the cowardly soldier's face and menacingly asked what he had done to his second brother. The butler suggested the young master check his list of friends. The master noticed his buddy's inactive icon on the screen and genuinely wondered why he was offline. The girl said that at the time the arrow hit the second brother, he was in battle mode and went offline involuntarily to which the master responded by suggesting that in reality, he could have been forced to do so by someone. Chu Tiange quickly asked the butler to keep an eye on things while he went to look for the second brother in reality. The butler didn't seem to approve of the young master's decision, but before he could say anything, Chu Tiange pressed the exit button. Chu Tiange passed out and hurriedly walked out of the game pod to check on his friend. He was walking towards the room's exit when at the same time, Ella was walking towards him along the corridor. The assistant noticed the hurrying master and called his name. The master asked why Ella wasn't in the game and learned that she had been trying to contact Nubi to use the new healing herbs, but she hadn't been in touch in a while. The assistant also said that she knew what young master Zhao's team was capable of and wanted to check on Nubi personally. The young master approaching the car agreed with the assistant's thought and suggested that she split up. Chu Tiange arrived at the second brother's house and rang the doorbell for a long time to no avail. The master began to call out loudly to his friend and knock, but still heard no answer. He walked closer to the apartment door and decided to try to open it. The handle easily gave in and the door opened, much to the master's surprise. Chu Tiange cautiously quietly opened the door, and after looking around, he went inside. When he entered the second brother's apartment, he saw a terrible mess. Things were scattered around, dishes were broken, and furniture was damaged. It was obvious to the master that something terrible had happened here and something bad had happened to the second brother. Chu Tiange noticed the torn cord from the gaming chair. He walked closer to the chair and saw the second brother's gaming helmet with some kind of sticker on it. Having examined it, the master realized that it was a QR code, which was not difficult to scan himself with the phone and get the necessary information now. The phone scanned the sticker for some time and rang when it was finished. A line appeared on the screen of the phone with a password entry with a note that only player Chu Tianj knew it. The master looked at the phone in bewilderment and didn't understand what password they wanted from him. At the same time, Ella's assistant was pulling up to dorm number five where Nubi lived. While walking down the hallway of the dormitory, Elle met some girl and asked her where Nubi's room was. She went to the open door of the room and saw three girls. One of them was Shue Rong, who immediately asked who she was looking for. Elle made up a story on the fly about how she and Nubi were friends and were going to meet up, but she hadn't heard from her since morning. One of the girls assumed that she had left still early in the morning, but wasn't sure about that since she was usually out playing at that time. The assistant didn't know how else to discreetly find out any information about Nubi. As she was about to leave, she noticed a gaming helmet on the table, apparently belonging to the missing girl. Elle somehow immediately realized who was the owner of this gaming helmet. 
Not daring to go inside without asking, she asked her roommates for permission to do so. Having received approval to enter, the assistant came closer and took the game helmet in her hands, scrutinizing it carefully. It was unclear why the girl was not there, but the helmet was, on which just by the way she noticed some sticker. Elle realized at once that there was a sticker in the form of a QR code in front of her, and it could mean something. The master has already left from the second brother and met with the assistant on the way. Elle told what had happened in the dormitory and handed the young master her phone. In the phone, there was a photo of Newbie's game helmet with a sticker of some QR code. The master took the phone and looked at the photo closer, saying that he found exactly the same QR code at his second brother, who asked for the password from the player Chu Tianja. The girl immediately inquired about the password and found out that the young master was not aware of it either. The assistant suggested that Chu Tianju go to the game forum or private messages. She assumed that the people who did this do not know the real identity of the player Chu Tianj and will write him directly to the game mail. The master thought the idea was great and quickly logged into his account with a login confirmation. A window with an unread message appeared on the tablet screen. The young master immediately opened it and saw a message saying that Zhao Shu's people had his friends, followed by a long password to log in. Chu Tianz realized that this was the password that the system requested from him after scanning the QR code from the game helmets of his friends. He took out his cell phone, scanned the code again, and entered the password from the message. After pressing the confirmation button, a location-based navigation map appeared on the screen. After a few seconds, the pointer on the map identified the exact location of his friends. The young gentleman looked at the map carefully and concluded that it was somewhere around the western pier. There was a small western pier located on one of the shores of the East China Sea. One of the abandoned buildings on the west pier was of particular interest. Inside the building, between the wooden containers, Zhao Xu sat surrounded by his subordinates, looking at the young master's friends tied up on the floor. After entering the password, a picture of his bound buddies appeared on the master's cell phone screen, with threats of their swift reprisal if he did not appear in person. Chu Tiange did his best to calm himself down and quickly thought of a further plan of action. At this time, Zhao was calmly sitting on a chair and waiting for master's reply. One of his guards, yawning, asked the boss when that famous Chu Tiange would show up. He didn't have time to say anything as someone knocked loudly on the door of the abandoned house. The second brother and newbie lying on the floor were not only tied up, but their mouths were also taped shut so they could only moo for help. One of Zhao's bouncers, hearing the loud mooing, ran up to the second brother with a bat and pinned his head to the floor. The guard opened the doors of the building and saw an old man standing there with a broom in his hands. The old man politely said hello to the guard and asked to go inside. Zhao looked at the old man in bewilderment, pondering if it could be Chu Tiange. The old man went inside and started talking about the upcoming sanitation inspection on the pier and the mountain of unsorted garbage in the building. The guards tried to escort the old man out, saying they would handle sorting the trash themselves, which embarrassed him. The bouncer couldn't contain himself and hit the other brother who tried to stand up with a bat. The tied-up guy fell to the floor with a thud, hitting a metal barrel and thus attracting a lot of attention. The second brother noticed some old man and started mooing loudly again. The old man also noticed the tied-up guy who had fallen down, obviously asking for help. All the while, the old man was holding a broomstick, in which, as it turned out, a surveillance camera was safely hidden. Through this camera, the young lord was watching everything that was going on, promising to take revenge on the insolent Zhao family for such a despicable act. The old man quickly headed towards the exit, saying that he didn't want to disturb them and would leave the sorting of garbage to them. The guard standing at the door of the building immediately stopped the old man who was trying to leave. He informed the old man with a menacing look that he could not let him go because he had already seen too much and knew too much. The old man only calmly warned that he had better not do that. Just about this time, the master's car pulled up to an abandoned building on the pier. Chu Tiange made a call to someone, reporting the kidnapping of his friends into the receiver. The person on the other end of the wire asked the master not to take any rash action and wait for him. Chu Tiange promised not to do anything until he arrived and pressed the disconnect button. The young master had finally decided for himself to face his opponent face to face. 
At this time, the Zhao Guild had a powerful demolition of his subordinates' headquarters. Player Chu Tiange had already defeated some of the opponents and was heading towards the remaining ones, who for some reason decided that they would easily destroy him. With one strong jerk, the master pushed off and flew into the enemy's attack. Zhao's fighters were not going to give up and wanted to prove to their young boss what they were capable of. Chu Tiange rushed towards the opponents with his spear, destroying everything in his path and leaving a trail of fire behind him. One of Zhao's subordinates informs him that Chu Tiange is attacking their guild and they cannot resist. Zhao Shu is furious at the news that his worst enemy, Chu Tiange, is still in the game instead of saving his friends. One of the guards suggested that God Chu might be in another city without being able to report it. But Zhao was sure he was right, because he had previously checked the city of residence of Chu Tiange's player IP address. While they were exchanging thoughts on this matter, someone knocked loudly on the door of the abandoned house again. Zhao Shu ordered his men to immediately open the doors of the building. The doors seemed to take forever to open, and Zhao and his guards stood in languid anticipation. Standing menacingly on the doorstep of the abandoned building was the young Mr. Chu he knew well. Zhao was speechless for a moment, and after a moment of gathering his thoughts, he spoke the master's name. Chu Tiange was determined against Zhao and had no intention of backing down. Zhao was surprised by Master Chu's arrival, which was easily readable in his face. So Chu Tiange started the conversation first, saying that he wasn't hard to find. Zhao Shu asked him if he was Chu Tiange's player, but immediately thought about who was attacking his guild right now then. Meanwhile, Assistant L was in the game booth, playing as the young master and admiring his power and strength. The master continued his dialogue with Zhao, telling him that he had no idea what grudges he had against Chu Tiange, but he dared not hold back his friends any longer. Zhao Shu asked the master if he was not Chu's god, how he had tracked them down, to which he received a reply about the video surveillance throughout the city and his frivolous behavior regarding stealing people in broad daylight. The young master also ordered his men to be released, otherwise even his famous family wouldn't help him escape. Zhao Shu didn't seem to understand the gravity of the situation and just smirked in response. He was clearly thinking of something and leisurely moved towards the second brother. Zhao Shu leaned straight towards the frightened guy's face and pointed the stun gun at him, scaring him wildly. After waiting for a little while, he turned around to the master and questioned him if he really wasn't the player Chu Tiange. The young master became worried for his friend's life and said that he was the one who was the richest player of the era and asked Zhao what he wanted from him. Zhao didn't doubt his desires for a second and immediately replied that he only wanted Chu Tiange. The master did not miss the moment to play a joke on his enemy and said that he only liked girls, which embarrassed him. Zhao was angry at the master's behavior and shouted that he didn't like him either, and he only wanted a game account. Chu Tiange agreed to give the account only if he let his people go, and Zhao immediately agreed. He took out a game helmet and offered to put it on Zhao to see for himself, unless of course he was afraid. The guard intervened in the conversation and reminded his boss about their guild being attacked right now by Chu Tiange, to which the master quickly intervened and replied that it was a good provocation that they ended up falling for. The master continued to convince his opponent of his words, talking about tens of billions of inventory and a pile of gold coins right in front of him if he dared to check it out. Zhao Shu could no longer resist the urge and abruptly snatched the gaming helmet from the master's hands. He quickly put it on himself, tightly fastening the connecting clasps at the back. Once inside the game, the system greeted Chu Tiange's player with a welcome back to the era. Zhao Shu looked at his new game account with admiration and wanted to learn more about it as soon as possible. He brought up the character information on the system screen and saw some girl there. Zhao stared at the screen, realizing that this was his new game account. He was just furious at the situation and realized for sure that he had been tricked. Zhao, loudly insulting the master, quickly tried to log out of the game angrily clicking the logout button several times. At the same moment, other players with weapons flew out at him incomprehensibly from nowhere. Among them was the master's third brother, who dealt Zhao the first blow, saying that he wasn't going anywhere from here. He also added that they weren't going to destroy him either, ordering another player to monitor his health and heal him in time. The enraged Zhao in his new body was attacked time after time and healed immediately. The guards silently watched their master convulsing and didn't understand what was happening to him. 
They began to discuss amongst themselves about what was going on with their guild and saw on the screen that it was still being attacked by Chu Tiange with a significant advantage in their favor. One of them still didn't understand why their young master wasn't returning from the game, while the other guessed that they had just been divorced. The master decided to put in a word as well, explaining that in battle mode, players could not exit the game on their own, and their boss was doomed to suffer agonizingly for his own rash actions for a while. Chu Tiange approached an old man tied to a metal barrel to turn on their battle mode, while calling him Uncle Yin Li. The disguised butler, smiling evilly, was in full agreement to put on a show. He asked one of the bouncers something about sorting the trash and the material used to make the rope on him, thus putting the latter in a stalemate. Butler, taking advantage of the moment of surprise, jumped up and struck the bouncer with a powerful blow, as he had secretly freed himself from the rope long ago. The bouncer was whistled backwards by a martial arts master with many years of experience. The bouncer flew all the way to the end of the building, straight into the metal barrels, scaring even the guards. The butler was already standing firmly on his own two feet and threatening his enemies. Everyone stood and looked at the unconscious bouncer as if in anticipation. Butler saw the master preparing to attack and asked him to wait a bit. One of the guards with a bat in his hands finally came to his senses and loudly ordered his men to attack. The young master didn't listen to the butler and grabbed the daring guard by the arm. Looking him straight in the eye, he informed the guard that his opponent was now him. The guard was angered by the arrogant tone of the young man and called him frivolous. For some reason, he was hesitant to engage him and gestured him to leave, adding that this was his last chance. The master remained standing still, for which the guard tried to hit him with his bat, but he deftly dodged to the side. Unexpectedly, Chu Tiange delivered a crushing blow to his opponent, knocking the bat out of his hand. The other two guards turned around at the noise and found their partner lying unconscious on the floor. Yin Li's butler noticed the dazed guards and called out to them. They took turns turning towards the pseudo old man, knowing what was about to happen. The butler flies at the guards in one fell swoop, overpowering them hand to hand while reminding them to respect their elders. One of the beaten guards sitting on the floor is still trying to threaten the young master. Another one approaches Chu Tianju from behind with a baton, threatening to deal with him right here and now. Just at that moment, a police patrol with blinkers pulled up to the abandonment. The master and the bouncer turned around simultaneously at the sound of the siren and loudspeaker. A squad of police burst into the building, holding everyone at gunpoint and ordering no one to move. The police captain commands to rescue the hostages sooner rather than later and his subordinates order everyone to the ground. He runs into the abandoned building with L's worried assistant, asking the master about his condition. The captain is angry at the young master since he didn't listen to him and intervened in the fight, and after all, he is very worried about him and is responsible to his parents. Chu Tiange only cheerfully calms down the captain, who is also his uncle, and looks at the freed friends. He takes a quick step towards his buddies to see if they are okay. Master suggests Nubi to go to the hospital just in case, but she refuses, citing only a strong fright. The police arrest Zhao Shu, who shouts at the young master that he won't get away with it and will pay for all his lies. The assistant looks at Zhao ominously and slowly walks over to him. She shows him some papers and tells him that she is the one who is the captor of his family. Zhao quickly reads the agreement between the singularity, their association, and further some sort of enforcer a small raccoon which is Ella. He realizes that the Singularity Organization no longer tolerated their failures and broke the cooperation between them by hiring El. Chu Tiange approached the lost Zhao with a menacing look and started asking about Singularity and their relationship. Although Zhao Shu was already depressed and lost, the mere voice of the young master made him angry like a wild beast. He got up from his knees and started shouting out the master's name, repeating it louder and louder. In an instant, he abruptly breaks free from the hands of the police officers and angrily rushes towards Chu Tiange. El observes the terrifying scene with his master and screams too, but out of desperation. Zhao rammed the master a couple of meters forward, hitting him hard in the stomach in the process. Instantly, everyone jumped up to Chu Tianju with an offer of help, but the master only brushed it off and said that he was fine. Suddenly, Zhao took out some kind of detonator-like device from his pocket and shouted orders for everyone to stay where they were, or else he would blow everything and everyone up right now. 
He pointed to a device with a big button saying that he would press it and everyone would die with him. The police captain tried to calm the furious Zhao down, saying that he was too young and shouldn't make such a mistake, but he seemed to be quite determined. The butler also tried to help and said that he didn't advise him to do so. Zhao laid out the conditions under which he would agree to do nothing, which was to provide him with a car now and let him go, to which the cops agreed. After a second, he says he's changed his mind, explaining that the Singularity Organization won't let any of them out of here alive. After gathering his thoughts, he decides to press the kill button after all. In front of everyone, he is paralyzed by an electric current. The young master immediately shouts to everyone to lie down on the floor as soon as possible. Everyone present quickly falls to the floor, except for the police officers who are frozen by the sight of Zhao shuddering. After a while, the master and L raise their heads and look at the bomber. Zhao Shu was literally fried by the device that he himself had activated, thinking that everyone would die with him. Everyone stood up and the police captain walked closer to the guy's body falling to the floor. He examined him carefully, concluding that he had been electrocuted. The people from Singularity put the head of the family on the monitor of what had happened to his son in the abandoned house. The father of the Zhao family, of course, although angry at his son, had not expected this to happen, and was shouting angrily at them about what they had done. He continued the conversation in high tones, saying that he had done everything they had asked, including letting the little raccoon take over everything. There was no way he could accept the loss of his son and questioned them several times as to why they had let him die. The Singularity representative calmly replied that he could not declassify himself, and no one else had the right to do so. The head of the family still couldn't believe what was happening and looked pleadingly at the screen. The voice from the screen informed him that his son had not quite gone to the other world, at least not in the sense that everyone was used to understanding it. Zhao Xu's father didn't quite understand what it was about and tried to find out more details. For a while, the communication screen turned off and it was as if it was reconnecting to something else. After a moment, something that looked like an astral projection of his son appeared on the screen. The father of the family tearfully stared intently at the screen. Zhao Shu in an astral body had appeared in some special place in the system that only the Singularity knew about. The head of the family could no longer hold back his tears and called out to his son while sobbing. Zhao saw him immediately, but he couldn't realize where he was yet. Wiping his tears, his father only said that he would now have peace of mind knowing that his son was safe and sound wherever he was. Zhao Shu himself could no longer hold back his tears and cried while looking into his father's eyes. Meanwhile, there was still a police patrol standing outside the abandoned building on the West Pier. The master, surrounded by police officers, approached Zhao and couldn't believe that it had ended with his demise. El tried to stop the young master and said that it could be dangerous, and the captain asked them to leave the building as soon as possible. Chu Tiange was still keeping his eyes on the electrocuted Zhao and running through his connection with jingularity in his head. Suddenly, the master grabbed his head and started screaming loudly, scaring Ellis standing nearby. Scraps of memories from the future that he had seen earlier began to flash through his mind. His memories were a mixture of Zhao's death, the name of singularity, and a door. The last frame of his mind was a bunch of identical people sitting in game helmets. Chu Tiange collapsed to the ground with a scream, and his frightened friends immediately rushed over to him. He held his head, and the only thing he could squeeze out was that his head was about to explode. El looked at the young lord writhing in pain and despair and blurted out that it was a side effect of the medicine. With trembling hands, she held out some kind of capsule to him and asked him to take it immediately. The last thing the master saw was El's blurry hand with the capsule. On the hospital table was a metal tray with medicines and various medical supplies. The young master's hand fumbled with something soft that looked like a bed. After being unconscious for a long time, he began to regain consciousness and slowly opened his eyes. Chu Tiange finally fully woke up and stared wordlessly at the ceiling for a while. The master began to look around, looking at the table standing nearby. He felt some tension in his body, and as he stood up, he noticed that he was tightly strapped to the bed. Chu Tiange became angry in a moment as he tried to get free and shouted loudly. He heard someone's approaching footsteps and fell silent in anticipation. The master looked around him once more and saw numerous monitors and more, thinking that the place seemed very familiar. The door to the chamber was opening and some people were about to enter. Chu Tiange, as soon as he heard them, immediately decided to pretend that he hadn't come to his senses yet. 
Two men dressed in medical uniforms were discussing the young master's long unconsciousness, arguing that it was due to the effects of a new drug. They decided to keep an eye on him, but before doing so they needed to unbuckle him and give him an examination. One of the men began to slowly undo the straps holding the body of the master. At the same time, he watched the young master's reaction, but saw nothing suspicious. As soon as the man handled the last strap, Chu Tiangye abruptly jumped up from the bed. The masked men didn't even have time to say anything before the master grabbed both of them from behind. Young Master Chu pushed their foreheads against each other with all his might. The men passed out from the impact and collapsed to the floor, while the master moved forward, having worked perfectly. Chu Tiangye walked to the open door of the chamber and cautiously peeked out to look around. After seeing that the corridor was empty, he went out in search of a single staircase and recognized the Little Raccoon Research Institute as the place. Suddenly, the security alarms in the entire building went off loudly. The young gentleman saw the guards who had noticed him run into the hallway. One of them commanded to call for someone higher up before he ran far away. Chu Tiangye turned the corner and tried to figure out how he was discovered so quickly. He ran to the first door he could find and ran inside, locking himself in there. The master had only just caught his breath when he saw familiar faces in front of him. In front of him, the same men who had come to check on him earlier and whom he had knocked out were lying unconscious on the floor. Chu Tiange quickly ran up to one of them and began to slap his face, thus bringing him back to consciousness. The young master wanted the man to wake up quickly and explain to him what was going on here. The waking man finally began to say that he had been sent here for treatment by a small raccoon. The master knew that the little raccoon was indeed his assistant, L, but didn't understand why they kept him tied up in restraints at the time. The man explained to him that it was necessary as a precautionary measure, as the side effects of the medicines were unpredictable, and he might unknowingly harm himself. Chu Tiange listened to him and immediately asked where the little raccoon was now. The man gestured to the glass room where Ella was lying under the machine and said that she was still in intensive care, greatly surprising the master. L's defenseless body was under a breathing machine connected to several monitors at once. The master leaned against a huge glass and looked through it at the girl who was still unconscious. A butler quietly approached the master and informed him that she had tested the drugs for him on herself. Chu Tiange was finally confused and asked the butler to explain everything in order. Yin Lie told him his assumption that during Zhao Xu's death, he had suffered a violent seizure that caused side effects. He also explained to the young master that Ella had long ago investigated the serum with his blood to further study the side effects of the medicine sooner, but things had never been fully investigated. Some time ago, when L had called someone and rushed them to research the material, this was the very work that the butler had told the young master about. Scientists entered the room and began to explain that they were working overtime on the side effects of the drug, but since Ella wouldn't allow experiments on humans, they were still under development. One of them came closer and told the master that when Ella saw the young master in a coma, the situation was an emergency and she had tried the drugs on herself and this was what came out of it. At the end, the scientist added that since the master was awake, the little raccoon should come to his senses soon. A woman with some documents entered the room and everyone turned towards her. The woman turned out to be Elle's doctor, and the master asked her with hope in his eyes about his friend's condition. The doctor saw the frightened face of the master, but still had to tell him that the situation was dire and L might not last long. The master, after hearing this, was as if numbed, so much he was shocked by what was happening. A few minutes later, he came to his senses and started yelling loudly that this should never happen. The woman went on to say that the little raccoon's body had accumulated too much of the medicinal poison, and it was a miracle she had survived at all. The doctor was still trying to say something, but the master interrupted her, saying that he knew everything about her, and so he never let her fall into the despair of the past. He remembered the time when they were just children and Elle kept offering to play maid with him, to which the master replied that it was better to be a princess. Elle explained this desire by saying that a maid is always by her master's side, which is exactly what she wanted, and the master had no choice but to agree with her. Chu Tiange was pulled out of his memories by the hospital room and Ella under the machine. He was very sorry for how things had turned out in the end and could not forgive himself for it. The little raccoon lay with no signs of life all alone in the tiny glassed-in room.
The doctor had told the master that she would also participate in drug research in the future, though even the treatment itself was dangerous, not to mention the side effects. The young master was still screaming for her salvation, to which the doctor suggested that her mind and consciousness be transferred to a special system base before her brain finally shut down. Chu Tiange was not satisfied with this option. After all, existence in the system did not equal reality at all, nor was it even true existence. The master thought something and said that she hadn't given up yet and they just had to save her. An excited nurse ran into the room and informed the doctor that Ella had moved. Everyone there was pleasantly shocked to hear the news. The doctor and the scientists immediately went to check her for signs of life. The master, leaning against the glass, did not give up hope for the girl's early awakening. He plunged back into memories from his childhood when Ella's parents had passed away and the pharmaceutical company had taken her for drug testing at their own family research institute, justifying it as a cure. The master and the girl's parents were friends, and when they found out what was going on, they bought out the pharmaceutical company and the institute, and thus saved little L. Chu Tiange also remembered the first time he entered the little girl's room as a child. Back then, she had asked him if he had also come to test drugs, to which the master had replied that he was not sick and would not test anything. Hearing this, the little girl asked him to leave and let her rest for a while. The little master, as if he didn't hear her request, and cheerfully sat down on her bed. He told her that now it was his home and he did not need to go anywhere, and if she wanted to run away, only with him. The girl didn't understand where she was supposed to run away with him, and the boy took her hand and dragged her forward, telling her that her mother had asked her to bring her home. Little Ella was still at a loss, unlike the confident Chu Tiange. The young master knew that El never cried and was always strong, but when he felt bad, he saw her tears and despair. The little raccoon seemed to be coming to her senses little by little, moaning softly. The master looked hopefully at the fragile at such a strong girl. The doctors, observing Ella's condition, were extremely surprised at what was happening and were glad that she had developed antibodies to the extremely harmful effects of the drug so quickly. A nurse looked out of the girl's room to the waiting master and informed her that it was a true miracle and everything would definitely be fine now. The exhausted L came to her senses, and the first thing she did was turn to the glass behind which she saw the young master and cried. Chu Tianga was eternally grateful for this miracle that brought back his loyal friend. A week later at the Little Raccoon Research Institute, the game helmet was already lying on the hospital room table. L was still in her hospital pajamas, but was already reaching for the game helmet. At this moment, the young master entered the room and caught the assistant off guard. He wouldn't let her get into the game yet and told her to rest for the needed recovery. The girl had no choice but to obediently lie back down and obey the master. After thinking for a bit, she informed him that lying down just like this was too boring. Chu Tiange immediately told her that if it was boring for her, let her not do such things anymore. Although she repeated to him several times that it was fine, he was speaking too seriously. He started questioning her about why she was hiding the making of the side effect medicine from him. After all, he could have helped her in some way. Elle was silent for a while, as if she was about to say something important, and then she put her hand on the master's arm. She began to tell him that both the future drugs and the side effects were made in utmost secrecy from everyone, as there were not many people she trusted, and she didn't want to take too many risks. The young gentleman looked away from her a bit, asking if it was him she was watching out for. The girl didn't bother to explain anything and just silently held out some picture to him. After that, she added that she wasn't watching out for him at all, but for other people. Chu Tiange scrutinized the photograph but did not understand anything and asked her what it all meant. In the photograph, an unknown man wearing a white cloak was entering the room in familiar surroundings. The master tried to see the stranger's face, but he was wearing a long hood with his face covered by a mask. Chu Tiange asked the girl who was in the picture, but she didn't know the answer either and just asked him to be careful. The master was already thinking something quickly in his head and said that in that case, they would have to lure him out. Another week later, the players were sailing a huge ship across the Sea of Song Country. El stood on the deck with Chu Tiange and couldn't believe that the truth was here, asking him what they would do with the golden boss in this part of the game. The master replied to her not to rush things as there were more important things to do, 
but the girl sighed heavily for some reason. Chu Tiange was frightened and asked if she felt bad about the sea trip, to which Ella replied that after playing in his account, she didn't feel so useful anymore. The master offered her to solve this problem with just a single donation. The girl immediately refused, as she couldn't afford such a luxury. As they sailed close to the shore, they noticed the other brother waving at them. The big brother cheerfully greeted his old buddy, stopping the ship. The second brother was walking quickly towards his friends with some interesting news about the Alien Guild. The world announcement said that the Alien Guild had been using a large number of accounts controlled by artificial intelligence and had been blocked for that reason. The announcement also stated compensation sent to the in-game mail of Song Country players and regret with inconvenience to all involved with further wishes to remain in era. On the system monitor, an update of the available guilds of the game at the moment was urgently going on. The second brother concluded that the strangers had disappeared thanks to the young master, and the lands of Song Country would no longer be touched by anyone. El asked the master if there was any connection between these strangers and singularity, and although he didn't know the exact answer to this question, he agreed with the girl in some ways. Master went into the system settings, found the appearance change there, and pressed the confirmation button. In the same second, the appearance of the richest player Chu Tiange began to change. He changed from his famous appearance to another appearance he had previously created under the game name Yi. Walking forward between the gorges, the master warned his friends that he had taken out an appearance card so that he wouldn't shine much right now. Chu Tiange took out the long one vial of liquid song and entered it into the game's system. The vial was successfully confirmed by the system and began to activate the hidden portal above them. Meanwhile, hiding behind the rocks, the little monkey watched the activation of the hidden portal and the vial of liquid. As soon as it saw the full activation of the portal with a sharp jolt, the little beast leaped towards the players. The monkey had already grabbed the vial needed for the portal opened above them when the young master noticed her. She quickly ran forward, holding the vial tightly with both paws. El was at a complete loss as to whether they had been robbed by some cunning monkey. Second brother said that this monkey belonged to Lu Chao, but Chu Tiange didn't know a player with that name. The second brother began to explain that he was from a sea guild whose president had hidden duties, and that was why their battles were so fierce, and they were called sea kings. At this time, a little monkey began to croak towards the players and laugh at them. It stood very close by and merrily hopped, danced, and slapped itself, thus mocking the group of buddies. The players were terribly angry at this mocking behavior of the restless monkey, and they wanted to punish her. The entire team of players ran after it, and the young master commanded them to catch the beast at all costs. Chu Tiange lunged forward and quickly ran after the bubble monkey in an attempt to catch up with it as soon as possible. The little monkey ran faster and farther into the forest, as if following a premeditated route, and led the players straight to the familiar teleport portal, which it jumped into without hesitation. All the players who ran after the animal were so engrossed in the chase that they did not even notice how, following the monkey, moved in space and time to a completely different location through the forest teleport. One by one, coming out of the portal, the players carefully began to look around in a new place for them, and young Mr. Chu quickly tried to figure out where they had just been thrown, and most importantly, for what purpose. The company of friends stood on the seashore and looked with amazement at the picture that appeared before their eyes, which was a huge, shimmering city, located for some reason in Upside Down, the base of the roofs down. Chu Tiange didn't even expect that someone could know the place they were in, but he still asked where they were, to which suddenly the second brother replied that there was a hidden map of the void city in front of them. While everyone was admiring the beauty of the hitherto unknown place, El's assistant remembered the reason why they were here in the first place and began to quickly look around for the little monkey. The second brother immediately joined the search for their little thief, looking through every corner of the shore, and soon enough found the little monkey with a vial in his hands, dashing away from them. The cunning monkey dodged the pursuing players along the shore, ignoring repeated attempts to persuade it to stop, and even managed to shout derisive names. The second brother had almost minimized the distance between himself and the thief as he suddenly tripped over a large mountain of earth dug up here by someone earlier, and with a clatter immediately flew face down, swearing loudly at the same time. The young lord, of course, immediately stopped to help his buddy, 
but when he turned around, it wasn't so much his friend's fall that caught his attention as the unfamiliar body next to the dug-up earth. While the second brother was rising from the ground while sighing heavily, the assistant and Chu Tiange, forgetting their previous objective, stared at the unknown guy lying on the ground and tightly bound with a rag in his mouth, clearly asking for their help. The unknown player with his mouth gagged looked very frightened, and as if he was on the verge of bursting into tears, mooing loudly, which implied his intense desperation and pleading for release in the form of save help unbind. The friends moved closer to the dug hole with a man inside, and Chu Tiange told the guy that the players from Song Country were excellent, thinking that this was some other part of the enemy's plan, but still gave him a chance to speak up and untied him. The unfamiliar fellow quickly thanked the young gentleman for his release, and began tearfully begging his buddies to rescue his friends, who had been kidnapped by men who were sailing away on a boat far out to sea. The friends realized that he was not part of an insidious plan, but just a random guy who got into an unpleasant situation, so the master asked the stranger to calm down a bit, take a breath, and explain to them in detail what happened here. The unfamiliar fellow introduced himself as Hitaru Ching and began to tell them that after he and his friends obtained a vial of song liquid and used it to open a hidden portal, they were immediately robbed by the vile Lugia. Chu Tiange listened carefully to Hitaru's entire story, and after not understanding one detail, he asked him what happened to his friends in the end and where those scoundrels on the boat had taken them to. Hitaru started yelling about the very same heavenly city and specified that in order to get there, one needed song liquid to summon a sea monster, as well as the need to use a gem as bait to get inside. The other brother began to recall the story about the sea monster, which said that after obtaining the treasure, the demon would build a staircase to enter the city. But if there wasn't enough jewels, it would only make the monster very angry, which wouldn't be good at all. El still didn't understand why the kidnappers would take his friends and leave Hitaru here alone, to which the young lord explained to her that the other boys were taken as bait for the monster. Hitaru immediately burst into tears and blamed himself for being a bad friend, as he was left lying tied up because of his ordinary equipment, while his friends with good equipment were taken away to certain death, and he was unable to stop them in any way. Chu Tiange's special attention was drawn to the part of the story with the stolen song liquid, which they had apparently taken from many people already, and Hitaru himself confirmed this theory of the master saying that this was not the first time they had stolen it. The young master seemed to have already thought out a plan of further action regarding these scoundrels and told the small but brave Hitaru to stay on the island while he and his friends did their duty. The brave boy decided not to give up so easily and desperately begged Chu Tiang to take him on deck with him for some assistance in the rescue operation, while expressing his strong desire to find his friends. Somewhere in the middle of the East China Sea, crashing against the waves, an enemy ship could be seen heading towards the entrance of the heavenly city through certain obstacles. At the very base of the ship, comfortably ensconced, sat the very same thieving monkey looking out for something, while on the deck sat Hitaru's kidnapped and bound friends, sailing in a direction hitherto unknown to them. One of the ship captain's subordinates, looking closely through binoculars, saw the imminent pursuit of them and immediately reported it to his boss, worried for his life and the lives of the crew on board, which they still needed for further successful plans. The captain of the ship was that famous Lu Jia, who took a confident fighting stance and was convinced that this was not even a chase, but just a bunch of characters who knew nothing about the game and wanted to find their early death right in the sea. Lu Jia was saying all this with excessive smugness and confidence, although he didn't even take his binoculars to see who was on their tail, when suddenly he heard something very loud and intimidating behind him, and slowly turned around. A huge young master ship with a golden dragon head at the base of the deck was approaching the tiny vessel, seemingly about to ram them and send them to the bottom to be eaten by the sea creatures. Lu Jia, a.k.a. the captain of the tiny vessel, felt as if he were in the midst of electric lightning discharges from the majesty of their pursuit, and became visibly agitated at the speculation of his rival's identities. Standing menacingly on the bow of the luxurious vessel was Chu Tiange and his friends and new mate Hitaru, 
whose faces clearly read obvious indignation and a wild desire to repay the villains in their own coin for what they had done. The subordinate and the commander ran panic-stricken across the deck, shouting to the monkey to give them a vial of song liquid to attract the sea monster and pay back the wretched humans who were trying to catch up with them and punish them. Lu Jia took the necessary song liquid from the monkey and started to try to call the monster, putting his hands with the vial up, but hesitated, because he did not know how to properly address him to realize the goal. The captain of the ship, quickly thinking over the correctness of the next actions, began to call to the richest ancient dragon-like beast, hoping for the rapid appearance of the monster from the depths of the sea floor. Suddenly, the hitherto calm sea revolted, rumbled, and formed a huge tidal maelstrom not far from the ships, steeply gaining momentum and powerfully pulling in everything around it. The subordinate and the captain immediately realized what was going on and quickly took turns dragging the kidnapped boys to the bow of the deck to satisfy the appetite of the monster, which was about to appear any minute now. Hitaru saw from the top of Chutianja's majestic ship how his bound and helpless friends were being dragged somewhere to the side of the ship, where a small monkey was cheerfully watching and clapping his hands. The boy could hardly restrain himself from crying at the sight of this picture and gathering all his will in a fist, shouted with all his might to his friends about their imminent rescue. At the same time, a powerful whirlpool was quickly pulling both ships into its web and began to increase the strength of its already frantic waves to the limit, as if helping the powerful monster of the sea depths to get out. At the very epicenter of the water cycle, the sea waves splashed almost all the way to the shore, and several parts of the huge dragon's torso began to appear from there. A moment later, at the same place instead of parts, a giant rich ancient dragon-like beast with horns and red eyes appears in all its glory and emits a menacing roar from all its nine mouths simultaneously. The players on Chu Tiange's team with Hitaru, the players on Lu Jia's ship with their little monkey, they were all surprised and frightened by the crushing sight of the sea monster and were vividly thinking of a retreat plan just in case. All nine heads of the monster were looking at the people in front of them with anger, but they still did not attack. And one of them leisurely asked who among the people present now was calling out to the strongest monster of all time. Lugia decided that this was the moment of truth, and it was time to show Chu Tianju and his crew who ruled everything, and quickly began waving his fingers and shouting to the monster that he was the brave man who had summoned the dragon-like beast to the human world. The captain had already prepared the bound friends of Hitaru in a corner of the ship as an already worked bait and subsequent summoning payment for the sea monster to thereby gain free passage to the heavenly city. Lugia is also not oblivious to the chasing players, gesturing to the young lord and his crew as additional payment for the ancient nine-headed monster and informing the latter of the gift. The mighty dragon-like beast, after listening to Lu Jia's entire speech, gazed fiercely at the majestic ship with its crew, emitting a red glow from its eyes towards Chu Tiange. The sea monster was immediately interested in such a gift, and regally swam closer to the young lord's ship, keeping all nine pairs of its nine pairs of fiery eyes on him. Standing at the very edge of the ship, the entire crew of the master was frightened and simply terrified of the unfolding actions, as they were not prepared for such a thing, which could not be said about Chu Tiange, who kept complete calm and peace until now. The behemoth overshadowed the entire view of the open sea with its shadow, while the second brother was telling the young master about lowering his level by one in case of defeat, and Eli immediately rushed towards Chu Tiange, and Hitaru was simply out of his mind with paralyzing fear. And only the master remained motionless in his seat, even as the dragon-like beast erupted in an intimidating roar, knocking all the players on the ship far away in different directions. At this time, Lu Jia, who was watching everything, chuckled and was satisfied with his plan, thinking that Chu Tiange's team was just paying for his journey to Heavenly City. After all, they deserved it and would be eaten by the mighty dragon. The ancient red-eyed beast took in more air and once again gave another powerful roar, and there was no one left on the edge of the deck except for the young master, who did not even move, thus greatly surprising all the players who were watching. The moment the dragon-like sea beast swam as close as possible to Chu Tiange's face, 
the master imperceptibly reincarnated into his former famous appearance as the richest chew player. The ancient nine-headed beast, which clearly did not expect such a turn of events, immediately realized why its mighty roar had no effect on the young master, and it was still gazing at Chu Tiange with interest and amazement. Suddenly the sea monster changed its face and obediently bowed all of its nine heads, saying that he, the ancient dragon-like beast Dion, was honored and proud to pay homage to the ancient dragon emperor. Chu Tiange still unnoticed by the rest of the players, he changed his famous appearance to that of Yi's character and stroked the obedient dragon-like monster while affectionately calling it Dragon Beast in front of everyone's eyes. The entire team of the young master was shocked and surprised at what was happening, because they had not even seen the reincarnation of his former appearance and did not understand why the sea devil behaved so obediently. Lu Jia and his subordinate and the little monkey were already firmly bound, having previously accepted the punishment for everything they had done, and were graciously honored to be visited as a gift to the sea monster on their own. All of the players were on Chu Tiange's majestic ship, where the young master had previously checked all of the song liquid bubble boxes and mockingly thanked Lu Jia for such a sincere gift. A couple minutes later, a system alert popped up on the monitor congratulating the young master on receiving 20 song liquid vials. While Chu Tiange was looking at his loot, Hitaru and his friends approached him and bowed politely, showering him with many thanks for everything done for him and his buddies. One of Hitaru's friends asked the young lord if he would need all the liquid boxes he had found, while the other guy compared his power to that of God Chu Tiange himself. The red-haired player with the name Yi, who had been hiding his true in-game identity until now, only contentedly handed the guys the vials of song liquid he didn't need. Hitaru's friends clearly did not expect such gratuitous generosity from their savior and stared at the young lord with undisguised surprise, not knowing what to say. Once they came to their senses, they began to jump and loudly thank Chu Tiange for the vials of liquid returned to them, while the master and his friends set off from the ship straight to the main head of the dragon-like beast Dion. The young master and his company were about to head down the ship when he heard Hitaru calling loudly for him and stopped at the very edge of the deck to see what he wanted him to do. The boy with genuine enthusiasm told Chutianju that he had previously been in the portal of the heavenly city and knew the route on the map, which will gladly show him and thus somehow help to repay for the rescue of friends. The young lord looked at the brave boy and hesitated for a moment, for as far as he could remember from their previous conversation, he had never been to Celestial City before. Meanwhile, Hitaru, who was begging the master to take him into the portal with him and looking at him with his big eyes, looked like a small puppy desperately begging for a tasty bone from its master. Chu Tiange could no longer tolerate this adorable sight and allowed him to go with them on the condition that he would not get into anything on the way, to which the boy happily thanked the master and promised to behave well. On the game system monitor, Hitaru Ching with the game name Xing Chen joined Chu Tiange's team for further adventures together in the Celestial City. The ancient dragon-like beast, Dion, quickly carried the young lord's team across the East China Sea on one of its heads, straight to the portal of the heavenly city, for free entry as previously promised. Chu Tiange's buddies, being on the face next to the sea monster's fiery eyes, took turns expressing their emotions from this journey. Some were delighted by the height. Others clumsily tried to keep on their feet, while the master stood firmly on his own two. Hitaru's buddies, who remained on the young master's majestic ship, discussed the fact that no more than four people could enter the portal at a time, meaning they remained on the deck. The players didn't like the rash behavior of their friend and began shouting after him that he had forgotten where he came from and had fallen for the majesty and beauty of the character and powerful beast that had saved them. As they approached their destination, the second brother noted that the celestial city had been turned upside down and they needed to figure out how to get there, to which the dragon replied that when they got inside, the perspective of the city would automatically change. Hitaru also pointed out that even though the foreshortening would change once they entered the city, they would in fact be upside down there, for which they would receive an impenetrable skill. 
while the players were chatting amongst themselves about their impending entry and future skills, the dragon-like beast Dion informed them of their arrival and brought them to the very entrance of the portal to the heavenly city. Slowly floating back into the depths of the sea floor, the nine-headed beast wished good luck to the players who were already approaching the portal, which was a light-absorbing disc anchored between the main gate. The entire team of Chu Tiange's players were facing the main portal, which closely resembled a huge human eye, and were about to make a space-time travel to Heavenly City. When all the players stepped inside at the same time, the portal activated, lighting up with a bluish glow and began to move the team inside the mysterious city. The first to step into the street of the new location was Chu Tiange, followed by the rest of the team, where everything was still in a shroud of teleportation glow coming from the closing portal. The players moved correctly and found themselves right at the central hall of the Sky City, which was the entrance to the Zerg lair that dwelled just in that area, and were preparing to attack anyone who came here. The system screen displayed information about the Zerg that appeared from above and exploded in the air, leaving a poisonous trail behind them, which could only be gotten rid of by destroying their leader and rebuilding the destroyed city within twenty minutes. Just at that moment, the Zerg appear above the players in the guise of the usual poisonous mushrooms and begin to use their weakening effect with the duration until the city is restored. The Zerg, as they dispersed their poison over the players, also revealed that the poison would reduce the character's damage output to 10%, to which the second brother replied that it was usually only reduced to 6%. While the team was shrouded in a veil of poison, one of the Zerg clarified some more information about their effects, saying that the player's critical damage would be reduced by as much as 30%. It seemed that because of the effects of the poison, none of the players were interested in what the Zerg had told them, and L was only concerned about one thing, which the second brother noticed immediately and decided to find out what was bothering her. The assistant said with annoyance that the young lord simply hated mushrooms and everything related to them, and judging by the appearance of the zerg, Chu Tiange was simply furious with such rivals. Hitaru suggested that everyone should quickly clear the level and thus get rid of the annoying zerg, but the master refused, arguing that the insects were too annoying and they needed to be destroyed right now. Walking forward a bit more, the players found the recovery zone they were looking for between the numerous debris in the form of a small stone with a notch for something inside it. On the game system screen immediately appeared a choice to rebuild the destroyed and abandoned celestial city with the help of gold coins or missing materials. After a bit of thinking, the young gentleman clicks on the button to rebuild the city with gold coins, as he is not sure of the available stock for the renovation of the entire celestial settlement. On the system monitor, the game starts alternately debiting gold coins from Chu Tiange's account in various sizes, starting from 100 coins to 500 gold coins several times over. From the ruins and ruins, it was as if the heavenly city had not been rebuilt but had been rebuilt entirely, starting from the main towers of the buildings to the roofs and walls of the structures. The young lord's buddies were staring at the screen with undisguised amazement at the gold being written off, while Chu Tiange informed everyone that rebuilding the city was much cheaper than upgrading the guild and that the game system still had some conscience. Hitaru said naively that he was about to have a heart attack from the amount of coins spent, and L, who was used to the young lord spending so much, sweetly suggested that it was just the legendary rich master's stubbornness. The second brother fully supported the young lad, saying that he understood him, and he himself had a heartache after such expenses of Big Brother, and especially his wallet. Meanwhile, the players who remained on Chu Tiange's majestic ship were carefully watching the heavenly city that had changed and revitalized before their eyes. Hitaru's buddies immediately guessed that the team had rebuilt the ruined and abandoned city, but had no way of knowing how they had managed to do so at such a breakneck speed, unless they had some sort of power and superpowers. The game's world announcement congratulated the players on successfully repairing the Sky City and breaking the curse of the poisonous insects, something the wizard was much more excited about than the restoration itself. On the tallest tower of one of the settlement's buildings, Chu Tiange noticed some familiar sign, 
and as he tried to scrutinize it, intense surprise grew on his face. There was a bright blue glow all around the rounded border of the oval symbol with familiar characters, and the master knew for sure that his mom and dad were involved with this sign. But before he could say anything, he heard a voice behind him. Assistant L, who had entered the young master's family from a young age, knew very well that this mark belonged to the Chu family's research institute, which she immediately said loudly. The players resolutely moved forward and went inside the main building to have a look around, and saw there were huge empty halls with tall columns and long staircases. Something that looked like a teleportation point came across the team's path, and Hitaru quickly told everyone that it was a relocation point to enter the Zerg lair, and that was where they needed to go if they wanted to destroy their leader. They walked further down the corridor, and the boy noticed that the last time he was here, such beautiful murals were not there, and El assumed that they were visible because the young lord had rebuilt the celestial city. Chu Tiange, for some reason, decided to stop at the picturesque murals and scrutinize them carefully, as if he was trying to learn something from them or solve some mystery. Suddenly, huge devil armadillos began to appear from nowhere one after another, running straight towards the players to attack. El and Hitaru immediately turned around at the strange noise and the strange pink glow as they saw the new opponents reviving for another fight. The assistant immediately shouted at the young master to be careful as they were surrounded by a bunch of armadillos, but it was as if Chu Tiange had no intention of taking part in the battle and continued to look at the murals on the walls of the main building. Suddenly, Chu Tiange abruptly turned around and loudly shouted that these evil NPC killers had already pissed everyone off, and it was time to deal with them once and for all, at least in this city. The young gentleman called up the game system screen to select the necessary inventory and, having found the necessary tool, clicked on the button to confirm the activation of the protective dome around the entire company from attack. The defensive shield immediately began to line up around his buddies, creating a reliable force field, inaccessible to enemies, which was very surprised little Hitaru, who had never seen anything like it before, looking at everything in complete amazement, and even with his mouth open. The protective dome just had time to fully form and close the friends from the advancing crowd of devil armadillos, which seemed to be getting bigger and bigger by the minute, and they were running straight to the formed shield. Chu Tiange's team was perfectly safe inside the dome while their angry opponents with sharp tips on their paws were attacking the shield, trying to break through it at least in some places to get inside. Chu Tiange kept his eyes on the wall murals all this time. He was so impressed and interested by them that he tried to read something iconic or familiar in them, for even the tower of the main building itself bore the symbol of their research institute. The young master attracted the attention of his friends by pointing to the frescoes and saying that the drawings were very similar to the starry sky in the universe. And while he further tried to figure out the meaning of the drawings, his friends only looked at the walls in amazement. Chu Tiange, with genuine excitement, still continues to look at the murals, where he shows his friends that he sees through the dome two planets standing very close to each other. Next, Unknown people appear on the wall paintings, exchanging something, most likely gifts, and some of them wear incomprehensible masks over their faces, so similar to modern gaming helmets. Players looking at the person standing in the mask begin to realize that he is trying to pull it off his face, but it is useless, as it is simply impossible to remove it by himself. The alarmed assistant notices something very interesting on the mask and immediately informs the young master about it as she saw a familiar symbol drawn on it. Chu Tiange immediately paid attention to Ellie's drawing, and without her immediately realized that the pattern on the mask was exactly the logo of his parents' research institute. Sometime later, the young gentleman asked the girl to write down in great detail all the available murals on the walls so that they could then study them thoroughly, being at home with the right equipment and information, and L quickly got to work. All the players waited for a while while the assistant recorded the drawings from the walls, and once her work was done, Chu Tiange called out for everyone to start attacking the vile devil armadillos that had long been waiting for them at the very edge of the dome. Calmly approaching the base of the defensive shield, 
the young lord's team fully armed themselves with the necessary arsenal for battle on the way, looking at the devastatingly sharp tips on the enemy's paws. Chu Tiange as always stepped in first, possessing the most damage and the best fighting skills, and plus to set an example for the rest, using the combo of the fierce dragon slashing fire sword. Without hesitation, the master flies at breakneck speed through all the devil armadillos at once, dealing them powerful crushing blows with his fiery weapon, thus giving them no chance of survival. Chu Tiange's next attacking move is the Earth Dragon Split, striking all the vile foes with one fierce blow at once and bringing the master another victory over the enemy. Having finished dealing with the devilish armadillos, the young master calmly called everyone to follow him further forward, which did not surprise his friends, with the exception of his newfound buddy Hitaru, who was still in a state of shock from the superpower he had seen. The brave boy had hoped to help in some way and thank the master for all he had done for him, but he only frustratedly told everyone that he felt completely useless on his savior's team. L, who was passing by him, gave Hitaru a friendly pat on the shoulder, cheerfully saying that this was a common occurrence for all of them, and he would just have to get used to this order of things in their team. All four buddies headed back straight down the corridor to the teleportation point for further travel to the Zerg lair, and upon reaching the platform, immediately and simultaneously ascended to its center via the side stairs. Chu Tiange and his friends had been standing on the teleportation platform for some time now, but nothing was happening, and they tried to switch places, which still resulted in nothing. The young master didn't understand what they were doing wrong, and asked the players if any of them knew what to do next to trigger the activation of their movement through this teleporter. No one had time to reply anything to the master, because at that very second, the teleport portal activated, and a sudden, abrupt movement in space began for everyone, thus taking the players by surprise. The brave foursome flew through the tunnel of the open portal to an unknown direction somewhere in the depths of space, staying at this time as if in space weightlessness. The second brother quickly realized that there would be no soft landing and they were about to fall straight to the ground, so he urgently had to activate the reinforced armor mode to be able to reduce the impact damage. At this time, the young lord manages to summon his pet, and as soon as Ursha appears in the tunnel, the dog's master quickly commands him to increase in size, and the beast obediently begins his transformation. Ursha, in a very short period of time, significantly increases to a huge size for the subsequent successful landing of all the players flying directly at him. Once the players are done moving, they are thrown onto a stone slab in the middle of the street with a deafening rumble and dust and dirt flying everywhere from the impact of the fall. On top of the incredibly huge Ursh lying unconscious on the stone slab from the violent impact, players scattered all over the dog's body were lying on top of him softening his landing and reducing the damage he received to zero. All four of them begin to slowly get up and come to their senses, noting the successful soft landing and their unharmed state, which could not be said about the master's pet that saved them. The young master's assistant notices the dog lying unconscious with no visible signs of life and with a worried face asks the master if Ursh will be all right after such a landing. Chu Tiange calls up the game's system screen, adjusting something there, and informs everyone that his beast will be fine once it's fully recovered and resting in the pet vault. While the young master was moving his dog into the system, Hitaru announced that he now realized who his real boss was, calling out Chu Tianje's name, to which L replied that the master is so strong and powerful, and he is so quickly recognized even without his real appearance. A while later, Hitaru, with a sly smile on his face, says a very interesting thing. What young master Chu Yi once did while calling his family name was the best, and can't be compared to anything. Chu Tiange, still entering data into the game system, along with all of his buddies turned around in utter confusion and surprise at the mysterious Hitaru who clearly knew his true identity. The young master immediately closed the system window and transferred all his attention to the kid, suspecting that he might be someone's informant, but Hitaru, only with a smile, seeing the slightly frightened face of the master, says that he, with his behavior, now confirmed his theory about Chu Yi's brother. Chu Tiange is completely confused and bewildered because Hitaru in this case is hardly a fake person, but who he really is, 
the young master did not even dare to guess, and therefore personally asked him about it immediately and asked. The clever kid began to explain that after overhearing their conversations in the beginning of the city, he began to guess everything, and after seeing the logo, immediately stopped doubting, because his father worked in the research institute of the Chu family and he knew him well. The master immediately wanted to know more about where and who his father worked, to which he received the answer that he even participated in the creation of the Project ERA, and managed to tell the guy that the game has very important things that are inseparable from the ERA itself. Chu Tiange abruptly perked up and felt very tense, as he had long been interested in everything related to this game, much less something secret and important from the developers of ERA themselves. The boy only shrugged his shoulders, not knowing what to say to the young master, as his father had immediately had a serious accident afterwards and was still unconscious in St. Louis Hospital for long-term treatment. Chu Tiange asked Hitaru if he was playing for nothing in such a case, or if there was something more to it, to which the guy explained his reasons and goals for this particularly important news, and finding out the circumstances of his father's accident with the possible involvement of it all in the ill-fated game. While the players were talking peacefully, they didn't even notice how sand began to run in from all the corners, crevices, and even roofs. And when they did, the mountains of sand were already rapidly taking over all the buildings in the neighborhood. Chu Tiange didn't want to put any of his friends in any danger, and suggested that everyone quickly get out of there, looking around carefully for possible additional attackers. The players didn't hesitate long over the young lord's suggestion, but simply gestured their agreement and immediately started running as far away as possible from the quicksand that filled the open space. The friends, without looking back, ran into the only sand-free gate in front of them, with the hope that inside they would be able to hide from the misfortune that had befallen them and think over the next plan of action. Just as Chu Tiange's team found themselves inside and ran up the main staircase, right before their eyes, quicksand engulfed and destroyed all the buildings standing there and an army of golden spider armadillos appeared in front of them. The golden opponents with shimmering stones all over their bodies breathed viciously, preparing their sharp tips, and came closer and closer to the four to surround them and attack them further. The second brother, who had finally decided to fight back against the spider-like enemies and surprised those around him with his assertiveness, commanded everyone to go on the attack to mop up the vicious NPC killers, while clarifying that the boss was going to the boss. The young lord noted that his buddy gave a motivational speech just like their named third brother, and praised him for his courage and ingenuity, in response to which the latter said that their trio had learned self-discovery during their friendship. Chu Tiange's team swiftly armed themselves with everything they needed for the offensive and noisily moved forward to attack the golden armadillos bearing down on them. The master carefully ran past all the vicious NPC killers, as if to give his friends a chance to toil in battle while they flew off in different directions from their own blows to their enemies. Chu Tiange saw this and on the move quickly turned around to his buddies to ask how they were doing and if they needed his help. The second brother and Hitaru shouted to the young lord about how those golden armadillos are quite strong and powerfully repel their attacks, causing them to become difficult to deal with. Chu Tiange realizes that it is his time to enter the fray and shouts for everyone to disperse for his attempt to deal with these pesky spiders, flying towards his enemies with a flaming sword in hand. The second brother and Hitaru, watching the young master powerfully smash the entire army of golden armadillos in one fell swoop, shout out that more are sure to fight back, and immediately notice how the master deftly controls the damage. Chu Tiange deftly wields his flaming sword in victory against his opponents, clearly not expecting the battle to end so quickly for them, and takes center stage among the enemies for a more comfortable position to attack all at once. A few seconds later, the army of defeated armadillos lay motionless, emitting smoke in front of the master, who didn't even notice the seriousness of the battle, which as always amazed the buddies who were preparing to help, especially Hitaru. El noticed the change in her second brother's face and asked him what was wrong, to which she heard a reply about how he couldn't get used to the incredibly huge difference between the strength of all of them combined and that of their boss. The other brother tried to calm down, but he was too bad at it, or rather not at all, 
and was hysterically yelling about how far they were from their magnificent boss, and it was useless to even compare them. Meanwhile, a shocked Hitaru mentally entered a quick calculation of the reward for the victory and wondered aloud about how there are so many great weapons, equipment, and abilities, because all this can be only if there is a form of immortality. On the ground in front of the players, there were mountains of rich golden rewards in the form of equipment, armor, weapons, coins, and many other things that the players needed to improve their equipment and combat skills. Chu Tiange didn't take anything for himself and told his friends to take whatever they wanted, surprising them greatly and adding that although all the rewards were immortal, they were still not as good as his inventory. The young master's assistant and the kid were a little embarrassed and at the same time incredibly delighted by such a noble act of the master and couldn't take their eyes off the shiny mountain. The second brother was in a state of complete euphoria from everything that was happening and could only squeeze out that there was nothing better than fighting together with a big brother. L was the first to make a choice among all the available rewards and took a friend in the form of an immortal magical sorcerer's staff with a topaz inside it. The brave Hitaru chose an immortal double-sided axe with long blades to coldly attack future enemies. The final choice was made by the second brother in the form of an addition to his armored sleeve, Fists of Heaven, with sharp blades, and wanted to try it out in action as soon as possible. While the players were enjoying the splendor of their reward, a new attempt by an army of golden armadillos from the Sand Mountains was already being prepared for them, and in the same second, the foursome went on alert and counterattacked. The girl was the first to show her mastery of the new weapon and launched into battle, destroying everything in her path with her magic staff, the impact of which scattered all nearby enemies. The next attacked Hitaru with his immortal double-edged axe, smashing the golden armadillos into small pieces with a single blow. The second brother didn't waste any time either and ran into the attack with an advanced armored armor arm called Fists of Heaven, which made powerful bursts of fire energy when attacking enemies and thus blowing everyone up. Finally, all of the friend's upgraded powerful moves were joined by Chu Tiange himself with his signature move of splitting the evil dragon's ground, aiming his flaming sword at the remaining enemies. From such a bursting blow from the young lord, all the spider enemies are destroyed in a violent, fiery explosion and shattered into small pieces in different directions. The players wandered around the mountain of destroyed golden armadillos in the dispersing smoke, and the second brother said that it was a great practice to test the new weapon, and Ella said that she had never felt such strength and power of the master before and considered him truly invincible. Suddenly, from nowhere, a whole flock of fired arrows flew towards the four buddies at breakneck speed. Such a generous gift from the unknown, just in time to hear and notice the young lord, who had just turned around at the incomprehensible noise and clearly did not expect to see all this. Chu Tiange quickly drew his battle sword and deftly began to defend himself and his friends from the flying arrows, shouting to everyone to urgently run to the shelter that the second brother had managed to put up in the form of a protective dome, while Ele tried to slip away. At some point, the young master, fighting bravely, heard someone's loud scream behind his back, and frightened, almost immediately realized who it belonged to and what had happened there. The master's assistant had fallen to the ground in pain, kneeling on the ground, struck by one of the many arrows fired in her direction, which had hit her exactly in the shoulder, wounding her badly. Turning around in the direction of the scream, Chu Tiange saw the wounded little raccoon and called out to her loudly, but she didn't answer him due to the whistling of the arrows still flying at them. The girl was about to get up to go towards the young master, but suddenly she was frozen in place by the fact that someone's hand with all its strength grabbed her by the fluffy tail on the game suit, thus trying to prevent her. The little raccoon slowly stood up to her full height and felt someone else standing behind her very close by, breathing loudly with a clearly unkind intent toward them all. The young lord's entire team turned around at the unfolding action with a little surprise and fear for the life of their loyal and brave mate. The frightened girl stood in the enemy arms of an unknown armed player in expensive armor who grabbed her not only by the tail but also by the throat and ordered her not to twitch and not to make attempts to escape for her own good. 
an armed army appeared behind the unknown player, and the one, apparently being their leader, ordered that all the immortal gear they had earned be handed over to their possession, as otherwise they would destroy them all and still take the rich reward. Chu Tiange was simply furious at such an unknown person's insolence and was mentally already drawing himself a step-by-step -step ruthless annihilation of his entire army along with him. The little raccoon was terribly angry at the player who had grabbed her and threateningly told him that he didn't have to fight with anyone from her team if he could just fight to defeat one-on-one -on -one with her. The leader of the company liked such a bold character of the girl and he, without hiding it, told her about it, inviting her to his guild to fight with them, to which L gave a categorical refusal, saying that such a thing would happen only in his vile dreams. The young lord, greatly changed in his voice, calmly told the stranger to immediately let the girl go, as they would give all the immortal equipment they had received to them without resistance. Without having time to do anything, the army of attackers saw before them mountains of golden immortal equipment obtained so easily without any military action. Their mouths were wide open in amazement and delight as they gazed at the countless amounts of rich rewards they had received for nothing and were on the verge of killing each other for it. The leader of the company commanded his subordinates to immediately collect all the golden immortal equipment and, upon completion, activate the boss in the dungeon to receive additional rewards. The stranger's army, having hastily gathered all the richest equipment, moved forward with wild excitement to attack the main boss with the hope of a quick victory and reward for it. Suddenly, for the players who were there, even though everyone was expecting the boss to arrive, mountains of sand everywhere began to be sucked inside the ground, forming deep craters for quick access. The players who were running to attack abruptly stopped, and watched with undisguised astonishment as a massive explosion came from the formed funnels and sand scattered all over the area. In front of everyone, a giant golden armadillo with blade-sharp legs crawled out of the exploding mountains of sand, a zerg boss that even the game system couldn't provide information about. L, feeling the release from the strong embrace of the enemy, immediately rushed towards the young master and heard from the leader of the attackers that she was too stupid to choose such a tasteless and unremarkable player for her team and would regret it. The girl, clinging tightly to the strong shoulder of the master, was in mixed feelings and wanted to both run away from the battlefield and pounce on the unknown leader in a fierce fight. Chu Tiange immediately asked the frightened L if she was all right, to which, after hearing a positive answer, he also heard the girl's regret for everything that had happened to them because of her carelessness. The young lord did not seem to care at all about it now, and he only asked her with complete calmness not to worry about anything, as he would take care of everything. Noticing the armed players approaching, Chu Tiange left L in place and quickly walked towards them, finding himself surrounded by them with an order from some guy not to move. The girl standing behind the master whispered a suggestion to him to fight them right now and destroy every single one of them, but the young master refused, saying that he wanted to check something and test them. Meanwhile, the entire army of attackers rose up in a formidable battle against the giant golden armadillo, using all of their many techniques, skills, and abilities to destroy it quickly. At that moment, the game's system monitor displayed the current health of the Zerg boss, which was one-fourth of its life force. The giant golden armadillo, after receiving countless powerful blows, roared menacingly, deafening all nearby players for some time. Players noticed the enraged boss, and one of them said that he had entered a state of bloodlust and they needed to keep a close eye on his future actions and their state of lives. The army of attackers didn't even have time to do anything, as all the players took turns flying away in different directions from the destructive explosive blasts flying from the enraged golden boss. One of the subordinates, who had survived so far, looked at his dead buddies and their flying souls in bewilderment and could not understand what had just happened. While he was staring at the bodies of his partners in amazement, he was hit by a destructive explosive charge that threw him far back to the other players. The leader of the attackers, looking at what was happening around him, quickly realized that the golden armadillo had the ability to reflect damage and they could not win now and needed to get out of there as soon as possible.
Standing on a tall tower free of sand, he immediately commanded all his subordinates to retreat and return to him immediately as the battle was over for today. Judging by the look on the players' faces, they didn't even have to ask him to do that, as they were already on the run from the powerful Zerg boss, who was delivering devastating blows one after another. The giant golden armadillo was not about to end a battle it had not even started, and once again bellowed loudly after the fleeing players, baring its sharp fangs. The enraged Zerg boss caught up with the fleeing players in one giant stride and unleashed a massive blast of explosive fire, blowing away and blinding everything and everyone in its path, thus destroying them all at once. The giant golden armadillo, after dealing with his subordinates in a flash, reached the high tower with the army leader and was already ready to deliver a crushing blow to him. The head of the attackers was simply terrified and not expecting such a quick massacre of his men, quickly tried to defend himself by summoning his shark breath shield to defend against the savage monster. It was at this moment that the golden armadillo launched a clamping attack with its blade-sharp claws, but it hit the protective fireball that had just appeared around the army leader and continued to squeeze him with all its might. The shield of the shark's breath, a short time later, cannot withstand such force and power of the embittered opponent and bursts like a soap bubble, pushing the leader out of himself, flying fast down with the collapsed stone slabs. At the same time, the golden armadillo, ignoring the leader, turns towards the remaining players on the battlefield and looms menacingly straight towards them as they scurry not far away. The players from the attacking army shouted to each other to run and escape, although they themselves did not know how that could be possible with their current situation, while the frightened team of the calm Chu Tiange took refuge within his protective dome. The giant golden armadillo dashingly caught up with the players, unleashing a powerful crushing counterattack on all the characters at once, and everything around it instantly exploded from several waves of fire, blinding and destroying everything in its path. In the thick pall of smoke that dissipates after the explosion, a part of the young lord's protective dome, in which he and his buddies had taken shelter, begins to show up intact. Chu Tiange removes the protective field and steps out to face the evil monster, saying that to defeat the boss, immortal weapons are still not enough, and one must have something much stronger and cooler. The giant golden armadillo, having heard the insolent words of the player going to his certain death, stands up on its hind legs and, baring its fangs, growls menacingly, as if warning him of the coming attack. Chu Tianj is not so easily frightened, and he comes closer to the monster, and triggers the change of his current appearance to the familiar appearance of the richest player Chu in front of the Zerg boss. The reincarnation starts from the bottom up, dressing the master in his former favorite armor, and is accompanied by a blinding golden glow with a bunch of small sparks. The last and final stage of the return of the young master's appearance is the return of his famous and universally recognizable face. The gigantic golden armadillo changed its face at that very second and changed its cruel grin into a friendly smile and cheerful gaze, as if it had just seen something beautiful and charming and could not take its only eye off the master. Chutiange, already fully in his usual appearance, cheerfully said that this spider-like beast immediately seemed familiar to him, and it was as if he had always known it, so he was not afraid of it. Meanwhile, lying wounded on the ground, the leader of the advancing army looked at everything behind the young master's team, and of course, even from the back, he recognized the famous player Chu Tiange. The master moved closer to the gigantic golden armadillo that had already bowed its head before him and stroked it affectionately, greeting it and sweetly calling it a spider that he hadn't seen in a long time. The young gentleman's friends, who were observing such an amazingly strange picture, opened their mouths in astonishment and froze on the spot, unable to utter a word, as they were so much shocked by what was happening. A few years earlier, something very interesting had happened in the Chu Yi family's richest mansion, which was directly related to the current actions in the era today. On the marble table was a small, artificially created golden creature with many legs that looked like a spider, scorpion, and armadillo beetle at the same time. Little Mr. Chu sat in the chair in front of the table and spoke through a video call on the screen to his father, pointing at the creature and asking what it was in front of him. 
The father, working long and hard, informed the little son from the TV screen that it was the latest artificial intelligence as his new gift, and that he could even talk to it. The small artificial being spoke first, greeting the little master in a friendly manner and waiting for further instructions and orders from him. Little Chu Yi did not even hope for such a gift from his father, and assumed that he just wanted him to test it and give his opinion on the advantages and disadvantages of the device. The father realized that so simply smart son cannot bribe, and said directly that for his company is very important to calculate the balance of the benefit to the player, as it is an integral part of turning the game into a realistic world. The little gentleman just brushed it all off, saying that it was none of his business, and besides, the creature was too ugly and unnecessary for him, so let his father take it away and test everything himself for his dear company. At this time, someone entered the room and brought the uncooperative boy a cup of hot, delicious tea before dinner. The person who entered the room turned out to be a little girl named Elle, who immediately turned all her attention to acute artificial intelligence in the form of some incomprehensible creature. The tiny golden-colored creature immediately sensed the connection between the girl and the little master and friendly climbed onto her arm, causing Elle to be wildly excited and interested in such a cute creature in her opinion. Chu Yi immediately noticed that his girlfriend really liked such a gift, and he without any interest, with a cup of tea in his hands, informed his father that they would keep it for fun. The father was very happy that at least someone managed to convince his son to keep the artificial intelligence, thus testing its abilities and skills in work, and he asked the little raccoon to take good care of him and, if possible, to communicate with him. The little raccoon immediately agreed, and introduced herself to the creature by her family name El Xiaotan, inquiring what she could call him and heard back that the little master had not given him a name yet. The boy sat quietly in the chair, not knowing what name this gift deserved and said that he was something like a spider, only small, so they would just call him Spider. The spider flirted merrily with the young master and giggled, no doubt recognizing him even after so many years, and Ella began to remember the familiar name and gazed intently at the giant golden armadillo. After a moment, the girl realized what spider she was talking about and waved her hands and shouted a nice greeting to him, still not believing her eyes in the truth of what was happening. Through the shroud of thick smoke, Elle began to shout loudly to the spider about who she was and how happy she was to see him again while the rest of their teammates were completely bewildered and confused. The golden spider quickly reacted to the familiar voice, and of course recognized the little raccoon that had so carefully and carefully protected him for several years. The giant creature was thrilled to meet his loved ones and began to walk on his hind legs, hissing merrily and picking up a pile of sand and dust from the ground. The spider was very grateful to the young master and his assistant for everything they had done for him, and as a small gift, he spilled out a huge pile of various golden armor and equipment to them. On the ground in front of the master, there was a whole mountain of excellent awards and other things on the ground, but Chu Tiange didn't seem to be interested in any of that. After a short period of time, an unknown but somewhat familiar object flew from the game system directly towards the young master, emitting a bluish glow. Chu Tiange watched the approaching object with bated breath, and the closer it flew, the clearer it became to the master what was in front of him. The mask fell straight into the hands of the still-surprised young master, and he finally realized what he was now holding in front of him. The system screen displayed information about the item as a mysterious mask that was a special plot attribute that could not be reset on its own. While Chu Tiange was studying the information he received about the attribute, he heard someone running fast behind him, while the other brother was shouting, apparently in pursuit, that they couldn't get far and fate would still catch up with them. The young master turned around and saw the leader and his surviving subordinates running away, taking with them the reward given to them by the golden armadillo, which was noticed by the other players and shouted to the master. The army of attackers had already managed to take their places in the protective shields of the shark's breath, activating the teleportation mode, and began shouting for their boss to jump towards them as he barely ran while trying to carry away a huge amount of loot. Chu Tiange was not going to just watch all of this in silence, and decided to act categorically, summoning his favorite weapon for battle, the mighty dragon spear. 
The leader of the attackers managed to jump into the shark's breath shield, and lastly said that since his opponent was Chu Tiange himself, he would leave a teleport portal for him and politely said goodbye. All of the shark shields were closed and prepared to instantly move in teleportation mode, while the young lord and his friends watched all of this, but did not even think of retreating. Meanwhile, the leader, who was in his protective ball, proudly thought only of the fact that with such a powerful shield, even the richest player, Chu Tiange, would not be able to catch up with them, much less cripple them. The master did not take a step towards the brazen rogues, taking a fighting stance and prepared to attack, swinging his spear for a more accurate, crushing blow towards the shield where the gang leader was. Taking good aim, the young lord powerfully threw the spear with a strong jerk, which flew at breakneck speed into the intended aiming point. The spear with its tip blasted through several shields at once, reaching the protective ball of the leader himself, and flew right into the center of the shark's breath a couple of centimeters from the enemy's face, breaking the shield into small shards. The gang leader and his subordinates flew down, losing both their defenses and teleportation point at the same time, furious that even at such a great distance, his shark's breath shield had been shattered by some Chu Tiange. A couple seconds later, the entire army of vile humans fell to the ground with a thunderous crash, raising dust, dirt, and chunks of earth into the air with a huge smokescreen around them. Some subordinates were lying unconscious, while some of them, partially injured but not completely destroyed, were slowly regaining consciousness along with the leader and trying to get back on their feet after such a crushing fall. Chu Tianj came closer to the head of the attacking gang, which no longer looked like a strong and brave. As before, the army and literally lay at the feet of the master and looked him directly in the eyes, full of regret for all that had been done. The young master, along with his friends, looked menacingly at the former leader of some now defunct army and scrutinized his facial expression, thinking over the fate of his enemy. The former leader, sitting on his knees in Chu Tianga's intimidating shadow, quickly realized his imminent fate and looked pleadingly at the master, begging for mercy and forgiveness. The young master didn't even blink an eye and threateningly commanded his old spider friend to get rid of the pesky trash as soon as possible. The giant golden armadillo immediately appeared and accepted his master's order, quickly activating the emergency garbage collection mode, taking on a sinister appearance and stepping on the terrified player. The spider opened its mouth wide with teeth as sharp as stakes and formed something like a sucking bottomless hole in the light of sparkling lightning. The former gang leader realized that this was the end and no one would save him, but he did not want to accept such a humiliating defeat and the coming terrible doom. The world announcement of the game congratulated all the players of Chu Tiange's team for completing the location Heavenly City Coup in just over ten minutes. Waiting for them all this time on the greatest ship, Hitaru's buddies heard the announcements with the richest player's name and were surprised that their boss and savior was actually Chu Tiange. On the Song Country's revival field, one after another travel tunnels with the players who had died earlier in Heavenly City appeared in a bright flash, and brought those players back to life, lowering them a level. At last, the leader of all the players who had appeared there before him finally revived on the field and became terribly angry at what he thought was a rash act on Chu Tiange's part, threateningly promising himself to avenge him for everything. One of his subordinates heard the promise of revenge and reminded the boss of the instruction from the Singularity Organization that ordered him not to contact Chu Tiange for the time being but their opinions didn't seem to bother the leader at all right now, and he decided to do as he saw fit. He also angrily added that he was only using the singularity because of their resources for his own benefit, and that the sea had always been his territory, and even Chu Tiange wouldn't be able to defeat him there. When Chu Tiange's entire crew moved back to the deck of the ship, their onward journey was accompanied by the ancient dragon-like beast Dion. Hitaru, looking at the nine-headed sea beast, wondered how Chen Hai, now known to everyone as the former leader of the attackers, was able to get into Heavenly City if this teleporter was only for four people. The dragon began to explain to the lad that he was right about four people, but it was only through him, and since Chen Hai was a shark, he had gotten hold of deep sea bubbles and created shark breath shields, 
thus flying into the city right on top of them. The young master didn't understand how the dragon-like beast knew so well that Chen Hai was widely known in the sea and asked him about it. The sea beast replied that this Chen really only relied on himself, and in the sea, he had always been extremely arrogant, appropriating all the available resources to himself. The second brother immediately recalled the incredible speed at which they had built their sea guild, which happened to be created from looted resources from the sea floor, and agreed with the dragon about Chen Hai's excessive arrogance. While the players were having a conversation amongst themselves, an alert appeared on Chu Tiangge's system screen about the ancient dragon emperor's hidden mission to help the dragon-like beast clan escape the seal. The mission also mentioned the possibility of unlocking the hidden skill Taiku Dragon Breath after completing the main mission and a button to confirm it appeared, where the master quickly clicked. At this point, something suddenly begins to powerfully wobble and rock the majestic ship, pouring seawater onto the deck and knocking the players down, trying to destroy everything and everyone on this ship. The second brother realizes that someone is attacking the ship from below and loudly informs everyone about it, to which Ella immediately guesses that it can only be one person seeking revenge, Chen Hai. At this time, a dragon-like beast flies up to the ship for rescue and calls everyone to him, and the young lord shouts to all his friends to get on top of Dion's head from the attacked deck as soon as possible. Next comes the sharp, powerful crash of a huge sea wave against the bottom of the ship, plunging the whole vessel into the embrace of the water and making several long, decisive cracks in it at once. The greatest ship of Chu Tianja cannot withstand such deep damage, and with a crack and rumble breaks into several parts, quickly becoming covered with water and going to the bottom. All the members of the young master's crew manage to comfortably settle on one of the heads of the ancient sea monster, and there, from a great height, regretfully watched the ship's speedy wreck, quickly floating away. Suddenly, someone's loud voice was heard from somewhere, shouting for them not to even think about saving themselves or trying to escape, and immediately ordered someone to throw huge steel chains on the dragon-like beast, which had already been thrown out of the water towards Dion. Chu Tiange, what everyone else on the sea beast's head, did not expect such a swift attack, and flew up from the powerful strike that came from the heavy chains that were thrown around the ancient dragon's neck for several turns. The steel chains powerfully encircled the neck of the sea monster's main head, giving it no chance to break free. And from Dion's attempts to escape the trap, the players flew high into the sky in different directions. All four buddies flew far beyond the dragon, dashing downward with a whistle, and unwillingly ducked under the water, completely submerging themselves in the East China Sea. The players were still reeling from what had happened, and were slowly sinking to the bottom beginning to slowly realize what had just happened to them as the inexplicable sea object swam towards them. The young gentleman was the first to notice something that looked very much like soap bubbles, and just as he was thinking about what it could be, they all found themselves individually inside each of the bubbles with no way to get out, as they immediately closed up completely. While the guys were trying to figure out what had happened and how to get out, the bubbles pushed them all to the surface of the water with a powerful jerk. Once above the water, the girl immediately tried to free herself from the ball that engulfed her and used her magic staff, but the blows only reverberated inside the ball, in no way breaking its integrity. Elle asked loudly why she couldn't break the bubble, and the hovering Hitaru told her that it was a Chen Hain shark's breath shield, with an inscribed seal that had special powers, and therefore couldn't be broken from within. At this time, Subordinates from Chen Hai's army pop up from the depths of the sea one by one, smiling echidiacally while hoping for a swift reprisal of the master's team and sweet revenge. The young master looks at all of this through an impenetrable shield and carefully considers his next steps regarding their invaders and their leader. Finally, a self-satisfied Chen Hai appears from the depths of the seafloor on the wakeboard, holding him to the surface of the water, and wonders to Chu Tiange what it would be like for him to find himself in the shoes of a victim, and even in a sealed shield of shark's breath. It seems it's not at all as simple as Chen thought, and the master knows exactly what to do next, smirking at his opponent's speech and saying that the bubble is good enough, and now it belongs to him completely. 
The leader of the Sea Guild was instantly enraged by such an impudent statement from the young master and decided that he was just teasing him, not realizing the gravity of the situation he and his team members were in. Immediately after his words, Chu Tiange took out some card and turning it over to face Chen Hai and saying that he was also a draftsman, informed him that he was not the only one here with the sealing skill. After these words from the master, the exact same cards with rotating arrows were simultaneously taken out by the rest of the satisfied players of Chu Tiange's team. The young master loudly said the purpose of the rune change card and a fiery blinding flash appeared, knocking all the subordinates standing nearby off their wakeboards, thus beginning their action. Taking advantage of the element of surprise, the master immediately commanded all of his friends to quickly dive underwater in shark breath shields as deep as possible. All four soap bubbles with the players inside deftly dived as close to the sea floor as possible, leaving only linear waves behind them. But then Chen Hai thought that the master's plan wasn't so perfect since they had captured the bubbles and dived into the sea, which is the leader's territory, instead of just soaring into the air. Chen Hai was already preparing for a powerful dive underwater, and before he did so, he managed to order all his men to quickly dive after him and catch up with all the fools in the shark's breath shields. The army of subordinates bullet dived powerfully deep into the sea, trying to catch up with the bubbles with the players floating far to the bottom and pay them back for everything. As the exasperated Chen Hai swiftly swam towards his destination, he thought about the fact that the young master could still do something to prevent them from capturing them and accomplishing what they had planned. Chu Tiange and his friends were already swimming towards the seabed as they encountered a huge split-shaped crack in their path, preventing them from swimming all the way into the bubble due to the insufficient size of the gap. Chen Hai, although he saw the small size of the split, still visibly became anxious and nervous, assuming that nothing good would end if the master was already up to something. Swimming closer to the crack, the second brother asked the young master what they should do about it, as it was like a barrier blocking their further path to the sea floor. Chu Tiange did not take long to answer, and in the same instant, he shouted that they should smash this crack and deftly swung his spear to strike through the shield, piercing a huge hole in the crack. Chen Hai was once again wildly surprised and angry at the same time, for he had not even imagined that a master with just one strike would be able to blow up such a powerful barrier and get inside. The young master waited for the undermined barrier to fully open and boldly walked forward in a bubble through the underwater gorge, leading his buddies to the desired point. A satisfied Chu Tiange carried the sealed double Jupiter ring attribute to the desired point and carefully inserted it into the available notch on the pillar telling his team that everything had finally gone splendidly and smoothly, and they were close to victory. After activating the sealed attribute, something akin to an earthquake began, rocking the seawater into foam and the players in sharks' breath shields. A moment later, it was announced to the entire underwater gorge that Chen Hai's seal had finally been successfully released, and this meant that the players could escape the bubbles on their own whenever they wished. The young master was in no hurry to free himself from the shield and was thinking about something before his thoughts were interrupted by his second brother loudly calling out his name. Chu Tiange plunged into a very recent memory from an hour ago when they were still in Heavenly City after defeating the Sea Guild in the Zerg's lair and meeting the spider. After disembarking the ship briefly and walking through the city, the young master asked Hitaru what the bubbles were that Chen Hai had used in the lair for protection and teleportation. Hitaru began to explain to the master that these bubbles were used for battles in the water and were controlled by a sealed rune, also having the ability to sink underwater and soar high into the air. El was worried that the young master had something in mind and asked if he wanted to confront anyone but the master only replied that he would not remain silent in case of an attack and should be ready for anything. After a while, he also added that he was not going to be the first to get involved in anything, but if things didn't go according to plan, they should have maps with them, which he immediately handed to each of his men. In the underwater gorge, the Chen Haya Sea Guild's armed army led by Chen Haya was already approaching the place with the players where the seal had been released. The young lord with a smirk on his face thanked Chen Haya for his shark breath shields, adding that without them, 
he and his team wouldn't have been able to descend so deep into the sea. The Sea Guild leader wasn't exactly sure of the Master's next plan of action yet, but he already realized that he had been tricked and became terribly angry. Chu Tiange interrupted his conversation with Chen Hai and turned to his team members, asking them to go forward now and not wait for him. Chen Hai angrily rushed out to attack the master, armed with the Neptune trident, and began shouting along the way that no one would ever dare to harm his good deeds, and anyone who dared to attempt to do so would receive a powerful rebuke. Chu Tiange had already launched a retaliatory attack, shouting to the leader that it was still necessary to find out who was harming whom, because he was not the one who bought endless resources, sealed dragons and beasts, robbed players for personal gain, and dared to brazenly talk about his good deeds to his face. The young lord and the leader of the Sea Guild met in the middle of the path and clashed weapons, dealing powerful crushing blows to each other. As they continued to attack each other, Chen Hai said, as if to justify himself, that they were just dumb as chickens, bots, and weak players, and it didn't mean anything. The enraged leader added to Chu Tianzhu that he was just as stupid and weak as everyone else, even if he was called a god, because the sea was not his territory and he was doomed to fail here. He sharply pointed his Neptune trident straight at the master's face, hoping for a quick victory, but the latter deftly put up his spear as a defense and countered his opponent. Chen Hai decided to launch a nuclear fire attack using the magic ability of his trident as his next attack technique. But it was all in vain. The master, as well as his bubble, were unharmed. At this moment, the leader of the Sea Guild called for all of his subordinates to attack the young master, and finally added that they should not return without his head. Chen Haya's army was already purposefully running to attack towards the master, who told their boss that he was thinking in vain about his absolute invincibility in the sea space. At this moment, the game system screen displayed Chu Tiange's congratulations for completing the Taiku Dragon's hidden mission and activating the Taiku Dragon's breath secret skill, wishing him good luck in the future game. Fire trails appeared around the young master, and he informed Chen Haiyu that he would try out his powerful new skills on him right now. Staying still in the shark breath shield, Chu Tiange formidably summoned the new powers to test their power, which descended upon him in the light of dazzling, fiery waves. The bright waves were so dazzling to those around him that all the players not far away flew backwards with tremendous force, unable to stop on their own. In front of the entire Sea Guild army and their boss, in place of the dazzling fiery waves, a huge, furious golden dragon appeared in all its glory with an annihilating roar. Chen Hai looked puzzled at Chu Tiange's ability that had appeared, and a short while later, he was already in a state of anger, shouting at his opponent that he was a fraud and a cheat who did not deserve such power. The young lord didn't seem to be hurt by any of the Sea Guild leader's words, and seemed to pay no attention to himself as he summoned the breath of the dragon Taiku in the light of the flickering sparks. In the same second, the huge torsos of several golden angry dragons formed from the small sparks and headed straight towards Chen Haiyu, knocking down everything and everyone in their path. The vicious Taiku dragons attacked the subordinates of the Sea Guild, scattering them in different directions one after another, and one of them, which was the main monster, finally reached Chen Hai. The leader of the Sea Guild looked straight into the fiery eyes of the Taiku dragon with horror, knowing what inevitable fate awaited him now. A second later, a massive nuclear explosion occurs in the underwater gorge, destroying everything within a ten-meter radius, and the young lord hears the last screams of the greedy and vile scoundrel Chen Haya. Meanwhile, the other players hovering in the air above the sea in bubbles were pondering whether their boss had already dealt with the leader of the Sea Guild, when they suddenly realized everything themselves when they saw the floating equipment on the surface of the water. They rested in their shields for a few more minutes until L spotted a young lord floating out in the distance and informed everyone. The ancient dragon-like beast Dion, having freed himself from his chains not without the master's help, swam over to personally offer him a word of thanks for his rescue. The Sea Beast presented several impressive chests of golden divine equipment as a small gift to Dragon Emperor Chu Tianju from the entire Dragon Beast clan. 
The master thanked his nine-headed buddy for such a generous gift and asked him to keep it safe in his possession until he had some space in his inventory, as he still had a few uncompleted quests in reserve. The dragon-like beast Dion, of course, agreed, inquiring where the young lord was headed next, and learned that it would be the land of Yun. The sea beast offered the dragon emperor Chu Tianju to take him from the sea on his own straight to the desired country, and the latter gladly agreed. All four players climbed onto one of the ancient Dion's heads and began their short journey, speeding along the waves of the sea. Along the way, El expressed her regret that Hitaru, whom they had all grown accustomed to, would have to leave them at the end of their journey and return to his place. Chu Tiange, on the other hand, asked Dion if he could become a rider, to which he heard in reply that although dragons could not leave the sea, they or their beast clan would always come to his aid at the call of a dragon bead, which satisfied the young master's curiosity. The master was pleased with himself and his bargain with Dion when Ella called out loudly that they could already see some coastline ahead of them. All the travelers riding the sea monster had arrived at the shores of the yet undiscovered country of Yang, which the dragon himself had informed them about. The players said a friendly goodbye to Hitaru and the dragon, thanking the latter for his help in traveling, and rode down to the shores of the new country, taking Ursh with them. The second brother noticed how the young lord, having opened the system screen, was quickly looking for someone or something with his gaze and decided to ask why they had come here in the first place. Chu Tiange began to explain to his buddy that he didn't even need to look for anything here, as thanks to his krypton and gold privileges, the friendliness of all NPCs was maximized for him. He also told him that there was a mythical merchant here that none of them had ever met before, and from whom they could purchase rather rare items at a very favorable price. L, stroking the dog affectionately, remembered that the young master had already mentioned the secret merchant once before when it came to the mythical pet beast egg from which Ursha had later emerged. Chu Tiange, looking into the monitor, began to tell him that he had only seen the merchant once in the Tang and Song countries, and if it wasn't a server error, he should appear in each country at least once, which was what the master here expected him to do. The second brother suggested that this was quite reasonable, because if these bots appeared to all players everywhere and at all times, it was unlikely that special portals would be created for them, and something really worthwhile could be found from them. A second later, the second brother thought to himself that, with the maximum NPC friendliness available, the master didn't need to specifically look for the merchant, as he should find him himself, and bring all the artifacts right to his feet. Chu Tiange pondered over his buddy's stated theory, and decided that when the time was right, that would be exactly what would happen, and the merchant himself would come out to meet him. Suddenly, the young gentleman quickly ran towards the city and began to shout to his friend to catch up with him, to find someone in the street and ask if the secret merchant had not appeared here yet, and if anyone knew about his next appearance. Meanwhile, somewhere in the Tang country of Luyang City in the Ghost Valley on the 45th level at the entrance to the Dung, one of the bots was standing there thinking about something. Suddenly, and very loudly, this bot sneezed turning out to be the very mysterious merchant that the young lord was so desperately searching for earlier. The NPC sneezed a few more times in a row and thought that the server had a health damage function, and he had caught a cold. The mythical merchant was about to enter the dunge cave when a sharp, cold breath and several magical vortices with a purple glow flew out from there. The merchant did not immediately understand what was happening, and, paying attention to the colored swirls, began to guess that something terrible was about to emerge from the cave. The merchant decided not to test his fate, considering all his previous adventures, and ran away from the cave somewhere behind the trees. At the same moment, a creature with giant claws began to emerge from the dunge cave, one of which stepped powerfully onto the ground, kicking up a column of dust and dirt. A second later, a full-fledged monster stood at the entrance to Dunge, which was a huge, vicious spider with sharp claws and a serrated back, wanting something to eat immediately. The mythical merchant, hiding behind the nearest safe tree, peacefully awaited the departure of the terrible spider as far away from his dwelling as possible. The merchant finally waited for the mother of the devouring spider to leave to hunt for about half an hour, and quietly entered her dwelling 
hoping to find something of interest to her. Chu Tiange ran at breakneck speed with his friends to the city of Yang Zizin and commanded everyone to split up into different streets and search for all available large and small unions for the most accurate lead on the merchant. The players finally reached the desired town and began to look at all of its virtual inhabitants, hoping to extract some useful information about the merchant. The young lord approached the first soldier he saw and asked him which portal the mythical merchant might be at right now, but the soldier didn't know the answer to that question. Chu Tiange was pondering the next plan of action in case the portal was not found soon, and he would not wait for his random discovery, he would act on his own. At the same moment, the young master heard the sound of the game's system notification about a new letter received on his personal mail. The master did not understand how he could get this letter, because he blocked all possible annoying friend requests and should not receive unknown messages. The letter contained a gift in the form of a flower and a text that said that the sender hoped the master would accept the gift and would not make any attempts to unravel his identity, because when the time came, they would meet each other anyway. After carefully examining the flower, Chu Tiange quickly realized that it was a Ching Feng Ling, a very rare and valuable attribute, and was confused for a moment. The young master began to lose himself in speculation as to who this mysterious sender could be and how he knew that he needed this flower right now, although he did not notice any hostility between the lines. Mentally, he began to berate himself for wanting to figure out the anonymous sender and decided to just accept this generous gift since this mysterious person didn't want to reveal the cards right now. On the outskirts of Yan Cizan City, a group of unknown subcategory warriors grabbed a girl and tried to force her to join their guild, to which the girl only waved away, saying that she was not a warrior at all. One of the players asked the frightened girl if she thought she was better than them, and the other player picked up the conversation and added with a chuckle that it wasn't hard to be a warrior. All you had to do was make a toast and drink good wine. Suddenly the players heard someone's approaching footsteps behind their backs and turned sharply to the noise. L stood proudly in front of the crowd of characters with a magic staff and said with a serious look that they couldn't do what they were going to do, as each player was free to choose a guild to join. One of the guys entered the conversation with her, saying that she was apparently new since she hadn't heard about the strength of their alliance, to which Ella replied with a chuckle that she was a complete ignoramus since in this country dog training was called an entire alliance. The little raccoon really pissed off the gang with her words, and the guy who had spoken to her earlier changed his tone abruptly, telling her to be careful what she said if she didn't think it was a good idea to stand alone against an entire gang. The guys from the gang didn't wait long and went straight into an armed assault, running briskly towards the brave L. The little raccoon was not going to just stand there and used her magic staff on the players who were quickly running towards her. Before they even got halfway there, they had to fend off magical discharges of electric lightning that explode when they come in contact with something or someone. After reaching the brave girl, the guys try to fight back, but they do not succeed well, because L does not give them even a chance to attack, making powerful discharges of electrical energy one after another. Suddenly, one of the guys decided to step from the back and swung his mace, but luckily Ella was also very agile and dodged the blow in time. The little raccoon decided that she had had enough, and she no longer wished to play their silly games, going to step over these cheeky players with obviously low levels. L abruptly gains momentum and attacks all the players at once from different directions with explosive blows, throwing them far back. The girl clearly wasn't done yet and wasn't going to stop, smoothly moving on to the next crushing blows for her opponents. L, using her magic staff, shot a ball of lightning with a powerful paralyzing effect at the players and blocked their ability to attack her. While the players were thrashing around in agony and wishing for the lightning discharge to stop, the girl calmly walked past them and reasoned about how nice it was to have a bonus skill to attack inferior players who would never match up to her. Elle walked over to the startled girl who thanked her quietly a few times and told her to hurry up and get out of there while she dealt with them. While the girls were talking, the little raccoon heard the sound of an object flying towards them and quickly looked around trying to find the source of the gunshot. At breakneck speed, an arrow with a sharp tip was flying straight towards the girls with a whistling sound, clearly not there by accident. 
L, having great experience and skill, shouted to the girl to lie down and deftly pushed her aside, protecting her from the arrow flying at them. The arrow crashed straight into the rocky cliff behind them at high speed, making a hole in it. The little raccoon was not confused and loudly asked who was hiding there in the darkness and shooting cold arrows without warning. An unknown voice from the gloom somewhere nearby answered loudly that it had definitely already hidden its destroying arrows and was waiting to meet such a nimble opponent. On one of the hills, a tall, red-haired guy stood with a crossbow in his hands, surrounded by his army, and said that he had underestimated the girl, and her level was a bit higher than he had expected. Just at that moment, some guy ran up to him and started calling him boss, wanting to tell him something right now. The player moved closer to his and the boss on the hill and pointed his finger at L, informing him that this was the same girl he had managed to warn him about earlier, and was hoping for a fair punishment for her. Suddenly, the boss pushed his subordinate with all his might into his stomach so that the subordinate's eyes sparkled and he flew backwards with a thud a few meters. The boss was simply enraged and ashamed of the members of his army who still dared to open their cowardly mouths after failing to deal with one little girl together and came running like dogs to ask for his help. Looking at everything that was happening, L quickly realized that the real leader of the guild that had attacked the defenseless girl at the cliff earlier was just this very formidable red-haired guy, and loudly called out to him. The guy, of course, heard the little raccoon's voice and immediately answered her, introducing himself as Hawk and the head of their guild of trackers. He scrutinized the girl from head to toe and stated that with her cool equipment and skill level, she was very effective in battle, and he wondered what guild she belonged to, which he asked her, but didn't get a clear answer from the feisty girl. The guild leader naturally didn't like such an answer, but he tried to show composure and simply added that she couldn't answer in such a manner based on her desires since she was in a battle against his brothers, and they should definitely discuss this point. The little raccoon didn't even think of giving herself or her team away and only shrugged cheerfully, saying that she was in too good of a mood today and forgave them and let them go home in peace. The leader of the Pathfinder Guild could no longer tolerate being treated like this in front of his team, and at the same moment he loaded his crossbow with an arrow and fired it, aiming it precisely at the insolent girl. The young lord's assistant had expected such a turn of events and was already ready, deftly dodging the arrow that flew at her with a whistling sound. It seems that L got bored and decided to tease the leader. She began to make faces and wiggle in response to the shot, sticking out her tongue like a little child, and in the end she offered them to attack herself. The hot-tempered and aggressive commander shouted all over the valley that the little girl would regret all her actions and words and would give him all her rich equipment and money today, bitterly regretting what she herself had done. He immediately threateningly ordered all his subordinates to prepare crossbows with loaded arrows for battle and aim at the girl's head. El was still amused by the situation and said with a smile that she had already given them time to leave or change their minds, and whatever happened next would be their own fault. She quickly opened the system screen of the game, revealing the young lord as a friend and sending him her exact coordinates, and told them not to beg for mercy later on for failing to calculate their strength properly, and not to say that she didn't warn them. Chu Tiange heard the sound of a system notification, and after summoning the screen to view it, he saw the following. Ella had sent him some coordinates, apparently with her location, and he immediately realized that she needed his help. At the same second, the members of the Pathfinder Guild released arrows from their crossbows at the intended target on command and loaded new ones. The little raccoon froze in anticipation of her savior and decided to do nothing as she hoped he would make it just in time. The moment the arrows almost reached the girl, an inexplicable bright glow lit up, breaking and throwing all the enemy arrows aside. The hawk was already expecting to soon receive his victorious reward, as he abruptly changed in his face, looking with anger and some anxiety towards the still-living girl and someone else's unfamiliar figure. The young lord appeared just in time right in front of the little raccoon, thus shielding her with himself and fending off all of the tracker's attacking blows. Chu Tiange looked at the slightly embarrassed assistant and couldn't help but ask what she was doing here, hearing in response how she had encountered some problems 
and in addition had stumbled upon one of the strongest guilds in the lands. For some reason, Hawk didn't recognize the richest player, Chu, perhaps because of the darkness around him, or maybe because of his own sense of superiority. But nevertheless, when he saw the master, he only carelessly said that there was another character to be killed. The guild leader quickly ordered all of his subordinates to load arrows into their bows and shoot accurately at the target, which they obediently did, while Chu Tiange calmly waited for his time to come. The released arrows once again failed to reach their destination, breaking and scattering on the ground. The Pathfinder Guild captain simply became furious and extremely bloodthirsty, as he once again did not understand how these two had managed to survive and so easily swing away from all the blows at once. Chu Tiange and his faithful assistant at this time were inside the protective dome he had cleverly put up in front of the enemy shots for defense. The young master cheerfully said that it was now their turn to attack, and Ella warned him to be a bit more gentle, as if he overreached and wiped everyone out, they would have no one to ask about the portal with the secret merchant. The master cheerfully nodded his head and agreed with his assistant's words, assuring her that he would definitely leave one of them for dessert. Chu Tiange opened a small passage in the protective dome for himself and began to step out of it towards the armed troops of the Pathfinder Guild. The young master pushed off so powerfully for the ensuing jump that he made giant cracks in the ground as a reminder of his strength. The master quickly flew towards his opponents to carry out his intended plan. Chu Tiange, in one powerful leap, quickly reached the high hill where the army stood, and holding his spear tightly, he caused a thunderous explosion with lightning flying around. A tremendous nuclear explosion occurred on the mountain with a blindingly bright flash in the light of the thunderbolts, throwing off destroying everything and everyone in its path. Chu Tiange stood victoriously on the hill in the dissipating smoke and silently watched as souls flew out of the bodies of the destroyed players to be reborn. The master didn't know exactly where Hawk was standing and had inflicted maximum damage in the place where most of his subordinates were so that the commander could be used for his own purposes later on. Chu Tiange exhaled deeply when he saw Hawk alive, for he had almost sent him to the rebirth field with the rest if he had been unlucky and 90% of the attack hadn't hit the ground. Otherwise, the commander would have definitely been caught. His buddies were already rushing towards the young lord, shaking the air and kicking up dust and dirt. The second brother began to ask the master what had happened here, and if he needed their help, and he replied that he was just in time. Chu Tiange informed his friend that the person they were looking for, who was also the head of the toughest guild in the area, had surrendered and the second brother began to shout to the hawk not to pretend and to get up as they could see ten more health on his vitals. The Pathfinder Guild leader stubbornly showed no signs of life and lay motionless, unwilling to make contact with anyone. Chu Tiange summoned his pet, and Ursha immediately rushed over to sniff hawk, leaning against his face. The Pathfinder captain sensed the presence of some animal, and upon opening his eyes and seeing Ursha, he jumped up in a wild fright, jumping far back with loud screams. Chu Tiange's entire crew came closer to Hawk, who was lying on the ground with a menacing look, expecting him to give any explanation. The captain had no choice but to throw himself at the feet of the master and beg for forgiveness and mercy, while mentioning that he was killing monsters day and night for the sake of leveling up to break through to the top of the top players. The young master got tired of listening to Hawk's silly whining and ordered him to shut up and answer a few questions if he really wanted to stay alive and leave quietly. All battered and in tattered gear, the captain knew he had no choice and quickly agreed to all the terms, promising to tell everything he knew. The young gentleman asked Hawk if he knew where the secret merchant might be dwelling now or where he intended to appear soon. Without waiting for an answer, Chu Tiange menacingly repeated the question again, and the captain quickly replied that he knew for sure, as his team had recently passed the dungeon and something else. The second brother could not stand it and intervened in the conversation, saying that they were not interested in the details of his team's adventures, and if he had something to say, let him stop being so intrusive and rather get to the point. Hawk began to tell them that there was too high a difficulty and the maximum number of players allowed was five, and that in order to go straight to the secret merchant, you had to complete a hell-level quest from the system. 
He also added that his team had been trying to do this for a whole week, but to no avail, and then the master asked about the hidden modes. Hawk said that besides those modes, he himself had also developed a special strategy, which Chu Tianzhu especially liked and asked the captain to guide them there. Without hesitation, the guild leader agreed and led the young lord's team deep into the forest, to the entrance of the cave. All four players climbed the long staircase of the lost building, and Hawk said to put his hand directly on the glowing stone slab to open the entrance to the portal. The young lord stepped closer to the stone and did as the captain told him, and placed his hand in the center of the desired stone. A second later, the portal activated and the moving process began, throwing piles of large stones outward. The players moved closer to the activated portal and, after waiting for the debris to end, all stepped inside at the same time. The portal lit up with a bright pearlescent flash with blue sparks and transported the players to their desired destination. Chu Tianga's team, along with Ursh, found themselves on one of the cliffs of the dungeon looking for opponents. The young lord did not wait for the attack and suggested that everyone move forward on their own to search for the boss to destroy and complete the quest as quickly as possible. Hawk blocked everyone's way, saying that they should listen to him, as this side was the first level of the dunge in the form of a swampy abyss, and added something about a hidden mode. What he clarified about the mode was that when they were in the first level of the dunge, they wouldn't be able to destroy more than three monsters before defeating the boss. The second brother looked around and told the big brother that there was a huge monster not far away in the mountains. After carefully looking around and the immediate surroundings, he said that there were more than a hundred monsters ambushed below them in the swampy thicket, but they didn't have much health, and so they would be very easy to finish them off. Hawk interrupted the second brother's observation and said that they didn't know the exact number and location of the monsters, and that as long as they were around, the creatures would chase them on their heels without stopping for anything. He also added that the monster's attacks would only get better with time, and was about to start talking about his plan when he abruptly stopped talking. The Pathfinder Guild captain saw that Chu Tiange was no longer listening to him, and was quickly heading somewhere, leaving behind a trail of fire and a sound characteristic of whistling. The young master powerfully pushed off from the edge of the cliff, and with sparkling speed, he took off in a leap to single-handedly attack the huge monster to kill. After reaching the required height, the master deftly swung his spear towards the enraged, multi-toothed monster for a powerful attack. Chu Tiange decided to use one of his favorite techniques, and with fury, he summoned a thunderous dragon blast. The terrifying monster was destroyed by the master's most powerful nuclear explosion, from afar resembling a volcanic eruption with raging lava. Hawk had not expected this level of ability from the master, and even fell to the ground in surprise, blinded by the bright flash from the explosion, fearing for his life. Having finished with the massacre, Chu Tiange immediately turned back to the players in light of the flying golden reward for another victory. He looked at the astonished hawk, and cheerfully said that they didn't need to go to such trouble here and collect extra rewards for small monsters, because the boss would have gone down in a second, and they would have been able to move on. The second brother saw the overly surprised face of the Pathfinder captain and asked him not to be too impressed, as this was a common thing for them and he should lead them onward. After a short period of time, the players moved further into the path, going deeper and deeper into the forest. At one point, the players stopped and the young lord inquired as to where they were now and heard Hawk reply that it was the second level with very strange trees. He also explained that if you stand near the tree, after a few seconds, it will activate and start attacking with branches that grab, slow down, and poison the player, and in the stealth mode of this level, the final boss must be unlocked. L didn't quite understand the actions of the main boss, and decided to clarify with the captain exactly how it could activate itself. Hawk answered the girl that he does not know the exact answer, but based on their experience of exploring the neighborhood, there are about 40 trees in total in this area, and after activating each of them, the boss should appear. He further explained what the most difficult part of the level was, telling them that the boss would only be here with all 40 trees at the same time, and as long as they attacked it, they wouldn't be able to attack the smaller monsters at all, thus taking damage from both the boss and the smaller critters.
The second brother concluded that the game developers had made this level a good design and an interesting idea that trained not only the brain, but also the way the team behaved in emergency situations. Chu Tiange looked at Ursh enigmatically and thought about the fact that it wasn't necessary to engage all the monsters in battle, but could just piss them off a bit. The master did not make any more guesses and plans and quickly commanded his pet to run forward to the monsters and piss them off a bit, which the obedient dog did, rushing forward with a vicious grin. Ursha chose a good trajectory for the run, as he attracted the attention of all the trees of the dungeon at the same time and thus pissed them off, making his master's plan a reality. Meanwhile, somewhere in the distance, the menacing roar of the main boss of the second level had already been heard, who was viciously waiting for his time, emitting a poisonous green light from his bloodthirsty eyes. Ursha bravely continued his provocative run between the vicious trees, forcing the smaller monsters to activate and apply their powers to literally nowhere. The second brother figured out the master's plan and said that it was quite amusing, because the trees only had melee attacks, and as long as there were fighters with taunting aids, the trees simply wouldn't be able to catch them due to their excessive slowness. The young master, as if agreeing with this judgment, says that his pet is doing just that for them. Chu Tiange also explained that there should always be a helper nearby on the battlefield, as he would help recover by distracting the opponents. And in a team, the helper should have very cool skills and be fully pumped up to be able to protect everyone at once. While they were walking and chatting carefree, a vicious tree monster with huge claws appeared in their way, which was the main boss of the second level. The tree boss opened its mouth wide and roared loudly, releasing vapors of poison from its poisonous green eyes and was large enough in size to inspire wild fear in the other players, but not the young master's team. The hawk, certainly unaccustomed to such a sight, was simply terrified with paralyzing fear from such a sight and could not even utter a word. Chu Tiange, having quickly thought of a plan to destroy it, moved forward and shouted to his friends to stop looking at the monster and rather catch up with it in an attack. The tree monster was bombarded on all sides by crushing attacks from each of the players with thunderbolts and blasts. Little Raccoon used the magic staff with its crashing lightning bolts to attack and caused a mad crackle of fire. The second brother called forth a wild earthquake wave to attack with incredible force, striking the ground and leaving a huge trail of fire on the ground. Chu Tiange, in the light of the paralyzing discharges, came closest to the monster and decided to destroy it with his most powerful azure dragon split. The main boss was engulfed in a thunderous blaze of lightning and sparks flying in all directions and devouring every tree branch, causing irreparable damage. A second later, the fire elemental completely engulfed the tree monster, producing the greatest atomic explosion, leaving it with no chance of escape. Hawk his eyes wide open, watched with bated breath and stood just where the mountains of golden rewards for defeating the main boss were whistling. The captain of the trackers could not understand how the young gentleman managed to pass the second level in just a couple of minutes, while other players could not do it for weeks. Hawk couldn't resist asking the divine and majestic master to give his name and tell him which powerful guild he was fighting in, which seemed to surprise Chu Tiange a bit, as his account ID was usually visible to everyone. The second brother speculated that the player's information might be incomplete due to their illegal entry into the country, as a similar thing had happened before in Song Country, where some people also didn't see the young lord's ID. Chu Tiange was even happy about this mechanism of the game, because if they went somewhere in the future, he wouldn't even have to hide his true identity using a left account. The second brother clarified to the master that if he really wanted to completely hide his identity, he should change his costume, because Era assumes the presence of two costumes in the system with their change at any time convenient for the player. He went on to say that the master already has his current outfit, but there are also materials available that can be used to make another secret costume consisting of a mask and cloak. For example, since even if players can't see his account ID, they can recognize it. The second brother reminded the young master of his photos plastered all over the game's forum, and the master smugly decided that the latter was rebuking him for his excessive beauty and popularity. Chu Tiange told his friend that he was already thinking of obtaining more cool materials, such as a mask and cloak for the secret costume, although the game had already saved him a lot of trouble with its mechanism. 
Hawk listened attentively to their conversation and began to recall something from the numerous mentions of the same player on the game forum. And then it dawned on him. In front of him stands none other than the god Chu Tianj. He loudly shouted the name of the young lord, which immediately attracted the attention of the surprised players who stopped the conversation because of this. Chu Tiange, sighing deeply, said as if regretfully that he would still be recognized sooner or later, no matter where he was. Hawk broke his head, rushing towards the slightly distracted master at breakneck speed and shouting out how infinitely glad he was to finally meet Boss Chu himself. The second brother wasn't going to so easily forget everything that this Pathfinder captain had accomplished before their meeting and immediately retaliated against the arrogant fellow. At the moment when the hawk almost reached the master, the second brother put his foot aside, thus hitting him directly in the stomach and pushing him far back. The second brother approached the hawk with a menacing look and asked him why he was trying to get closer to Chu Tiange's team when he had recently bullied the little raccoon and still hadn't even apologized for it. The captain rushed to bow and shout for forgiveness, to which Ella said that he would not apologize and would no longer dare to forcefully and violently force anyone to join his guild, as it was the free choice of each player. The captain quickly started to turn the tables on himself and said that it was a rash decision by his guys. He had nothing to do with it and would never let it happen again. The master immediately said that he would definitely teach good manners and discipline to his guild and the others in the future, and also pointed out that judging by his explanation of the levels, he was also a big fan of playing. The young lord, pointing at all the gold equipment lying around, told the commander that they had come here thanks to his help, and so on the way back he should remember to pick up all the bounty, as it now belonged to him. The Pathfinder Guild leader looked at all the gold lying around in amazement and wild delight, unable to believe that it would all belong to him alone. Chu Tiange added that their inventories were already overflowing and all of this equipment was below level 20, which was not suitable for them, so let him boldly take it all for himself and his guild. Hawk ran out to meet the master with open arms and shouted words of endless gratitude with other honors along the way. The second he had already reached the young master, the second brother once again put his foot out sharply to the side, pushing the hawk far back once again. He didn't like this flattering behavior from the captain, and rudely told him to stop talking nonsense and hurry up and lead them to the last level, as they really didn't have much time for all of this. After a bit of breathing, the leader of the Pathfinders informed the god Chu that actually none of them still knew exactly what the last level of the dungeon was, much to the master's surprise. Hawk began to tell that regarding the exploration of the surroundings, they were still crossing the river on the rocks, making their way to the right palace, which they had seen earlier at the very beginning of the dunge. After opening the map, he went on to say that they had been sneaking or resisting bosses in the levels before to buy time for the others, and that they had explored the entire area of the dungeon, and that that abandoned palace was the location of the final boss. He started to say that they had been there, but abruptly stopped talking, and Ella menacingly asked if she allowed him to stop halfway through the story, and immediately added that if he were writing comics, he would blow his readers away with his intrigue. Hawk tried to quickly calm the little raccoon down by saying that he didn't really know the details himself, and suggested that they'd better take a look for themselves first. The whole team returned to the dilapidated and abandoned palace, which the buddies had already met at the very beginning of the dungeon. The gray and unremarkable palace from the outside inside was like the richest house of a famous family, which greatly impressed all the players who entered it. The inside of the spacious palace was too chic and grand, from the golden windows and shutters to the high ceilings with patterns and painted walls. The palace also had many columns and colorful canvases, and the second brother, after looking at everything carefully, came closer to one of the patterned walls and asked what it was. The captain of the Pathfinders approached him and replied that this was exactly what he had been telling them about, how everything here was very strange. He began to remember how he had been here with his subordinates before and tried to destroy the palace and destroy the patterns on the walls, attacking with all the items and skills available. Hawk clarified that as soon as they dealt damage to anything, the place of huge cracks would immediately restore to its former form in an instant, 
and no matter how long they tried to summon the main boss, they were never able to do so. Chu Tiange was looking at the patterned wall enigmatically, and seemed to be either thinking of something or wanted to test some theory. The young master dashingly dashed backwards, leaving his buddies behind, and Ursha ran after him as well. The second brother, noticing this and the sly smile on the boss's face, ran after him along with the others, thinking that he had definitely already thought of something. Chu Tiange ran over to another painted wall and began to gaze at the symbols on it, making the suggestion that it could very well be some kind of message. After thinking for a bit, the young lord also had an option that all these symbols were not just a pattern, but a secret cipher. The players decided to deal with all this later and left the palace to the place where the rewards lay so that the leader could take what he needed. And after waiting for him to finish collecting the gold and words of endless gratitude, the team said goodbye to Hawk. The second brother suggested that the boss go to the king country to fetch the Ching Fung Ling flower, as they already knew where the secret merchant was now and how he would be traveling in the future. The young master brushed off the idea and told his friend that he had Ching Feng Ling long ago and there was no need for it. The master added that no one should be surprised by the fact that a guy he didn't know sent the necessary attribute by anonymous mail, and since he was already so generous and didn't ask for anything in return, he just accepted such a gift. The buddies thought about it, and the master asked them not to get loaded about it and just leave it as it was and go back to the guild but L didn't understand why someone would just send high-level material to a young master. The whole team was heading back up to the palace to exit the dungeon through the stone and then cross the sea by ship to their city of Shannon. The second brother stayed in the sea harbor at the dock to sail to Song Country to make his guild stronger and bigger, and not to embarrass the young master. The master didn't doubt him in the slightest and wished him to work hard in farewell, after which he traveled with his assistant to the Dragon Emperor's palace. In the palace, they were greeted by an army of subordinates in a friendly manner, talking about how much they missed them, led by the third brother who already had a very cool equipment and it was noticed by the boss. Chu Tiange cheerfully greeted everyone and said that everyone was excited lately and he would not leave for a few days and would stay with them to pump up the guild level. Just like that, the master enthusiastically suggested to all the players to make their Dragon Emperor Palace the strongest guild in the entire era. The army of subordinates, of course, approved and supported such a decision by God Chu and cheerfully applauded and cheered. The third brother happily informed the young master that while he was away, they had not sat idly by, and some of the high-level guild members had cleared many portals on their own. He continued to tell, pointing at the players that almost all of the subordinates already had new blue and purple equipment, and Nubi and Mao Yun were still leading the team to open new territories. Chu Tiange was visibly pleased and happy with the work done by his men from the staff and proudly declared that they were all great and worthy of being in the Dragon Emperor's palace. In between, the master asked if the Blasphemer's Guild was bothering them anymore, and the third brother changed his face and said threateningly that they simply wouldn't dare to even approach their lands. Pointing at the Divine Phoenix, the third brother added that they had a guardian beast guarding everything and everyone in the guild and after the last siege, no one would dare to approach them. Plus, there was still a fee at the entrance to them, which replenished the ranks of their stock. The young lord was satisfied with everything he heard and headed away on his own, saying that he still had something else to do. Chu Tiange once again headed to the already familiar guild of armorers in their city. The master found the armorer and handed him all the necessary upgrade materials he had asked him to get to improve the appearance, and the man was delighted by what he saw as he had never held such precious items in his hands before. Finally, Chu Tiange asked if the armorer would now be able to help him enhance the immortal's appearance, and the latter asked him to wait a bit, as he simply had to take a photo and post such rare materials. The armorer proudly stated that the guys from other countries would envy him and take cues waiting for months just to come and at least touch these sublime materials. The master somehow hesitated at the worker's words and asked him to remember to be sure to add him the most improved equipment possible. Chu Tiange thought that it would be a good idea to say hello to other NPCs he hadn't met yet, or national-level NPCs in general, with the hope that they would be interested in him and he would ask them for battle efficiency improvements. An elder from the appraisal guild sneered right at his own lecture, 
and was awkwardly embarrassed, as he had acquired the honorable status of national capital appraiser after meeting Chu Tiange. The armorer quickly took the young lord's previous equipment and ran to the main hall, saying as he went that after loading his uniform, he would definitely start improving his efficiency in battle. He brought the gear along with the precious materials and piled everything on the table for further fabrication of the immortal form, swinging the sledgehammer with a pleasant sense of might. For faster and better work, a few more workers came running to his aid and together with him, they furiously hammered out improvements for Chu Tiange's armor. Finally, the squire mercilessly swung his sledgehammer one last time and struck the table with a mighty blow, releasing sparks under the tools. All of the workers standing nearby had to retreat a few steps on opposite sides of the manufacturing area as a blinding pillar of fire soared towards the ceiling. The stream of light was so powerful that it pierced through the building and rose high into the sky, becoming visible to the entire city. The young lord himself had not expected such power from the work he had done and was also slightly shocked and delighted at the same time. In the end, the most difficult work was completed, and before the master appeared completely updated and improved immortal equipment, surrounded by divine glow and golden lightning. Chutiange, as well as everyone else, looked at the new armor with bated breath, and the squire shouted to the master to hurry up and try it out and share his feelings. The young lord did not have to be begged for long, and he immediately gestured for the updated armor to be brought back to its former owner, that is, to himself. The immortal equipment instantly moved and flew towards the waiting Chu Tiange, emitting a bluish luster. The young master adopted a comfortable stance so that the suit could easily sit on him on its own. Vesting began simultaneously with all parts of the body and armor, and after a short period of time the master was fully dressed in the new uniform. Chu Tiange stood majestically and menacingly in a completely unique immortal outfit with discharges of paralyzing lightning. The master was crazy about the resulting result of the armorer's work and examined his armor with admiration, saying that he only regretted that there were no available enchantments in this set of equipment of his. The armorer saw the young lord's satisfied face anyway and responded to his regret by saying that it was all good anyway, as he would be the strongest player of the era to come out of it. The world announcement announced that the battle efficiency table of all era's districts had been updated and the first place honored was occupied by the Dark Sky player, while the second place belonged to Chu Tianzhu with a mark of 500 points less than that player. The players who heard the announcement were divided into two camps. One was outraged by God Chu's huge number of points, while the other was surprised that it wasn't Tianzhu who was ranked first. The young master himself opened the system window of the game and looked at the table in amazement, just like many not realizing who could have more power than him. The master remembered that the leaderboard had a search function and began to remember the name of the first place player so he could type it into the search box and look it up. The young master quickly typed in a query with the name Dark Sky and clicked the search icon, languidly waiting for a result, but the search was unsuccessful and yielded nothing. Chu Tiange looked at the system screen and became terribly angry after learning that he was unable to find out anything about his main competitor. He seriously pondered over who this mysterious Dark Sky player might actually be. The master was strolling through his guild when the third brother caught up with him and started to talk about something. But he interrupted him, saying that he already knew everything and had tried to find some information about this player, but could not. The third brother became indignant and swore loudly because how could it be possible that someone could be above his boss? But it was impossible to find information about him on the search engine and suggested that it might be a system error. Chu Tiange immediately refuted this theory because his parents were involved in the development of the game and their strong point was the logical interconnection of the system and they simply could not make such a mistake. After all, it is tantamount to an alien attack on their planet. The third brother didn't seem to be listening to the young master anymore and stared somewhere, even opening his mouth in intense surprise. Someone from the guild headquarters people loudly announced to everyone that Nubi and Mao Yun had returned from their completed missions. Nubi was holding the dragon hilt artifact, telling the other players what reward she had gotten from the dungeon and offered to trade it for other guild jewels if they wished, as it was a platinum weapon. 
All the players ran towards the healer and crowded around her to exchange the cool weapon, while the young lord pondered all the while on who Dark Sky might be. His musings were interrupted by Mao Yun telling the master that while he was away, he had caught a spy in their guild as well. On the high roof of one of the buildings in Shannon City, some unknown player was climbing up a long ladder. This player turned out to be a red-haired guy who had joined the Dragon Emperor's Palace Guild earlier and promised him revenge. The guy looked out the window and thought about something for a while, but quickly came to his senses when he saw someone's figure in the reflection. He immediately turned around to see who had come to meet him and was standing there and saw a man he knew well. This person was holding a mini crossbow with a loaded arrow to the red-haired guy's back, as if hinting him not to move and be obedient. The armed player turned out to be Hen Wu, a new recruit from the Blasphemer Guild himself, who had known the red-haired guy for a long time. Heng Wu, being experienced, pulled out the Sakura's lament throwing knife he had hidden there earlier from the guy's back pocket. The red-haired guy named Katomi even laughed at this and called it very entertaining, to which the recruit replied that he had been a spy in battles for a long time, too. Finally, Heng Wu got down to the main business. He asked Katomi to give him the materials for his crossbowmen and gold-level weapons. Katomi was angry at Hen Wu for first asking for three pieces of equipment and trying to lure him back since their guild still had some weight, and then he asked for three more, and now he wanted the whole ten. The new recruit chuckled and told him not to resent him too much if he wanted to get out of here in one piece and just enjoy the warm sunshine, but Katomi only got him four sets of gear. The guy calmly said that he didn't have a choice before, but now that he had given it to him himself, he didn't want to be on their side, but wanted to join the Dragon Emperor's Palace Guild. Heng Wu was furious at what he heard, and he was just bursting with anger at the guy's insolent statement. The new recruit started yelling at the top of his voice to repeat to the Blasphemer Guild leader and all of their brothers that he wished to join Chu Tiange's headquarters. But the guy with the same calmness as before only said that he was indeed grateful for many things to his faction and their people. Katomi added that he was especially grateful to his brothers for helping him in battles, and he would never forget that. But he no longer wished to be a spy as he realized how many guilds had been destroyed by that trick. Hen Wu wasn't going to back down so easily, and reminded the guy of how he himself had done to others and used them in the same way last time, threatening to tell everyone about his little secret so that the players themselves would choose his fate. A slightly terrified Katomi told Hen that the Blasphemer's Guild is really just a bunch of guys who do nothing but torture and humiliate everyone. In the midst of the players' conversation, Chu Tiange came over to advise them not to get excited about Hen Wu so early because nothing good had happened yet. The new recruit did not expect to see God Chu himself here and could not utter a single word, just staring at him with his mouth open in surprise. The young master who had come there with Nubi and Mao suggested that the recruit put away his weapons and let the red-haired spy go first before he helped him. Hen Wu didn't know what to do, and simply grabbed the resigned Katomi hostage, putting his gun to his neck, and yelled for everyone to stand still and stay back. Mao Yun stated that he didn't believe in this performance, and was sure they were faking it since he had seen them together many times, and warned them not to even think about cheating and hiding from him anymore. Mao Yun had already formed a fireball to attack the vile new recruit, saying that he would gladly try out his new skills now and would love to test how strong he was in battle. Hen Wu still had Katomi in his sights and at that moment pulled out his teleport scroll, shouting that this time he was ready and their damn iron bird wasn't here, offering to catch himself if they could. The new recruit had already opened and activated the scroll to move, starting to disappear in a light of blue flicker. Mao Yun couldn't stand still and watch this and began to shout that he was trying to get away from them, which he could in no way allow, and wanted to run towards him. Suddenly, Chu Tiange blocked Mao's path and put his hand out in front of him, saying that he was just another criminal and they shouldn't give him so much of their attention, much to his buddy's surprise. Katomi stood with his head down all this time, not knowing what to say, as he was very ashamed in front of the team and Chu Tiange himself for his past actions. After gathering his strength, he said that he was very sorry and would leave the guild as soon as possible, but the master was not going to let him go, and only reminded him of his recent words that he wanted to finally join his guild. 
The red-haired fellow looked up at the young master in bewilderment and reminded him that he had recently attacked the Dragon Emperor's palace and was still unable to forgive himself for it. Chu Tiange, coming closer to Katomi with his buddies, laughed, saying that it wasn't an attack at all, but a collective gaining experience which stumped the lad. The master explained to him that their guild hadn't lost anything in the end, and the value of each player's experience had increased by leaps and bounds, and finally added that his former guild's contribution wasn't small and he could stay, though he couldn't forgive him right now. Mao also added that he had paid attention to Katomi since the day he arrived, and when they were mopping up portals together, he noticed that he really liked a good fight. At the end, putting his hand on the boy's shoulder, Mao said that he had scouted out his past and reported everything honestly to the boss right away, and as long as he treats his brothers in the palace well, no one will prevent him from returning to the guild. Katomi couldn't believe his ears. How could the great god Chu Tiange, after all he had heard, allow him to stay in his palace without any conditions or threats? The red-haired fellow threw himself at the feet of the young lord and endlessly thanked him for another chance, promising never to let him down again and meet all expectations. Chu Tiange asked the boy, since he was still a member of the Blasphemer's Guild recently, if he knew about their plans, since they had clearly gone off the rails lately and might be up to something. Katomi began to tell him that he didn't know much, but he had heard that their guild leader was preparing for the first faction battle and had already spent a lot of money on sponsorship ads in the competition centers, with the bonus of learning about the details of the trials. Newbie stepped into the conversation and informed the young lord that since he had not returned for a long time, she had been temporarily put in charge of the first faction battle. She explained that their palace was also taking part in the first battle but its detailed contents were not published anywhere, and she did not even provide how one could prepare for it in advance. Chu Tiange, smiling evilly, immediately remarked that it was obviously all about money here, as they always solved everything with ease. The master would appeal to Katomi that they would spare him this time, but on the condition that all of the Blasphemer's Guild's dues would be reset as his punishment, and the fellow would gladly agree to anything just to stay together with them in their guild. Chu Tiange, together with his team, finally decided to head back to the palace and was glad that another secret case had been solved and could soon go about their business in peace. The young lord noticed the frozen surprise on his friends' faces and explained that they were, of course, going to the first guild battle of their dragon emperor's palace and were not going to be left without a victory. Soon, the young master's entire team visited the battle expert's pavilion in the city, anticipating the upcoming battle and were going to find all the necessary information about the competition from the local NPCs. Chu Tiange suddenly became interested in the rewards that would be given out for winning the guild fight, and the little raccoon quickly called up the game's system screen to view the information they needed. On the monitor appeared the rewards for first place, in the form of a thousand contribution points from all the guilds with a treasure chest of the highest quality. And in addition to all of this, the palace's experience increase factor with a permanent increase of 30% with an immortal level booster. Chu Tiange was interested in the last additional reward and thought it was no surprise that the Blasphemer's Guild was so eager to win from the back door. After all, a set of these boosters were stronger than gems of the 6th to 7th level. They were already entering the main palace building to the first expert as Mao Yun began to reason that the extra reward was certainly great. But a thousand points from all the guilds and a platinum weapon also meant a lot as far as he was concerned. The master and his buddies approached the first NPC they saw behind the counter and asked if he was in charge, as they had come for one important purpose, to discuss some investment issues for the guild's first battle. The NPC, fixing his glasses, proudly said that with all due respect, they would not accept any form of bribes from players or their guild, as they were very principled in such important matters and asked the company to leave the room immediately. Chu Tiange was clearly not satisfied with this response, and for a brief moment he was even confused, as he had not at all expected such adamancy from some pathetic bot. The young lord also wondered at what point his enhanced NPC friendliness skill, which had never failed him before, stopped working. Chu Tiange decided to go the other way and try to still divvy up the honest bot for at least some information, 
by asking it about the nature and content of the upcoming battle. The NPC didn't take his eyes off his book and reiterated again that they were very principled with all his respect, adding at the end that they would send out a list of all the necessary information regarding the content of the battle to every guild leader who registered by mail. Feeling the heavy gaze of the unsleeping master, the NPC, sighing deeply, reiterated once more that all the necessary information would be sent to the mail, and the other contents were temporarily off-limits. Even Mao Yun couldn't stand it anymore and couldn't tolerate this incorruptible and decent bot anymore, and started shouting at him to give out all the necessary information as soon as possible if he still didn't realize who was in front of him. None of the threats made to the bot did not interest him, and he just calmly continued reading his book, which, as the master noticed, was about the rules and norms of NPC behavior. Chu Tiange switched to offensive tactics and began to tell the bot that he really needed some information and had a lot of money, so if he wanted to make some good money, let him immediately get away from his literature and help them. It was as if the bot had been programmed with only one phrase for all players and didn't even change its face when it heard about gold and wealth, once again dryly repeating that, with all due respect, they were too principled and he couldn't help them. Suddenly the NPC, who was engrossed in reading his book, deigned to raise his honest eyes to someone else as he heard a familiar voice and some noise. At that very second, the incorruptible bot is hit squarely in the face by a strong kick from his foot making huge cracks in his glasses and leaving a memorable mark on his face. Chu Tiange's entire team watched in slight amazement as another NPC, apparently the main one here, kicked the young bot far behind its counter with a powerful kick. The main was just furious and shouted angry insults at the young bot, who only knows how to read official literature for days instead of learning real abilities, and almost missed a serious task while he was away for one minute. The chief bot politely apologized to the master and bowed, saying that there was no way the young NPC would let him breathe easy, and added that he immediately recognized the president known as the mighty god Chu Tiange. The head bot immediately boasted that he had noticed the unique work of the armor makers and Chu Tiange's majestic immortal enhanced appearance, saying that this equipment was very suitable for his character and mannerisms in battle. The master quickly returned to his former collected appearance, confirming everything the chief said about his outfit and asking who the new guy was and learned that it was a new kid who was completely giving him a hard time and had been sent to piss him off. The chief also added that he shouldn't worry about anything, as he would take care of everything, and asked again about the investment in the guild's first battle earlier and if there was anything he could do to help. The young lord coughed as if wanting to show the importance of his person, and asked the chief why he was still making them stand in the aisle, knowing what important deals they had come here with. The chief quickly realized the mistake he had made, and with an apology, invited the master to invite his buddies into the reception area to discuss the details of the matter further. Everyone walked into the spacious reception hall with high ceilings and sat down at the negotiation tables. Chu Tiange still honored the people of the obliging NPCs, and excused himself before asking to be told about the contents and number of participating guilds. The head began to tell him that the participating teams were divided into divisions, and there were about 500 factions in total, but after a selection process, they chose the 12 strongest guilds to further participate in the competition. The master listened attentively further, and the chief added that the whole process of the battle will be broadcast, so players will be able to follow the battle on the world channel and cheer for their favorite faction. After the main explained that the content of the battle is divided into several events, but since they are very fundamental, and in order to keep things fair, they are not allowed to disclose information about the details of these events. Suddenly, at this moment, a bag full of gold coins fell onto the table in front of the chief with a clinking sound. The chief couldn't contain his surprise and kept his eyes on the precious bag of riches while the young gentleman asked him with a menacing tone to repeat something about their integrity. Greed and avarice clouded the foolish bot's mind, and with gold instead of a brain, he quickly shifted and inquired about the details President Chu Tiange was interested in. The master thought about what question was best to ask the self-serving bot to surely find out all the answers to his questions, and decided to start with the main one, 
asking how one should fight in this first battle of the guilds. The master began to tell him that because of the decision in the direction of views and fairness, most guild matches were decided to be held by other means than fighting, which surprised the young master very much, who did not understand how a guild battle could be held without fighting at all. The master wondered what then was the point of a battle at all if it did not contain combat, and the chief only quietly replied that most felt that it would not appeal to the spectators. In front of the main bot's eyes, Chu Tiange added another bag with a bunch of gold coins to the existing bag. The master became so angry that a strong tension like lightning discharges was created around them and threateningly told the main bot that he didn't want him to think for himself but to do as he wished. Chu Tiange, based on past experience, was sure that the main was mistaken and saw no point in hiding the battles from the spectators as they just loved to watch them. After hearing these words, the chief came to his senses a little and indignantly asked the master if he was not asking him now to change the course of the battle, for it had been long ago drawn up and approved, and they were very principled. The young master opened the system screen again and started clicking on the gold coin eject button many times in a row. The NPC's greed was taking over, and he couldn't resist the mere sight of the gold glitter in the bags, and his eyes already had treasures instead of pupils. Chu Tiange, with a stockpile of countless riches, couldn't stop clicking the eject button and fleetingly ask the one if it was enough to change their mind. The NPC was in a state of shock at what was happening, and looking at all the coins flying towards him, could only shout out that it was enough. The chief greedily picked up all the gold and literally hugged himself with the filled bags, informing the master that he had realized everything, and the spectators really enjoyed watching the battles more than anything else. He told Chu Tianju with a satisfied look, telling the president not to worry about anything as he would promptly discuss the schedule change with the other organizers, and it would satisfy both him and the spectators. The young gentleman got his way, as always, and informed his buddies that it was very late and they should get out of here as soon as possible. Lastly, Chu Tiange cheerfully asked the chief to organize an advertisement for his emperor guild and specified that he needed the most prominent place there. Having filled his pockets full of gold, the NPC had already agreed to everything, and so he happily informed the master bot not to worry as he would guarantee to do everything in the best way possible. While the master bot was admiring the gold booty and tasting it, a new guy came up to him and quietly asked him if it wasn't him who told him that they were the most principled of all NPCs. The new guy, fixing his broken glasses, tried to refute this theory, but the main guy, keeping his eyes on the coins, said that he was right, and they were indeed the most principled of all. The chief sensed that the newcomer had something else to say to him, and irritably turned to him with words to think less to himself and listen to him more. A huge angry bear with long, sharp claws and fangs growled viciously at the top of its voice, standing up on its hind legs. While the embittered bear shook the air with its roar in the high-level area outside Luyang City, a secret merchant lurked behind a tree, waiting for something. After calming down a bit and finding nothing useful or interesting, the angry bear quickly ran deep into the long cave. The secret merchant immediately collapsed to the ground, scattering some of his wares, and thought that he was too close to being massacred if it weren't for his ability to run fast and hide cleverly. The merchant sighed heavily and said that it wasn't easy to be on guard all the time, and that if that big, dumb bear hadn't woken up and caught him off guard, he would have had time to steal the cubs' eggs as well, not to mention the chance to get millions for them. The secret merchant quickly gathered his thoughts and opened the navigation map to view the next location with possible lucrative finds for him. Suddenly the ground beneath his feet shook violently along with him and he heard strange sounds and rumbling. The mystery merchant became very frightened as he thought that a big dumb bear had spotted him and had gone back. The merchant quickly closed the navigational map and hid behind the nearest tree, peering intently into the cave, from which thick black smoke billowed. The merchant didn't fully understand or realize what he was seeing through the shroud of smoke, but he seriously wondered what was in front of his eyes. A worried assistant came running to the young gentleman with the news and, opening a news forum on the screen, asked him to look into the monitor sooner rather than later. 
The site was discussing the latest news about a certain Dark Sky player and wrote that Chu Tiange was not such a god since he did not occupy the first place in the rankings and that they should definitely fight and put an end to this matter. Master was a little upset that even players unknown to him were writing all sorts of nonsense that they could think of, and the rankings meant absolutely nothing, because if they met this Dark Sky, he would definitely be nailed to the ground immediately. Chu Tiange left the game for a while and walked out of the game pod, where L.A. was already waiting for him with a delicious cake, offering him a taste of it, to which the young lord only waved it away and asked him to leave it on the table and help him contact Uncle Yin Li to discuss some matters. The little raccoon saw the worried and even a bit embittered expression on the master's face and was lost in speculation as to what had happened to him and why she was so frightened by his current state. L quickly contacted the butler and he arrived at the young master's office, wondering what had happened and what he could do for her while he was looking at something on his tablet. Chu Tiange asked the butler if he had already heard about today's incident, to which Yin Li replied by asking if he was referring to the Dark Sky player with a number of battle power points higher than him. Master nodded at his uncle's question and said that they had already counted all the players with the highest number of donations, the number being 80 million. But even so, no one could overtake him, especially since he himself had invested a lot of money into pumping up his combat efficiency. Chu Tiange was still surprised along with his uncle on one point. The provided possible experience gained with money in the game was also limited, not to mention that he had met the mysterious merchant twice. The butler continued to speculate that this player's ID was not in the top, and perhaps he was just like his young master hiding his identity with something. And he also remembered that there were many workarounds in era, and until he wanted to, he would remain hidden from everyone. The young lord finally realized and even became seriously interested in the fact that the Dark Sky player was deliberately hiding his true identity from everyone, and they would not be able to trace him in any way for the time being. After pondering for a bit, Chu Tiange asked the butler what else he could suggest or say about it. Uncle Yin Li informed the young master that as long as this player was online, he would be able to track him down. In between, the butler decided to ask the master why he was so concerned and worried about this mysterious Dark Sky player puzzling everyone to find him. Chu Tiange calmly replied that he was not interested in how he had improved his efficiency in battle, but simply, if he was truly better than him, how could one miss out on such a worthy opponent? Among other things, the young master really wanted all those player commentators on the other side of the screen to understand for themselves who the strongest person in this game was. The butler humbly listened to the young master's position and asked him not to worry about anything, as he was taking care of everything. Meanwhile, in one of the small towns in Japan, two people were about to meet for a cup of coffee in a county cafe. The second brother, standing at the entrance of the cafeteria, called his buddy, calling him Hong Hao, and said that he had been waiting for him for a long time and would like him to hurry up. Before he could finish his thought, the second brother saw a guy running down the stairs towards the cafeteria, shouting that he was in a hurry and was already here. Hong Hao approached the second brother apologizing for being late and explained that he was delayed by some things unrelated to the game. The guy began to tell him that he hadn't played ERU since their guild broke up, and besides, the company at work had been loaded with things lately, so he was very busy. The second brother invited his buddy to a table, and a waiter approached them to see if they were ready to order already, to which the guys took turns naming the hot drinks they would be drinking. He started to tell Han Hoa that he could forget about their guild and that it was all in the past as this time was long forgotten. The second brother tried to pull his friend back into the era and went on to say that after their guild broke up, he had joined another in the Song Country, and it was now just about one of the first and strongest guilds in the entire era. Hong Hao focusedly replied that he had no time to play games now, as he was fully loaded at work, as he had said earlier. The guy quickly suggested changing the topic and wanted to know the gist of their conversation since he had called him just today to urgently meet and discuss something important. The other brother began to show a photo of wall frescoes from a palace on the screen of his phone, saying that his boss was sure that there was some text behind the patterns. He went on to say that Han Hoa is known as the best at solving word puzzles in games and could help him figure out what's encrypted there after all. 
The red-haired guy took the phone from his buddy to take a closer look at the photos he had taken of the murals. He thought for a moment, and then said that he couldn't understand it all at once, but it looked like an inscription. He said that he would need a little time, and as soon as he understood the meaning, he would tell his other brother about it. In the end, Han Hua didn't understand why the second brother needed to invite him to dinner instead of just texting him, since he's always online. The second brother laughed and said that it wasn't an attempt to lure him to Era to play together at all, since he had already said that he was very busy at work and could forget about it. The world announcement was reaching out to the dear players of Era to announce that the guild's first battle would be starting soon and would be available for viewing on all official live streaming channels of the game. The Chu Tianja Guild of the Dragon Emperor's Palace arrived at the teleport portal to enter the game, where they were greeted by a bot announcing the start of the first stage, group competition. The NPC asked President Chu Tiange to choose the other four participants to form their group and follow him. The young lord knew in advance who would be in his group and got there together with El, Nubi, Mao Yun, and the third brother, following the bot into the displacement portal. Some players were trying to use teleport tickets to enter the guild battle, but there was no way they could figure out how to do it. They quickly clicked on the ticket several times, and at one point, a sudden abrupt movement began. Both players fell with a thud right into the stands with the rest of the spectators, surprising everyone present. One of the players told the other that he thought for a long time whether to take such an expensive ticket for the game, but he didn't regret it in the slightest, as it moved them right to the right seats. First among the players from the teleport portal, the richest player, Chu Tiange, walked out of the competition with a proud gait. Following behind the young lord, his team members came out of the portal one by one, following the bot. One of the players in the stands saw the greatest player of all time, Chu Tiange, and jumped up from his seat and shouted loudly about it. Everyone present in the stands took turns jumping up and shouting out the young master's name with best wishes, loudly applauding and cheering. While languidly waiting for his exit, the leader of the Blasphemer Guild said that it was unnecessary to gather so many spectators here, but since they were all here, it wouldn't be long before they would see their heroic appearance. The newcomer added that they had finally waited for the Guild battle and are the favorites, having participated in many quests recently and seen a lot of things. So some Chu Tianju won't be able to defeat them. After all, the competition isn't built on fighting and they have the advantage. The main bot appeared on the suspended platform, greeting everyone in a friendly manner and announcing the start of the battle, calling himself the host of the first guild tournament. The host NPC starts talking about how right now they will instruct all participants about the upcoming tournament. The leader of the blasphemers addressed his subordinates with indignation that he paid as much as 10,000 gold for this game, and it would be possible to present his team much cooler. The chief suggested that before the game started, he show everyone their spectators who had come to watch the battle, who had bought tickets and would be able to participate in a special raffle using coupons. The chief began to talk about the prizes, starting with third place, for which there would be a chest with 3,000 first-level gems. The second-place prize would be 300 second-level gems. And finally, for first place, three chests of platinum-level equipment and all at the expense of the Palace of the Dragon Emperor. He further added that for those who don't place, there will be prizes for participation in the form of discount coupons from the Blasphemers Guild to purchase items from merchants, which caused outrage from players saying that this guild is either too greedy or poor. The leader of the Blasphemers listened to the tournament briefing in astonishment and did not understand why, relative to Chu Tiange, he could offer such a paltry reward, and even more so, only for participating. Hen Wu, as if trying to calm the boss down a bit, asked him not to be so surprised because according to his calculations, most of the money was spent on advertising and pumping, but that only made the leader more angry. The main bot announced the end of the briefing and asked everyone to pay attention to the main screen as it would now introduce the participating teams and their honorable players. A video of a divine phoenix flying over the palace of the dragon emperor appeared on the huge suspended screen. The next video display was a fragment from Chu Tiange's team's battle with one of the vicious stone monsters. The screen showed a close-up of the face of Chu's richest player in all his glory and mighty strength. 
The spectators in the stands began to squeal, shout, stomp, and applaud the most anticipated player of the battle. The young lord was satisfied with such a wide advertisement of his staff and decided that this bot could be safely relied upon for everything. The next player on the screen was the assistant L, striking with her magic staff and enchantments. Next came the healer newbie in a moment of using her regenerating powers. The little raccoon didn't even realize that the game had recorded such details with her participation and was a bit upset that she didn't manage to finish anyone off in this shot. Nubi in turn made the point that no matter how well she was presented on screen, she was only maintaining a small level of health. Mao Yun decided to support his buddy and asked her not to say that, as her skills were actually very important to their team. The next picture was the young master's powerful move, the Earth Dragon Split. The pictures alternated, showing all the majesty and importance of the leader of the Dragon Emperor Palace. Each of the slides showed a detailed display of the battle with the enraged main boss, who was attacked by the forces of the entire team. The monitor once again displayed a close-up of the formidable Chu Tiange's face as he flew towards the monster with his spear. The main screen was able to show the young master's crushing blow to the entire audience at the same time. A second later, the master was already running with a satisfied expression surrounded by flying rewards in the form of gold coins, equipment, and more. The third brother, addressing the master, correctly said that it was a very cool performance, and he deserved it rightfully. As the video ended, the main bot turned its attention back to itself and announced the first team to participate, the Palace of the Dragon Emperor. All of the team members, led by Chu Tiange, majestically appeared on the screen with their palace and guardian beast as a backdrop. The spectators in the stands solemnly shouted out the names of all the players of the master staff after seeing the powerful guild on the main monitor. The next slide on the main screen, the NPC host brought up a list of all the other guilds participating in the battle. The leader of the Blasphemer Guild was naturally enraged that all the other teams had just put a list on the screen and the Dragon Emperor's palace had been given a whole showdown. He was about to go looking for the bot that had arranged the whole thing when the recruit stopped him, saying that if they started causing trouble now, they would be disqualified and the whole thing would be over before it had even started. The recruit tried to find a way out of the situation and informed the leader that unlike the other guilds, they also have an avatar on their screen. The leader yelled for Hengwu to be more careful as their avatar was upside down on the main screen, and they immediately thought someone had made a big mistake. The team introductions ended, and the main NPC announced that, with the audience's permission, he would announce the rules for the first guild battle tournament. He began to tell them that the Jedi Battle Royale would begin where they would be lifted into the air and sent to the battlefield adding that the number of kills would directly affect the total scores of all subsequent challenges. The leader of the Blasphemers protested, shouting loudly that battles were out of the question in the announcement, especially in the first round, and they were most likely just gathering everyone for a battle with Chu Tianju. The spectators in the stands were pleasantly excited and anxious about the upcoming competition, as they were eager for the exciting battle and even began to slowly place bets on the players amongst themselves. The young master at this moment heard many people from the stands betting on him and talking about how he would brutally blow everyone away. Chu Tiange announced to all of his team members that it was finally time to put on a grand show. A map with marked locations and rules appeared on the screen, stating that in the first round, players would be sent into the sky and would have one minute to choose the exact place to land. Also, according to the rules of the game, reinforcements were scattered throughout the field that could increase attack power in battle, restore health, and even magic. There was also a warning that in order to win, you must destroy members of other guilds, and a warning that there was a poisoned zone around the edges of the field that would cause you to lose 35% of your maximum health every second, and that the zone would shrink as the game progressed. The members of the Blasphemer's Guild began to argue loudly among themselves about the landing point, wanting completely different locations. Suddenly, Liu Fei appeared out of nowhere in front of the players and told them to stop arguing in an orderly tone. After a little thought, she suggested that the players use the back entrance, since it exists there. The leader of the Blasphemers himself didn't know what to do anymore, and the new recruit thought that even if some of their team remained, they still wouldn't be able to defeat Chu Tiange. 
Liu Fei suggested to fly a bit and land right in the center of the field, and afterwards find a place to take cover, and even in case they were annihilated, they could still find some loophole. Chu Tiange didn't waste any time either and chose a suitable landing point for the team on the screen. The third brother asked the boss where they were jumping to and found out that he had already chosen a point from which he would have a good view and could be the first to spot all the other players. When all the competitors had made their choices, the main NPC solemnly announced the start of the first guild battle. The spectators in the stands cheered and loudly shouted words of encouragement to the participants, excitedly waiting for the game to begin. The glider aircraft rushed forward to transport all participants to the locations for further selected landings. The glider made stopping points in the air so that all players could parachute down to the desired locations. The first to successfully land on one of the chosen locations was the leader of the Blasphemer's Guild. He examined the chosen location and hastily concluded that not even birds flew here, so they would definitely never meet Chu Tiange here. Next, all the members of the Blasphemer's team landed, and the new recruit immediately asked the leader if they had landed at the correct location. The leader of the Blasphemer's Guild didn't hear any of the new recruit's words as he was wildly horrified by the scene before him. Right in front of the Blasphemer's Guild, the mighty god Chu Tiange stood in full armor and mockingly said hello to the team. The leader immediately pounced accusingly at Liu Fei, who obviously did not expect this turn of events herself, and only said that they were making a decision he did not argue with her. The little raccoon playfully informed them that it was simply all about the young master's incredible strength, and he could certainly detect any enemy just by poking his finger in the sky. While Ella was telling them this, she was drawing something in the air with her finger, and at the end of her speech, she created the magical rune Fox Spirit Cage, aiming it at all the opponents at once. At the same moment, Sharp pointed stakes began to rise from the ground around the leader of the blasphemers. The bars flew at the rest of the guild members from different directions, not even giving them a chance to escape. And a moment later, all the blasphemers on the field were sealed into magical cages with no chance of escape. The assistant was satisfied with the work done and said that it was very convenient to have them just stand there in the middle of the field during the battle, allowing her to control them. Chu Tiange, with a menacing look, was already flying with his friends towards the imprisoned opponents and commanded everyone to attack, not even hearing the pleas for mercy from the frightened, blasphemous leader. The world announcement rang out that the Dragon Emperor's palace had drawn first blood and, after a little counting, reported five consecutive annihilations right now. The players from the other guild were quickly gathering their equipment from the field and discussing the much-hyped demise of several players at once at the hands of Chu Tiange, deciding not to be distracted and hurriedly picking up their supplies before they too were discovered. The young master walked forward with his team on the road ahead and consulted on what they should do next, as his option was to run all around and eliminate the players one after another. Mao Yun suddenly told the master that he had some sort of plan, but he didn't have time to finish. In one of the glades of the near location, one of the battle attack boosts was in a golden glow. The players who had landed nearby were scouring the surroundings, and one of them spotted a level 3 attack rune and immediately reported it to their boss. The head of their team ordered them to quickly run to all the reinforcements they would see and be able to carry and quickly gather them before the poisoned zone began to shrink, which they did. There was a small house on the edge near the poison zone from which more reinforcements were illuminated, and the boss ran in there quickly, not seeing who was waiting for him there, and rushed towards the rune. When he and his subordinates reached the rune to retrieve it and turned around, he was surprised to notice the players of the Dragon Emperor's palace. Their guild leader, breathing heavily, quickly realized that it was a trap, but it was too late for rescue. Sparks and fiery lightning bolts rose into the air. Chu Tiange's guild had deftly dealt with the competitors in a split second. Mao Yun noted that these guys had indeed fallen for the cunning bait, and the young master agreed, asking them to quickly divide up the things of the destroyed guys and move out to the next location. The players of the young master's team set up a huge magic wall on the field for protection while they looked through the data. A map with the number of surviving players and their approximate landing spot appeared on the game system screen. 
The other players ran up to the master while he looked at the screen and studied the information, informing him that there must be at least one other team besides them that had found shelter and survived. While they were talking, Chu Tiange heard the sound of whistling and noticed the arrows flying at them just in time, shouting for everyone to be careful and take cover as soon as possible. On one of the rooftops of a tall building, players from different guilds were standing on one of the rooftops and on command, non-stop loading arrows into their crossbow and shooting at Chu Tiange's team, hoping that their incessant attack would prevent them from getting too close. The master deftly swung back and dodged all the shots, shouting to them that they would not escape and certainly not defeat him, even after rallying themselves. The third brother, hiding behind a tall rock, said with a smile that they were all about to watch a master class from the greatest player of the era. The young lord reached the roof of the right building in one dash, surrounded by a fiery shadow, and threateningly told all the players that they were too naive to believe in such a possibility. Chu Tiange quickly ran across the roof, knocking down everyone in his path with his sharp spear and leaving a trail of fire behind him. When the practice master reached the players, one of them shouted that they were doomed and they needed to destroy the opponents from the other guild as soon as possible to get some points before they did. A distraught guy with a long sword stabbed one of the players standing with his back to him, hoping to get some points. The injured player turned to the guy who hit him in a frenzy and shouted loud insults after saying that he was from his team. Chu Tiange was not bothered by all of this at all and was about to use the next crushing blow. The master called into action the hidden skill Taiku Dragon Breath, and the fiery dragon body that appeared at the same second blew away all the players standing in its way. Taiku's steel dragon torso appeared as well, smashing and crushing everything and everyone, destroying the building itself in a bright flash. The third brother, who was not yet aware of the boss's new power, was extremely delighted with this new power, and cheerfully thought that he had not followed the young master for only a few days, and he had already become stronger than God himself. The world announcement announced the end of the game due to the Dragon Emperor Palace winning the first tournament with Chu Tiange's number of players destroyed per battle totaling 29. The spectators were ecstatic and solemnly shouted out the young master's name as they watched the Dragon Emperor Palace's magnificent victory on the main screen. Chu Tiange stood there thinking that the game had somehow ended rather quickly and those 29 annihilations seemed all too familiar to him, at least their number. All of the players of the Dragon Emperor Palace Guild had returned to the starting platform of the stadium after successfully completing the task of the first tournament in the light of the fiery radiation. The game system congratulated Chu Tiange's team for their first victory and receiving prize mementos that guaranteed to double all the reinforcements gained during the battle and create immunity to all negative statuses below level 5. El read the information about the reward and thought it was very good and learned that players could share the received artifacts among themselves and surround any guild to capture these rare items. But when she got to the point about the team race, she asked the master what it was about. The young master began to explain to the girl that it was like a game of Monopoly, when you have to throw a dice, make steps, and get caught on different tasks. But most likely, here will not be all so simple. The team, after listening carefully to the master, were already waiting with genuine excitement and interest for this race to start as soon as possible. After a couple of minutes, Chu Tiange noticed a clickable button on the system screen of the game to view the available task. Without thinking for a long time, the master immediately clicked on it and waited for the information to load. On the system screen appeared information with the number of dice of a certain value, which clearly were not affordable for everyone. Chu Tiange was surprised by the fact that the dice had already appeared in the public domain and could be purchased and rolled before the game started. Other players were outraged at such a huge cost of dice and decided that the game organizers just wanted to get a lot of money out of them to buy their entire massive show by deciding to take the cheapest dice. The leader of the Blasphemers Guild flipped through the dice one by one, realizing that it was too expensive for him. The wily Liu Fei asked the leader to take his time, as there seemed to be some secret prize in choosing the dice. The head of the Blasphemers Guild stopped his surprised gaze on one of the pages with some very entertaining information. 
On the screen appeared a chest with the price of the first prize gift of 1,000 gold coins, and each gift is guaranteed to give three to five gems, purple platinum equipment, a decorated dice, and other gadgets. On top of that, there's also an opportunity to obtain a secret immortal level equipment and other enhanced parts, which certainly pleased the leader, and Liu Fei offered to buy it for him. The boss of the blasphemers, thinking that on top of everything else there was also a guarantee here and other guilds had already bought it as well, clicked on the icon of this chest. At the same second, a prize gift in the form of a gem fell out of the chest to the guild leader in the arena. He was surprised to see that the gem that fell out was an obsidian with a critical chance for second-level spells, and the chance of victory was still not completely lost. Chu Tiange at this time was picking up his prize of the greatest divine sphinx ruler and decided that he would definitely hand it over to the appraisal guild for appropriate work. Mao Yun suggested taking a short break since their inventories were full anyway, and the game was about to begin, and the master handed him a bag of gold coins, telling him to take them to the guards and alert him when they ran out of them again. Chu Tiange decided to take his buddy's advice and rest for a while, but he saw a bright glow on the screen from the alert that had arrived. On the system screen was the prize of the first guild battle in the form of a golden dice from the Krypton gift with a certain effect, optional quality control of the numbers rolled, and the ability to see all the traps and tasks of the next six squares in advance. The young lord quickly realized where such a generous gift had come from and gestured his approval by looking up the arena. The Krypton gift for Era's richest player was made by the now familiar main bot of the game's first tournament. A leading NPC on a suspended platform in the center of the arena happily informed the cheering spectators of the start of the next and most expansive part of the battle, the team race. The main bot summoned the necessary playing field into the competition arena for the battle to begin. In the same second the arena turned into a huge playing field, and, as the master said earlier, it was something like Monopoly from childhood with numerical and iconic symbols. Then they presented the general gameplay of the complex competition, where each guild has different surprises on the way through the tiles, among which there are rewards, punishments, and other interesting things. In the rules of the game, there was a clarification that if two teams get on the same tile at the same time, they will have to fight until all members of one of the teams are dead. At the end, it was mentioned that each guild team has 10 life points, and if they lose, they will lose a corresponding number of points. But if the number of lives is zero, the team is automatically eliminated from the game. While they were finishing the story that if no team reaches the finish line, then the guild closest to him will win, the recruit decided not to waste time and buy another chest with the hope of getting third-level gems. The leader of the Blasphemer's Guild also wanted to buy one more chest before the game, but he didn't understand why nothing was happening. On his system screen, the number of remaining chests available for purchase appeared at zero. The leader of the Blasphemers heard nearby shouts of something about some player getting a dragon totem from a chest. The leader turned around at the source of the sound and saw in amazement and shock who had gotten such a cool prize gift, looking towards Chu Tiange's team surrounded by a pile of everything. The spectators in the stands were certain that there wouldn't be a strong difference between the battles on this playing field and the previous airplane chess games, only this competition would be truly exciting. The leader of the blasphemers could no longer listen from every corner about Chu Tiange and his might, for he was in partial agreement that those who would meet the master would also meet a terrible doom. He couldn't stand it and rushed to accuse the boss of promising a fair competition, and what they got in the end is clear to everyone to which the new recruit tried to calm down the boss, reminding him about the expulsion from the game with shame for such behavior. While the line with the random team assignment was displayed on the main screen, Hen Wu lastly told the boss that they would play for themselves and would not meet Chu Tiange there. A second later, the combination of the two competing teams appeared on the screen, the Dragon Emperor Palace versus the Blasphemers. While the main bot was announcing to everyone that the first two teams were entering the playing field, the leader was menacingly yelling at the new recruits for bringing their guild nothing but misfortune and could hold his tongue until the distribution was over. Once the official part was over, the teams were automatically teleported to the field for further battle. Both teams were moved to their respective tiles of the playing field with dice for each guild. 
Chu Tiangye didn't miss the opportunity to banter with his opponents and cheerfully greeted them, asking why they were getting so emotionally tense if they thought they were a logical company, and warned them not to go unarmed. The new recruit got angry as usual at the young master's remarks, and began to shout loudly that there was no need to be so cocky and proud. After all, the game hadn't even started yet. Heng Wu wanted to continue saying something else, but suddenly he was hit by the leader himself with a vicious anger and told him to shut up. The leader began to reprimand the new recruit, saying that bad things often happened to them and he didn't need to be so testy to everything he heard and saw. Chu Tiange heard another guild talking behind his back, asking their opponents to hurry up and throw the dice, or they would start walking first. That guild's opponents were an unknown team with hidden faces, dressed in long kimonos with wide hoods. The master suspected something wrong, and he even thought that this team was strange, since since he had been in the arena, he felt constant attention to his person from their side. The game officially began and one of the teams made their first roll of the dice on the field. The cube flipped in the air several times, going through different variations of possible numbers, and finally settled on the number four. The team of blasphemers quickly raced across the playing field in the right direction for the number of tiles that fell out. The guild hit the boost icon, activating the reward of increasing the attack power of all team members by as much as 15%. Chu Tianga's team was next in line to walk, making their move with the dice. The dice tumbled in the air, hitting the ground several times, and made a final decision with the number two. The players of the Dragon Emperor's Palace quickly ran forward on the indicated tiles. Their team hit the reward badge as well, activating the facility with obtaining a level two gem. Next up was the move for the blasphemers and the leader took over, making a roll of the dice. The dice spun around again, making a couple three turns and landed with a number equal to five. The team of blasphemers moved towards the finish line again on the right tiles, running past the dreaded marker. They stopped just exactly behind the punishment tile, which they were very happy about. The leader of the blasphemers exhaled heavily, seeing how close they were to failure and told no one to relax. The young lord's team made their next move, throwing the die far forward. The dice, after hardly making a single revolution around itself, quickly fell to the ground with the number one. All four buddies immediately ran over to the neighboring tile of field players. They had once again hit the boost, activating the items of obtaining a 10th level chest with a healing potion and an additional item in the form of a mid-level territory evaluator, and were quietly cheering. Newbie, looking at the screen, anxiously informed her that if they continued like this, they would run out of inventory space, but the third brother assured her that it was fine as he was still an intermediate-level assessor and was just missing that very item. The leader of the blasphemers, looking towards Chu Tiange's team that had received such awesome rewards, was somewhat confused as to how they managed to be so lucky. The young master informed his friends that the next 20 squares were not equipment awards, and they should now pay attention to the guys from the competing team. The head blasphemers were afraid that Chu Tiange's team might catch up to them, and as they slowly pressed the dice roll button on the screen, they dreamed and prayed that the number six would now fall out for them. The dice jumped up sharply, making a couple of rotations, and landed with a number equal to one. The team of blasphemers quickly ran forward one square, making their move. The players hit a tile with the gain of some random object and got a little excited. The leader quickly began searching the system for the necessary information, but found nothing thinking that it might be something related to the attack on them given their luck. While the leader was trying to find some instruction to a random object, behind his team's back was already Chu Tiange and his buddies talking cheerfully about how he hadn't even thought of meeting them so soon. The new recruit once again flared up and threatened to stay out of their way. After all, this was a competition, not a personal score settling to which Mao did not stay silent and also said that he did not look as brave as he did when he was sneaking equipment from their guild before he was exposed and was now hiding behind his boss. The third brother added menacingly that they had learned how their guild had used secret spies to destroy many other factions in previous games, and now, in era, his players had killed many more players than their dragon emperor's palace. Other teams overheard the players talking and began discussing amongst themselves where their resources had been spent earlier and all their expensive gear had disappeared, 
as well as the possibility that the blasphemers always know the locations of their guilds. The leader of the blasphemers, after hearing the other players' guesses, became nervous and worried, as instead of going through the game sooner, they were having conversations while he kept thinking of ways to bypass Chu Tiange. The head in a frenzy began to quickly press the dice roll button and pray for the number six to fall out on it as soon as possible. The dice whistled and began to spin and hit the ground, flying farther and farther away. Suddenly, the leader of the blasphemers finally got lucky and got the number six he wanted on the cube. The leader of the blasphemers was ecstatic at his good fortune and quickly, glowing with happiness, ran forward. At this time, it was Chu Tiange's team's turn to move, and the master made a move by pressing the roll of the dice, which had already started spinning in the air and landed with a clatter with the number three. The leader of the blasphemers couldn't resist a caustic comment, shouting to the young master that he would have worse luck than him today, and if he was so far away, how would he be able to catch up and land any kind of blow? Right at this moment, after finishing his fiery speech, he is horrified to see the master's team get another reward in the form of a second chance to roll the die. Chu Tiange had already cheerfully asked the head to repeat everything he had just told him and made his second move, pressing the roll, waiting for the dice to land on the field. The leader of the blasphemers prayed in desperation for only one thing, for the number one to fall on the dice. The dice whistled and landed on the field with the number one, but after a second it spun a few more times and stopped at a four. While the entire team of blasphemers was shocked at what was happening and couldn't believe such a fatal coincidence, the young lord's team was already rushing towards their opponents. The main NPC on the suspended platform began to announce to the spectators that the first battle in the second round of the team race would begin very soon. The leading bot didn't have time to finish his speech, as he heard strange noises behind him and hurriedly looked around to see. In the center of the playing field was a special battleground, where one team was already in the middle of a violent attack on the other. The players of the Dragon Emperor's palace rose with all their strength and power against the team of blasphemers, pouncing on them with all their weapons, not even giving them a chance for a decent defense. The spectators in the stands cheered at the new battle on the playground and shouted words of encouragement to Chu Tianju. The main NPC had already flown over to the teams, one of which was lying down and recovering from the blows they had taken, and addressed the master, saying that it was too much but the master only replied that they had asked for it by taunting them. The lead bot asked President Chu to give him time in the future to announce the battle and team names, as he is also the commentator for the game, and the players won't be going anywhere off the field in that time anyway. Chu Tianju felt a little embarrassed by this ridiculous situation and apologized, saying that he had completely forgotten about it, with a promise that it would never happen again, and he would make sure to wait for the bot to finish its speech. The main NPC returned to his seat in the center of the arena and declared the Dragon Emperor's Palace the winner of the first battle of the second round, giving the audience a reason to shout and applaud in triumph. The all-wounded and battered leader of the blasphemers slowly came to his senses after rising from the battleground, saying that it was actually too complicated. Some spectators suddenly started pointing to another part of the playing field and shouting about another great boss battle. A huge iron sphinx with sharp fangs and humps was looming over the team of mysterious players in long kimonos with wide hoods, emitting a terrifying roar. Chu Tiange, standing on his cage and looking at the players of this mysterious team, decided to watch the fight for a bit. The young master sensed that there was something wrong with them and decided to gauge the strength of these guys. The enraged Sphinx continued to roar loudly as the mystery players looked at the available information about him on the screen, where there was nothing else besides level. The spectators in the stands were alarmed by the 18th level of the boss and decided that the team was doomed and they would never be able to deal with him since they still didn't have enough health reserves and only the greatest god Chu Tianju could do it. The evil Iron Sphinx rushed to attack the secret players, who powerfully attacked back with fireballs and displayed engraved protective shields. The enraged monster decided to strike with its huge fist at several players at once, who easily dodged it. The Iron Sphinx became even more angry and struck again, but with a fiery blow, again without hitting any of the players who had cleverly taken off. 
the mystery players decided to change their defense tactics to offense and, after surrounding the evil monster, began running in a circle and firing their shots at it. While they were running around the circle, the Iron Phoenix moved slightly and one of the players hit the other. The angry monster with red eyes decided to take advantage of this moment and attack the players, making a powerful leap towards them and roaring loudly. One of the mysterious players, after waiting a bit for the right moment, creates a fireball and directs it with all his might at the Iron Sphinx running towards him. The fireball goes straight into the heart of the enraged monster, and he and the player simultaneously realize what will happen next. The player, not giving a single chance to win, continued to attack the enemy until it victoriously exploded with a powerful flash, leaving behind a nice reward. The main NPC announced to everyone present that the Kingdom of Hades Guild had successfully defeated the 18th level boss, and the stands solemnly began to shout out the team name while cheering and whistling. Chu Tiange, Looking at all this, suspiciously thought that they were too strange, and L.A. reminded him that it was their turn to roll the die, which the master did by pressing the right button. The leader of the blasphemers said that there was no need to panic anymore as they were far enough away, all because of the master's good luck, but now the main task was to stay as far away from them as possible, and they would have a chance to move to another zone at the next intersection. At this time, the dice of the Dragon Emperor Palace team twisted several times in the air and landed with the number five. Chu Tiange ran with his friends across the squares of the playing field, shouting loudly to the blasphemers that he knew how much they had stolen from their guild, and he wouldn't just let them go, to which Heng Wu told the boss that he was waving the flag of doom tougher than him. The young master's team once again demolished the opponents who were only thinking about their bad luck. Liu Fei, slowly coming to her senses, told everyone that they only had three units of health left, and if they lost the battle a few more times, they could say goodbye to the guild battle forever. Chu Tiange walked over to the blasphemers, and after saying hello once again, he told them to get up and roll the dice since tens of millions of spectators were watching them right now and they were stalling. The leader of the blasphemers started running across the tiles like a madman and shouting that he would never throw again. And why was he even asking him to do it? Let him throw it himself if he needed to, to which the master only nodded calmly. The Dragon Emperor Palace team threw the dice, which flipped several times, fell with the number three, and the players quickly moved forward across the field. The young lord shouted to the leader of the blasphemers that he had thrown, and now it was his turn after all, if he wanted to continue playing, of course. The enemy guild leader begged the system to throw out the required number several times with pleading and pity before pressing the right button. The leader in a cold sweat slowly presses the roll button on the game system screen, waiting for a miracle. The dice begins to spin rapidly on its axis now and then, bouncing into the air. All the members of the blasphemers team watch the dice with bated breath in languid anticipation. The dice makes one last flip and deftly lands with the number three. The head of the rival guild immediately realizes that luck has turned away from them as quickly as it caught up with them, and they are doomed to failure once again. Meanwhile, in the arena, the other teams were fighting, and the head NPC was commenting on how the boss had placed group shackles on the third four positions of the Sea Dragon Guild, and they had lost the ability to move, which meant the failure of their plan. The evil boss used his fire charms and the players were destroyed with the announcement that the Sea Dragon Guild had lost the battle. The main NPC, after finishing commenting on the battle, announced the start of the preview for the third clash between the Dragon Emperor's Palace and the Blasphemers. The young lord and his buddies powerfully attacked the enemy team, who couldn't understand why they kept bumping into this particular guild and used crushing fire techniques. The spectators from the stands watched the battle and noticed that the Blasphemer Guild's health had dropped to zero, and according to the rules of the battle, they would be eliminated and unable to participate in the next tournaments of the game. Mao Yun admired the work they had done and said that the other guilds looking at this would no longer dare to attack them, to which the master said that they wouldn't touch them themselves unless there was a serious reason, as the lesson would be devastating. After thinking a bit, Mao Yun came to the conclusion that now the other guilds would spy on each other, and the blasphemer faction was no more and would not exist. 
The young lord suggested that the players try to continue the game, as there was a boss ahead that might be high-leveled. The third brother agreed with the master with childish excitement, and said that the other guilds were in the middle of a battle, and needed to gather all the treasures to find a bigger battle than the blasphemers, who only had a few people on their team. Newbie enthusiastically accepted the wizard's suggestion, and said that if a pumped reward could drop from the boss, they should use their available boosts so that everyone in the guild could get a piece of gear from it. The Dragon Emperor's palace team pressed the dice roll button, and the dice began to spin in the air, whistling as it landed with a number equal to four. The young lord and his buddies landed on a tile with a boss battle challenge icon. The second the players stepped on the tile, they unnoticeably teleported quickly to somewhere else. The spectators in the stands didn't even have time to realize anything, and began anxiously asking each other where the team had disappeared to. The main NPC told everyone not to worry, as the change of arena is due to a special boss mechanism, because they are getting stronger and stronger in the future game, and innocent players can get hurt on this playing field. The host added that this is why the organizers have thought of special arenas for especially strong bosses, and he will broadcast the whole battle on the big screen. The young master cheerfully said that he himself had just thought that his attacks might hurt other players, but the main bot had beaten him to it, and maybe he wasn't as stupid as he seemed, and the master hadn't wasted money on him. The players were discussing amongst themselves their excitement about the upcoming fight, and some of them even wanted to be in that arena, but another player said that he wouldn't stand there for a second. Meanwhile, Two unfamiliar players were chatting in the stands as they didn't expect to see each other here because one thought that the other was busy mopping up portals and didn't have time for such games, but the other replied that he thought his excitement about the games was greater than his own. The long-haired player with the fan said that everything in Han country was under his control, and of course he cared, and asked the scarred player if he was involved in the dark deeds in Kin country, but after looking at him, he quickly realized that he was. After a bit of thought, he added that he wouldn't beat around the bush anymore and their goal was most likely the same, so they hoped that this player, looking at the main screen, wouldn't cause any problems. The scarred guy said that he was surprised when their boss, knowing all the risks, still allowed his kid to put his mysterious plan into reality, even though he doubted it, to which his interlocutor replied that it was a big mistake by Zhao Guild and the blasphemers. The long-haired player added that they shouldn't care as it had nothing to do with them, and it wasn't such a big deal because the losing players were just pawns and the best option was to succeed directly. The scarred guy clarified if he was referring to something that was still in development and didn't understand how one could get through the head of era right now and if they could even use something like that. The long-haired player replied that it was only a matter of time, and Zhao Shu had successfully completed the last test so it wouldn't be long before access would be in their hands. Scarred Boy pondered over his interlocutor's words and silently looked at the main screen. The leading bot, pointing at the screen, was telling him that the boss battle was about to begin, and as he could see from the screen data, the main boss could be difficult even for Chu Tiange. The team of the Dragon Emperor Palace, armed, stood on the field, shrouded in a shroud of thick smoke, waiting for the main boss. They saw a bright flash in the middle of the playing field, and the young lord shouted for everyone to get ready as the boss was on his way. In the place of the bright flash, a huge funnel of fire appeared at the same second with lightning bolts flying out from there. None of the players of the Dragon Emperor Palace, except for the young master and L, were able to stay on the ground, and began to be forcefully drawn towards the funnel. Chu Ting saw his friends being sucked in one by one by the fiery vortex, and he shouted out their names in despair. Many other smaller ones appeared in place of the main vortex, and from one of them, someone's huge stone face appeared. A second later, a huge stone monster emerged from the fiery vortex in the light of sparkling lightning. Chu Tiange was slightly shocked and surprised to see a true dark elf in front of him. At this time, the players from the young master's team fell out of the fire vortex one after another in an unknown direction. Mao Yun was the first to land successfully and asked the others if everyone was all right and if anyone needed help. All the players made sure that they were safe and immediately noticed the monster coming towards them, quickly starting to prepare for battle. 
Meanwhile, the winged dark elf was getting closer and closer to Chu Tianzhu with Ella, leading an army of evil flying heads. The main NPC explained that this boss had an inherent void of yin and yang energy, and the peculiarity was that it could not be defeated alone, and a team of more than two players each had to divide equally and fight both sides of the boss. Mao Yun also heard that the boss would be defeated under special conditions and wondered what exactly it was about. Perhaps they wouldn't be able to contain him, but something else was definitely lurking. Meanwhile, Chu Tiange had asked the little raccoon to help him deal with the small flying heads while he would fight the main boss, and the girl was already standing ready in magic engraving. The formidable young lord took a powerful leap toward the dark elf and flew straight at him with his spear and summoned a vicious dragon that shook the ground. Mao Yun said that he would go all out to attract small monsters and asked Nubi to heal him in time and then their swordsman represented by the third brother would take care of the boss. Brave Mao Yun ran and loudly banged his sword on his shield and shouted various insults, attracting the attention of all the small enemies. He found a vantage point and stopped, placing a few protective shields around him, waiting for the angry heads flying at him with a whoosh. The third brother didn't waste a second at this point and moved in to attack the main boss, cleaving the air with his carrot sword. He flew at point-blank range towards the light elf and decided to use his air slash technique. Bringing his sword Karatel forward, the third brother makes a powerful air slash that reaches all the way to the monster. The light elf responds to the attack defensively, crossing his arms over his chest. The third brother makes a few more powerful sword strokes and the winged opponent flies a bit away. The game's system screen immediately displayed its health information, which was still more than half. The third brother expected after this to anger the monster, but was very surprised when the monster didn't try to attack first. He decided to seize the moment, since it was unknown how long he would be in defense mode, and began to deliver one crushing blow after another with his sword, wanting to achieve critical damage. A bar with zero health of the light elf appeared on the system screen, and at the same second, a massive nuclear explosion occurred. The third brother quickly selected a video call on the screen and contacted the young master, reporting his progress, receiving approval. Ending the conversation, Chu Tiange rushes into his next attack, summoning a new technique, Dragon Spear Fluff. The master quickly flew around the huge dark elf several times, leaving a trail of fire behind him and aimed his spear at his heart. Gaining momentum abruptly, Chu Tianga flies straight towards the intended target and thrusts his weapon precisely into the monster. A shroud of thick smoke appears in place of the dark elf and his assistant approaches the master. The little raccoon is happy to report that she and the young master did a great job once again. Chu Tianga doesn't seem to be listening to the girl and only thinks about how suspiciously strange everything is because after the destruction of the main boss, there wasn't even the slightest hint of any explosion. The master doesn't have time to develop his thought in his head to the end, as bright lightning and sparks start flying out of the maelstrom of fire. The young master and the little raccoon are in a state of paralyzing shock, mouths open at the sight now before them. From the main vortex, the unharmed dark elf once again emerged unharmed, accompanied by fireballs, lightning, and sparks. Chu Tiange stares at the monster in amazement and loudly shouts that there simply can't be such a thing, as he had definitely finished him off. The rest of the Dragon Emperor Palace's team members look forward and are also puzzled in shock as to how this could have happened and what is even going on. The huge winged light elf was moving away from the red flaming maelstrom towards the frightened players of Chu Tiange's team. The spectators in the stands were also obviously perplexed as to why the boss was being transferred with full health and thought that God Chu Tiange himself would probably need the help of a healing potion as well. The main bot decided to clear things up a bit and said that even if they all didn't expect it, the boss would be reborn since he had mentioned earlier about the yin and yang voids, which were clearly not as simple as they seemed. The little raccoon standing on the protective engraving shouted at the young master to leave her behind and go fight the boss, as she still had the strength to restrain the pesky flying heads with her magic grating. Chu Tiange powerfully pushed off the ground and reached the stone monster in one leap and dealt it a devastating fiery blow with the tip of his spear. The master who flew over behind the dark elf tried to break quickly, leaving a scorched trail behind him, 
as the place where the embittered monster stood exploded behind him with a bright flash. The little raccoon was already holding off the smaller enemies from the last of her strength and quickly decided to check if her abilities had recovered, but was disappointed and annoyed to see that her supplies were still empty. The girl did not immediately notice the army of flying monsters with explosive projectiles coming at her and quickly ran forward, defending herself with her magic staff. Elle opened the game's system screen as she ran and quickly found a bottle of a potion to restore at least some ability as soon as possible in her inventory, deftly grabbing it for use. The little raccoon was just about to apply the potion, as at that very second she was attacked with a bloodthirsty bite by one of the smaller monsters, and she dropped the bottle out of surprise. The young master noticed in time that his assistant was already being attacked from all sides by vicious winged heads and rushed to her aid with a bullet. The flying monsters from the master's sharp lightning strike flew apart and were destroyed. Chu Tiange quickly ran up to Ella and anxiously asked if she was all right, to which the girl replied that she was just a little tired and wanted to catch her breath. The young lord was still irritably trying to figure out why these small monsters and their evil boss were not being killed in any way, and if it was all about the stealth condition. At the same time, on the other playing field, the other players were fighting the light side of the boss, dealing devastating blows to the enemies one after another and helping each other. Mao Yun, surrounded by an army of abominable flying heads, was shouting to his friends that all his strength was running out and he was unlikely to last much longer. The healer, who had been holding a healing shield all this time, also informed everyone that she could no longer heal anyone as she had run out of wizard magic and urgently needed at least one blue potion. The third brother shouted that, according to the rules of the game, they were now both fighters of the same rank and had no blue scale, nor did they have blue potions. The spectators in the stands visibly began to worry about the Dragon Emperor's palace team as they realized that they had probably run out of all available resources, and there were too many small monsters with some simply immortal boss to defeat them. The mysterious players from the Kingdom of Hades team were quietly watching everything that was happening on the main screen. One of the players of this team, most likely the main player, was quietly and inconspicuously pulling out something from the wide sleeve of his kimono. The chief of the Kingdom of Hades, deftly launched this something, which looked like a black sheet, ahead of his team onto the playing field. He began to control this secret attribute with his hand, as if to guide it towards the action, and when the attribute almost touched the ground, the player directed his magical powers at it and turned it into a black box. A pillar of fire rose sharply towards the sky from where the players were standing, powerfully nailing the sky around the entire arena. The main NPC couldn't help but notice such a bright flash and turned around in surprise and horror to see what was happening, beginning to realize who was about to appear. The sky turned black in an instant, thickening the clouds and forming a spiral-like funnel shooting out electric lightning. The spectators in the stands were distracted from watching the main screen and waited with bated breath to see what would happen next. The leading bot, quickly realizing what was about to begin, in fear began to shout loudly to all the players to quickly leave the stands and run as far away as possible. A creature with sharp claws and a vicious grin began to appear from the shining hole of the funnel, accompanied by lightning discharges. The players in the stands finally understood the meaning of the words of the main NPC and began to run between the rows in panic, not realizing what kind of monster was about to emerge and what they would have to endure. A moment later, a monster in the form of an angry, powerful dragon with huge wings completely appeared out of the celestial vortex, emitting a roar. The spectators from the stands tried to leave the arena with the monster as soon as possible, running to all possible exits, but all entrances and exits were blocked and inaccessible for some unknown reason. The players didn't know what else to do and panicked and tried to exit the era, but as it turned out, they couldn't leave it either for some reason. The leading NPC realized that it had begun, and the dragon was holding all the players here, as they must join the battle and not leave until the very end, but one thing he could not understand was how the monster got loose, as all precautions had been taken before the games. The stands of the guild battle were noticeably empty because of the scattered players, 
and those who were still there were running in terror and begging for mercy and withdrawal from the game, while the dragon was aiming at them from above and destroying everyone with magical flames. The young lord heard something amiss and quickly opened the system screen to communicate with the main NPC, inquiring what they had going on up there in the first place and where this black dragon had come from. The lead bot seemed to be confused himself, informing the master that he himself didn't understand how it had happened, and the 45th level boss, the ghostly hunting dragon, had gotten loose, though it was securely sealed and unmentionable. The ghostly dragon continued its destructive mission and sizzled the still hopeful players on the field. The bot appealed to President Chu in horror to hurry up as one guy has control over the dragon, and all the players must join the battle with no way out. And even if there was a complete loss of health, they wouldn't get out until the boss was killed. He also added that only the young master will be able to destroy the monster and save them all, but the master didn't understand how to defeat the yin and yang void and quickly asked the bot how else he can get out of there. The master NPC, in his usual slow manner, as if nothing threatened his safety, began to leisurely tell him that the essence of the strategy to battle the yin and yang void was this. Naturally, while the bot was about to lay it all out, the sinister dragon heard him and immediately rushed towards him, carrying the bot far beyond the stands. Chu Tiange was still trying to contact it and calling out loudly, even though he already realized that it was useless and they were doomed to fight on their own. A worried L approached the young lord and began to ask what they should do now, and he in turn, trying to calm them down, exhaled deeply and said that they should relax and take things a little easier. Suddenly an alert came up on the game's system screen with a new inventory being obtained from the list they already had. The young master was a little surprised, as this was definitely not the time when he would be buying anything, but of course he decided to see what was there, pressing a button on the monitor. In front of the master, the greatest attribute, a dragon totem with immense strength and power, appeared on the screen. As Chu Tiange gazed at the totem with bated breath, the dragon's eyes looked directly into his eyes, and something like a simultaneous exchange of energy in the light of blue radiation occurred, energizing the young master with new power. The system announced to the master that he had learned a new passive ability, Dragon Vision, and could see through the movement of the living, and depending on the difference in strength had extremely high predictive power. In the air, several fire whirlpools were in the same place as before and emitted electric lightning. The young lord carefully watched the whirlpools in anticipation of the next enemy, portion of monsters. As expected, numerous vicious flying heads began to fly out of the fire whirlpools one by one, heading towards the master and L for another attack. Chu Tianga, having gained new strength, only waited for the vile monsters to emerge from the black holes and ran headlong into a retaliatory attack. The young lord pushed off the ground hard, jumped high, and was already flying with his spear towards the enemy army and the main black hole. In the fiery vortex where the master had struck a crushing blow, there was a nuclear explosion and all the small monsters that appeared from there immediately began to die one by one. All that happened immediately noticed the dark elf and came into a frenzy of rage, surrounded by the negative energy of all his dead subordinates. Since there were quite a lot of small monsters because the main body of the army was coming out of the main funnel, which was destroyed earlier by the young master, the dark elf began to literally suffocate from the huge flow of negative energy absorbing him and could not do anything about it. When all the negative energy of the destroyed flying heads had been completely absorbed by the boss, he would turn into a magical electrified ball along with it. Chu Tiange was just standing nearby and watching the entire process, happy and admiring his work because it was finally possible to return to the arena. The master decided to talk about everything and thus help his friends to defeat the enemy as soon as possible, cheerfully explaining to them to look carefully at the funnels, as one of the black holes is the main and part of the boss's body, and also it doesn't move and they just might break this mechanism. The third brother was of course happy about this news, but there was still anxiety on his face as he couldn't figure out which of all the black holes was the main one and how he would find it. Mao Yun informed his buddies that he had one last ability left, which would temporarily protect him from the damage he received and tease the small monsters. The brave guy asked his friend not to waste the power of magic healing on him, 
and to go with his third brother to find the right black hole while he would attract small monsters. Nubi tried to contradict him somehow, but Mao, quickly running away, shouted to her that they needed to protect the third brother as he was their last hope for salvation. The guy ran across the battlefield and once again loudly banged his sword against his shield and shouted insults to the flying heads, drawing all their attention and taking them away from the boss. The third brother started a quick calculation in his head that if the period between the summons of the small monsters was 30 seconds and there were about 2,000 of them on the field, Mao Yun would only be able to support one wave, which meant that he only had one single chance. For some reason, he remembered the national competition that took place about two years ago. The competition was frisbee shooting, where a flying disc is launched and players simultaneously shoot it with a shotgun until the first hit. Both players were focused on shooting accurately and confident of their victory as they looked at the launched disc. One of the players took quick aim and a moment later made a deafeningly accurate shot. The third brother thought about the fact that one wrong shot in the air had caused that player to lose the competition. He quickly realized that the situation then was very similar to the one in front of him now, only he was facing this evil monsters and needed to accurately hit the right black hole. Nubi anxiously shouted to the third brother that the small monsters were already rushing towards him, but he didn't lose hope, for there was still his team around, and Mao informed him that he couldn't destroy them now. The third brother, having the right attitude, triumphantly ran forward in the light of bright lightning, shouting to his friends that this time everything would definitely work out. He quickly ran towards the fire funnels emitting real evil and tried to quickly figure out which one was the main part of the mechanism. The third brother noticed that one of the funnels kept summoning and emitting evil monsters, so he decided to take a chance. Powerfully pushing off the ground, the swordsman approached the desired black hole and was about to attack it. Almost reaching the necessary funnel, the third brother is attacked by flying winged heads and has to quickly defend himself by taking several hits. The healer immediately noticed the damage her buddy received and channeled her regenerating powers to heal him. The third brother was completely absorbed by the vicious monsters attacking him and was only thinking of one thing. There was no way he could give up so quickly and let the whole team down. It was at this moment that scraps of memories of the competition from two years ago surfaced in his mind, giving him strength. The third brother, gathering his courage, decides to do the impossible, and still surrounded by enemy heads, throws his long sword with all his might into the chosen black hole. At the same second, a massive nuclear explosion occurs in the fiery vortex, producing a blinding effect. Following the destruction of the black hole, all the winged monsters begin to quickly disappear from the battlefield. Mao Yun, already exhausted, exhaled deeply, unable to believe that it was finally over. Nubi solemnly raised her hands up and began to jump from her long-awaited victory. The third brother sat on the ground, still coming to his senses, realizing that he had been so close to perdition, but had miraculously managed to survive and save everyone. The light side of the boss began to absorb the negative energy of the destroyed small monsters, emitting a loud roar. Boss, joined together with the flow of negative energy, formed a magical electrified ball surrounded by lightning discharges. At the same second, all the players from the field instantly teleported to the same playing field as the young master and Ella. The third brother cheerfully ran towards the master, reporting their teamwork and long-awaited victory over the monster. Chu Tiange, shaking his buddy's courageous hand, said that he didn't doubt him in the slightest and was confident that he could do it. While the friends were exchanging friendly remarks, the little raccoon called everyone to look forward at the yin and yang void. Two huge balls of black and white color respectively named yin and yang were moving towards each other in a shroud of thick black smoke. A moment later, the balls powerfully flew into the air, leaving behind fiery trails and circled around each other, emitting lightning and sparks. For a while, they rapidly spun in a circle, as if they were exchanging energy and frantically rushed towards each other. The young lord looked on in bewilderment at this breathtaking spectacle and didn't want to believe that they were rejoicing in their victory too soon. Finally, the balls of emptiness stopped spinning and twirling and with a powerful pull merged into one huge ball, depicting a full-fledged picture of the yin and yang symbol in front of the still astonished players. In the center of the ball appeared the head of a stone elf, bifurcated front to back into both sides of the boss.
dark and light at the same time. From the merged yin and yang voids, a huge, powerful elf emerged menacingly, gaining the power of both sides at once and emitting a spirit of evil and hatred for everything around him. The entire Dragon Emperor Palace team stared at the elf in amazement, realizing that this was the main boss of this round. The stone elf looked even more terrifying and embittered than when it was split into two monsters and walked forward towards the players, angrily snarling and grinning. Chu Tiange, despite all of the elf's majesty, was confident in his strength and decided that he could handle it. The young lord pushed off the ground with a powerful jerk and flew towards the formidable monster, shouting to everyone that he would take care of everything himself and only heard warnings from his friends. The stone monster gained a new double mighty strength and immediately aimed magic whirlwinds at the master flying at it. Chu Tiange deftly dodged all the blows in his favorite zigzag form and continued flying with his attack on the enemy. The master landed his first crushing blow on the stone elf who tried to repel the attack. The young master had no intention of giving up and resorted to using his favorite technique, dragon fury, cleaving the air with fire. Chu Tiange flew from the monster that was slipping away from him as it tried to defend itself with several powerful attacks at once. After flying around the monster several times and landing, the master would push off again to jump in another attack. The stone elf decided to respond to the attack and flew straight at the young master at breakneck speed, displaying its sharp claws. The monster landed with a thunderous crash and literally crushed the place where Chu Tiange was standing, shooting out fire lightning and bombs. The stone elf hoped for victory, but the young master managed to slip away from the attack in time and quickly flew around the monster from behind for another strike. The master's spear shimmered, charging up with a new stream of power, and Chu Tiange summoned a crushing attack from the evil earth-crushing dragon, flying at him from his second elf's side. And then the master in a rage notices the other side of the monster begin to activate in battle and opens its jaws with something glowing. Out of the stone elf's mouth comes a ball of magic surrounded by spherical lightning and a stream of energy. At the same second, a powerful stream of magical attack spews out of the ball, demolishing and destroying everything in its path. The players of the young lord's team watch in horror and loudly shout his name several times. Chu Tiange managed to dodge the monster's crushing blow just in time, and as it turned out, he had completely forgotten about its other body part on the backside. The buddies saw the living master in the light of the flickering attack, and the third brother quickly commanded everyone to urgently run to his aid. The other side facing the players immediately noticed the impending attack and prepared to attack first, forming a magic ball with paralyzing lightning. The enraged elf launched the ball and it exploded on the way, throwing streams of negative energy and destructive blows at the players who flew backwards with a whoosh. This made the young lord mad, and he decided to take extreme measures and call upon a hidden skill, Taiku Dragon Breath. At the same second, the powerful bodies of several intertwined dragons appeared in the air, flying in a fiery light towards the angry opponent. The dark elf did not expect such fury and power from the master, and with a roar he took the power of the ancient dragons launched at him, not even having time to defend himself and dodge. Another powerful nuclear explosion, from which everything around him exploded and flew far in different directions, blinding everyone with a bright light. The bifurcated elf survived the crushing blow, but was noticeably badly hurt as he was unable to even take a step, slowly swaying in place. The system screen immediately displayed a bar with up-to-date information about the health of the stone elf, or rather his two personalities in one body, decreasing exponentially and tending to zero with every second. A few moments later, there was no trace of the stone elf, and in its place in a pall of thick smoke was a huge scorched hole in the ground with a kind of shimmering portal above it. The third brother and the rest of the players were once again amazed at the young master's power, splitting both space and time at once with a single blow. Chu Tiange immediately realized that this was the portal through which they would finally be able to leave this playing field and return to the arena and he loudly called out for everyone to follow him into it. The players immediately rushed into the teleport vortex after the master one by one, wanting to get out of here as soon as possible, and didn't even turn back once. The whole team instantly moved through the portal back to the arena, where there were only empty and half-destroyed stands. 
Master and his friends saw the surviving players trying their best to attack the ghost dragon and defend against its ferocious flames. Mao Yun opened his mouth and declared that it was a real mess, while the third brother wondered how they should fight the 45th level boss. Around the stands, all around the arena, the souls of the destroyed players hovered in the air and literally filled the entire field. The dead players, or rather their souls, were communicating amongst themselves as to why they were still here and not returning to the objection field, suggesting that they were now being affected by the dragon's reinforcement on their forceful hold and would not be able to leave the fight or resurrect until they finished off the boss. It came to one of the players that they had been trapped in this arena from the moment they came here to watch the games. Some of the players hovering in the air noticed Chu Tiange, who had returned with his team on the battlefield. The master had summoned his faithful assistant to help, and the latter was already dragging someone by the collar in his teeth to his master's feet. Ursha, responding to the young master's call, dragged the main bot to the master's side, putting him in his full favor. Chu Tiange was no longer going to wait a moment waiting for any explanations and menacingly asked the lead NPC how to understand all this and what was going on here in general. The bot guiltily began to tell him that he didn't know much himself, as such monsters were locked in separate subspaces beforehand and only weak bosses could get out into the arena. But the master didn't want to listen to this useless stuff. He asked if this boss had any weaknesses or hidden conditions for its destruction, to which the bot replied that there was no special mechanism and everything was simple. It was necessary to lower its health level to zero. The master commanded the third brother and Mao Yun to go and gather as many surviving players from the field as they could and prioritize taking those with remote and elemental abilities while he looked for an opportunity to destroy this monster. It was up to Nubi and the little raccoon to use his abilities to revive the dead players in as many as he could. The young lord himself rushed towards the dragon and on the way ordered the enraged dog to try and find a way to get its attention. Ursha ran forward and began barking loudly and menacingly at the ghostly dragon hunter, thus managing to draw its gaze to himself. Chu Tiange flew at the mighty dragon and sent it a disc with a seal of fire, releasing explosions upon contact with the surface. When the disc reached and touched the dragon, it turned into a multitude of explosions, dealing several strong blows at once to the monster, taking them painfully. Chu Tiange thinks that the moment of truth has arrived, and this will be the end of the legendary battle, bringing his spear over the dragon and screaming his demise with a single blow. At the same second, there is a blinding flash, preventing anyone from seeing anything clearly and a piercing roar. Suddenly, the master, who obviously did not expect it, flies out of the bright splash and falls down quickly, not having time to group or somehow stop. Behind the fading flash, the same evil dragon hovers in the air and on either side of it fly at breakneck speed Ursha and the young master. The little raccoon girl pays attention to the disappearing flash in time and notices the young lord flying at high speed to the ground, shouting his name several times in despair. The girl quickly realizes what she must do and sends a rune of salvation towards Chu Tiange, hoping for a favorable outcome. The master practically reaches the very ground as at that very moment, the rune of salvation transforms into an underhanging net and literally catches him from the clutches of demise, cleverly unfolding right underneath him. The little raccoon was terrified and finally exhaled loudly, realizing how close her young master was to the end and how she had arrived just in time with her rune. Chu Tiange lay in the net and slowly came to his senses, as he didn't quite yet realize what had happened to him up there, how he had ended up here in the first place, and most importantly, why. The little raccoon immediately rushed to the master's aid, quickly running to him and inquiring about his health and well-being. Chu Tiange fully recovered, stood up and said that he was absolutely fine, but he still didn't understand what had just pushed him backwards with such power up there. At this time, a worried head NPC ran up to the players and nervously asked how the president was feeling and if he had lost health. The master looked wistfully at the ghostly dragon that continued to sizzle all remaining living things on the field and asked the leading bot what abilities this monster had, for he had practiced finishing it off. But something could be pushed back by Chu Tiange himself. The leading bot asked for a moment to ponder and a little later said that he remembered besides the dragon retention enhancement about its dragon blood. 
special immunity to any kind of damage below 65 points. He decided to elaborate a bit more on the dragon, calling it a blood rebel, as its crushing attacks have a high probability of causing a powerful critical hit. The monster also has destructive tracking, which is when it unleashes a quick attack on a target with high physical damage. The dragon's next ability was the Breath of Evil, with which it deals a large amount of magical damage to enemies in the form of a straight flickering beam. The final ability of the main boss was the dragon's reverse scale, when more than five groups of enemies on the battlefield die, the effect of bouncing attacks would appear. After listening carefully and thinking for a bit, the master decided that presumably his skill had bounced due to the large number of dead players on the battlefield. Chu Tiange began to quickly question the master bot if the dead and surviving players could somehow leave the field or the game so that he could safely perform his attacks, which the bot seriously pondered over. After thinking for a bit, the host informed that there was one way. It could buy back the dead members of the teams, where the price per person would be 100 gold coins at a time. The host, in a cold sweat, feverishly began to make a quick calculation in his mind to buy back all the destroyed players. Suddenly, interrupting the main bot's musings, a pile of gold coins began to pile up in front of him without stopping. When the young lord finished, the practice leader was bathing in a sea of gold, covering himself with practically an entire head of gold. Chu Tiange ordered the head bot to hurry up and buy back all the players for him, and if they died again, to buy them back once more, and the bot shouted happily that everything would be executed in the best way possible. The enraged dragon hunter rushed with an intimidating roar after Hirsch, who was fleeing across the player field from him. The young master looked closely at the flying fire-breathing dragon and was already contemplating the best option to attack the monster. The master powerfully pushed off the ground to leap towards the dragon, which continued to actively scorch the battlefield and everyone in its path, and shouted various things at it, thus taunting it. Formidable Chu Tiange swung his spear for the first strike in this party, hitting the mighty dragon's target precisely. The attack only angered the fire-breathing monster more, and with a savage grin, it pushed the young master heavily aside, preparing to strike back accurately. The dragon has no time to do anything, but at that very second, the master summons a force of furious thunder, illuminated by lightning balls and bright shimmering sparks. The young master rushes at full speed towards the enemy monster, and thrusting his spear forward, it hits precisely the torso of the angry dragon, leaving behind flaming rings around it. The great Chu Tiange's next crushing blow is a blow to the face of the wild beast, enraging it even more and leaving a couple of flaming rings around it. The game system screen updates with the monster's health status, where the bar with its life level is already less than half. The ghostly dragon decides to go on the offensive in anger and abruptly flies over the master, leaving behind only a trail of dust and dirt. The monster prepares a new-in-its-mouth magic ball with electrified lightning and is about to deliver its crushing blow with fury. The little raccoon immediately notices the dragon's intentions and shouts to the young lord with a warning of impending danger from the enemy side. Chu Tiange is not even going to retreat that easily and in a moment decides to use his new passive skill Dragon Gaze and his eyes emit a powerful stream of deep radiation. The ghostly dragon throws his orb towards the master which on the move turns into a pillar of negative energy and destroys everything in its path. The monster aims precisely at the young master with its magical power, but the young master deftly leaps aside in an instant with a somersault. After dodging another dragon attack, Chu Tiange cheerfully thought about the fact that this new dragon gaze skill of his has excellent visibility through the trajectory of the resulting attack. The young lord decides to tease the fearsome beast a bit, and shouts to it that its speed is weak for any powerful strike, and the 45th level boss turned out to be just a blank slate of nothing. The ghostly dragon hunter, as if wanting to refute all the words of the master, just silently points him to one of the places on the playing field of the arena. In the ground scorched by the fire-breathing monster, there was a huge hole in which the bodies of numerous annihilated players from the stands were peacefully resting. Chu Tiange immediately threateningly ordered the main bot to stop nonsense and immediately resurrect all the dead players, and it immediately rushed towards the pit with a pile of gold. 
while the dragon hunter found the players lurking in the upper rows of the stands and sizzled them with his fiery roar, the master shouted after him that he didn't understand why there was so much noise and chaos, and why such a trifling boss of 45th level couldn't be destroyed by so many players. At the same second, Chu Tiange switched to another level of attack and summoned a hidden skill to help him. Dragon Breath Taiku, who began to appear several pillars of light at once. Several intertwined, menacing dragon torsos fly from the wizard towards the black monster at breakneck speed, shooting lightning and sparks along the way. The ghostly dragon quickly reacts to the attack and unleashes a huge stream of sizzling roars towards its opponent. As a result, in one second, the two enemies' powerful attacks meet at half of each path and smash into each other with incredible force, asserting their might and not yielding to anyone. Chu Tiange holds his attack with all his might, surrounded by ball lightning and electrical discharges, and shouts to the dragon that he can only not think of his majesty because he has different enhancements. The dragon similarly confronts his rival with his punch and responds by telling him not to make himself a god either just because he has tons of money and has bought everything everywhere already. The entire team of the Dragon Emperor's palace tensely awaits the end of the great battle with bated breath and excitement and shouts words of encouragement and approval to the young master. While the master is trying to hold back the enemy attack, he feels something or someone appear behind his back to help him. Chu Tiange quickly turns around and sees there activated the dragon totem enhancement obtained just at the moment of their battle with Void Yin and Yang. The master quickly realizes that the advantage is on his side, and with a smile asks the dragon for forgiveness, and says that it's really cool to have a fortune channeling the extra boost. Taiku's hidden dragon breath skill is augmented with new power and strength and gains an overkill ability illuminating everything around it with a fiery red light. The ghostly dragon lets out a menacing roar and takes the full force of the incredible blow as it no longer has the privileges and reinforcements to defend itself and explodes into a bright flash in the same second. From the destroyed monster, countless rewards fly to the ground directly at the players, who are thrilled to notice that it's all immortal gear with items and equipment of level 45 and gems of level 3 and above. At this time, the mysterious players of the Kingdom of Hades continue to stand in the same place and see something in front of them that looks like a sharp dragon fang. The head of their guild leisurely approaches the attribute that fell from the dragon and takes it into his sleeve to the place where he had previously taken out the secret attribute for summoning the monster. The two unknown players continued to observe everything unnoticed by the others, and the long-haired one said that the strategy of chasing away the strongest and exterminating the weakest had worked, and now Chu Tiange was ready to face any opponent, unaware of his strength. The scarred guy was leaving into the teleport portal and only said that they should leave the master behind, for now was not the right time for any of their interference. The long-haired guy didn't say anything to his interlocutor and only silently followed his example and headed straight into the portal. On the system screen of the game, after defeating the Black Dragon, a new hidden mission, Revival of the Dragon Clan, appeared on the system screen with an invitation to accept it or decline it. Chu Tiange carefully read the hidden mission and thought about something. The master simply couldn't refuse the Dragon Clan Revival being the heir of the Dragon Emperor and pressed the confirmation button. Information about the reward and mission requirements should have appeared next on the system screen, but the corresponding fields were blank. The young lord was angered by the lack of mission information. After all, it meant that he had to figure out what to do with it there himself. Mao Yun ran around the arena and shouted that finally the rewards had finally stopped falling down, and in full huge piles lay all over the playing field, and there were enough for the entire guild by a large margin. Little Raccoon offered to clear the field of rewards and return to the palace since the other players were worried about them and he agreed. Chu Tiange was heading towards the main NPC and asked for a more detailed explanation about what ended up happening here. The host began to reply that he didn't know himself, as the project developers had said that all the monsters had been firmly locked up by them personally in special subspaces from which, theoretically, it was impossible to escape. The master also asked that since the guild battle competition had come to an end, what he should do with all those rewards, putting the bot in a stalemate. 
Chu Tiange menacingly asked the master bot if he wanted to stash away all the money he had given him for the resurrected players since it had not been fully utilized. The master bot quickly realized the essence of the conversation and said that since the only survivors in this competition were the players of the Dragon Emperor's Palace team, the entire reward belongs to them only. The master left and thanked the bot, saying that he would gladly accept all the rewards and let him take as many as he needed to fully restore the arena. The lead NPC shouted words of thanks and good wishes to the master until he turned around and was about to say something else. The young master sternly asked the bot which NPC had summoned the Black Dragon after all. The master wasn't particularly sure if the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Criminal Affairs were allowed to identify special bosses for system missions and asked why he was interested. The master told the story of the hidden mission and that he accepted it, of course, since he was of the ancient dragon lineage, but he didn't see any detailed instructions, so he wants the person who set it all up to question him and find out what happened to the black dragon at the same time. The leading NPC said it would be on him and vowed to find out all the information he needed. The young lord and his team finally returned to the Dragon Emperor's palace, where the other players were already waiting and solemnly welcomed them. The team had brought a giant mountain of expensive rewards and gold with them to the guild, and one of the players said to quickly inform all the players who weren't online right now to log into the game to evenly distribute it all. Chu Tiange, after greeting the people from his headquarters, started whistling loudly. The Divine Phoenix quickly responded to his call and recognized that Master had summoned it to absorb the bounty. The Master approached the pile of gold and informed it that it could eat as much as it needed to level up quickly. Though the Guardian Beast was famous for being greedy, even he was unable to take in so many rewards at once. The Master clarified that he was not asking him to take them all at once, but only as many as they needed to protect their guild while he was away. The Divine Phoenix replied that it would not be able to raise its level until the level of the guild, which was directly related to the level of the master, was raised. Chu Tiange wondered where to put all the remaining rewards, since his level couldn't be raised yet temporarily, and they couldn't just lie here and accumulate. One player new to the game saw the piles of rewards in the palace nearby and wondered what they were and where they came from. Characters also notice that there's a whole mountain of all sorts of elevation materials and equipment, and it's all as if in a dream. The master stood with his buddies and examined the whole pile of gold, offering to sell it all since they couldn't use it themselves. Chu Tiange began to reason that their guild was located on the only way to Chanan City, where there were always the most newcomers, and thus the traffic every day was high, and the materials and equipment they had were very useful, so someone would definitely buy them. Before the master could finalize his plan, various players were crawling at his feet and begging to join him. Chu Tiange turned around at the noise and saw another crowd of maddened players rushing towards him with open arms, shouting nonsense. The divine phoenix turned towards all these players and sneezed loudly, spewing out a fiery breath. The master grinningly asked the guardian beast what it was doing. The phoenix obediently bowed and replied that he was allergic to dogs, especially licking dogs. The Ursha standing nearby immediately reacted to such a speech from the bird and turned around in bewilderment. Chu Tiange summoned the strongest players of his team to advance to new victories as he solemnly raised his hand with his spear upwards. The young master's team had reached the 30th level dungeon of the Devil's Inferno and fought valiantly against the mighty king of purgatory. Chu Tiange gave the giant monster a crushing blow, and it was defeated in the same second, exploding from within. After the Dungeon King exploded, various rewards of different levels sprinkled in its place. The game's world announcement turned to Chu Tiange's team, congratulating Chu Tiange for passing the Devil's Hell Dungeon in just 14 minutes, and the player levels rose one after another. Mao Yun exclaimed that level 30 was completely worth it because his upgrade was instantaneous as much as level 24. A congratulatory world announcement announced that Chu Tiange had reached the 30th level and opened the country's authority system. The master immediately opened the country authority map and began to quickly study the skills and abilities he had obtained. He noted with some annoyance in his eyes that these achievements were still weak for him. The little raccoon reminded the young master that this was already the maximum level of the dungeon available in Shannon City. 
Chu Tiange turned to the girl, saying that there were high-level dungeons near Luyang City because there were about 10 to 20,000 players alone, and they could form their next guild assignment there. Third brother enthusiastically supported the boss's idea, saying that players would always get better with time, just like they once did. Chu Tiange expressed his approval of the plan and told everyone to sort out their rewards to leave for Luyang City as soon as possible. The master picked up one of the bows and said that there were no archers among them, and he didn't need it, so it would be better to pass it on to the guild for someone. The third brother hesitantly asked the young master to pass the bow to him if possible. Chu Tiange recalled that his friend had previously had a career as an archer, but after one incident he had stopped using it. The third brother confirmed the boss's words, saying that after defeating Void Yin and Yang, he felt attracted to the game again, and thus wanted to try again. The master was pleased with this decision of his friend, and gladly gave him the bow, accepting the words of gratitude. Nubi decided to intervene in the conversation between the buddies, and offered to continue later, as she was already a bit sleepy. Chu Tiange looked at the clock in the screen in surprise, and didn't even realize that it was already so late, and in reality it was already deep into the night. Master decided that everyone should get a good rest, and suggested that everyone go out and meet tomorrow. The young master was already standing in his office asking his uncle how things were going with the funding, having learned that the current exchange rate was mostly stabilized, but the trade turnover had started to increase day by day, and now up to 10 million coins could be traded in the game every day. The master said with a satisfied look that they could now carry out their plan, and in the near future gather a group of players in the game and allow them to go offline in a specially prepared area with game booths for them. Butler reported that he had already started preparing the grounds and booths, and currently 50 players could go offline unhindered, but he didn't have time to finish as he heard an alert sound on his tablet. Uncle Yin Li looked at the screen and said that the IP of that Dark Sky player had reappeared. Butler opened the detailed map with the tracking beacon and started the download. Master reported that the first few pages on the forum were just solidly covered with news of this and cries for them to finally battle. Uncle reported that this player was using an anti-tracking device, and he couldn't pinpoint his exact location, but roughly speaking, Dark Sky was somewhere in this city, and in the game, it was close to Luyang City in Tang Country. The master immediately perked up upon hearing about Luyang City, and said that it was a great coincidence, as his future path in the game lies just through there. The butler began to tell him that this city is surrounded by dungeons ranging from level 30 to level 60 and this guy's importance has obviously been determined. But one thing that is not yet clear is whether he is their friend or foe. The master only smirked and said that it didn't matter at all since he was going to make this city his own anyway. He adopted a fighting stance and loudly announced that if he couldn't convince this player, he would have to settle the dispute with his fists. Chu Tiange was already in the game, and the head bot was introducing him to their chief martial minister of Chenan City. The young master politely extended his hand to the minister and introduced himself, seeing only the stern face of the latter. The minister did not reciprocate the master's favor, and immediately said that if he was that Chu Tiange, then according to the guild battle, he should not approach him with such a question after receiving his reward. Chu Tiange was once again convinced that his pumped-up NPC friendliness skill didn't work for everyone. The master immediately asked what he meant since the boss had caused such chaos in the arena and he refused to investigate further. The minister replied that the master, as a player, doesn't need to know such a thing, and he's only here at all to tell him to never get involved again, not to chat with him. He finished his speech and headed away, saying that he had better get it right. Chu Tiange wasn't going to give up so easily and informed the minister that he had recently raised the 30th level and hadn't had time to look at the authority system in this city yet which caught the latter's attention. Raising the prestige meant that he could improve the prestige of different locations in Shanann, and for 10,000 gold, he could purchase one prestige point for one location, which meant that when the master maximized the prestige, he could become the owner of that location. After everything, the master began to push the buttons of increasing authority at a frantic speed. The world announcement announced that player Chu Tiange had reached the maximum prestige level of the Channon City Watchtower. Next was the master's congratulations on reaching the maximum prestige level of the herb store. Within a few seconds, 
Several dozen prestige-level congratulations from different locations rained down on Chu Tiange. The main NPC shouted for the minister to hurry up and apologize, because when the master bought up all of Shannon, he would have to pray and sleep outside. Chu Tiange, with a sly grin, loudly informed everyone that it was too late. The world announcement congratulated player Chu Tiange for reaching the maximum level of authority in Chenan City and unlocking the title of Lord of this city. The young lord slowly walked towards the minister sitting on the ground. Mar Yun approached the master and gave him a stone to massacre the frightened minister. Chu Tiange took the stone and said either he would throw the minister straight into the street or they would talk calmly. The minister immediately grabbed onto the master bot and started shouting how wrong he was and apologized to the president. The head bot quickly kicked the minister with his foot, reminding him that Chu Tiange was now the lord of the city. The minister quit tearfully begging for mercy and praising the new lord. The master grudgingly reported that the situation was still unpleasant because he had to buy up all of Shannon, which also took quite a long time to deal with for some unfortunate conversation with him. The master, throwing out a stone, suggested that the minister hurry up and tell him what was up with the guild battle, and the headbot hurried him up. The minister began to tell how after they left, they went to the arena to check everything, and the people from their department found that the subspace with the dragon was not destroyed from the inside, and they found the blood of a young dragon on the field, which made the black dragon fierce and raised its damage. After a second, he continued that after its death, the black dragon gives away rare materials and the cursed dragon fang, but the soldiers didn't find it anywhere, and no one had it. The master wondered if someone in the competition might have stolen the fang. Chu Tiange asked the master to find a list with all the contestants and spectators and sort through it, and he would look into it later. El approached the master and said that he was too impulsive and spent as much as 500 million for authority, but he only said that it was a small thing and it would pay off very soon. The young master showed the girl on the screen that all players would pay a certain tax for NPC expenses and their guild members could use it for free. He also explained to his girlfriend that he was going to buy authority as early as yesterday, but he hadn't exactly decided on the location, so it was good that he had now bought everything at once together, to which L expressed great joy at the fact that they no longer needed to spend money. The players at the gates of the Dragon Emperor's Palace were shouting to each other to rather run to the master since he now had everything for free. A lot of players stood at the guild gates and solemnly shouted his name, welcoming the new lord to the city. Little Raccoon asked the master if what happened at the guild competition was related to the player who wanted to frame him. Chu Tiange thoughtfully said that he wasn't exactly sure of anything, but after recalling the mysterious players of the Hades Realm Guild, he had some guesses. El shook at the mere thought that if the Black Dragon was not defeated this time, they would all remain trapped there. Chu Tiange didn't share his friend's fear, after all. He wouldn't have taken so long with the dragon if it wasn't so evil, and suggested that they just wait for the list to be sorted. The master and his assistant went out into the city and suggested she go shopping, for the whole city was now theirs. El cheerfully remarked that after the young master had purchased the city, it had been transformed, just like some kind of celebration. Unknown players on one of the streets of the city were arguing amongst themselves about the payment for the task, when suddenly they noticed the Lord. They were talking about how nice it was to be as rich as the Lord and buy out anything, including an entire city. Suddenly the bots descended with the whole crowd right on the young Lord, offering him their expensive equipment, stones, and other paraphernalia. The master regretfully thought about the fact that he once had a bonus to the friendliness of NPCs, but now because of his maximum authority, their enthusiasm was simply insane. The third brother suggested that the boss accept all the offers of those annoying bots, since every time they entered the city, they wouldn't be able to move around peacefully. The master quickly rushed inside to the main bot, and the third brother and Mao Yun firmly locked the building's gates while listening to the bot's cries of endless suggestions. The host had already brought the list of participating teams with spectators to the Lord's attention so that suspicious players could be identified. Chu Tiange began to scrutinize all the teams and found the Kingdom of Hades there, which was just in Luyang City. The little raccoon noted that all the participating teams were from around Chanan City, except for this one team from Luyang City, which was very strange. 
The young master quickly ordered the main bot to prepare him all the available information about the Kingdom of Hades Guild in three minutes. Meanwhile, somewhere on the border of Luyang City, a secret merchant was resting on one of the trees, snoring quietly. Suddenly, not far from that tree in the thick of the forest, there was a powerful explosion. From the unexpectedly loud sound, the mysterious merchant fell with a clatter from the tree to the ground. He got up and tried to come to his senses to realize who it was that was keeping him awake from early morning. The mystery merchant walked closer to the cliff to look at the clearing where the supposed explosion had occurred. He began to look closely at what was happening and noticed something already familiar to him. One of the players of the Kingdom of Hades was standing in the clearing, surrounded by golden rewards and doing some sort of energy exchange with the other players hovering in the air. The secret merchant looked at the guys he knew through his spyglass and realized that they had just passed the dungeon since they had such a good catch around them. While the merchant was watching everything that was going on, he noticed a guy running not far away from these guys, thinking it was a secret guide, and tried to understand where he was running to and why. The unknown kid ran past the mysterious players with their ritual and taunted them, telling them that they were too pathetic to catch up and destroy him. The hovering players, of course, heard the brave little guy and reacted. One of the players shouted to the others to immediately grab the kid while pointing a finger at him. Chu Tiange read the information provided to him about the Hades Kingdom, which said that the guild only had 200 players with the same strength in battle, which was not suspicious. The master also remembered that the minister had mentioned some sort of fang and asked what it was for, to which the chief replied that if he remembered correctly, the item was to be used for a special craft, and he'd better ask him about the details himself. The lead NPC quickly called the minister over to the young lord, saying that the lord of the city urgently needed some answers from him. The minister said that he had just checked everything, and this dragon fang is as much a secret class item as his totem, and its specific purpose is only known to the secret guide from Lujan. Master was confused by yet another mention of this city, and decided to go there immediately right today. Chu Tiange remembered that he had already reached the 30th level, and could improve his armor as he did so every 10 levels. The young master arrived at the forge and was greeted cheerfully by the armorer, asking how he could help, and the master inquired about the materials needed for a level 30 outfit. Immediately, Chu Tiange took out an attribute, clarifying that it was an immortal level booster that he had won in the guild competition. The armorer opened his mouth and was genuinely shocked to learn that it was a jade killin'. He kept repeating time and time again for the master to definitely think about his decision. After all, it was an incredible jade keelin, but the latter was adamant in his decision. Chu Tiange calmly said that he knew exactly what the attribute in his hands was and didn't see it as anything so special. The armorer told how his mentor had said that this attribute could maximize the compatibility between materials and was not bad at increasing the chances of success and the probability of obtaining additional items in case of luck, and that it was a very strong material that was hard to buy. He also added that usually only capital-level spellcasters are equipped with such jades and their entire set is level 60 and above, and the master asked what other materials he needed to improve. The armorer insisted that the master should think hard once more. After all, it could be sold in the capital city. Mao Yun couldn't stand it and intervened, saying that the lord himself had come to him for work and he was talking so much, and the armorer quickly ran to the main hall. The armorer asked for some time to take some memorable photos of the jade, as he would never get the chance to see it again in his life, but the master only said that as long as he was here, it would always be possible. Chu Tiange clarified the exact materials needed for the pumping, and learned that he would need one ninth order gemstone of seven colors each. The armorer specified that since it would be for a lord, it would not be of the thirtieth level, but of the fiftieth level and although the chance of success was only 1%, it would increase to 100 with jade. Chu Tiange decided to ask him what he had to say about the gemstone. The armorer explained that they are mined in the city's mine, but there are only first-order gemstones there, and second-order gemstones are obtained from 31st-order gemstones, and the master realized that he would have to work hard and long. A second later, he thought that he wouldn't be doing boring mining, because all the power of the city was now in his hands. 
Chu Tiange walked towards the building with the main control panel of Chanan City. The young lord walked and thought about the fact that he was the lord of this city and did not have to go down into the mine by himself at all. The master sat down on the majestic throne and the system announced that the main control panel of every industry in Chanan had been successfully activated. Mao Yun asked the boss what he now planned to do next. The master informed his buddy without a shred of doubt that he was going to change the tasks in the city and quickly clicked something on the control panel screens. The players of the town, upon seeing the change, reacted violently to such a quick change of assignments. One of the players shouted to the others that they were giving as much as ten gold coins for the ore mining mission. The players were pleasantly surprised that they were getting more coins for mining some ore than for monsters and rushed to fulfill the mission. They worked nonstop in the mine, extracting gems for the master. A huge crowd lined up at the young master's throne, shouting about the large amount of gems of different levels and the need to take them soon. The master was visibly pleased with the work done, for everything was going according to his plan. The master would descend the stairs and announce to everyone that they would now see how he would be improving his equipment. The weaponsmith was broadcasting live on the chamber ball, saying that they would now see the Ninth Order gems and the Jade Kill-In. The players watched the broadcast on the screen and heard the armorer thanking the Lord for giving him the opportunity to improve his equipment. The armorer moved to the main armor hall and said that he would stop talking nonsense and let everyone enjoy the process of upgrading their equipment. The main processor with the blue highlighted gear upgrades activated immediately after starting up. The material matching panel emitted sparkling discharges and lightning bolts. The equipment pumping process finally started, directing a stream of powerful light at the materials with the available armor. The equipment underwent the first changes in the fire glow light. The main processor released the last and most powerful stream of energy onto the equipment, which made the entire surrounding shudder. The third brother waited with bated breath for it to finish and quietly wondered if they had succeeded. When the pumping was over, a shroud of thick smoke dissipated around the main processor, and there was nothing on the platform. The little raccoon was horrified to notice that the equipment was missing from the platform. The armorer was also shocked and thought that the improvement had gone off for some reason. At that moment, the room was blinded by a bright light and everyone inside turned to look at its source. A young lord slowly approached the players and the armorer, already in an upgraded outfit, emitting powerful streams of light and sparkling lightning. In front of everyone present stood Chu Tiange in all his majestic beauty and incredible power emanating from every detail of the new armor. Behind the powerful master, the spirit of an ancient dragon in a blue glow appeared and roared loudly. The armorer shouted in shock that it had appeared, the hallmark of the Jade Killin. The system screen displayed information about the hallmark, detailing its strength and damage dealt with attack resistance. The young master was very satisfied and remarked that the Jade Kilin was truly amazing and worthy of its rarity. Chu Tiange was fully prepared and informed his jubilant buddies that it was now time for them to head to the mysterious Luyang City. Master told his friends that he had previously studied the map and Luyang City was the closest city to Chanan, but it was too far and too long to get there on foot. Chu Tiange decided that in order to avoid unplanned problems and conflicts, it would be better to use a disguise and activated the second account. In the same second, the rapid transformation and change of guise to another began. The master quickly opened the navigation map and began to look at possible routes and distances to the city they needed. He scrutinized all the routes and paths and was disappointed to find that it would take too long to get there, no matter which way he chose. Nubi said that nothing would help here anyway, and they just needed to activate the entrance to Chenan to open teleportation to Luyang, and added that without that, they would just have to stick to their path, and soon they would reach the right place. Mao Yun, remembering the dog's former abilities, suggested that they just increase Ursh's size and give it a try. The guy didn't have time to say anything as the pet itself pounced on him with a menacing bark, as if expressing its displeasure. Chu Tiange said that it wouldn't work, as this skill was only for combat and only lasted for 90 seconds, and besides, it would be too easy to use it. The young master added that relying on skills in such simple situations was not their style at all. Chu Tiange's team was walking along the cliff and heard the loud sounds of no one fighting nearby, assuming that someone was fighting bosses. 
the master immediately rushed forward, shouting to his buddies to rather catch up with him to check everything there. In the valley, a battle of a large armed army against a giant angry polar bear in armor was in full swing. The commander-in-chief ordered all his subordinates to hold formation, as the boss had entered a quiet phase, and they simply couldn't let him sneak away from them right now. He cheerfully shouted to everyone that this was an incredibly rare wild polar bear that could only be encountered in rare events, and if they destroyed it, they would definitely get rich. The army of soldiers, upon just hearing about the riches, immediately rushed towards the boss for future rewards. Many players simultaneously began to attack the polar bear using several types of powers and skills, thus making the already menacingly snarling beast very angry. Moments later, the same players were flying in different directions from the retaliatory powerful blows of the enraged wild bear. The huge monster came out of its silent phase mode and ruthlessly rushed straight at the players, viciously scattering and trampling them. The young lord's team moved closer to the cliff for a better view, and watched as the wild rare bear mightily smashed the army so eager to get their hands on the bounty, they decided that it was time to intervene. Chu Tiange quickly formed a new plan in his head and suggested that everyone not walk but ride to Lu Yang on horseback while looking at the polar bear, which shocked the little raccoon. The third brother happily supported the boss's plan, but El thought it was a bad idea, as they were unlikely to be able to just ride the formidable boss. The master cheerfully reminded his friends of his beast king skill, explaining that unlike the hunting king skill that archers had, his skill involved taming beasts in addition to hunting. The third brother began to recall this skill, where a high probability of perfectly capturing a monster appeared when it had low health and created a larger gap between strengths. The guy also remembered that this probability was very difficult to increase, and that was why few hunters used the Beast King skill. Chu Tiange calmly walked towards the beast, saying lastly that since no one had anything against it, he would be happy to go down to the wild bear for a talk. The rare polar bear with eyes red with anger went into bloodlust mode and destroyed everything and everyone in its path, powerfully waving its paws with sharp claws, letting the commander-in-chief know that their entire army would soon be defeated. At this moment, the young master ran headlong straight towards the enraged beast, and the player who spotted him was shocked with surprise. The master, with a sharp jump, pushed himself off the ground and flew straight towards the wild beast. The commander-in-chief, having recovered a bit, decided to save the unknown player from an unfortunate fate and began shouting loudly for him to get away from the ferocious monster as it would not spare anyone. Chu Tiange was just above the wild polar bear's head and prepared an engraved inscription disc to attack. The master took advantage of the moment of surprise and launched the disc, activating it and releasing a magical web. The already enraged polar bear began to shriek and lash out while Chu Tiange restrained it with the help of the engraved inscription disc. At one point, the beast could no longer bear to be bullied anymore and abruptly stood up on its hind legs and growled menacingly as it tried to free itself. Mao Yun and his third brother were already quickly running to the young master's aid, shouting that they had better destroy the monster, for it had too much health to be tamed. The commander-in-chief, barely standing on his feet, said that this beast had nine phases, one of which hit deadly, and it didn't even reposition what it meant to fight it in the bloodthirsty phase, not to mention that it was a 25th level boss. Chu Tiange stepped away from the polar bear for a while and slowly approached it, in parallel trying to calm it down somehow. The wild, embittered monster did not even think of calming down and growled menacingly, but the master did not give up and continued to talk about calmness and peace. Chu Tiange decided to touch the beast imprisoned in the magical web, but it immediately tried to bite him, viciously snapping its mouth. The master tried again and moved a little closer, reaching out to the wild polar bear, managing to overcome the beast's rage, and stroked it. The young master realized that he had defeated the bear and began stroking it affectionately, speaking words of comfort to it while the third brother once again admired his skills and abilities. Chu Tiange had already saddled the polar bear, having previously removed the cobwebs, and cheerfully turned to the surprised friends with a request to repeat to him everything they had said earlier. As due to the loud roar of the beast, he did not hear anything. Nubi excitedly said that her boss was really incredible, 
because she had never seen him play with such a skill before, or at least just practicing. The master suggested not to shine his power and skills and called everyone to join him, since it was getting dark and they needed to get this bear on the road, and judging by the way he was fighting now, the speed should be pretty fast. The commander-in-chief shouted resentfully at the master that he shouldn't be so reckless. After all, this upgraded boss was discovered by his guild, and they had gone through fire and water fighting to defeat for hundreds of years. But these guys are just running away with the boss. The rare wild polar bear got angry at the player's idle chatter and was about to do something. A moment later, rewards were falling from the sky directly onto the commander-in-chief. The rewards in the form of gold, gear, armor, and more were so plentiful that he was literally covered in them. Moving away from the place with the commander-in-chief, the master shouted that everything that fell from this boss was low-level, and if they needed it, let them just take everything they needed for themselves. The commander-in-chief could no longer utter a word, as a moment later the gold completely concealed him, and he was only able to gesture his agreement. The players of the Dragon Emperor's palace team made themselves comfortable on the Roaring Beast, and the master commanded them to quickly run towards Luyang City. All five players rushed at breakneck speed, riding the speedy beast. The third brother suddenly felt an attack of incoming nausea and dizziness. The young master only noticed his buddy swiftly going offline. The third brother, already in his room, emptied his stomach of its contents directly into the trash can. He could barely stay on his feet and turned sensitively pale, not expecting this polar bear to be so fast. A couple minutes later, the third brother returned to his buddies in the game on the back of the wild beast that was rushing at full speed. The master began to ask why he was interrupted, and the third brother replied that he had to pass out because he had thrown up. As they approached the town, the young master suggested that they should rush off, as they were quite close and riding a bear would look too flashy, and they didn't need any extra attention at all. The rare wild polar bear... Hearing the master's wishes, immediately slowed down, digging its paws into the ground. Chu Tiange was the first to jump off the huge, swift beast, and the rest of the team followed suit. The young master thanked the polar bear for its quick delivery and ordered it to head back. The players looked at the departing beast, and the master suggested that everyone go ahead to take a look at Luyang City. Chu Tiange suggested that the team split up and go to the nearest guild to search for clues, and when they found the Hades realm, they should immediately notify the others, and since he had increased NPC friendliness, he would go look for that secret quest guide. The young master was walking down the street thinking about how nice it was to be in a different guise when he wasn't being rushed by NPCs with numerous offers, and also so he wouldn't be recognized by other players. The master stopped somewhere in the middle of the street and noticed a man in front of him, asking him how he could find the secret guide for the quest. The stranger replied that he was outside the city on a mountain and he needed to be careful because the place was close to the portal and if he accidentally ran into monsters, he would be cornered. Chu Tiange moved forward and went into one of the available buildings on the mountain where the guide was supposed to be. The master went inside and saw the building destroyed from the inside with a complete mess, thinking that something had definitely happened here. Not far away from the mountain in the thicket of the forest, the young master heard some loud noises and screams. The master turned around at the strange sound and ambiguously thought that the situation was clearly getting worse. Chu Tiange, without a second thought, decided to change his appearance back to his previous appearance to be able to reliably defend himself and attack if necessary. He walked towards the source of the sound and was suddenly thrown aside by some violent explosion. The secret guide once again taunted the Hades Kingdom guild players by shouting out that they were too pathetic to catch him. The guide's words had already reached the chief of the entire player team, and he immediately decided to act. He sent a huge magic-grabbing hand after the secret NPC, being able to control it from a distance. The magical hand quickly reached the running secret guide and grabbed him tightly, clenching him into a fist. The NPC started screaming to be released immediately, as he was just a simple bot, and they would definitely be punished for this. The secret merchant had been watching the unfolding action in the clearing the entire time, and thought why they would have grabbed a regular secret quest guide. The chief of the guild held the secret bot in his hand, similar to the way he held the players from his team on energy bonds, and said that he could do whatever he wanted since he wasn't afraid of some measly punishments. 
He pulled out the cursed dragon fang from his sleeve and thanked the bot for giving him the opportunity to use it for its intended purpose. Since he had already been pumped up enough, he had no reason to let it live, and finally added that a quick death was too boring and he would check what else this attribute could do. The secret guide yelled loudly for help and tried to break free from his captivity, when suddenly he saw someone in the distance and the chief turned around to see a mysterious merchant peeking at them from the cliff. The terrified bot was screaming in terror to the merchant for help and rescue in the name of all that is holy. The main sent some of the players on energy links to look at the merchant, who was already quickly fleeing from his previous spot with the thoughts that if the guide decided to die, he shouldn't pull him along. The guild chief was already holding a sharp fang and magical light for the secret guide. The cursed fang turned into a sharp blade under the effect of magic, and the player said that he probably would have let him live and fall behind him, but he already knew too much. The main man abruptly launched the dagger straight at the power-hung secret bot for reprisal. The magical blade hit exactly in the heart area of the secret guide, flying through and making a huge hole there. The quest guide who died at the hands of the main quest guide fell to the cold ground with a rumble, emitting his last breath. The magic blade began to disappear instantly into the darkness after the job was done. The guild leader was disappointed once again, saying the testing of the weapon had failed once again. He quickly dialed someone on the system screen and shouted that this batch was once again not working, and everything disappeared just like last time, asking the unknown to do things normally and intelligently for once. A voice from the screen told him to watch his language and be careful what he said, as there was no rush and their people had already stolen the samples they needed, but just needed a little more time to do it all. The chief immediately perked up and was visibly interested in what he heard, asking how they were able to infiltrate Chu Tiange's assistant Chu Tiange's lab and steal the samples. The voice calmly replied that it was of no concern to him at all, as there was only one thing he was required to do, defeat the young master. The player sent to track down the secret merchant quickly found him and surrounded him, cornering him. The mysterious merchant began shouting for them not to dare approach him and do anything about it, because his elder brother Chu Tiange would not be happy about it at all. One of the players joked that if Chu Tiange was his older brother, then he was definitely his uncle. Suddenly a mighty golden pointed spear flew out of nowhere at breakneck speed. The weapon flew straight at the player who had pranked the merchant and stabbed into his body, destroying him. From behind the hill, the young lord approached everyone present, leisurely picking up his incomparable weapon. The majestic and powerful Chu Tiange stood beside the destroyed player and said with a smirk that an incredible coincidence had just happened and his uncle had just passed away. The young lord didn't waste another second and rushed lightning fast towards the still surprised other players of the kingdom of Hades. The players quickly regained their senses and began shouting to each other to scatter, powerfully pushing off in a leap. Chu Tiange also furiously pushed off the ground with his spear and flew towards the enemies. Chu Tiange flew above the player who had not had time to escape and had already swung his weapon at him. With one powerful strike, the young lord destroyed the enemy player, throwing him far back. To all that happened, a secret merchant quickly ran and shouted to the master to hurry and quickly find the other NRS that these players had swept over earlier to save him. The young master, following the mysteriously merchant's instruction, quickly ran forward with him to see what happened there. Chu Tiange came running and abruptly stopped exactly where the main guild master was standing and controlling the other players. The guild chief turned around at the noise and calmly said that he didn't expect to see him here. He next sort of gave a clarification as if to say that he didn't think he couldn't find him at all. It was just that he had come to him on his own, and that was his luck. The young lord was serious and menacingly asked who was in front of him and if he was involved in coming to the guild competition. The main man woke up for something up his sleeve and informed him that the master was even smarter than he would have thought since he had found him so quickly. He took out a familiar attribute in magical radiance from his sleeve and shouted that he was sorry, as it wouldn't be long before Chu Tianju would have to pay dearly for his unquenchable curiosity. The young master, of course, recognized what he had gotten, for it was the cursed dragon fang that had so suddenly disappeared from the arena's playing field. The chief tossed the ancient attribute into the air and it underwent some kind of change. A moment later, a powerful pillar of magical study flow emerged from the cursed fang directly at the main Hades realm, shaking everything around. 
All the players who were hovering in the clouds on the energy link began to shake and shudder in time with the main. The young lord looked at everything going on in amazement and quickly asked the mysterious merchant what was going on here. The mysterious merchant began to tell him that this was a secret puppeteer deformer class where any player could contract with the main and become his puppet, which in turn could give the boss a certain equipment bonus. He went on to say that there is no limit on the number of puppets, and the attribute allows the puppeteer to extract from the puppets and other benefits like experience and level, which although temporary, but significantly improves the effectiveness of the boss in battle. While the boss was getting the power he needed from his puppets, he listened intently to the merchant and said he had no idea. He knew it all, but he was absolutely right. The players who had once become puppets for the boss were already at the end of their strength and capabilities. In the same second, something like a large magic ball formed around the main one and abruptly exploded, shaking the air. In front of the master stood the main, after fully improving his effectiveness in battle. He stood surrounded by several small magic balls, and a world announcement announced that the Huaxia District's battle list had been updated, and the first place was occupied by Dark Sky with a battle strength of 40,000 points, and the second place was occupied by Chu Tiange with a gap of 10,000. At that same moment, the young master realized who was in front of him, the Dark Sky player. The master in charge, surrounded by the light of electrified lightning, replied that the master had guessed and was now most likely frightened. Chu Tiange seemed to become even more confident and said that he wasn't scared at all, but instead was very happy that after such a long time of waiting, a worthy opponent had finally appeared. The master added that before destroying him, he would ask about all the strange things that had happened recently and rushed with an attack towards the enemy. The master retaliated by sending his magic orbs filled with evil and magic at the young master. The magic orbs were not as simple as they appeared at first glance, and in flight they turned into huge evil hands. Several magical hands simultaneously flew towards the formidable Chu Tiange, who placed his spear in front of him. The huge hands clenched into fists at the chief's pranks, and the master began to attack them all with fiery blasts. Chu Tiange snidely informed the vile opponent that in addition to increasing his battle strength by more than 10,000 points, he had not only gotten this, but something else as well. The main man told him not to be so quick to jump to conclusions, because when he got rid of his equipment and sent him back to the first level, then he would enjoy watching him go crazy. One of the magical fists flew too close to the young lord and he immediately fought back, bravely defending himself with his spear. The master immediately comes up with a new plan of action and makes some movements with his hands, controlling the magical ones. The master only proceeded to retaliate with his magic fists, as they all turned around in a second and rushed back towards the master, putting Etit Chutiand in a stalemate. The magic hands all flew towards their master, and he performed some rituals related to further fighting. A second later, the magic hands were already looking at the master, charged with new strength and power in the light of ball lightning and sparks. The chief kingdom of Hades, like a madman, read some spell on the hands and directed them towards the young master, summoning a whiff of evil. In an instant, all the magic fists available on the field joined together and turned into one, depicting a powerful snake-like dragon that radiated evil and destruction and rushed at breakneck speed towards the master. The young master said with a chuckle that his opponent was very frustrating to him and summoned the hidden skill Taiku Dragon Breath, flooding everything around with fiery light and bright flashes with lightning. A majestic scene unfolded on the battlefield. The power and might of the two strongest era players met midway in a powerful explosion, intertwining and blinding everything and everyone around them. The power of both could not be retreated and only gained even more gravity. The chief kingdom of Hades was sure that the advantage was on his side and he would be victorious very soon, as the master could not compete with him. The young master, for his part, knew that he would not back down, no matter what it cost him. The insatiable head of the enemy guild had literally sucked all the life, not to mention energy, out of his puppets. But he didn't stop. With all his vile and bloodthirsty appearance, he was shouting to Chu Tianju that he was about to know true strength and feel despair. Through the already channeled magical black energy sweat, more new hands formed towards the master. The head of the enemy guild increases the available power, 
and will apply magic amplification. The young master seems to no longer be able to contain such a rush of black magic knocking him down for a moment, and can barely stay on his feet, struggling to slow down. Chu Tianzhu has to powerfully defend himself and hold his defenses against the dark forces and the whiff of evil breaking through from it in the form of the snake-like dragon. The young master gathers his wits and new strength and cold-bloodedly decides to deal with this smug type as soon as possible. The master shouts loudly through the torrent of endless attacks to the chapter that it is time to show true might. On the battlefield, everything shakes and trembles from the majestic battle, throwing chunks of earth and rocks in different directions. The dragon emperor palace lord finally summons the only holy level, the supreme gift of heaven and the reflective fists of the second level heavens, souls for the cooling deities. The master notices how the fiery blazing heavens are at the mercy of fire and lightning and is surprised to call it a form of celestial space. Thinking that the master is too weak to have such an ability, he decides that this is just one of his methods of intimidation and soporific vigilance to weaken his magical flow. Suddenly, from the fiery heavens, surrounded by thunderous lightning, a violent, fiery stream of light descends sharply onto the ground. The master boldly takes on all the incoming energy to increase his strength and gain the ability. An explanation of strength appeared on the system screen as a super-powerful enhancement that strengthens both the team and one player individually, increasing damage resistance and critical hit damage, as well as lowering all of the opponent's attributes. The majestic Chu Tiange from the Maelstrom of Fire was being infused with energy and was about to make his next strike. The master menacingly. Extending his spear arm forward aims at the enemy with a gigantic flaming stream of power that dazzles with its power. The energy of good meets the energy of evil and immediately explodes with the preponderance on the first side. The main kingdom of Hades does not understand how this happened and refuses to believe in the superiority of the master. He continues to suck the life force out of the puppets, turning them into mummies and says that his combat potential is higher than his and he will not be defeated, because he has trained long and hard. The young lord only smiles at this statement, already having a new plan in his head, and calls his faithful assistant to battle. At the same moment, a menacingly barking dog appears on the battlefield from the system, ready to attack. At his master's command, Ursha quickly runs towards the head of the enemy guild, showing him with all his appearance that he is doomed. The head of the kingdom of Hades becomes furious, shouting unflattering remarks and threats at the master. Ursha immediately rushes at the master and sinks her sharp teeth into his arm. With eyes red with anger, the dog does not back down and mimics holding his hand in his teeth, growling menacingly and listening to the shouts and cries of his enemy. After a while, Chutiag loudly orders Ursh to immediately move as far away as possible. The clever dog is carried at full speed towards his brave and powerful master. Chu Tianga, meanwhile, sends Taiku's dragon breath towards his opponent, and the embittered monsters are carried at breakneck speed towards the main to fulfill their revenge. Another massive nuclear explosion occurs, shaking the ground and shattering rocks nearby. The head of the enemy guild cannot resist such tremendous force and jumps back sharply, flying far backwards. He is thrown back so powerfully that he is immediately imprinted into the nearest rock with an imprint in it and shatters the rocks into small pieces. All of his puppets, after such a powerful attack, break the energy connection with the puppeteer and unconsciously, like empty sacks, fly to the ground. The mysterious merchant never ceases to marvel at the persistence and strength of the young master, marveling and being impressed by him. He immediately goes closer to the epicenter of events, where the master stands at the opponent sealed in the rock. The game's system screen displays a bar with Dark Sky's health at only 3%. Chu Tiange puts the tip of his spear to the temple of the barely living head and menacingly asks him to tell them what they are accomplishing and where they are taking all the captured NPC players. The all-wounded and half-alive player, not even having the strength or ability to stand up, says he's not done yet and delivers another round of insults. He quickly pulls out something from his sleeve that looks very similar to a teleport scroll but embraced by flaming light and lightning. Chu Tiange has no time to say or do anything and simply watches as Dark Sky disappears from the battlefield, leaving behind a trail of fire. The master did not expect Dark Sky to want to leave so easily at all, and silently stared at the place where the enemy had disappeared from. 
The young master was still standing in bewilderment trying to figure out how it was that the opponent decided to escape right during the battle and with what help. The merchant began to tell him that he had used the thunder talisman to self-destruct, which was the fastest way out of the battle, and if not enough blood was collected, it could be used to resurrect at a place of his choosing, and it also did so without losing experience points. Chu Tiange cheerfully said that fighting was just bragging, but escaping was the real trick of an experienced player, and laughed loudly. Meanwhile, on the battlefield, the bodies of the destroyed players from the Kingdom of Hades Guild began to disappear one by one. The young lord asks the merchant to wait for a while. He and the merchant decided to walk the field in search of at least one more player who had not disappeared. On their way, they just happened to come across one guy who was literally begging for help and rescue from all of them by the incredible and divine Chu Tiange. The master asked him to stand up and calmly tell him everything, and he began to say that for a very long time now, he and others had been suffering, with hundreds of players locked inside. The worried and scared guy added that they are all forced to be puppets for the boss and have to pump for 18 hours every day, which is very exhausting. He had already started to disappear like the other players, and only managed to pray to God Chu Tiange again for the last time. The players' last words to the young lord were for help and their salvation. After listening to all of this, Chu Tiange came to the conclusion that they were forced to reconnect not of their own free will. Somewhere on the outskirts of the city stood a tall, somewhat old and run down, but still occupied by someone. Some other man walked into one of the rooms behind bars, looking something like a prison cell with only a bed and a gaming chair with a person in it. The burly man approached the player in the chair, and afterward, with a sharp movement of his hand, pulled the power cord. He grabbed the poor guy out of the chair and threw him to the floor, kicking him hard on the body and yelling that he thought too much of himself for daring to leave the network without permission. While he was beating him, some other man in a suit came into the cell and told the guy to stop, as they would need this poor guy. The man in the suit approached the poor guy and threateningly asked him how he dared to disobey orders and go off the net, unless, of course, he was going to do something to help Chu Tianju. The man menacingly ordered the bouncer to throw the guy into the cage, and he obediently nodded. In one of the offices of the building, there was apparently the boss and his butler standing in one of the rooms, who expressed his opinion as he felt that he had done wrong to Chu Tianju this time. And according to the spiritual master's opinion, his operation was not ready yet, and the time was not right. The boss got angry at such a statement and started shouting at the butler that he was just an ordinary servant and didn't dare to tell him what to do and say such things. Besides, he was tired of hearing that it wasn't the right time yet. The boss commanded the butler to tell everyone to get ready because tomorrow they would have a deadly training session and asked him to get all the equipment from the warehouse while he went to Chu Tianju, and the servant obediently nodded. The businessman went into the room with the head office to see how things were going. One of his subordinates informed the boss that they had withstood the cyber attack and asked if they should attack his system in response. The boss replied that he would think of something and let them continue to make sure that he didn't sniff out anything. Chu Tiange walked through the valley and thought about what had happened for a long time, guessing that something was clearly wrong here. The master decided to ask the secret merchant what he was doing there in the end, unless he was waiting for him to sell something worthwhile, or still wanted to meet those guys, to which the merchant replied that it was a long story, thanking him for his rescue. The arcane merchant clarified that what he was selling was not just some stuff. Chu Tiange also asked the merchant if he was familiar with Dark Sky, to which he heard that they were not familiar and had only met. At this moment, Ursha suddenly ran up to the mystery merchant and began to rub his leg affectionately. The mystery merchant immediately recognized the dog that had hatched from the creature's egg and said that although he had grown up, he had still become a divine beast. After all, it was not for nothing that he had risked his life to clone him. Chu Tiange opened his mouth in astonishment as he did not even suspect that Ursh had been cloned and asked the merchant who he really was. The mysterious merchant, taking a serious look, said that he would tell him everything as it was, since he had asked. A pillar of fiery glow descended on the mysterious merchant, blinding the master. The mystery merchant confessed that he was actually a treasure hunter. The master immediately gave the merchant a friendly kick in the ass for introducing himself so pathetically and blinding him for a while. 
The merchant angrily shouted that he was also a famous character and had the right to use special effects, and even though the master was handsome, he still had no right to belittle him. Chu Tiange only smiled cheerfully and tried to calm the merchant down by asking him what he was doing in general. The merchant began to say that the equipment he was selling was obtained at the risk of his life, as he had stolen them from the most difficult dungeons, especially the Ursh Egg, and let him not think that it was that simple. Chu Tianju now understood how he knew so much about the equipment and asked again what his relationship with Dark Sky was. The merchant also reminded the master that when he robbed him in the Song Country, he had nothing left and had to create copies, and just at that moment he came across Dark Sky with the ability of a puppeteer. The young lord clarified if he went with him to see his ability. The merchant nodded and asked not to misunderstand him as there was nothing special about accompanying players. After all, it was a reasonable waste of resources. He summarized that anyway. This guy is obsessed with making spears and looting dungeons, but what happened between him and that unfortunate NPC he doesn't know about? At this time, his buddies were already rushing towards the young master at full speed. The third brother apologized for being late and asked what happened here while they were gone. The master asked the secret merchant to tell them everything while he and the little raccoon went out for some business from the game to see the butler. Chu Tiange asked his uncle if he was able to find the right IP address, and he replied that their past attack had forced those to strengthen their defenses again, and they were also fighting in 48 places at the same time, so it was impossible to say with accuracy where they were yet. The butler disappointedly said that it was his fault for being too careless, and so the enemy had prepared better and he had missed the moment. The young gentleman asked his uncle not to blame himself as it was his own fault because he could have guessed it, and the dark sky itself is not as easy as it seems. The little raccoon came into the room and anxiously asked what really happened in the forest and what this dark sky had done. The master said that there was a theory, and if the words of that player were to be believed, then dark sky had something to do with connecting and keeping a hundred players. The girl was shocked by what she heard, and after coming to her senses a bit, she suggested that she urgently report everything to the police. Chu Tiange was in agreement, but said that there was no hurry, as they would definitely be ready for it, and one could not lose someone, so they should find a way to provoke him in the game to come in, and then fight as a distraction to gain enough time. He went on to say that at the same time, Uncle Yin Li would figure out his IP and call the police, though it would be worth it to at least meet him first. The butler dutifully accepted the errand and said that he would prepare everything in the best way. The little raccoon decided to ask the young master if anything had happened to him in the game. After a bit of silence, she added that the ranking table had been updated and Dark Sky was 10,000 points ahead of him. Chu Tiangi only cheerfully asked Ellie not to mention it as his power was great, but he was worthless in battle, and it was proven by the fact that Ursha was easily able to fell him, and if it wasn't for his thunder talisman, he would have easily done him in. The master and his assistant, who had asked what they were going to do now, were heading towards the game pod, and he said that they would start by getting him back to the top of the table, which would take quite some time. The buddies were glad to have the young master and L back in the game. The master asked if the merchant had told them everything and if they were up to speed. Newbie picked up the conversation and said that they had already learned about this brazen type, how he was kidnapping players and destroying NPCs. Chu Tiange nodded approvingly and said that he had already come up with a plan of further action. He also asked if they had found the location of the Hades Kingdom Guild, to which the third brother replied after opening the system screen that they were in a valley near Luyang City, and the area was easy to defend. The third brother also said that there were over a hundred players there right now, but they were all low level. After looking through all the available information to the end, they all went to the guild management office of Luyang City. The master tried to open teleport portals to the cities, but it didn't work. He said that when they were able to open them, all the guild members would be able to travel here from the same Shannon office, after which they would send everyone directly to the Hades realm. The third brother clarified if they would attack them, and the master nodded affirmatively, clarifying that it would not be an easy attack. The young master said that Dark Sky was the head of the guilds of the Hades Kingdom and should be broadcasting live during the attack on them, and asked that they spread the word through all possible channels that he had defeated him. 
Mao Yun decided to inquire that when they captured the guild and the warehouse, how would their equipment be shared? The young lord clarified that whoever captured the warehouse first would get a portion of the riches. Mao Yun heard everything he wanted to hear, happily running to tell everyone about it. The secret merchant doubted this plan and said that Dark Sky was unlikely to fall for it. The master said that he was wrong because the puppets were under his control and were his power. And since he had already spent a lot of resources and needed time to recover from the so-called resources, that is, the people in the warehouse, he had to react. The mysterious merchant pondered. After all, Dark Sky is capable of controlling a hundred players at the same time. He clarified that if the warehouse would be completely devoid of its power after it was captured, then why publish anything? The master clarified that he had realized from their fight that he was too arrogant, and it would be good to use radical methods, but there was a but. The young master changed the subject, calling the merchant with him to do business. The mysterious merchant, clutching his backpack tightly with fright, inquired about the business in question and learned that they needed to find a way to prevent him from escaping. The master said cryptically that since he was so educated, he should know how to nullify the effects of the storm talisman. The merchant began to crumple and mumble, and the young master beckoned him to follow him. Lastly, Chu Tiange asked the merchant if he had anything of interest to him. The merchant fell to the floor in grief, while the master looked at the extraordinary crystal and the undiscovered diamond and said that he was really worthy of his title for such unique things, and the merchant tried to explain that he wanted to sell this diamond. At this time, just then, the third brother from the mission teleported into the guild. He quickly ran to the boss and shouted that they had surrounded the kingdom of Hades, and their broadcast of the attack was already being watched by over a million viewers. The third brother added that their chairman had offered them a non-aggression deal, and the master immediately realized that those were stalling and let them start and take over the warehouse. Lastly, the master gave his buddy a top-level great sword just in case. The sword was followed by a bunch more expensive equipment, and the third brother, being in a pleasant shock, did not know where to put everything. He inquired if his boss needed anything and noticed a distressed merchant muttering something about ruin. Chu Tiange cheerfully told his friend to take everything, after all. Now with the secret merchant, they wouldn't be left without equipment, especially since he had only given a couple hundred gold coins for all of it. The master quickly went back to their plan and reiterated that the first priority was to capture the warehouse. The third brother thanked the boss for the clarification and said that he thought he had driven the merchant to tears, but he had just cleared his shelves of goods. The master had some more fun banter with the merchant, and the third brother was heading back, telling the boss to expect good news. After taking all the equipment given to him, he teleported back to Lu Yang to his buddies. Chu Tiange approached the merchant again saying that since they were friends, let him come to the Dragon Emperor's palace when something more interesting came up. He also added that business came first, then the plan to prevent Dark Sky's escape, and as long as the merchant helped him, he was willing to pay whatever he wanted. The mysterious merchant agreed and told him not to retract his words, as he would be asking for a lot of money. Lastly, he invited the young master to take care of business and deal with Lu Yang's copies. Meanwhile, a fierce battle against the Guardian Beast began at the Hades Kingdom Guild Gate. Little Raccoon and Third Brother powerfully attacked the three-headed monster in close combat. The monster was attacked from all sides, where crushing and destroying blows came down one after another until they completely overpowered the beast with a fiery explosion with a bright flash. The Third Brother stood victoriously on the toppled three-headed monster and shouted to the guild that they had a completely useless Guardian Beast and they could open the gate on their own to stay alive or be destroyed, but the gate would still be opened. A huge armed army stood in front of the pavilions of the Kingdom of Hades, while two players on the roof of the building were deciding whether to summon the boss or if they could handle it alone. The conversationalist shouted to the player that there was nothing they couldn't handle and let him put those bad thoughts aside. He loudly ordered everyone to stay where they were as their boss doesn't believe their base can't handle this attack. The player had no sooner finished speaking than he heard a rumble and turned around, looking directly at the blown-up part of the building and the HQ people flying off the roof. The players of the Dragon Emperor's Palace were powerfully attacking the Hades Kingdom Pavilion with all possible ways and techniques, having already destroyed a decent portion of it.
a broadcast of the attack was launched across the country, which could be watched right from the street. One player recognized the Hades Kingdom Guild and said that they had bombed their headquarters last week, while a second player asked why Dark Sky himself wouldn't show up for the battle, unless, of course, he was afraid of Chu Tiange's incredible power. More and more spectators piled up at the live main screens, shouting out the name of the Lord of Channon City. The enemy guild's pavilion shattered into small pieces from the attacking players blasting everything in their path. The worried player still insisted that his stubborn interlocutor should call their boss immediately, because they wouldn't stand up to such a powerful army with their level 15. The merchant and the master were approaching a valley where all the monsters were level 40, and the merchant warned that they were all very strong, and if he went in there he would die, even if he was the greatest warrior, anything could happen. The merchant took out something that looked like a compass to determine the way ahead. He took out a book and began to carefully read the incantation. Looking for a hundred dragons, looking at the mountains, you will come across trials. If the door has a thousand locks, you will find a princess inside. The compass immediately activated and the hand on the dial began to change values rapidly, stopping at one of them. The travelers heard over the cliffs in the thick of the forest the loud cawing of black crows. The young gentleman asked if the merchant was sure of his determination, and the merchant replied that the thing was not only for the sake of bringing good luck. The merchant, assuming the most serious look possible, said that the craftsman could doubt any NPS but not him. The young master liked this answer and showing a gesture of approval, beckoned the merchant on his way. The world announcement announced that player Chu Tiange had entered the dark forest of level 40 with someone, and the countdown would be over in 20 minutes. The mysterious merchant was angry at the system since it failed to announce him properly. Suddenly, someone's voice announced that if the sound of the voice rises above 90 decibels, the players would be immediately imprisoned in a bone trap. A little ahead of the players in front of them, the skeleton bones began to crunch and come together. The master quickly grabbed the mysterious merchant and told him to hide behind him. Several skeletons fully reunited and went on the attack with weapons against the master. While the merchant was screaming in fear, the master asked him to shut up and just hide as far away as possible, saying that he would deal with them now. The army of walking dead rushed to attack and Chu Tiange and Ursh advanced to meet them. There was a clash of worlds, and the young lord attacked in his usual fashion with a fiery zigzag, shattering the skeletons into pieces. Bouncing over the entire army of the walking dead, the master swung his spear for another crushing blow. Another batch of powerful blows flew at the skeletons, accompanied this time by an explosion destroying the entire army at once. Chu Tiange exhaled loudly after realizing that these improved copies were not that difficult to deal with. The young master asked the merchant not to set off any more traps since they already had little time to search for priority materials, and the merchant agreed. Not even two meters away, the mysterious merchant accidentally steps on a small spider, thus destroying it. A world announcement announced that whoever destroys the spider will automatically be sent to the battlefield, and the corresponding activation symbol lights up beneath the master with the merchant. Both partners were tightly braided in the same second by a sticky but very strong web that appeared from the depths of the earth. While they were unsuccessfully trying to escape the trap, giant bloodthirsty spiders were already closing in on them. The monsters surrounded the master and the merchant from all sides, viciously chanting that they would just eat them and they wouldn't even feel a thing. One of his subordinates walked in abruptly and without knocking to the boss hosting the meal anxiously reporting that things were very bad and their pavilion was being attacked by the Dragon Emperor's palace. The boss stopped chewing and froze in surprise for a moment, not believing his ears. The frightened subordinate also said that the situation was out of control and they needed his help urgently. The boss threw the glass to the floor in a rage, shattering it to pieces, and yelled that no one dared to tell him what to do if he didn't want to go to the other side of the world. The guy reported in horror that the enemy guild had sent about 200 fighters at once, and their attack was so strong that the pavilion was already barely holding on, and the army intended to take over their warehouse. The boss threateningly ordered to immediately release all the remaining players and move all the weapons to the warehouse, and he would deal with Chu Tiange himself. The subordinate shouted in panic that he couldn't take such a risk because his puppeteer technique was at an intermediate stage, and it would be better to move all the materials from the warehouse and then do something about it. 
The boss, not thinking long, immediately slapped the insolent servant for his long tongue. He shouted that if Chu Tiange was breathing down his back, he wouldn't wait for something and added that since he couldn't get rid of him last time, he would definitely be finished this time. The boss walked away from the dumbfounded servant, saying that he didn't care who this Chu Tiange was, god or lord, but he would finish him off. Meanwhile, Chu Tiange walked surrounded by spiders, with Ursh dragging a secret merchant in a cocoon, saying that the latter had activated seven traps in eight minutes, and he would never believe it was pure chance. The master commanded his pet to release the merchant from the cocoon. Ursha immediately rushed to chew open the dense cocoon, freeing the secret merchant from there. When the dog was done with the cocoon, the merchant would get up and slowly come to his senses, saying that he was the best of the best, and it was just that some details were ignored, but otherwise he could be trusted. Chu Tiange approached the diverging paths on both sides of the forest and asked where they should go now, as they had no margin for error due to the small amount of time. The mysterious merchant convinced the master not to worry and to trust him, as he was definitely better than his dog. The mystery smith again took out his compass with the spell book and began to say, Looking for a hundred dragons, looking at the mountains, you will come across trials. If the door has a thousand locks, inside you will find a princess. The compass blinked again, and the hand quickly raced across the dial, determining the right value. Finally, the compass stopped, and the merchant indicated which direction they should go next in search of the treasure. Chu Tiange couldn't stand it, and snatched the book from the merchant, asking what it even was. The master was surprised and displeased as the book turned out to be a cheap copy, costing only five bronze coins. The young master stepped forward a bit and said that after all they had been through here, he could no longer trust him. The mysterious merchant abruptly jumped out in front of the master, blocking his path, and informed him that this time, everything would be fine. Chu Tiange took a deep breath and nodded approvingly, warning that this was the last time. The master and the merchant moved forward and approached yet another pile of skeleton bones. They came across a simply gigantic dead boss in armor with a spear, which the young master observed was currently resting. Chu Tiange did not hesitate to decide that this was a great opportunity to destroy it and rushed to attack without listening to the merchant about it being a bad idea. The young lord runs at the sleeping dead man in a rage and in parallel summons the power and superiority of the dragon. At the same moment, a powerful golden dragon appears and the master feels a surge of extra energy and power. The giant boss reacts quickly to the loud noise and in anger, he stands up in a fighting stance for a counterattack. The monster prepares to attack and moves towards the attacking Chu Tiange. The young master at the same second summons Taiku's hidden dragon breath skill as well in the light of dazzling flashes. The master delivers a powerful blow with his spear at the dead man, which spreads a bright explosion through the dark forest and throws the monster backwards. The walking dead man flies straight into the stone cliff behind him and shatters it into several pieces. The giant boss gets up pretty quickly and goes on the counterattack, trying to devour the young master. The master doesn't back down and delivers another powerful blow to the monster's armor, leaving a trail of fire. He summons the power of the dragon's pursuit with fury and flies straight into the dead man at breakneck speed. There is a new series of crushing blows in the light of the lightning balls and the monster is about to respond. The dead man grips his spear tighter and rushes at the majestic Chu Tiange with a menacing roar. At the same time, the master summons one last crushing and annihilating dragon dissection strike. He easily swings the mighty spear straight at the giant boss's head. With a single strike, the master swings the spear along the entire body, starting from the head, and with a fiery attack splits the dead man in half. The giant boss cannot withstand such power and strength and explodes with a wild roar at the same second, leaving behind only a pile of bones. The world announcement congratulated player Chu Tianj for passing the dark forest for the first time in 18 minutes, which once again surprised the secret merchant. The merchant quickly ran up to the master and shouted, hurry up to see the rewards, which must be very valuable. The merchant ran ahead of the young master to the rewards and began shouting loudly that there were only gems and equipment. For some time, he was still looking at all the rewards and suddenly froze at one interesting thing that caught his eye amongst everything. The merchant picks up a familiar round attribute with magical effects from the pile and tells the master that he has found what he needs. The butler, following the young master's instructions, 
called a police patrol to the house and explained to them the whole situation with the players. While he was telling them everything in detail, his cell phone rang from his pocket. The phone kept ringing insistently, and Yin Li, apologizing to the police officers, stepped aside to talk. The butler quickly took out the phone and was amazed to see that it wasn't a call at all, but some kind of virus. The message from the burglars said that they were very sorry that they had to be contacted in this way, but there was no other way out, and things were quite bad. Butler dialed the number and asked if he was one of the Dark Sky hackers, and the person on the other end of the line agreed, saying that he would be brief as there wasn't much time left. The stranger began to say that although things were bad because he knew about their connections in the police force and the fact that they had started the operation, but he would like to suggest some peace talks to start with. Yin Li sternly replied that they had contacted the wrong person for that. The interlocutor began to explain that he had misunderstood him, and this time he really wanted to help. The master told the merchant that this time he had not let him down after all and was able to find the right equipment to which the merchant replied that the master should not think that all previous goods had come so easily to him, for he was really strong. The merchant reminded him of their previous agreement that he was free to ask for as much as he wished. The young master cheerfully agreed and said that he always kept his word. And besides, he wanted to remain friends with him because he really respected him deeply. The merchant, without saying too much, said only the sum of twenty million. He also added that he would actually get a lot more for his Ursh at the auction in the capital than he sold it for because of the two million limit. The master asked about the twenty million and asked if he wanted anything else. The merchant only nodded negatively and Chu Teague wondered where NPCs could spend so much money. The merchant replied that he couldn't speak for everyone, but personally, it was for food and a place to sleep. The secret merchant at some point couldn't help himself and cried bitterly, saying only that he needed them very badly. Chu Tiange did not question further as he realized that he had pressed on a sore point. In that very second, without further ado, the master in front of the merchant spilled out full bags of gold. The merchant had already taken the coins and was moving away when the master said one last time that he seemed to be an NPC with a sad story, and since it was so important, he wouldn't question him further and said goodbye. At the same moment, Chu Tiange heard an alert sound from the system and rather opened the screen. The butler reported the plan with the police with one caveat, and the young master realized that he shouldn't immediately destroy Dark Sky, but rather stall for a bit, to which his uncle reported the lives of 300 people in his hands. Having finished his correspondence with his uncle, the master noticed at his feet what appeared to be a roll of paper. He reached to pick it up and decided that it was a secret merchant who had dropped it as he was leaving in a hurry. Chu Tianz quickly unfolded the roll and saw on it a picture of a merchant with some unknown girl, but most likely very close to the merchant. A black armored van was dashing through the city along a certain route. Inside the van was a squad of armed special forces in full uniform. The butler's tablet received a notification with an unread message, and he pressed the open button. The message contained the coordinates of the Dark Sky base camp in the west of the city, in a poorly developed part, whose residential area had been bought by Zhao Group six months ago. But due to payment problems, the area had been closed for some reason. Butler stared at the screen in surprise, unable to believe his eyes. Zhao Group again. Yin Li immediately remembered that he already had a bad feeling about this, but he wasn't sure. Two some guys were meeting on the grounds of a half-destroyed closed building. A squad of armed special forces under the commander's orders had already surrounded the building in question. Not far from the grounds of the closed building in the park, a black police van was parked in hiding. The police captain, watching the game broadcast with the butler, asked him if Dark Sky had appeared, to which Yin Li said that it would take some time to enter the game, but Chu Tiange would keep him there. The captain warned the butler when Chu Tiange and Dark Sky clashed, they would surround the house, but it would be quite difficult for the young master to hold out. On the battlefield at the enemy guild's gate, the people of the Hades realm began to retaliate with magic shots. Mao Yun ran to his buddies to let them know how bad it was, because some of the squad was injured by some explosion and disappeared. Dark Sky finally appeared at the pavilion's half-destroyed gate, who could be recognized from afar by the energy bond players hovering in the air. The butler immediately informed the surprised police captain that the Dark Sky player had appeared. 
There was a massive explosion on the field, sending players flying in different directions. Dark Sky stood on the roof of the main tower and controlled the puppets, blasting everyone on the field with magic shots. Nubi, healing all the players caught, shouted to all the mages to rather unite and create a shield. The players heard the healer's order and immediately rushed to fulfill it, creating protective shields. The mages stood to the last, holding their shields, but the Dark Sky's attack was much stronger. They were scattered in different directions in the light of bright flashes from a series of powerful explosions. Mao Yun shouted to all the first-line players to hurry up and run towards him, as the mages were already creating a teleporter for everyone to leave the battlefield faster. Dark Sky, watching everything that was happening, jumped from the tower to the ground with a sharp jolt. The guild leader of the Hades Kingdom Guild was beside the attacking players and shouted, How dare they show up here and run away so shamelessly without worrying for their lives? The spectators looked at Dark Sky and were amazed at his appearance and specialization, and concluded that no one had ever seen him before and he would definitely defeat the Dragon Emperor Palace. One of the players looked for Chu Tiange and his buddies among everyone, and asked if Dark Sky hadn't been destroyed back in the last battle. The little raccoon reported that she needed some time to create such a large teleport, and asked her to hold out her buddies for as long as they still could. Dark Sky grinned and wondered why they were making such a fuss and commotion without his favorite Chu Tiange, or was he scared of him? Just at this moment, a rare polar bear was being rushed onto the battlefield by a young master on horseback. The polar bear did not give up its pace and crashed into the Dark Sky at full speed, delivering a powerful strike. The head of the enemy guild flew backwards from the surprise and powerful blow. Just like the previous battle, he was once again slammed into the wall, shattering it and leaving a deep mark in it. Dark Sky stood up and quickly came to his senses, menacingly asking what that was now. The mighty Chu Tiange stood in front of him and asked why he was looking for him. After all, he had to speed up because of this and he couldn't even stop his beast in time, and that was the only reason why he crashed into him. Dark Sky advised the master to be less cocky because he was about to take everything he had and show him what true strength was. Chu Tiange reminded him that he had already heard that last time, but he ended up losing and also escaped, and all the players standing nearby laughed loudly. Dark Sky smirked and said that this time it would be different, and dozens of players were already running behind him. The players approached the head of the Hades Kingdom and waited for further action. Dark Sky directed his energy wires to connect to all the players at once at the same time. With his manipulations, the energizing wire successfully connected and activated. A moment later, all of these players fly into the air, losing control of their bodies and minds. Dark Sky takes out a player's card and informs him that he won't need it anymore because once he wins, he will become the strongest player in the Tang Dynasty. Finishing his bombastic speech, he tears the card in half with a deft movement of his hand. The world announcement announces that the Huaxia District's player list has been updated and in first place is Dark Place with a total power of 60,000 points and in second place is Chu Tiange with 30. The third brother is puzzled as he tries to figure out how come their enemy has twice as many points. The other players were also outraged, allowing thoughts that it might be cheating, but in any case, fighting him would be quite dangerous and risking the life of even the most majestic god Chu Tiange. The young lord orders the little raccoon to take everyone away quickly through the teleporter, but she refuses and wants to stay here with him. Chu Tiange tells the girl in a friendly manner that he really appreciates her care and kindness, but he'll be perfectly fine handling all of this himself. El is still wary of everything, and the master shows her a message from the butler on the screen, where he asks her not to worry about anything and let him handle everything on his own. The little raccoon starts to realize that they have some sort of plan and just asks him to be careful. The helper goes to the teleporter field with her friends and the rest of the players and moves home. Dark Sky notices the teleportation and summons a huge magical hand for the players, shouting that no one can escape him that easily. Chu Tiange immediately blocks his friends by powerfully pushing off and flying towards the enemy player, and yells that his opponent is only him. On the move, the young lord summoned a divine staff and was about to use the lightning strike power on the opponent. Dark Sky met the strike in time, crossing his magical arms over his head as a defense. A moment later, a master with the power of fire flies towards Dark Sky with magical fists. 
their powerful forces meet and repel each other without doing any significant damage to either player. After a short period of time, Dark Sky seems to gain the upper hand and delivers a brutal attack to the master, hoping for a quick victory. At the same second, Chu Tiange's mighty spear flies out through a shroud of thick smoke. Dark Sky catches the weapon right in front of his eyes at the very last moment. Dark Sky becomes enraged and, gathering all of his strength, powerfully strikes the young master with his magic fist, thus throwing him back sharply. The master, after flying a few meters and stalling, digging his feet into the ground, stops to catch his breath. Dark Sky arrogantly shouts to the master that if he naively thinks that he can defeat him with all this purchased equipment, he is very much mistaken. Chu Tiange quickly contacts Uncle Yin Li through the system and informs him that he can begin the task. The master replies to the enemy head that he dare not speak of gold in such a manner, and he will have to prove otherwise today for the enemy to see the power of his rich ancient equipment. About an hour ago, when the secret merchant found a familiar round attribute in the dark forest, the master approached him with interest. Chu Tianga asked the mysterious merchant with obvious surprise what it was that he had found. The screen displayed information about the attribute he had found, which was the hidden material Immortal Jade Reincarnation, and increased the master's strength and skills, as well as when engaged in battle, blocking any attributes or items of the opponent with the ability to be used ten times. Chu Tiange was incredibly happy about such a find and did not skimp on kind compliments to the secret merchant, taking back all his negative remarks towards him and saying that he would not have said a word if he had warned him. But the merchant only modestly replied that he was a professional in his field. The master took out the attribute Rebirth Immortal Jade from his armor in front of the enemy. Dark Sky shouted in rage that he didn't care about his equipment or attributes, so he could easily deal with him without them. At the same moment after his words, he began to vigorously siphon energy from the players through energy links, thus becoming stronger. After sucking enough energy for further attack, Dark Sky activates a sinister magic ball overflowing with hatred and bloodlust. The maddened enemy guild player smugly looks at the master and laughs loudly in his face. On the system screen, information immediately appears with a bar of Dark Sky's attack power, which instantly fills up from minimum to full in an instant. Chu Tiange, smiling contentedly and holding the attribute, asks his opponent why he thought his antics could help defeat him, and added that he had spent as much as 20 million on everything and would now happily try out the purchases in action. The master activates the attribute and it flies upwards, opening a hidden portal of rebirth. A real rebirth of immortal jade takes place in front of the players, forming a huge spiral in the sky. The dark sky looks on in bewilderment at everything that is happening and does not yet know what the young lord in the portal has in store for him. The portal of rebirth begins to work like a whirlpool and suck the players inside of it, whose energy connection with the puppeteer is severed by the strong flow and they fly upwards. Players one by one begin to fall quickly into the portal, losing their connection to dark sky. A second later, the player himself is pulled away from the ground by the dark sky and drawn to the vortex against his will. The master with a serious look invites the nemesis to move through the portal and play there. Chu Tiange self-repels and flies into the vortex, while Dark Sky, clearly not expecting this, is sucked into the portal against his will. Moments later, both players land simultaneously in the world of rebirth. Dark Sky cautiously looks around but does not recognize the place in question and splices in irritation at where they have ended up. Not waiting for an answer, the head of the Kingdom of Hades quickly pulls out his thunder talisman for teleportation and attempts to move, but is surprised to notice that for some reason, nothing happens. Dark Sky tries a few more times to trigger the amulet, but it still doesn't work, and the player decides that there may have been a malfunction or some kind of system error. The young lord explains that there is no error and let him not even try, as none of the attributes work in this world, and he can forget about them, just like his past puppets. He goes on to say that one activation of the Jade of Rebirth cost two million gold and he's not even sure if such a vile type was worth such a waste. Dark Sky, having lost all his trump cards, stumbles and falls down, shouting to the master not to approach him. Nothing and no one can stop Chu Tiange anymore and from the breakneck speed he flies straight at his terrified opponent. Getting as close to his opponent as possible, the young master summons the wrath of the dragon that cleaves the ground and swings his spear. 
A tremendous nuclear explosion occurs and Dark Sky flies far backwards from the impact, almost unconscious. He slowly regains consciousness but not fully, and tries with all his remaining strength to get to his feet. The enemy player manages to get down on one knee and the only thing he can squeeze out is the quiet word, hurt. Extremely angry, he yells at the top of his voice that this is not the way to go and he shouldn't be here at all. The system notified that the despair objection has been activated with an attack power of 150 points, which completely takes over Chu Tiange's power and increases his power by that amount of points. At this second, Dark Sky has the information on the screen about the attack power decreasing by 150 points. The player is very angry and eager for payback, but doesn't understand how to do it, since his power just went to his opponent. Dark Sky shrieked and asked the young lord what attribute he was using to do all of this. Chu Tiange wasn't even going to reply something to the vile enemy and simply powerfully pushed off for another jump with the words to continue fighting. The master had already swung his spear towards the player, but the player quickly peeled off for a jump to dodge the blow. Dark Sky didn't even realize how he was trapped and still took the young master's mighty blow with double the force. Both players landed, and the master, unlike Dark Sky, knew exactly what was coming next. The game system reported that Despair Rebirth was activated again, and 50 units of resistance to magic were obtained and given to player Chu Tianju. Dark Sky, upon hearing this, realized that there was nowhere to go, and the master cornered him with a sharp spear to his throat and said that after using so many players as his puppets to level up, he was simply dangerous and harmful to this game. Meanwhile, the black police van continued to be ambushed while waiting for further action. The butler was explaining to the captain that Dark Sky was imprisoned in the rebirth world and would not be able to get out of there on his own, and it was all controlled by his young master for now. The police captain radioed his men to keep an eye on all the groups and begin to take action. The SWAT team, on the order they received, ran out on the offensive to take over. Two guys standing inside the surrounded building heard some noise and rumbling. The armed SWAT team rushed into the area holding people back and yelling for everyone to get down on the ground and not move. A butler with a clipboard led the squad, saying that there were more people ahead and they should follow him. Yin Li found a staircase and was quickly climbing up it with the SWAT squad. Butler opened the map in his clipboard once more and looked at where they should go next. He informed the squad that judging by the map, they had come to just the right place. One of the SWAT team reported that the door was locked and wondered if he had a key. Suddenly, the butler heard someone's footsteps from the stairs and froze in anticipation. Some guy accompanied by a squad appeared next to them and reported that he would open the door and all the guys were still in the game. The SWAT guys, on Yin Li's orders, quickly pawed the poor guy and let him in. The butler opened up a map on a tablet with some place on it and showed it to the guy, asking if Dark Sky was here with the hostages. One of the SWAT guys commanded half of the military to go to Sector A and the rest to go with him to Sector B and warned not to touch the hostages under any circumstances. The squad of armed men immediately split up and ran in different directions. The guy who was still being held by the guys from the squad addressed Yin Li by name, saying how long he had been waiting for him. The butler didn't quite understand why he addressed him like that and frowned. Chu Tiange and Dark Sky remained imprisoned in the rebirth world for the time being, continuing to fight. The master once again dealt his opponent a strong blow, then powerfully threw him to the ground. At the same moment, the young master opened a portal and they began to simultaneously travel back to Lu Yang. A second later, both players had already been teleported back to the previous battlefield to the Hades Realm Guild Gate. Chu Tiange received a message through the system from his uncle that they were done with everything. Dark Sky decided that now was the time for revenge and shouted out all of the master's used attempts and his turn to attack. He quickly recovered his wires and began trying to make the connection. Dark Sky immediately realized that nothing was happening and turned around, horrified to notice that his men were gone. The master asked his rival why they had been in the rebirth world for so long, and after a short pause, told him about the police and all the freed hostages, which surprised his disbelieving foe. Dark Sky couldn't believe it, convincing himself it was some kind of joke, quickly opening the system screen. The master immediately realized the cunning plan of his opponent, who was about to quickly leave the game. Dark Sky had no time to press anything before he flew whistling backwards with all his might. 
Chu Tiange sealed him into the wall of the guild's main gate with one slight movement of his hand, shattering it. He asked Dark Sky if he was going to accidentally disconnect from the game, clarifying that it wouldn't happen while they were in dual mode. The master also reminded him that the one has a game capsule with communication, and until he disconnects, his people can't either. But that didn't seem to bother the cruel player at all, saying that these fools don't interest him at all. At the same second, Dark Sky pulled out his thunder talisman with excitement and said that the master seemed to have forgotten about their last battle. The young master watched with bated breath to see what this vile type was about to do. There was a powerful bright flash of magical explosion that went nowhere. Dark Sky didn't move anywhere and remained lying motionless, destroyed by his own talisman. A moment later, his virtual soul began to slowly leave his body. He looked at everything that was happening with extreme astonishment, as if from the outside, and wondered what had just happened. Chu Tiange cheerfully told him that he hadn't forgotten anything at all and don't let him think that Sing was smart. Dark Sky didn't understand what this was all about and tried to ask about any details of the master. The young master told him that he had bought up the entire city with its surrounding areas and the lives of the players under his control, without activating which no one would leave the game on their own. Dark Sky's soul was still ascending and he became enraged at what he heard. He started yelling that since everything had already happened according to his plan, he should let him out already, but the master only said that it wasn't time yet and they would wait for the police. The butler informed the young master through the system that the hostages had been rescued and they were in the Dark Sky room, to which the master expressed his approval. At that moment, the former boss of the prisoner's game booth opened and a SWAT team stood beside him. Dark Sky still couldn't believe that all this was happening to him and looked at the squad with astonishment. The SWAT team immediately grabbed and kicked the vile man to the ground. The former boss yelled for them to let him go immediately, as they would never catch him and would regret everything they had done. From the area of the building, a SWAT team was leading Dark Sky and the guy out under his arms. He saw the guy who had once served him and started shouting insults, adding that after doing such a despicable thing to the organization, he was definitely finished. Yin Li asked if his sentence would be reduced, to which the captain replied a possible yes, subject to certain conditions and rules and good cooperation. The guy thanked Yin Li for his concern and said that he admitted his guilt and was ready to suffer the punishment he deserved. As the guys were being led to the van, everyone heard a ringing squeak coming from both prisoners at the same time. The police captain, just in case, immediately yelled for everyone to disperse and let them go. The boss and his subordinate were both electrocuted at the same moment. A short while later, the two bodies without signs of life fell to the cold ground with a thud. The police captain was completely confused about what had happened and stared in bewilderment in front of him. The butler moved closer to the unconscious guys lying there to examine them. Yin Li reported that they had definitely been electrocuted as there were no external injuries. The butler, while scrutinizing the bodies, noticed a metal bracelet on the right leg of both of them. He summoned a police captain to examine the device to learn a little more about it. Meanwhile, the players were returning to the Hades Kingdom Pavilion on the battlefield. The master commanded them to clean up the battlefield and divide up whatever they found according to their will to Mao Yun and the third brother. He informed them that they would manage without him while he and El were away on business. The young master and his assistant were already waiting for the butler, and as soon as he entered, they began to ask how everything went. Uncle said that all the hostages had been rescued, but Dark Sky and his subordinate had been destroyed by an electric shock. He also took out a metal bracelet in a bag and said he would clarify what it was. Yin Li told his surprised friends that although it was evidence, the police had given it to him to examine. A second later, the little raccoon stepped back in horror, looking at the metal bracelet. The young gentleman immediately wondered what was happening to her. The little raccoon took her head and began to say that she had seen it somewhere before, but she wasn't sure exactly. The master and butler looked at each other enigmatically after making such an unexpected statement. Uncle Yin Li asked where exactly she could have seen such a bracelet before. The girl desperately tried to remember but couldn't, saying only that it was insanely familiar to her, but it was unclear from where. The butler, taking a serious look, informed the young master that everything was much more confusing than they thought. A few hours ago, the butler was talking to a detained subordinate of the dark boss. 
Yin Lie asked the guy why he suddenly decided to help them and surrender despite the great risk and threat to his own life. The guy began to reveal that he had initially started working with Dark Sky for his victory over Chu Tiange, but the further their case progressed, the more terrifying secrets he learned and could no longer hide it. The butler was still distrustful of the guy and asked him to talk things over since it was a long story. The uncle narrated the whole story to the young gentleman and the faithful assistant. After a moment, he asked what their future plan of action would be. Chu Tiange began to think about what ways everything was connected, but he realized one thing. Their main goal was him. The master opened the map and suggested that he would examine the evidence so far, and in regards to the game, he would try to expand his sphere of influence as much as possible. Frowning, the young master said that he was sure there were many more such dark skies lurking in the game, and they were all waiting for him. Butler nodded approvingly and said that he would continue to work with the police and still help him somehow within the game. Master suggested that they meet with the selected players as early as next week, and Uncle replied that the game capsules would be delivered just within a week. Chu Tiange was very happy with this news and began to wait for the realization of his cunning plan. Late at night, the butler was still awake, typing something quickly on the computer. More and more folders were loading on the computer screen. Among the pile of hundreds of files, the search engine finally stopped on a project called Phoenix. Butler was seriously thinking about something, remembering a recent incident. The guy had wanted to talk to him about something and asked him for a moment. After a bit of silence, he asked just about that very Phoenix project. Yin Li immediately reacted sternly to the guy's words, grabbing him by the throat. He pinned him firmly against the concrete wall of the building for a few minutes. The guy began to hoarsely shout that he didn't see anything except the name, and if it was important, he would keep quiet. The butler, still holding the guy by the throat, said menacingly that no questions were allowed. A while later, Yin Li let go of the kid, and the kid fell to the floor with a clatter. Butler snapped out of his memories and decided to open the Project Phoenix folder. As he waited for the opening to load, he sank into even older memories. The butler stood in the study of the young master's father and inquired about what he could do for him. The head of the Chu Yi family handed Yin Li a Phoenix flash drive and asked him to guard it from outsiders and not open it unless absolutely necessary. The butler decided to find out what exactly was inside this project. The father of the family only assured him that there was nothing to worry about. It just needed to be used at the right time. After a bit of silence, he added that by doing so, he would protect the young lord. The butler looked at the worried boss and became a bit anxious as well. Meanwhile, in Singularity's organization, six men invariably stood in the main room. The elevator doors opened into the room with an unknown man surrounded by guards. All six bowed respectfully and greeted the formidable boss. The uniformed man approached one of those standing by the desk and asked to explain what they had going on here. The subordinate began to say that there was nothing to worry about and explained the situation, where Chu Tiange already already owned many areas of Tang country and was trying to take over this entire country altogether. Frowning, the boss inquired if Dark Sky was now left without any shelter. The subordinate nodded in agreement and revealed that they had also asked him to change the name of the guild and immediately felt the boss's hand around his neck. The boss held the subordinate tightly and warned him that if he did anything else without him, let him not expect any more help. The other subordinates watched all this in silence and one of them seemed to want to say something. A moment later, the man asked to tell the boss that they could only withhold all the information, but it would take a bit of time. The boss irritably replied for them to hurry up as he wasn't the most patient person. Chu Tiange looked at the monitor screen and thought about something else after defeating Dark Sky. The cursed Dragonfang appeared on the system screen with a suggestion to use it and the master clicked accept. Next on the screen came the information about reviving the dragon with a task and reward for it. The master finally realized that this tooth was originally obtained after defeating the black dragon and the task could be activated back then. Chu Tiange was interested in the task that needed to activate the dragon vein in Luyang and pressed browse. A navigation map came up on the screen, showing some specific locations. The master recognized the stops of the multicolored dragon altar here, where one had to dig up this altar and activate it. Chu Tiange finished familiarizing himself with the task and called his buddies forward. Mao Yun suggested to the boss to build a guild building in Luyang, as there were 30th to 60th level dungeons nearby 
and new people would soon be drawn to them. Little Raccoon supported such an idea, saying that their people were just there. Mao Yun clarified that it would take a lot of quite a bit of money to become a new guild. The master cheerfully said that money had never been a problem, and if everyone agreed, they could choose a suitable place for the future guild. The buddies looked around the area with players and a few buildings. Chu Tiange, scrutinizing the players, didn't understand why there were so many clones here. Mao Yun pointed out that the monsters here were too weak to pump, and El suggested going to Chenan. The master, exhaling heavily, informed that it was pointless to form a guild here. Suddenly, he shouted to everyone that he had an idea and ran to the nearest tall rock to announce it. Mao Yun wondered in bewilderment what the boss was up to. Chu Tianga began to loudly urge all the residents to listen now to his very favorable proposal. He began to ask if they could feel how it was becoming difficult for them to pump after leaving the village. The players began to take turns listing the drawbacks of the settlement and their unreasonable expectations. The young lord suggested that everyone move their guild buildings to Shanan, as it was a great place to pump with strong monsters. The players began to resent that it was too expensive and that they didn't have that kind of money. Plus, they were barely maintaining their existing guilds and barely raising their levels. Chu Tiange said that if they took his offer, he would cover all their expenses and provide a free portal to Shanan. In addition, he said that they would each receive 50 gold and experience, and as a bonus, a 20% discount on purchases from NPC for a month. The players were dumbfounded by such a generous offer and still couldn't believe what was happening. The master mentioned that all of Shanan was at his disposal, and if anyone wanted to head there, let them come over to register. The players solemnly shouted out the young master's name and ran towards him. Chu Tiange turned around to his friends and asked them to move a little aside for their own safety. A second later, he summoned his trusty spear from the available inventory to implement the plan. The young lord pushed off powerfully from the stone and flew closer to the buildings of the village. Chu Tiange, hovering above the rooftops of the buildings, immediately summoned Hellfire. Pointing his staff of fire, the master with a menacing look ordered everything here to burn. In the same second, all the guild buildings were engulfed in flames and burst into bright flames, leaving behind only bare earth. El marveled at the young master's strength, and Mao Yun, who knew that it was one of the most complicated techniques, asked where the boss had learned it. The master clarified that it was not a power, just another purchase from a merchant, and Mao worried that they wouldn't have enough money for everything. Chu Tiange immediately said that such an outcome was out of the question, as he had foreseen everything long ago. With a sly smile, he added that when all the guilds in the area left, all of Luyang's resources would be left to them. Mao in turn marveled at the boss's intelligence and skill, and said that he would move everyone now. Just then, a third brother teleported over to the rest of his buddies. He informed the older brother that they had begun digging the fourth altar, and he called for more players to speed up the process. The third brother warned that other players might revolt in Chanan, but Nubi was sure that wouldn't happen since those people were of a lower level than the people of Chanan. She also said that if they were to level up at the same time, they would not interfere with each other in any way, and in about a month they would be of equal strength. Master Nubi confirmed Nubi's words, saying that they were not as versatile as them anyway. Chu Tainje suggested that they all head towards the final altar as soon as possible. The team of buddies only reached the place with the last altar by nightfall. The master opened the screen and said that according to the map, the altar was right below this guild, and he was eager to find out what kind of treasures the dragon clan had. Suddenly the buddies were interrupted by a man from the darkness who said that he had not yet given his consent to all of this. The head of that guild stood in front of the players and said that only his decision would determine their fate. Chu Tiange assured him that he would bear all the necessary expenses, and this could be confirmed by all the players in Chanan. The head said that he was aware of everything but found it insulting to the other players. One of his guild staff told the boss that such a chance comes once in a million. Without thinking long, the head kicked the chatty player with all his might who flew far backwards. The head was angered by the subordinate's behavior and shouted at him not to talk nonsense. The guild head calmly informed the master that he was willing to move the guild for two million gold and no other way. Nubi interjected, saying that it was a very good offer, but the head quickly interrupted her, insisting on his point. 
The head addressed the master that he was not here for anyone to belittle his dignity. The young master asked what the head's skills were, and the head replied that he had the hidden class of a professional guardian, and as long as he was online, no one dared attack his guildmates. The head warned the master not to even try to take down the guilds until he gives him two million, as he won't leave the game knowing he's here. The third brother told the boss that he didn't understand where only such brazen players came from in the game and offered to beat him up. Chu Tiange didn't back down and offered the head another chance to think hard about his decision. The head didn't back down either and insisted on two million gold and not a drop less. The master asked everyone to take it easy and follow him to check on the other four altars. The head smirked and said that the insolent master would never take them for nothing. After a while, the head lay quietly resting in one of his guild's buildings. Suddenly, sand began to fall from the ceiling and a strange sound was heard. The head woke up and looked around and listened in bewilderment. The master was leading the robot diggers behind him and thanking them for their hard work. The guild leader jumped out onto the balcony of the building and tried to figure out what was going on. He saw the young master surrounded by robot diggers in front of him. The head immediately became enraged and started shouting at the master for doing such a thing. Chu Tiange suggested that he talk to the NPCs who had given him permission to expand Lu Yang's territory for only 200,000 gold. The head was shocked at what he heard, and the master decided to clarify one more thing. The young master reminded him that there were certain guild rules, and the third rule stated that no guild could be founded in such a city. The head realized that there was nothing he could do, but he was still very angry. In front of the guild, the throwing machines were already standing in front of the guild and released projectiles on command. Huge cannonballs flew straight towards the guild and its head, who froze in place from what he saw. Seconds later, all the guild buildings were under fire and under attack from the explosions. When the technicians finished their work, the guild was gone, and only ruins remained in its place. The head of the former guild was lying among the rubble, saying that he was wrong and he was sorry. The master asked him if he wanted to move to Shannon, and he quickly agreed. Little Raccoon clarified to the young master if he could just destroy all the guilds, then why move the players? The master clarified that not all players had a choice of where to build and play, but he wouldn't work with such rascals. Let them just live. Chu Tiange suggested replacing Lu Yang's old walls with new ones, and Ella happily approved of such an idea. At that very second, gold coins sprinkled into the sacks in huge quantities. The master gave those sacks to one player and asked them to divide everything to everyone and find the altar, to which the player fairly shouted that he would fulfill everything to the best of his ability. Chu Tiange said that he was done with everything here and would return to Lu Yang, and Ella said that they would stay here to keep an eye on everything for now. The young master was already leisurely walking down one of the streets of Lu Yang City. Towards the master, some familiar player was running loudly and quickly. Having already approached Chu Tiange himself, the familiar turned out to be the master NPC. Chu Tiange anxiously asked why he wasn't in Chenan and if something had happened there, to which the bot replied that he had a lot of things to do and didn't have time to answer all of them. He had come here for one single purpose, to report important news to the master. The master told him that the kingdom nearby had broken up and he was gathering information about it, where it turned out that their pavilion and the dragon emperor's palace had been built at the same time, but the former had a changed name. After a bit of silence, he clarified that the former guild used to have a different name, Unity Wave. The shocked Chu Tiange couldn't believe what he had heard, and he asked the bot several times to re-examine the name. The chief showed the master a paper with information that stated that this guild had robbed and attacked others, and successfully changed the name to Kingdom of Hades, 